Australian origins. In many countries, leading families proudly trace their ancestors back to some significant group of people. In the USA, prominent families may boast that their family came over on the Mayflower in 1620. In England, ladies and gentlemen are happy to announce that their ancestors came to Britain with William the Conqueror in 1066. In Australia, however, many leading families are reluctant to talk about their origins. In fact, many years ago, one Australian city burned its early records so that no one would know who their ancestors were. The reason for that is that Australia began its history as a British penal colony. In 18th century England, there was a large gap between the rich and the poor. To make matters worse, many farmers had been forced off their land by powerful landowners. These homeless people wandered to the cities, where employment was often hard to find. Frequent wars gave temporary employment to young men as soldiers and sailors, but when the war was over, they were no better off than before. As a result, theft was extremely common. To protect themselves, the upper class made theft punishable by hanging. The problem with this was that juries were often reluctant to hang someone for stealing something small and might declare the person not guilty. For example, if a man or woman stole a loaf of bread to feed their children, the jury might just let them go. To prevent this, the courts came up with a new category of punishment: exile or transportation. If the judge or jury was reluctant to sentence the accused to death, they would ship them far away from England across the seas. However, if the person was found back in England again, he or she would be hanged. At first, England sent its convicts to America's 13 colonies. However, when the United States declared its independence in 1776, this was no longer possible. England considered sending criminals to West Africa, but the land and climate were considered unsuitable. So finally, Great Britain decided to use the huge, almost uninhabited country of Australia. At this time, not a single European was living anywhere on the continent. In the fall of 1786, a fleet of English ships began to take convicts on board. This process continued till the sailing date of May 13th, 1787. Many British jails had been cleared of both male and female prisoners. Since the convicts were technically under a sentence of death, there was little concern for making them comfortable. At first, the convicts were chained below decks, but later some were released when well out to sea. One man had been sentenced for theft of a winter coat, another for stealing cucumbers from a garden, a third for carrying off a sheep. Among the women, one was guilty of stealing a large cheese, another of taking several yards of cloth. These ships, known as the First Fleet, carried 1,442 convicts, sailors, marines, and officers. The fleet finally arrived at Botany Bay on January 10, 1788. Later that month, they moved down to Sydney Harbour. No preparations whatsoever had been made. The forest came right up to the shore. Soon, the fleet members were cutting down trees and trying to put up tents. It was June 1790 before further supplies arrived from England. Meanwhile, many convicts suffered from sickness, aggravated by the lack of good food. In conclusion, Australians need not be ashamed of their origins. In time, great things were achieved, in spite of the almost complete lack of help from the English government. Many ex-convicts became respectable settlers who began prosperous farms and businesses. The members of the First Fleet, whether convicts or not, deserve to be honoured as the founders of Australia. Casaloma. Many people visit Europe and see the old castles left from the days of knighthood. Very few return home with plans to build their own castle. Toronto businessman Henry Pellet actually built such a castle, Casaloma. Pellet was born in Kingston, Ontario, in 1859, but the family soon moved to Toronto. His father opened Toronto's first stock brokerage firm in 1866. Pellet Sr. became part of Toronto's financial elite. And Henry Pellet eventually joined his father in business. The young Pellet was especially attracted by the military and the British armed forces. When Henry was 18, he joined the Queen's Own Rifles, a militia unit. He was soon one of the soldiers sent to suppress a railway strike. At 21, he was made an officer and gradually moved up through the ranks, eventually becoming a brigadier general. 
Meanwhile, Henry was learning the stock brokerage business. He soon showed considerable ability at forming new companies. Electricity was a recent invention, and Pellet hoped to be among the foremost developers. In 1883, he founded the Toronto Electric Light Company, and later was an owner of the Toronto Electric Railway. He also made money as a land speculator in the Canadian West. Unlike many businessmen of the time, however, Pellet believed in community service. He sponsored many charitable organizations and supported various good causes. In spite of his business dealings, Pellet found time to tour England and Europe regularly. He brought back ideas for a castle on the hill. Pellet's castle, however, would not be a damp, drafty castle of the Middle Ages. It would have the latest technology. Construction of Casa Loma began in 1910 and was completed in 1914. Outwardly, it looked like a medieval castle, but inside, it was comfortable and luxurious. There were 98 rooms, three bowling alleys, 30 bathrooms, 25 fireplaces, and 5,000 electric lights. It had an electric elevator and an indoor swimming pool. There was a library of 100,000 books. A temperature-controlled wine cellar, a shooting gallery, and a large art collection. Pellet ordered only the most expensive materials and employed the best craftsmen. The cost of all of this was 3.5 million dollars, a huge sum in those days. Pellet and his wife liked to entertain. They often opened up Casa Loma for special events. Sometimes he would invite all 1,000 men from the Queen's Own Rifles over for the weekend. The Pellets also held parties for the staff. Pellet had hoped that Casa Loma would be the center of an extensive subdivision. He hoped that wealthy people would build grand homes nearby, and so he bought up the land near his castle. Unfortunately for Pellet, most of the people coming to Toronto were poor immigrants who couldn't afford large houses. Pellet was unable to sell his land holdings, and his income declined. In 1924, Pellet turned Casa Loma over to the City of Toronto because he could not pay his property tax. All the contents of Casa Loma went on auction soon after. His 1.5 million dollar collection of art and artifacts sold for only $250,000. Now Casa Loma is a leading Toronto tourist attraction. The castle in the middle of the city has 400,000 visitors each year. It is the closest thing in North America. To a real European castle. Charlie Brown. On October second, nineteen fifty, a new comic strip appeared in American newspapers. The hero of the strip was a round-headed kid named Charlie Brown. In the very first cartoon, two young schoolmates watch Charlie Brown walking by, and one comments, "Well, here comes old Charlie Brown. Yes, sir, good old Charlie Brown. How I hate him." This comic strip was to become one of the most popular in history. Its creator, Charles M. Schultz, drew the strip for 50 years until his death. But reruns of Peanuts still appear regularly in the newspaper. What are some of the characteristics of Charlie Brown and his friends that have made the cartoon popular? Charlie Brown is an unlikely hero. Other kids don't like being around him because the things he does never seem to work out properly. Kids want to be with someone who's good-looking, popular, and successful, so they can feel part of his success. Charlie Brown is always worrying, hardly ever upbeat, afraid of failure, and always making mistakes. His kite gets snagged in the tree. He needs counseling from Lucy. His dog Snoopy is more popular than he is, and the little red-haired girl never notices him. In short, Charlie Brown is a loser. Charlie Brown illustrates all the insecurities that kids have. Many of these anxieties carry over into adult life. Sometimes they reflect problems in the life of the comic strip's creator, Charles M. Schultz. Schultz suffered from depression much of his life and had a difficult time in school. He was not very popular with his classmates. Humor and laughter are often a way of dealing with problems. And in the Peanuts strip, the world can laugh at all the silly things that people do. Because of his honest way of dealing with problems, Charlie Brown and his friends are more interesting than the average comic strip characters. The characters represent adult personality types. Charlie Brown is wishy-washy and is afraid to do things for fear of failure. 
Lucy is a pushy, overbearing female who thinks she knows it all. Linus, her younger brother, is intellectual but insecure. He still clings to his baby blanket for security. Schroeder is preoccupied with Beethoven's music to the exclusion of everything else. Sally, Charlie Brown's younger sister, combines both a romantic attachment to Linus and a desire for material things. Peppermint Patty is a tomboy who loves baseball, but nonetheless has a romantic crush on Charlie Brown. Snoopy, the dog, represents a cool, detached, inventive individual who also relies on basic creature comforts. These characters add up to a human comedy. In the comic strip, we can see ourselves and the people around us making mistakes, getting second chances, but tending to do the same things over again. Behind the humor of Peanuts. Is a serious message. Words can hurt. Relationships are important. Truth is difficult to find. Criticism is too common. Greed can easily overpower us. These messages are both timeless and timely. Peanuts has also been turned into television specials and several movies. Snoopy stuffed toys are popular all over the world. A huge industry has grown from a simple comic strip. Perhaps this means that while we all secretly want to be winners, we really identify more closely with the Charlie Browns of this world. Conquering Lake Ontario. In 490 BC, the Greek runner Philippides ran the 24 miles from Marathon to Athens to announce the Athenian victory. His endurance was so much admired that runners ever since have attempted to run similar long marathon distances. In the 20th century, however, long-distance swimming has also attracted attention and admiration. To swim the English Channel or Juan de Fuca Strait between Vancouver Island and the mainland have become challenges for both male and female swimmers. In September 1954, some Canadian businessmen from Toronto offered veteran Californian champion Florence Chadwick ten thousand dollars if she could swim Lake Ontario. They felt sure that such a feat would attract large crowds. Chadwick had swum the English Channel in both directions. However, no one, neither man nor woman, had crossed Lake Ontario. It was a 32-mile swim through cold water and difficult currents. Two other women also decided to take up the challenge. One, Winnie Roach Lausler, had also swum the English Channel. The other was a 16-year-old girl named Marilyn Bell. The swimmers traveled to the mouth of the Niagara River on the south side of Lake Ontario. They would swim from Youngstown in the USA back to Toronto. Bad weather delayed the swim for several days. During the night of September 8th, the weather cleared and the swimmers entered the water before midnight. Guided by her coach's flashlight, Marilyn swam through the dark water and soon passed Chadwick, who was lifted from the water after swimming 12 miles. Lausler made it further, but she too eventually had to give up. Marilyn not only had to overcome her fears of the dark, but she was attacked during the night by blood-sucking lamprey eels. She was able to knock these off with her fist. As dawn approached, the winds and waves increased, and Marilyn's weariness mounted. Her coach, Gus Ryder. Passed her some corn syrup on a stick, and later gave her liniment for her tired legs. He wrote messages on a blackboard to encourage her to keep going. Sometimes he tricked her into thinking that she was nearer to the shore than she was. Marilyn fell asleep in the water twice and had to be awakened. The second time, a friend of hers jumped into the water beside her and swam with her for a distance. Because Marilyn's strength was declining, she was being pushed off course by the currents. Although the direct route was 32 miles, Marilyn swam a total of 45 miles. The last few miles were extremely difficult. Marilyn's family and the lifeguards felt that she should be taken out of the water, but her coach threatened to quit as her coach if the swimmer gave up. It was getting dark again, and the swimmer was barely conscious as she approached the shore. Thousands of people lined the shore, hoping to touch her or get a picture of her. Marilyn's supporters had to push the crowds back so they wouldn't stop her from touching the shore. Finally, after 21 hours in the water, Marilyn reached land. The exhausted girl was rushed to an ambulance. She had lost about 20 pounds of her 120 pounds weight in the crossing. Finally, she was able to sleep. Huge crowds came out to see her the next day, and two days later, there was a parade in her honor through the streets of Toronto. Everyone admired the courage and endurance of the 16-year-old girl who became the first person to swim across Lake Ontario. Courier and Ives.
Before the widespread use of photography, there was a large market for artistic depictions of scenes and events. A process for making prints called lithography became popular in North America during the early 19th century. One young artist who mastered this technique was Nathaniel Currier (1813 to 1888). Currier opened his own shop in 1834. Currier's success came when he issued prints of newsworthy events. His ruins of the Merchants' Exchange followed a great fire in New York, December 1834. One of Currier's prints of a disastrous fire on a steamboat was published in the New York Sun in 1840. There was also a large market for decorative prints. People who couldn't afford oil paintings would buy color prints to put on their walls. Some of these prints were copies of paintings. Sometimes Currier mentioned his source, and sometimes not. In 1852, James Merritt Ives (1824 to 1895) joined Currier's firm. In 1857, he became Currier's partner. After that, the firm was known as Currier and Ives. Altogether, the firm produced about 7,000 different subjects. Small prints sold for about 25 cents, and large color prints for about three dollars. Traveling salesmen went from house to house selling them. Currier and Ives sometimes hired the original painters to make the print. More often, someone from their own studio either composed an original subject or copied an existing painting or drawing. Contemporary news remained popular. Currier and Ives' prints included the first appearance of Jenny Lind in America, 1850; the fall of Richmond, Virginia, 1865. And the Great Fire at Chicago, 1871. A common subject was a patriotic scene from American history. Interesting occupations such as whaling, bird hunting, trapping, fur trading, and deep sea fishing were portrayed. Pioneer and Indian topics were in demand. However, the most popular of all scenes were winter and holiday prints of ordinary people enjoying life: farm scenes, buggy rides, sleigh rides, market scenes, blacksmith shops. And town scenes sold well. Favorite prints included American Forest Scene, Maple Sugaring, 1860; Home to Thanksgiving, 1863; Winter in the Country, 1862; Life in the Country, The Morning Ride, 1859; and American Winter Sports, 1856. These scenes are still popular. Even today, you can buy Christmas cards with Currier and Ives winter scenes. This collection of prints gives a remarkable picture of America between 1934 and 1907. Although the prints are sometimes more romantic than reality, they give a lot of information about everyday life. They depict styles of clothing, trains and boats, buildings and bridges, and popular activities. They also tell us what sorts of scenes people at that time liked and what their artistic tastes were. Eventually, advances in photography made this kind of printmaking obsolete. In 1906, the firm of Currier and Ives closed its doors. For a while, these prints were not considered very valuable. Nowadays, however, there are many collectors, and Currier and Ives prints once again can be found decorating North American homes. Death Valley, California. The steep mountains of southeastern California dip suddenly into a deep valley. Rain is kept out of the valley by the high mountains, which form its western slopes. Although mountains surround the valley, Death Valley itself is very low. In fact, its lowest point is 282 feet below sea level, the lowest point of land in North or South America. Death Valley is about 140 miles long, but only a few miles wide. It got its name in 1849 during the California Gold Rush. Gold seekers attempted to cross Death Valley on the way to California's gold fields, and some died of thirst there. There's hardly any water in the valley. The average rainfall is only a couple of inches a year. It is also one of the hottest places in North America in the summer. Temperatures of 134 Fahrenheit have been recorded. As a result of this heat and dryness, Death Valley is a desert. These conditions give rise to the valley's most important products: mineral salts and salt deposits. One of these products is borax, which has many industrial uses. Borax was removed from the desert using 20 mule teams hitched in a long string. Later, a railway was built to help carry out these minerals. In spite of its desert conditions, Death Valley has considerable animal and plant life. Of course, its animals and plants are those typical in desert conditions. Only on the salt flats do plants refuse to grow. With even a small rainfall in the spring, the desert will come alive with wild flowers. Very few places in the world have such a contrast in heights and depths. 
The mountains near the valley are among the highest in continental USA, while the valley itself is the lowest elevation. Mount Whitney, at 14,495 feet, is less than 100 miles from Death Valley. The climate in the valley from October to May is generally pleasant. Since Death Valley is now a national park, many tourists visit during this season. Now roads and hotels provide comfortable access. Death Valley is located close to the Nevada border. Its desert conditions are common throughout the area of the American West, just east of the coastal mountains. In most cases, heavy rain falls along the coast, but very little in the interior. Because there is no farming and water is hard to obtain, Death Valley and similar desert areas have very few permanent residents. Dr. Norman Bethune Some people find their vocation early in life. Others do not discover their life's work until they are older. Norman Bethune tried many things before he fully recognized his true work. Bethune was born in Gravenhurst, Ontario in 1890. He was the son of a Presbyterian clergyman. The family moved frequently, and many of the places they lived were close to lakes, rivers, and woods. As a young man, Norman loved the outdoors. He became a good swimmer and skater. He also showed that he had a strong, independent streak. He hated rules, but also had a strong sense of justice. The young man studied science at the University of Toronto from 1909 to 1911. After that, he worked for Frontier College. This was a volunteer organization where instructors did the same jobs as local workers during the day and taught them English in the evening. He then returned to Toronto to study medicine. Early in World War I, he joined the Army Medical Corps. He reached France in February 1915, but was wounded in April and eventually returned to Canada. He went back to the war in 1917. At the end of the war, he continued to study medicine in London, England. While he was in England, he married a Scottish woman, Frances Campbell Penny. Although Bethune loved her very much, their marriage ended in divorce in 1927. The couple moved to Detroit, Michigan in 1924, where Bethune opened a medical practice. In the middle of his growing success, he contracted tuberculosis. This was a low point in Bethune's life. Thinking that he was going to die, he considered suicide. One day, however, he read of a new treatment for tuberculosis and insisted that his doctors perform the operation on him. As a result, Bethune recovered. The year was 1927. For some years after, Bethune devoted himself to the treatment of tuberculosis patients. However, he began to notice a pattern. Rich patients who could afford proper medical care usually recovered. Poor patients usually died. Bethune became a supporter of government-funded medical care. Bethune admired the government-funded health system in communist Russia. He was angry when Canada would not support his idea about Medicare. Bethune wanted to change the world, and communism seemed like the most promising method. In 1936, Bethune went to Spain to help the Republicans fight the fascists. He was appalled to see the fascists' allies, Germany and Italy, dropping bombs on women and children. He developed a hatred for fascism. He also decided that doctors should go to the front, rather than wait for the wounded to be brought to them. In Spain, he developed a blood transfusion service, which saved many lives. Returning to North America, Bethune heard about the Japanese attack on China in 1937. Early in 1938, he sailed for China. Bethune had joined the Communist Party. Now he went to join the army of Mo Tung in northern China. Mo's army was suffering badly from Japanese attacks. They had hardly any doctors or medical supplies. Difficulties only made Bethune work harder. He soon organized a hospital, trained medical workers, and wrote textbooks. He insisted on operating right at the front to give the wounded a better chance of survival. He went for days without sleep and gave his own blood to help the wounded. In November 1939, he died from blood poisoning, but his work lived on. In 1973, the Canadian government bought his house that he was born in and turned it into a museum. Ebenezer Scrooge In the story A Christmas Carol, Scrooge is an English businessman who thinks about nothing but money. He has no friends and spends no time with his family. He lives alone, eats alone, and works alone, except for his underpaid clerk Bob Cratchit. Scrooge never spends his money, but hoards it all and prides himself on his frugality. Scrooge hates Christmas. 
It's all nonsense to him. People spend money on food and gifts and parties. Often they can't afford what they spend. Worse than that, they take a whole day off work and so lose a chance to make more money. Scrooge is angry that he has to give his clerk the day off with pay. He feels that he's being robbed. Christmas is also a time when people are asked to give money to help the poor. Scrooge is angry when two men come to his door asking for donations. Scrooge argues that he pays taxes, which support prisons and workhouses. It is not his business to worry about the problems of other people. Scrooge represents businessmen who see the bottom line as all that matters. Scrooge's partner Marley had died seven years earlier. He was like Scrooge in all respects. That evening, which is Christmas Eve, Scrooge is visited by Marley's ghost. Marley drags steel chains round about him, which contain keys, cash boxes, ledgers, purses, and deeds. These are the things that Marley cared about when he was alive. Marley is condemned in death to wander the world and tells Scrooge that the same fate is likely to happen to him. However, three spirits will visit Scrooge, and if Scrooge listens to them, he may escape this fate. The first spirit comes and takes Scrooge back to the early scenes of his own life. He sees himself being left behind at school while the other boys went home for the holidays. Then his little sister arrives to tell him he could go home too. Another scene was of a cheerful Christmas party when Scrooge was a young man. A third scene showed him with the girl he was planning to marry. She left him because he no longer cared about anything but money. The second spirit shows Scrooge what people are doing that very Christmas. He shows Scrooge the preparations that people, even poor people, are making to celebrate Christmas. They visit Bob Cratchit's tiny home. There, they see the family cooking their little Christmas dinner. Bob's son, Tiny Tim, has been weakened by disease and has to use a crutch to walk. The family is delighted with its meal, small as it is. They see other scenes of poor people, miners and sailors, celebrating Christmas. Finally, they visit Scrooge's nephew and view his Christmas party and its games. The third spirit was the spirit of Christmas yet to come, the future. This spirit does not talk, but points to scenes connected with Scrooge. They overhear some businessmen joking about someone who has recently died. Scrooge sees that he no longer occupies his usual place of business. The spirit then shows him two women who have stolen the bedclothes, curtains, and clothes off the dead man and taken them to a pawnbroker. The spirit takes Scrooge to the room where the dead man died. The only people who are happy about the death are a young couple who owed him money. The spirit then shows Scrooge the Cratchit's house, where they're mourning the death of Tiny Tim. Finally, the spirit takes him to a churchyard where they stand among the graves. Then the spirit points to the name of the dead man on the tombstone. Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge is going to die, and no one will care. Scrooge finds himself in his own bed on Christmas morning. He is resolved now to avoid the fate that the spirits had shown him. He is delighted that he is getting a second chance. Scrooge decides to surprise all his acquaintances, and he begins by buying a huge goose and sending it to the Cratchits. On his walk, he meets the two men collecting for the poor and offers them a large sum of money. He goes on to join his nephew at a Christmas party. The next day, when Bob Cratchit comes into work, Scrooge gives him a raise in his salary. He also takes care of Tiny Tim so that Tim recovers his health. Charles Dickens' story was written at a time when governments did very little to help the poor. Wages were very low, and many businessmen were unwilling to look after their workers properly. Dickens points out that people like Scrooge not only make other people unhappy, but also are usually unhappy themselves. It is possible to be a very rich businessman and a poor human being at the same time. Etiquette. Etiquette is a French word. The original meaning was little tickets. These tickets were given to people who were attending a public ceremony. Printed on the ticket were instructions about how to behave on this occasion. So etiquette came to mean the way to behave on public occasions. Etiquette today includes how to introduce people, how to eat properly. How to dress for different occasions, how to speak to different people, and what to do on special occasions. Almost every part of social life can have its particular etiquette. Sometimes etiquette changes or seems to change. There was much behavior attached to courtship, such as a man holding the door open for a woman. Nowadays, some people find this outdated, but politeness is always a good idea. It is nice to hold the door open for the next person, whoever they are. 
In fact, it sometimes seems like contemporary life encourages bad manners. Etiquette is no longer taught to young people. Moreover, in a youth culture, young people take their examples from other young people. As a result, good manners aren't considered important. The point of etiquette is to help people to get along with each other. If people behave in an accepted manner, there is less chance of misunderstanding. It is important for people to think about treating other people well. If everyone does what they feel like doing, it doesn't seem like they respect other people. Etiquette can help things to go a lot smoother. Manners vary from culture to culture, but the intention is the same: to treat people with consideration. This is a way to reduce conflict. Sometimes we can understand where these customs come from. Originally, shaking hands with your right hand probably meant that you weren't carrying a weapon. Taking off your hat may originally have been taking off your helmet. This meant that you weren't going to fight. Nowadays, there are new areas of social life. For example, a lot of conversation now takes place on the telephone. Perhaps because there is no traditional telephone etiquette, some people feel free to be rude. Try to treat the person on the phone just the way you would treat them if you were actually talking to them. Most people feel it is rude to interrupt a conversation, but many people seem to think that it is okay to interrupt someone talking on the phone. Children especially need to be taught not to interrupt. The internet also needs its own etiquette or netiquette, because you cannot see whom you are talking to, and they may be thousands of miles away. It is easy to misunderstand. Also, people cannot hear the tone of your voice over the internet. For this reason, some people use smileys, little faces, to show how they are feeling. If they make a joke, they can use a smiling face or print grin after their remark. This tips off the recipient that their remark is not to be taken seriously. Using simple words like "please" and "thank you" can make everyday life a lot smoother and happier. Like a lot of other things, we do not realize the importance of etiquette until it starts to disappear. Gambling. Many governments have turned to legalized gambling as a way to increase revenues. Raising taxes has become very unpopular, and gambling can be seen as a cash cow. Large casinos are often considered good for areas with high unemployment. Most new casinos include a variety of slot machines, table games such as blackjack and roulette wheels. Opponents of gambling point to problems associated with it. Crime rates go up, especially with respect to theft and prostitution. People become addicted to gambling and play until they are broke. Stress is put on families when one member gambles and the grocery and rent money are spent. On the other hand, many people view gambling as an exciting form of entertainment. They look forward to the opportunity to play the lottery or go to the casino. Often, they feel that they are getting good value in terms of entertainment for what they spend. The truth is probably that some people can control the urge to gamble, while some cannot. People who find gambling really exciting feel that they have to go back for that high, even if it means spending all their money. Many people doubt that governments should promote gambling, since it is certain to produce addicts. There has also been some question whether gambling is good for the local economy. If a casino is built in an area of high unemployment, will local people really benefit? The answer seems to be both yes and no. People may benefit if the gamblers come in large numbers from outside the area and spend their money there. That is, if the casino is a notable tourist attraction. On the other hand, if not many people come from outside the area, there are few benefits. In this case, most of the gamblers are local people who are spending the little money they have. Gambling is especially attractive to older and retired people. Since older people don't have much chance of making a lot of new money, the thought of winning the jackpot is very attractive to them. Casinos regularly run buses from retirement homes so that seniors can come and gamble. Some would see this as taking advantage of lonely people. There are stories in the newspaper about couples leaving their children locked in the car for six or eight hours while they gamble. One man hoped to improve his finances by gambling, but he lost heavily. His wife found out and went gambling herself, hoping to win some of the money back. Before long, they had to sell their house to pay their gambling debts. Gambling has usually been associated with organized crime. Even today, when government agencies supervise gambling, it would appear that there is still a crime connection. This may be because many of the best gamblers and gambling administrators learn their trade outside of the law.
Besides this, gambling establishments attract various forms of crime to the area. Since law and government have an important educational function, one doesn't like to see them involved in gambling. Governments should be more than profit maximizers; they should be concerned chiefly with the public good. Gilbert and Sullivan. Gilbert and Sullivan are the authors of many lively and humorous operettas. These works are the most popular of their kind and are regularly performed today. But the two authors are known almost as well for their arguments and disagreements. The famous partners were very different people with very different interests. William S. Gilbert wrote the words that Sullivan set to music. Gilbert had a special talent for humorous verse. He loved puns and had a very quick wit. Personally, though, he was very businesslike. He had wanted to enter the military and always had the look of a soldier about him. He was fond of giving orders and disliked criticism of anything he did. Arthur S. Sullivan, on the other hand, was a sensitive, emotional person whose main interest was music. Sullivan came from a poor family, but his musical talents and good looks had helped him to succeed. Sullivan wanted to write serious classical music, but as a poor man, he needed a source of income. Sullivan also needed someone to direct him. On his own, he had trouble deciding what to do. Gilbert and Sullivan never became really good friends, and at the end of their lives, they had little contact with each other. But the writer and musician needed each other. Gilbert needed a composer who could enliven his writings for the stage. Sullivan needed someone to write a text for his music. Sullivan, who tended to be lazy, needed someone to push him. A theatrical manager named Richard Doyley Cart arranged their first collaboration. Gilbert visited Sullivan and read him his satire on the legal system, Trial by Jury. Sullivan loved the piece and quickly wrote the music. Trial by Jury was produced in 1875 and became the first triumph for the partners. Doyley Cart decided to form an acting company, which would stage future works by Gilbert and Sullivan. A string of successes follows: The Sorcerer in 1877. H.M.S. Pinafore in May 1878, The Pirates of Penzance in December 1878, Patience in 1881, Ireland in 1882, The Mikado in 1885, The Yeoman of the Guard in 1888, and The Gondoliers in 1889. In spite of these successes, the two partners were not happy. Sullivan did not like the way Gilbert dominated their relationship. Sullivan had to write music for Gilbert's scripts. Why couldn't Gilbert write words for Sullivan's music? Gilbert, on the other hand, thought that Sullivan got the most of the credit for the success of their operettas, and that he was overlooked. Gilbert was the driving force in the relationship. He was always writing new scripts and taking them to Sullivan. It was Gilbert who rehearsed the actors and supervised the productions. Sullivan had little to do with the actual performance. He usually did conduct the orchestra on opening night. The amazing thing is how these two different people produced such wonderful work. Each separately had difficulty writing something that the public wanted. Together, they were unbeatable. Gilbert's sharp and often cutting remarks were made acceptable by Sullivan's beautiful music. Gilbert's satire might have made people angry, but Sullivan's music calmed them down. Even when the English people were the targets of Gilbert's criticisms, the audience went out of the theater humming these criticisms to Sullivan's music. Hawaii. In the middle of the Pacific Ocean, far from any land, there are the Hawaiian Islands. These islands are the tops of a chain of volcanic mountains. Two volcanoes on the island of Hawaii are still active. There are five larger islands. Kauai is to the west. Oahu, Molokai, and Maui are in the middle, and Hawaii is to the east. There are three smaller islands. Hawaii is the largest island of the group, but Oahu has the largest population. The capital city Honolulu is on Oahu. Since the Hawaiian Islands are so far from any land, one might wonder how people arrived there. The answer is that the first Hawaiians were very good sailors. They traveled thousands of miles from other islands in the Pacific in canoes. To keep these canoes stable in the ocean, they attached an outrigger or pontoon to the main canoe. Sometimes they fastened two canoes together and put a wooden platform on top. Then they could carry lots of people and supplies. 
The first Hawaiians were Polynesians, and probably came from the Marquesas and Tahiti in the South Pacific. They were a tall, good-looking people. Their kings made rules about how their people should live, and priests and advisers called kahunas enforced these. Today, the phrase "the big kahuna" means someone who is or thinks he is very important. Although Hawaii lies within the tropics, it has a very mild climate. Sea breezes keep the weather from getting too hot, even in the summer. Many edible plants grow in abundance there, so it was not difficult for the Hawaiians to live very comfortably without working hard. Captain Cook was the first European to reach Hawaii in 1778. Soon, European and American ships visited there regularly. The sailors also brought diseases formerly unknown. By 1853, the population had dropped to 73,000 from about 300,000 when Cook visited in 1778. Besides Europeans, people from China, Japan, and the Philippines came to live there. Soon, large plantations of sugarcane and pineapples developed. As more and more land came under Western control, the native monarchy was undermined. American plantation owners were able to arrange for United States control of the islands. Today, the largest industry is tourism. Since the climate is good all year round, visitors can come at any time. When you arrive, a young Hawaiian woman will greet you. She will put a beautiful flower necklace called a lei around your neck. Hula dancers entertain tourists. Hula dancers wear skirts made of long leaves. Each dancer tells a story by moving their arms and hands in a certain way. For meals, the Hawaiians like to dig a pit in the ground, place wood in the pit, and then set the wood on fire. Food wrapped in leaves is then placed on the wood, and the pit is covered with leaves and mats. A feast cooked this way is called a luau. These traditions nowadays are usually performed for tourists or on special holidays. Hawaii is the 50th state of the United States, and its people enjoy all the advantages of the modern world. Henry Ford. Some inventions are based on simple ideas or principles. Barometers are based on the idea that air has weight and pushes down on objects. A barometer measures this air pressure. Evangelista Terricelli invented barometers in Italy in 1643. Other inventions have taken longer to develop. The automobile has thousands of parts, and it took a long time to make a really useful car. Henry Ford was one of the first people to make a reliable automobile. In 1765, James Watt invented the steam engine. Within a few years, a Frenchman, Nicolas Cugnot, had built a steam-powered vehicle. These steam carriages were used in England in the 1800s, but they were big and slow. They looked like a train without the tracks. Most people preferred to travel by train. In Germany during the 1870s and 1880s, Nikolaus Otto and Gottlieb Daimler developed the internal combustion engine. This ran by burning gasoline. Another German, Karl Benz, built a gasoline-powered car. Around the world, there were many inventors trying to build a car that would be better than the one before. Some people thought that electric cars would become common. In the 1890s, several inventors working in the United States developed a gasoline-powered car that was practical for daily use. Henry Ford was born on a farm in Michigan in 1863. As a boy, he loved to take clocks and watches apart and reassemble them. Eventually, he went to work for the Detroit Edison Company. In his spare time, he worked on a horseless carriage, as the early cars were called. In 1896, he completed a car that ran smoothly. He later sold it and made another one. Since early cars were made by hand, they were usually quite expensive. Not only that, but when they broke down, there were no repair shops to take them to. One had to know how to repair a car oneself. Henry Ford tried to make cars which would be affordable and which would not break down very easily. His Ford Motor Company was formed in 1903 in Detroit, Michigan. Since many parts had to be brought together to make a car, Ford developed the assembly line. On the line, each worker would do one specific job. When the car reached the end of the assembly line, it was finished. In this way, many cars could be made in a single day. The result was that Ford was able to bring the price of cars down. Ford's Model T car was advertised as being as frisky as a jackrabbit and more durable than a mule. 
Since it cost hundreds rather than thousands of dollars, many ordinary families were now able to buy a car. Once many people had cars, their habits began to change. People didn't have to live next to the factories or offices that they worked in. Going for Sunday drives or traveling to tourist sites became a common thing. In 1905, a car drove across the United States and back again. In 1912, a car went across Canada from coast to coast. Soon there was public pressure for good roads so that cars could travel anywhere in North America. Henry Ford was not the only inventor of the modern car. However, he was able to make a car that everyone could use and afford. It could be a whole lot better. As I was sitting in the reading room at the library, a man got up and left, commenting, "It could be a whole lot better." I wasn't sure whether he was referring to the reading room, the world he was reading about, or something else. I replied without thinking, "That's always true and always false." What I meant was that it was always possible to make little changes to improve things, but it isn't clear ahead of time that these changes will make a big overall improvement in a library, in the world, or in anything else. Years ago, literary critics used to examine great writers very closely to find bad phrasing or ungrammatical sentences. They'd look at a play by Shakespeare and identify lines that they didn't think were very good. Sometimes they would suggest that these lines were added by another writer, or that Shakespeare had written this part quickly without much consideration. Sometimes they would omit or improve on the lines. It is doubtful that any of Shakespeare's plays were actually improved by these critics. An entire play needs high points and low points, poetry and prose. The whole thing is greater than its individual parts, and changing a couple of these parts may not improve the whole thing. It is the same in many other areas: music, athletics, scholarship, and probably everyday living. It's not always the singer or musician who is flawless that we admire most. Sometimes it is the person whose performance is not perfect, but who puts a special energy, feeling, or enthusiasm into their work that we admire. It is true that little things can sometimes add up to a big difference. Changing a bad habit can make a difference in your life and in the lives of the people around you. Giving up smoking, for example, or ceasing to criticize a family member, can make an important difference. Sometimes, however, we are only looking at the symptoms of a larger problem. For example, nearly everyone would agree that giving up smoking is a good idea. But if our smoking is related to emotional problems or stress in our lives, then giving up smoking may make us feel even worse. It may be necessary to deal with the root problem. It can happen too that being always on the lookout for ways to improve things may become a problem in itself. Perfectionism means never being satisfied with things as they are, especially if we're always criticizing people around us for not being good enough. This can become a bad thing. A popular saying in North America is, "If it ain't broke, don't fix it." This is a warning to people who feel that their role or position involves making continuous changes in policies, procedures, products, or personnel. Sometimes the drive for change can be more of a personality problem than a genuine concern to make things better. Real problems are often clearly apparent. Problems like world hunger, personality conflicts. Policies that don't work, poor levels of service, bad manners, and all kinds of troubles are hard to ignore. They are also difficult to resolve. Perhaps that's one reason why some people identify things as problems which are of concern to hardly anyone except themselves. Yes, we can make the world and the reading room better, but we can also make them worse. It takes a lot of discernment and usually some experience to know how to make a particular thing better. There are so many things that could use improvement that it is difficult to know where to start. This too requires some thought, not to mention prayer and study. We can start by asking whether the thing we see as a problem is also a problem for other people. If it isn't, then maybe our energy and attention might be better employed elsewhere. John Chapman. American pioneer. When the first Europeans came to North America, they found dense forests coming down right to the shore. So thick were the forests that it was said that a squirrel could travel from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River without once touching the ground. Clearing these trees to make room for fields and buildings was a very difficult task for the early settlers. 
Another difficulty was finding enough food in this new land. Many European crops could not grow in this climate. Carrying and storing seeds over a long period was also risky. Native Indians were often helpful in teaching the settlers how to find food, but sometimes there were no Indians nearby, or they were hostile. John Chapman is famous today because he helped the early settlers grow one important product: apples. Apples could be eaten fresh in the fall or stored through the winter. They could be made into fresh apple juice or alcoholic cider. They could be dried or made into applesauce. Apples also could be made into vinegar, which is very useful for keeping vegetables from spoiling. John Chapman was born in Massachusetts in 1774, the year before the American Revolution began. John's father joined George Washington's army to fight for American independence from Great Britain. While the war was going on, John's mother died. In 1870, John's father married again, and soon John had lots of younger brothers and sisters. John probably worked on his father's farm as he was growing up. Then he worked on neighboring farms. It may be at this time that John began to learn about apples. After the Revolutionary War, the population of the USA was expanding. Many Americans wanted to go west over the mountains to find land in Indian territory. In the fall of 1797, young John Chapman headed west to Pennsylvania. On his way, he gathered leftover apple seeds from the cider mills that he passed. As usual, John walked barefoot, but as he traveled, snow began to fall. He tore strips off his coat and tied them around his feet. Then he made snowshoes out of tree branches. When he arrived in the West, he began to clear land and plant apple seeds. This began a pattern that would last Chapman's whole life. He would travel ahead of the settlers, clear land, and then sell his baby apple trees to the settlers when they arrived. When the area became too settled, Chapman would move further west and start again. Many settlers regarded John Chapman as a strange character. He never bought new clothes, but wore whatever old clothes came his way. But he was always welcome at a settler's cabin. John was good at clearing land, telling stories, and growing apples. He liked children, and children liked him. He was a religious man and would read to the settlers about God and living together peacefully. At this time, there was conflict between the settlers and Indians about land. John managed to be friendly with both groups, but John did warn the settlers if the Indians were planning to attack them. Every fall, John went east to gather more apple seeds. He would then go farther west and find some empty land to plant his seeds. During the warm weather, he tended all his fields of baby apple trees. Once they were properly grown, he sold the seedlings to settlers. When he had earned enough money, he bought land to grow more apple trees. In his own lifetime, he became known as Johnny Appleseed. Legends grew up about him. It was said that his bare feet could melt snow and that he could leap across rivers. Johnny Appleseed never built himself a real home. He was a wanderer all his life, traveling west to Indiana and Iowa and back east again. He enjoyed sleeping outdoors, lying on his back, looking up at the stars, and thinking about God and His world. He died in Indiana in 1845, and no one knows exactly where he's buried. But all through that region are hundreds of apple trees. These apple trees are the most fitting memorial to John Chapman, the legendary Johnny Appleseed. Las Vegas, Nevada. Nevada is a large state of deserts and mountains. Since most of the land is not suitable for farming, the population grew very slowly. In the 1950s, there were only 267,000 people in the entire state. Now there are nearly a million people living in the Las Vegas area alone. Las Vegas has become a major tourist center. It used to be quite a little desert town of the old west, but in the 1950s and 1960s, hotels and gambling casinos were opened. In order to bring tourists to town, these hotels hired well-known entertainers. Soon, Las Vegas became known as a major entertainment center. In order to promote the growth of Nevada, some activities were allowed, which were against the law in other states. These included gambling and prostitution. It was also easier to get married in Nevada than in some other states. Over time, many other attractions were developed. Much of the activity in Las Vegas goes on at some 30 major hotels. Many of these hotels provide a complete range of services and entertainment.
Some of them boast 4,000 or 5,000 rooms. It is common for these large hotels to be organized around a particular theme, such as the Middle Ages, the Arabian Nights, the movies, the circus, Paris, Egypt, or the Far East. The hotel, its restaurants, shops, lounges, and entertainment reflect this theme. For example, the Paris Las Vegas Hotel has a 50-story replica of the Eiffel Tower. The Luxor Hotel has a huge image of an Egyptian sphinx and a replica of the tomb of King Tut. Nearly all of the major hotels also contain a casino, sometimes several casinos. Gambling is a major reason why people come to Las Vegas. There are slot machines, blackjack tables, and roulette wheels, and much more. Even though Las Vegas is in the desert, there is an extravagant use of water. Large swimming pools, water slides, artificial waterfalls, and huge fountains are common. Health spas, beauty salons, fashion boutiques, specialty restaurants, and malls abound. Tennis and golf are also popular. The lavish shows at Las Vegas are world famous. Tall dancing showgirls, like the famous Rockettes, wear beautiful but rather skimpy costumes. Some entertainers, like singer Wayne Newton, rarely leave Las Vegas. The pay there is good, and the audiences are appreciative. Near Las Vegas are other tourist sites, such as the giant Hoover Dam. Behind the Hoover Dam is the large artificial lake, Lake Mead. Further up the river is the Grand Canyon. All these things are a short trip from the city. Las Vegas is called the city that never sleeps. At nearly any time of the day or night, there are casinos and shows that are open. A monorail connects many of the leading hotels. Many people view Las Vegas as a total entertainment package. One word of caution: set yourself a limit on how much you will spend at the casinos. Gambling can be addictive. Laura Secord. Women have often played an important role in war. They have worked in munitions factories, made clothing and supplies, encouraged and entertained soldiers, nursed the wounded, and acted as spies. It is rare, however, for a woman to have played a key role in determining the course of a war. Many people believe that Laura Secord played such a role in the War of 1812. Laura Secord was born in the United States at the time of the American Revolution. Her father had fought in the U.S. Army against the British, but when land in the American states became scarce, the family moved to Ontario, Canada, and so back under British rule. Laura married into a pro-British family and adopted their political views. So when the War of 1812 broke out between Britain and America, her husband James Secord joined the Canadian militia to defend Ontario against the Americans. The American invasion of 1812 was defeated at Queenston Heights, and some of the wounded were brought to Laura's house in nearby Queenston. Laura went out to the battlefield where she found her husband James, who was severely wounded, and brought him home. In 1813, the U.S. invasion was more successful. Parts of Ontario close to the U.S. border were occupied by American troops. Local families were expected to provide room and board for U.S. officers. It was sometimes possible, therefore, for Canadians to overhear American officers discussing military strategy, either in their homes. Or in the local tavern, the situation in Ontario looked desperate. In the spring of 1813, the whole province seemed likely to fall into American hands. In June, Laura overheard talk of an American attack on the British outpost at Beaver Dams. Her husband was still suffering from war injuries, and she had to look after him and their children. Nevertheless, she resolved to go to warn the British commander. Possibly, Laura did not intend to walk the whole way herself. She hoped to be able to pass on the news to someone else along the way. First, she would have to make up a story to get past the American sentries. She left Queenston in early morning and walked 19 miles to the neighborhood of Beaver Dams by nightfall. 
She still had to cross a wide stream and climb up the Niagara Escarpment. There, she came upon an encampment of Indians who were assisting the British. Their war cries in the moonlight terrified her, but she insisted on being taken to the British commander. Finally, one of the chiefs escorted her to British headquarters, and she was able to tell Fitzgibbon the American plan of attack. When the Americans arrived in the neighborhood of Beaver Dams, the Indians had prepared an ambush for them. A running fight ensued between the American force of 570 soldiers and 450 Indians supporting the British. At this point, Fitzgibbon arrived with 50 British regulars. Seeing the Americans disorganized and surrounded by the Indians, Fitzgibbon boldly demanded their surrender. By telling the American commander Boatsler that he was facing huge British and Indian forces, Fitzgibbon induced the American leader to turn over his whole army to the British. Although only small armies were involved at Beaver Dams, the battle had great significance. Afterwards, the Americans stayed behind their walls for the rest of the year. The U.S. government recalled their commander in chief. British and Canadian morale increased, and Laura's home in Queenston was restored to British control. Laura Secord's story was little known until 1860. She was an old woman in her 80s when she was presented to the visiting Prince of Wales, later King Edward VII. He awarded a gift of money for her services. Her story then became famous. Today, her home in Queenston, Ontario, is an historical museum and a popular tourist attraction. Little House on the Prairie. Much of the history of North America is about how Europeans moved westward from the Atlantic coast towards the Pacific. The first settlements began around 1600, and it was a long time before the Europeans settled the interior. By the late 18th century, however, good farmland along the east coast was becoming scarce. As the population increased, people began thinking about all the native Indian lands further inland. Families were quite large in pioneer days, and the oldest son usually inherited the family farm. This meant that other sons and daughters would have to move away when their parents died. Often, the sons would want to begin their own farm and start their own family. But if there was no farmland available, or if it was too expensive to buy, they were out of luck. One option was to move west, where land was free or very cheap. Sometimes the whole family might move if their old farm was no longer productive. Sometimes the old farm was on poor soil, or too much farming had exhausted the soil. Perhaps better land could be had further west. There were other reasons for moving west. Pioneer settlers depended on wild birds, fish, and wild animals for food, furs, and skins for clothing and trading, and trees for building materials. These things had become scarce in old settled areas. Out west, there were lots of animals to hunt for food, and animal skins could be traded for supplies. It seemed that it was easier to make a living on the frontier. Of course, there were some problems regarding moving west. Various American Indian tribes who might fight to defend their land occupied the land. Then the land needed to be cleared of trees and stumps before it could be planted. A log cabin and other buildings had to be built. A well had to be dug, or a spring of water found. Settlers might also suffer because there were no doctors or teachers or stores available. These things, though, often did follow closely behind the first settlers. A series of Little House books, written by Laura Ingalls Wilder, tells the story of her pioneer family. The Ingalls family moved many times while Laura was a little girl. She was born in Wisconsin in 1867. Her family moved next year to Missouri. Then they moved to Kansas in 1869. The Ingalls moved back to Wisconsin in 1871. They moved to Minnesota in 1874. Her family went to Iowa in 1876, then back to Minnesota in 1877. Finally, they moved to Desmit, South Dakota, in 1879, and there the family remained.
All these moves were typical for a pioneer family, always on the lookout for better land and other opportunities. But all these moves involved very hard work, all of which seemed all lost when the family had to move again. For example, when Laura's parents moved to the Kansas Prairie in 1869, they had many hardships. The family put all their belongings in a covered wagon, which measured four feet by ten feet. Two horses pulled it, and the family dog followed along. Laura and her sister Mary were very little girls. The family and their wagon were nearly washed away trying to cross a small river. They traveled through wild, tall grass where there were no roads. Laura's father built a house on the open prairie with logs he had hauled from the creek bottom. One of the nearby settlers helped him. They also built a log stable for the horses. That was a good thing because the next night their little house was surrounded by a pack of fifty large wolves. They formed a large circle around the house and howled all night. One day, while Laura's father was away, two Indians visited the house. They wanted Laura's mother to feed them and stood silent while the food was cooking. The Indians wore only fresh skunk skins as clothing. After the Indians had eaten all the food, they left. The following spring, there was a large gathering of Indian tribes. Most of them wanted to fight the settlers. For many nights, the sounds of Indian drums frightened the settlers. One tribe opposed the plan, and finally the gathering broke up, and the Indians went away. Many other problems faced the Ingalls family. These included bad weather, prairie grass fires, and malaria. The worst part was having to leave their new homes. The government decided that Laura's family was living on Indian land and would have to move. So the covered wagon was packed again, and the family traveled north. Such experiences were not unusual for pioneers in the 19th century. Mutiny. Mutiny is a word that has brought fear to the most powerful empires in the world. Mutiny is when soldiers and sailors refuse to obey their commanders, often killing or imprisoning them. Mutiny can spread through whole armies and navies, throwing governments into crisis. No wonder that nations have always taken harsh measures to punish mutinous leaders. The ancient Romans executed every tenth man from an army unit that had mutinied. In the British Navy, mutineers were normally hanged. However, one of history's most famous mutinies did not happen to a whole army or navy. It happened on a single small ship, the HMS Bounty. HMS Bounty set sail from England in December 1787. It was a small, cramped vessel, uncomfortable during a long voyage. Its goal was to sail to the South Pacific and bring back Tahitian breadfruit plants. The government hoped that breadfruit would provide a cheap food for black slaves in the British West Indies. The captain of the Bounty was William Bligh, a veteran of many voyages. His crew, however, was largely made up of inexperienced young men. There was no room on the ship for soldiers or marines, so Bly, as the only commissioned officer, had the difficult task of maintaining order. After a long and difficult trip, the bounty finally arrived in Tahiti in October 1788. Free from the constraints of life aboard ship, the young men enjoyed life on the tropical island with the friendly natives. Many of the sailors established relationships with island women. Meanwhile, the collection of breadfruit plants for the homeward voyage continued. In April 1789, Captain Bly decided that it was time to return to England. The breadfruit plants were loaded on the deck, making the ship cramped indeed. The bounty set sail and would no doubt have reached England again, except for the turmoil in the mind of one of its young officers. Fletcher Christian was 24 years old, of dark complexion, and from a good family. As the bounty pulled further from Tahiti, Fletcher seemed to have decided that he didn't want to return to England. Tahiti had been an earthly paradise, and now long months of discomfort aboard ship awaited him. He was too far from Tahiti to return by himself. He would need the bounty.
On April 28, 1789, some of Fletcher Christian's friends seized control of the ship. Captain Bly and 18 sailors who supported him were put in a small open boat with limited food and water. Meanwhile, Christian and his 24 followers sailed back to Tahiti. Eventually, Fletcher Christian would sail the bounty to the uninhabited Pitcairn Islands, far to the south of the shipping lanes. Meanwhile, Bly and his loyal followers sailed in their open boat almost the width of the Pacific Ocean. They suffered from thirst, hunger, and sickness, as well as hostile natives. Finally, they reached Timor in Indonesia in June and eventually made their way to the capital, Batavia. When they returned to England, Captain Bly was first greeted as a hero. Soon, however, public attitudes changed. The legend began that Bly was a cruel tyrant who had caused the mutiny by harsh treatment of his men. Although Bly had a temper and was not very tactful, this does not appear to be the whole story. In fact, it is the controversy over who is to blame for the mutiny, Bly or Christian, that has kept the story alive for more than 200 years. North America's Rainforest when people think of rainforests, they usually think of the tropical jungle, but heavy rain can also produce dense forests in temperate areas. Along the northwest coast of North America, there are some of the largest trees in the world. This forest runs along the Pacific coast from Alaska down to northern California. About half of it is in British Columbia, Canada. Several species of trees grow to an immense size. Some grow up to 95 meters, 312 feet high, and 12 meters, 40 feet in circumference. They may be as much as 1,000 years old. Because the trees are so tall, the forest has various levels of growth. Small plants attach themselves to the tall trees and may form a kind of garden in the air. Further down are the tops of the younger trees. Closer to the ground are shrubs and bushes. Along the ground are moss, ferns, berries, and other plants. These old forests have developed over several thousand years. The tall trees are at least several hundred years old. This old forest has several special features. Some of the dead tall trees remain standing and become homes for insects, birds, and small animals. Trees that fall to the ground can become nurse logs for new plants or trees to grow on. Trees that fall across rivers and streams can provide natural dams, which provide quiet water for animals to live in. In recent years, it has become common for logging companies to clear-cut this old forest. To clear-cut a forest means to go into a section of forest with heavy machinery and cut down every tree. Sometimes these clear-cuts are as large as some European countries. Logging companies are doing this because it is a cheap method of logging. The problem is that when an old forest is cut, it does not grow back again. Even with replanting, companies produce a tree farm, not an old forest. The complexity of an old forest, which grew over thousands of years, is lost forever. The old forest can shelter many kinds of birds, mammals, fish, and plants that a replanted forest cannot. Another issue is that companies are cutting more and more old forests because they haven't done enough replanting. As long as governments have been willing to let companies cut old forests, neither logging companies nor governments have been much motivated to replant the forests. As a result, most of the old forest has been cut down and continues to be cut at a rapid rate. This situation has also worsened because new technology allows more rapid logging. Clear-cut logging results in erosion, which in turn damages the quality of rivers and streams. This causes a decline in the salmon fishery. Animals like grizzly bears, elk, and deer are harmed by the loss of habitat. Likewise, birds that nest in the old forest, such as bald eagles, owls, woodpeckers, and various seabirds, are being threatened. Recently, public interest in the the old rainforest has resulted in an increase in tourism. People come to see these spectacular trees and the many plants and animals that depend on them. We hope that these unique temperate rainforests will remain for many more generations to enjoy. Peggy's Cove, Nova Scotia. Why do people travel hundreds of miles to look at beautiful scenery? 
And why does one particular place attract many more visitors than similar places not far away? Peggy's Cove in Nova Scotia, Canada, is one of those special spots that draws people from all over the world. It is hard to explain its special charm, but anyone who has been there will know what I am talking about. The southern eastern shore of Nova Scotia possesses many picturesque fishing villages and many beautiful seascapes, but one doesn't have to go very far from the capital city of Halifax to see this special spot. There are no trees around Peggy's Cove. The dominant feature are huge, round granite rocks, many of them the size of houses. They seem to be pushing up and out of the land and sea. Nestled inside the circle of these rocks is a group of fishing huts. Now and then, a fishing boat leaves by the little bay or cove in order to travel out into the great Atlantic Ocean. For nearly two hundred years, there have been fishermen at Peggy's Cove. All around the little harbor, there are huts or fish stores where the fishermen do their work. Here, they bring in the fish and clean them, wash them, and salt them. The salted fish are then stored in barrels. Nowadays, however, more fish are sold fresh than salted. Visiting as a tourist, I wandered into one of these little huts while the fisherman was busy at his work. He explained to me that although Peggy's Cove is a tourist destination, it is also a working fishing village. The fishermen get no money from the tourists, but have to take the time to talk to them and explain their work. There are, however, some tourist shops and tea rooms in the vicinity. Part of the charm of Peggy's Cove is that it is so small. The population has been well under 100 people for most of its history. The buildings are mostly small dwellings, with the lighthouse being the most prominent structure. A good variety of fish are caught in the area, including mackerel, herring, haddock, cod, and halibut. Lobsters are also trapped nearby. However, because of overfishing. Catches have declined in recent decades. The plants and animals of the area are also of interest. Showy purple lupins grow close to the ocean. They thrive on salty ground, and the closer they grow to the spray of the ocean, the better. One of the world's few carnivorous plants, the common pitcher plant, also grows around Peggy's Cove. Its leaves trap insects, which are digested to nourish the plant. Common birds are the stately blue heron, which likes to fish in the marshy pools. The heron stands several feet high and spear fish and frogs with its sharp beak. Another bird is the osprey or fish hawk. The osprey's keen eyes can spot a fish moving beneath the surface of the water. It can dive swiftly, hitting the water with great speed, catch the fish in its claws, and then fly away with its catch. I have also seen pools close to the ocean, full of large tadpoles. These tadpoles spend several years in the water before they develop into bullfrogs. Bullfrogs, the largest Canadian frog, have been known to eat baby ducks and small fish. Looking over the little harbor and out toward the great ocean, one notices the contrast between the very small and the very large. If Peggy's Cove were larger, it would be more ordinary. As it is, it represents all the little fishing villages where men have gone forth in little boats to fish on the wide ocean. Prince Edward Island. Throughout history, people have dreamed about a special place remote from the day-to-day -day business world. Sometimes they have thought of this place as an enchanted world where the weather is always good and the food is always easy to get. Sometimes it has been a hidden valley in the mountains, or an island far out to sea. When the Europeans arrived in the South Pacific, they thought that they had found it. Islands such as Tahiti seemed about as perfect as possible. Nowadays, our cities grow larger and larger, and people have to work harder and harder to succeed. Many people would like to escape to a quieter, slower, more peaceful, more attractive environment. When summer holidays come, many people travel to Prince Edward Island in eastern Canada. It has a mild summer climate and hardly ever gets too hot or dry.
The fields, trees, and crops stay green all summer. In fact, PEI is famous for the many shades of green on the island. Its soil and dirt roads are red because of iron oxide in the soil, and visitors are never far away from the blue waters of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. In late June and early July, the roadsides are covered with large purple flowers called lupins. The vivid colors of PEI help make the province a photographer's paradise. Prince Edward Island is almost 100 miles long and about 20 miles wide. It is small enough that a tourist can see much of the island in a couple of days. But there are enough interesting things to see and do that most people like to stay longer. One of the chief traditional occupations is fishing. At one time, fishing was an important source of food and income for many islanders. Now the fisheries are in decline. Boat owners find it more profitable to take tourists out to fish than to fish themselves. Lobsters and shellfish are still important to the island, which is famous for its lobster suppers. Tourists can visit many picturesque little fishing villages all around the coastline. Farming is also important. PEI is famous for its potatoes, which are exported all over the world. Dairy farming is also common, and local ice cream is popular with tourists. Apple orchards, grain fields, hay fields, and vegetable gardening are also widely found. During the era of sailing ships, a lot of shipbuilding took place on the island. But as steel hulls replaced wooden hulls, shipbuilding moved to regions where steel was being produced. The full impact of the industrial revolution has never hit PEI. Farming, fishing, and tourism have remained the chief industries. There are no large cities on the island, so if young people want to go to the big city, they have to leave PEI. The majority of island people prefer to live in small towns and villages, just as their ancestors did. Since there wasn't much industry on the island, many people did not have a lot of money. As a result, they may do with their old houses, old furniture, and old ways of doing things. This is why visitors to PEI sometimes feel like they are going back in time. Things on the island seem like they are still the way things were in our parents' or grandparents' day. Most of the people who live on the island are descended from British immigrants in the 18th or 19th centuries. The majority of these were from Scotland, and the Scottish heritage remains strong. There are also some Mi'kmaq Indians and some French Canadians or Acadians. The island has generally avoided social and political strife, and this contributes to the peaceful atmosphere. Islanders welcome people from away as tourists. However, some say that to be a true islander, you have to be born on the island. Nonetheless, some tourists have fallen in love with PEI and have gone there to live. A couple of years ago, a bridge was built to connect the island with the mainland. Many opposed this fixed link, saying that it would destroy the special PEI atmosphere. It remains to be seen whether the island will change now that tourists can drive directly onto the rich red soil. Public transit. Public transportation in North America varies greatly from place to place. Some large cities like New York, Boston, Toronto, and Montreal have subway systems. These same cities usually also have train service into the city, but most towns and cities do not have subways or trains. Some do not even have buses. Most big cities have some sort of public bus service. In most North American cities, people who use the buses complain about poor service. This is partly because most people prefer to drive a car. Automobile companies spend billions of dollars on advertising. They want to convince young people that they should drive a car as soon as they are old enough. Even when public transportation is very good, most North Americans prefer to drive cars. So mostly students, poor people, and seniors use buses. The large car companies have a lot of economic and political power in North America. They can usually convince politicians to limit the money put into public transit. Lobbying by large car companies has been effective in closing down many railway lines. In some cases, large corporations have bought train tracks and torn them up. So that no one could use them again, because of this, nearly all transportation in North America is by car, bus, or truck.
The automobile created the modern North American city. Cars allowed families to live outside the city and drive back into work. Since the 1920s, large numbers of Americans have lived in the suburbs and used cars to do nearly all their daily activities. People drive to school, to work, to the shopping mall, to the theater. To church and to doctors, lawyers, and dentists, because the modern city is so spread out, it is difficult to get where you want to go by walking or even by bicycling. But the automobile also causes problems. Car accidents are a major cause of death and injury. Crowded streets and snarled traffic can lead to road rage. Frustrated drivers sometimes get out of their cars to fight each other. Young people often use cars as super toys. They enjoy driving very fast and take risks while driving. A high proportion of serious accidents concern drivers using alcohol or drugs. More recently, some people have accused cell phones of being a cause of accidents. About half of the air pollution in North American cities is caused by motor vehicles. The exhaust fumes from cars and trucks are part of this. The other part is that vehicles erode the surface of the highways. Small particles are torn loose from the road and thrown into the air as cars whiz by. Heavy trucks are particularly large contributors to particle pollution, especially in hot weather. A layer of smog covers many cities. Much of this is caused by motor vehicles. Because city roads are often crowded, the result is frequent traffic jams. When cars are moving very slowly, bumper to bumper, it adds to air pollution. Another problem with cars is that not everyone can afford one. The average car costs nearly twenty thousand dollars to buy and about four thousand dollars a year to operate. So cars are also a status symbol. People with cars tend to move out of the city. As a result, downtown areas are usually where the poorer people live. For a long time, many people have said that governments should try to make downtown areas more attractive to live in. This would include improving public transit into and inside the cities. Then some people may move back from the suburbs, and air pollution levels will decline. Right now, the large automobile companies and oil companies oppose these measures. Recently, there have been cuts to public transit in many cities. Whether these cuts continue or whether they get reversed is a big political issue in North America today. Red-haired Anne. The story of Anne Shirley, the red-headed orphan, has been popular around the world for almost a century. The opening chapters of Anne of Green Gables tell how a brother and sister, living together on a farm, have decided to adopt a boy. Matthew Cuthbert is now sixty years old and needs help working the farm. They have sent away to the orphanage, and the boy will be arriving by train. When Matthew goes to the train station with his horse and buggy, there is no boy, only a girl, Anne Shirley. Anne is no ordinary girl. She has a vivid imagination and loves to talk about things that interest her. Matthew, who is shy and quiet, takes an immediate liking to her. When they arrive home, however, his sister Marilla is very upset. She doesn't see what good a girl would be to them. Matthew says. We might be some good to her. After a while, Marilla begins to feel sorry for the thin little orphan and decides to keep her. But Marilla finds that teaching Anne how to behave properly is quite a challenge. Anne often does things without thinking first, and Marilla has to be vigilant to keep her out of trouble. As time goes by, Anne becomes accepted in the community and doesn't get into as many difficulties. One characteristic of the little orphan is a love of big words. While she lived a life of hard work, Anne liked to imagine beautiful things that she didn't have. This was her way of dealing with unhappiness when she worked as a servant for unkind people. Living at Green Gables makes her happy, but she doesn't lose her love of special words or beautiful things. Anne is also unhappy because she has red hair and freckles. In Anne's day, beautiful women were thought to have light, clear complexions and black hair. Her coloring seemed unromantic, 
However, red hair and freckles are very common on Prince Edward Island, where many of the people are of Scottish descent. This story tells us a lot about how to be happy. When Matthew and Marilla stop worrying about needing a boy and start taking care of Anne, they find that they enjoy having her around. Their lives become much more interesting now that they have someone who needs them. So happiness involves looking after others and being needed by them. There are many stories about orphans when Anne of Green Gables was written. Before modern medicine, many parents died before their children were grown up. A lot of mothers died in childbirth. Since fathers didn't usually try to raise young children in those days, someone else had to take the responsibility. This is what happened to Lucy Maud Montgomery, the author of Anne. Her mother died when she was a baby, and her father left her with her mother's parents. Montgomery's grandparents provided a good home for her, but they were very strict and stern, and didn't have a lot of sympathy with the little girl. In her story, Montgomery is imagining how she would have liked her own life to have happened. What if her grandparents had been more like Matthew and Marilla? What if they had allowed her to do more of the things she wanted to do? Wouldn't she have been happier then? The story shows how young children are hurt by bad treatment from the adults looking after them. Even if the adults don't mean to be unkind, sometimes they say or do things that make children very unhappy. Anne teaches parents and grandparents to encourage their children and help them to be happy and successful. Anne Shirley is one little person who changes a whole community and makes it better. We all have special gifts and talents, and if we are allowed to use those abilities, they will benefit everyone around us. Romance novels. Novels are imaginary stories about people and events. They are written to entertain and amuse. Two thousand years ago, Greek writers told tales of young lovers. Usually, the lovers were separated by terrible events and were reunited only after much hardship and suffering. This plot idea is still in use today. The most popular books for women today in North America are romance novels. Many millions are sold every year. This means that romance publishing is big business and very competitive. Companies survey their readers to determine the kinds of stories they like. One survey asks readers whether or not they would like more references to sex in their novels. Usually, romances are about love, not sex. But in today's market, publishers are ready to give their readers what they want. The essence of the romance is to create suspense by putting obstacles in the way of lovers. One simple obstacle is to make the hero and the heroine as different as possible. For example, an Eastern school teacher meets a Western cowboy. Of course, at first they don't like each other at all, but in time they fall in love. Or a female social worker might meet an aggressive businessman. Quite often, the heroine is a spinster who has sworn never to marry, or perhaps she has a special dislike for the hero and his family. The romance writer must come up with a plausible way to bring the two together. There are a number of popular plots that lead to marriage. Sometimes the heroine, out of a sense of duty, will move in with the hero to help him raise his children, or she may be a professional nanny who moves in with a widower. A favorite plot is the marriage of convenience. Two people who don't like each other get married for financial or political reasons, or for the sake of the children. Later, of course, they fall in love. In most cases, there is some particular obstacle to marriage. Often, either the hero or the heroine already has children, and he or she doesn't expect that anyone will want to take on their ready-made family. Sometimes, one or the other has a physical disability. Or is of a different race, class, or background. For example, the heroine may come from a very strict and proper family, while the hero may have a dubious reputation or even be a criminal. The interest of the story lies in how these very different people come together. Usually, the hero is a very masculine type—a cowboy, engineer, military man, pirate, gambler, etc. The heroine is usually very female, but may have tomboy or spinster traits. She frequently has a strong personality and a temper, and is described as feisty or fiery. A good example of the two types is Rhett Butler and Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. Nearly every romance novel will contain some promotional offer to encourage readers to order more books. Romances can be addictive, and some women read them almost nonstop. Some romances are very well written, but the majority follows a set formula. That way, the reader always knows what to expect. Shopping at the mall. At one time in North America, most people shopped downtown on Main Street. 
Most businesses were at the center of town. When people started using automobiles, however, they moved away from downtown. In time, most people lived in the suburbs. Eventually, stores and small shopping plazas were built in suburban areas. Still, most of the big stores were downtown. But as more and more cars were on the roads, driving and parking downtown became a problem. There wasn't room for a lot of cars to park downtown. People also didn't want to fight downtown traffic just to go shopping. So, in the 1950s and 1960s, there was the beginning of large suburban shopping malls and plazas. Plazas were a row of stores attached to one another. Malls were usually a double row of stores with a roof connecting both rows. This means that shoppers did all their shopping inside. Large department stores and grocery stores were usually part of the mall, but there were many smaller stores as well. When you came to the mall and went inside, many people would get a shopping cart. You can walk along the aisles, putting your purchases in the cart. When you're finished shopping, you can push your shopping buggy out to the car. Many malls also have buggies or strollers for pushing small children along. There can be a lot of walking in a trip to the mall. In fact, some people go to the mall just to exercise. A half dozen laps around the mall every morning amount to a pretty good workout. However, there are always places to sit down when you get tired. Most malls have a food court. This is an open area with a lot of tables and chairs. Usually, there are a dozen or more small restaurants circled around the food court. The department stores often have full-size restaurants. Malls have large parking lots. Unlike downtown, you don't pay to park at the mall. On a busy day, finding a space close to the store can be a challenge. Many people go to the malls when the weather is bad. During wintry weather, the malls are busy. Likewise, in really hot summer weather, people go to the malls to get cool. The climate there is always the same. People don't go to malls just to shop. They also go to meet people. Usually, you bump into friends and neighbors there. Old people, as well as teenagers, go there to see friends. Usually, the malls sponsor special events. With lots to see and do, malls are a popular place to hang out. Stephen Foster, American songwriter. Before radio and television, movies and recordings, entertainment was often a family or community matter. Someone in the family could play a musical instrument, or a neighborhood musician would play for small gatherings. In addition, there would be traveling groups of musicians, actors, and clowns who would go from town to town. In 19th century United States, one of the most popular forms of entertainment was the minstrel show. Black slavery was still permitted in the southern states until 1865. Even after that date, the lives of many blacks working on large farms or plantations did not change much. They did hard physical labor in the fields, had little control over their lives, and very little time to relax with their friends. Foster, who was born in 1826, made this situation the background for many of his songs. White musicians would try to imagine the feelings of black men and women working on the plantations. They would write songs in the dialect or speech patterns that they thought black slaves used. In these songs, the black people would be talking about their hardships, falling in love, playing music and dancing, and finally growing old and dying. White performers would blacken their faces and sing these songs to white audiences. They would play musical instruments like the banjo, a small four-string guitar, which black people played often. As a small boy, Stephen Foster had sometimes been taken to a black church by his family's black servant, Olivia Pies. Here, he first heard the melodies that inspired his own songs. Only a couple of Foster's songs are based directly on Negro spirituals. But many of his songs have the natural simplicity and emotional power of folk songs. The youngest member of a large family, Foster showed his musical talent at an early age. He played the flute, violin, and piano. Growing up in an energetic business family, Stephen was expected to become a businessman, and for a while he worked as a bookkeeper. All his spare time, however, was spent writing songs. Foster attended minstrel shows and tried to get the performers to sing his songs. Sometimes the performers would steal his songs and publish them under their own names. Copyright laws were weak and rarely enforced, so some music publishers would just go ahead and publish a song without paying the songwriter. Since Foster hoped to make a living as a songwriter, this was a problem. Foster's first hit song was "Oh Susanna," published in 1848. It became popular with the thousands of men from all over the United States who were heading west to the California Gold Rush of 1849. Unfortunately. As an unknown songwriter, Foster received no money from his early songs. He seems to have given them outright to the music publishers just to establish his reputation. Foster's name, however, was soon widely known, and in 1849 he was able to afford to give up bookkeeping 
and marry the daughter of a Pittsburgh physician. During the next five years, he earned a moderately good income from songwriting. In 1851, a daughter, Marion, was born. Foster wrote many of his best-known songs at this time, Old Folks at Home in 1851, My Old Kentucky Home in 1853, and Jeannie with a Light Brown Hair in 1854. Difficulties in Foster's marriage began fairly soon. These may have been partly due to his strange work habits. He spent days locked in his room working on his songs. Then he would rush out with his materials to the local music store, presumably to test out the songs on his friends. He also became more and more addicted to alcohol. Eventually, his wife and daughter left him. Foster died alone in a rooming house in 1864. Immigrants to the United States brought their traditional folk songs with them. However, there are very few typically American songs. Foster provided many songs that expressed the life of 19th century USA. His songs were easy to sing and were popular with nearly everyone. In a sense, Foster helped to create roots for American popular music. Sunday Morning at Church Every Sunday is a holiday or half-holiday in North America. Some stores may be open, but banks, offices, and government services are usually closed. Sunday closing has a Christian origin. Christians believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday morning, so Sunday is known as the Lord's Day. About 30 or 35 percent of North Americans attend church regularly on Sunday mornings. About the same percentage attend church occasionally. At Christmas and Easter, the churches are very full as people celebrate these two important holy days. Nearly everybody goes to church at least three times. They are baptized or dedicated as a child. Most people are married in a church, and many people are buried after a church service. Church services are usually held Sunday mornings, often at 11 o'clock a.m., although there may also be evening services provided. Most services last an hour. Their purpose is to worship God and to help people focus on religious and moral beliefs. The service is led by a pastor, minister, or priest, who usually also looks after the people and the business of the church. It is the pastor who delivers the sermon, a 20-minute talk on a religious or moral matter. Usually, members take part in the service. They may lead the singing, read from the Bible, offer prayers for the congregation, take up the collection, or act as ushers. Most churches also have a choir, a group of singers who lead in singing the hymns. There are many cultural traditions connected to going to church. People normally wear their best clothing and try to be on their best behavior. Talking or making noise in church is usually considered bad. This is why children often have a separate children's church or Sunday school, where they can be more like children. The Sunday service is the main weekly event at many churches. But nowadays, there are a growing number of large super churches which organize all kinds of activities for their members. These churches usually have large buildings and a large staff to plan and lead various activities. These might include prayer group, counseling and social work, youth programs, social action, fundraising events, etc. Many large churches have gymnasiums for regular sports activities. At the same time, house churches are also becoming very popular. These are small groups of people who meet at private homes. Sometimes a group will meet in a house until they have the money to buy a church. But many people say they prefer to meet in small groups. That way they get to know one another better. Then they feel comfortable sharing their problems and successes and praying for each other. Some say that large churches can interfere with getting close to God and other Christians. There are many different brands of Christianity. The largest single denomination in North America is Roman Catholicism. One large Christian brands are Episcopalian, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, Lutheran, and Presbyterian. All have slightly different traditions and beliefs. Although in the past these groups have often been in conflict with one another, today they usually cooperate in working together for their members and the community. Thanksgiving Day Thanksgiving Day has a special meaning for Americans. Many holidays were brought along from Europe by the early settlers and didn't change very much. But Thanksgiving takes on a special shape in North America. That is because of the Thanksgiving celebrated by the early pilgrim settlers in Massachusetts in 1621. These early settlers were from England, and they were known as Puritans. This is because they wanted to purify the state religion of England. They felt that the churches were more concerned with politics and customs than God and worship. They were also called pilgrims because they were willing to travel to other countries in order to worship God the way they wanted to. When the English government put some of the pilgrims in jail, the rest left England and went to the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, they could have their own churches. 
However, it was hard to earn a living there, and at first they didn't know the language. In time, the English king learned where they were and tried to have them arrested. So they thought of another plan. Pilgrim leaders like William Brewster attempted to raise money to start a colony in North America. They would have to borrow money and pay it back later. Thirty members of the Pilgrim Church in the Netherlands voted to sail to America with their families. They returned to England and set sail on two ships: the Speedwell and the Mayflower. When the Speedwell appeared unable to cross the ocean, both ships returned to England. All who still wanted to sail crowded into the Mayflower and set sail on September sixth, sixteen twenty. Many of the passengers became sick during the long voyage, and some died. They encountered fierce storms because they were sailing late in the season. After sixty-six days, they sighted the sandy shoreline of Cape Cod in present-day Massachusetts. There was disagreement between the Pilgrims and others on board ship about what to do. So first, they had to agree to a common form of government and elect a governor. Since winter was coming, they decided to stay on the ship till spring. About half of the remaining settlers died during the first winter. When the Mayflower sailed back to England, only about fifty settlers were left. Nearly half of these were children. There were Indians in Massachusetts, but at first they were not friendly. They shot arrows at the settlers. But one day, a friendly Indian named Samoset came to visit them. He spoke English and could tell them many things. He brought another Indian named Squanto, who showed the Pilgrims how to plant corn. Eventually, their chief Massasoit came, and he promised to keep peaceful relations with the settlers. All spring and summer of 1621, the Pilgrims worked hard in the fields. They also finished building houses and barns. In the fall, they were delighted to see that the corn and vegetables had grown well. They decided to have a Thanksgiving feast and invited their Indian friends. On the day of the feast, Chief Massasoit came with ninety Indians. There were turkeys, deer meat, and fish to eat. The feast lasted three days. When the food ran low, the Indians went out to shoot more birds and animals. The Pilgrims and Indians competed in races, wrestling, shooting, and other games. The Pilgrims addressed prayers and thanks to God for providing food, shelter, freedom of religion, and friendly Indians in this new land. Ever since 1621, Thanksgiving celebrations include memories of that special occasion. Today, turkeys, cranberries, corn, and squash are usually part of the Thanksgiving meal. In the United States, Thanksgiving Day is a national holiday. It's celebrated every year on the fourth Thursday in November. In Canada, where the harvest is earlier, Thanksgiving is celebrated on the second Monday of October. The celebration always includes giving thanks for the good things that people have received, especially for food and families. Along with this goes the Thanksgiving meal, when so many good things are eaten. The Calgary Stampede. The Wild West, as we know it from Hollywood westerns, did not last a long time. Its height was from about 1865 to 1885, for only 20 years. By 1885, there were railways across the plains, fences had been built around farms and ranches, and lawmen were on the lookout for any troublemakers. Not only that, but by 1885, nearly all the buffalo had been killed, and most of the Indians were on reservations. Still, the Wild West had captured the imagination of the reading public. A former buffalo hunter and Indian scout, Buffalo Bill Cody, decided to take advantage of his fame as a cowboy. In 1883, he organized Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show and toured North America and Europe. Alberta, Canada, had been the last part of the Old West to be settled. But by 1912, ranching was being replaced by farming. The city of Calgary was itself becoming a commercial and industrial center. Old timers looked back fondly to the old days of cowboys and Indians. In 1908, the Miller Brothers' Wild West show visited Calgary. One of the cowboys, Guy Weedick, talked to local businessmen about putting on a rodeo and the Wild West show. Eventually, four Calgary businessmen put up twenty-five thousand dollars each to finance the event. Weedick was a good organizer. He advertised all over the U.S. and the Canadian West for cowboys and rodeo riders to come. And with twenty-five thousand dollars in prize money, people came from as far away as Mexico. Weedick was able to persuade the Canadian government to let large numbers of Indians leave their reservations to attend. In fact, the Indians were a big part of the program. The main rodeo events were bronco riding, bareback riding, women's bronco riding, steer roping, and bulldogging. These events were based on things that working cowboys actually did. But to make them harder, special bucking horses were brought in. One horse named Cyclone had never been ridden long by anyone. He had thrown 127 riders in a row. 
Most of the rodeo cowboys came from the United States, from Wyoming, Oregon, Oklahoma, Colorado, and Arizona. But there were also Canadian cowboys and some Canadian Indians competing. Queen Victoria's son, the Duke of Connaught, was the Grand Marshal. Many cowboys rode well, but no one could stay on Cyclone. On the sixth and final day, the grounds were muddy from rain, and the horses kept slipping. Cyclone escaped from his handlers and ran around the track. For his last Bronco riding contest, Cyclone's rider would be Tom Three Persons. Three Persons was a blood Indian from Southern Alberta. When Three Persons got on Cyclone, the horse would rear up and plunge its head down to throw the rider. Cyclone acted as though it would topple over backwards, but Three Persons hung on. Then it hurled itself forward with its head almost touching the ground. After a wild ride of several minutes, Cyclone began to tire. The judges declared Tom Three Persons the winner of the Bucking Bronco event. Three Persons was the only Canadian to win a major event at that first Calgary Stampede in 1912. Today, the Calgary Stampede continues to be the largest rodeo and Wild West show in North America. It has many new events and attractions, and still attracts the best rodeo riders from all over North America. The expulsion of the Acadians. The history of the Americas, from their discovery by Columbus till the founding of modern nation states, has been the struggle among European powers for the largest and richest sections of the continents. In particular, England and France have struggled for control of most of North America. Many tragedies and disasters have marked this conflict, but few have been as heart-rending as the expulsion of the Acadians in 1755. Acadia refers to what are now the maritime provinces of Canada: New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Nova Scotia. In 1605, a French expedition under De Monts and Champlain established an agriculture settlement at Port Royal in present-day Nova Scotia. Although Port Royal and other colonies had very mixed success, there was a gradual increase of French settlement through the 17th century. By 1710, the French or Acadian population had reached 2,100. In 1710, Port Royal fell to the English, and the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 confirmed British ownership of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. By this treaty, the Acadians, that is the French-speaking inhabitants, were allowed to stay or leave the country as they pleased. The majority of inhabitants of Acadia were French and were still being influenced by agents from France and Quebec. This made their loyalty to Britain very doubtful in time of war. Governor Phillips attempted to get the Acadians to swear an oath of allegiance to King George of England, and Phillips was able in 1729 to get the French settlers to agree to a modified oath, with the understanding that they would not have to fight against the French and their Indian allies. The Acadians remained neutral during the fighting between Britain and France in 1744 to 45 in Nova Scotia. In 1749, the British established a new capital for Nova Scotia at Halifax, and began to bring in English-speaking settlers. Because of threats from the French and Indians, most of these settlers remained close to Halifax. British skirmishes with the French and Indians continued, and a new war between France and England was approaching. Governor Lawrence decided that it was time to settle the Acadian question. He ordered the Acadians either to take an unqualified oath of allegiance to England or to face expulsion from the colony. At that time, in 1755, there were troops and ships from New England in the area, and it seemed like an opportune time to round up the Acadians and ship them out. When the Acadians refused to take the oath, which might oblige them to fight against France, the British rounded up 6,000 of the 8,000 Acadians, burned their homes, and shipped them away to British colonies of Virginia, the Carolinas, and as far away as the mouth of the Mississippi River. Several of the transport ships sank, drowning all on board, and the Acadians died from disease and hardship. Since the expulsion order did not come from London. It has been suggested that Governor Lawrence had personal reasons for the expulsion. He may have been greedy for the land and possessions confiscated from the Acadians. Others say there was the genuine fear for the English position in North America, and that Lawrence was only protecting the interests of the colony. Acadians still live in Maritime Canada today. Almost 2,000 fled into the woods and eluded the roundup. Another 2,000 Acadians later returned from exile to take the oath of allegiance. Many stories were told of their sufferings. One tale relates how, on the very day of his wedding, a bridegroom was seized by the British and transported from the colony. His bride wandered for many years through the American colonies, trying to find him. At last, when she was old, she found him on his deathbed. The shock of finding him and his death soon caused her death. This is the story of Henry W. Longfellow's poem, Evangeline. The Florida Everglades. 
Southern Florida stretches south, dividing the Atlantic Ocean from the Gulf of Mexico. Stretching further south is the Florida Keys. These coral islands are the southernmost part of the United States. Since much of southern Florida is close to sea level, it's very swampy. The famous Everglades are wetlands where tall grass and bunches of trees grow. Part of these swamps has been drained for agricultural land. The soil is rich, and market gardening is an important activity. The Everglades that remain are too wet to be used for farming. The Everglades are a river of grass. The deeper water areas stay wet all year, but the shallower pools dry up in the dry season. Some of the water has been drained off for agricultural purposes, making the Everglades drier. Nonetheless, the best way to travel in this region is by airboats. These high boats can go through water and sail over clumps of grass. Besides the wet grasslands, southern Florida has smaller areas of tropical forest. These areas of hardwood trees are called hammocks, and they are rich in animal and plant life. Along much of the coast are mangrove trees, which provide important nesting grounds for wild birds. The Florida Keys stretch 200 miles from Miami southwest. These islands are tropical in climate. Fishing and tourism are important industries. Because of its subtropical nature, the animal and plant life of southern Florida differs from other parts of the United States. Characteristic animals are alligators and crocodiles. Alligators prefer fresh water and usually live inland, while crocodiles live in salt water along the coast. Both animals are considered dangerous. Alligator wrestling is considered a sport for the brave or foolhardy. Probably Florida is the most famous for its birds. At one time, many species were almost extinct. Their long feathers were used on women's hats. Now the law protects them. Florida has at least six species of herons, several egrets, wood storks, white ibises, and cormorants. Characteristic Florida birds are the purple gallinule, the anninga, the limpkin, flamingos, and roseate spoonbills. Many of these birds are notable for their size, coloring, and interesting habits. Notable animals include the key deer, a miniature form of the white-tailed deer. There are also panthers or cougars, bobcats, marsh rabbits, mangrove squirrels, round-tailed muskrats, and the manatee. Naturally, the Everglades are home to many reptiles. Snakes are common, both water snakes and land species. There are four poisonous varieties. Both land and sea turtles abound, and lizards are fairly common. Fishing is a major industry. Sports fishermen go to sea in search of trophies such as marlin, sailfish, and tarpon. Smaller fish are caught commercially. Freshwater sport fish include bass and gar. After many decades of work to protect the animals and plants of the Everglades, the region finally became a national park in 1947. It is the third largest park in the USA and covers one and a half million acres. Within the park live 300 kinds of birds, 30 kinds of mammals. 65 kinds of reptiles and amphibians, and nearly 1,000 species of flowering plants. Of course, it is a major tourist attraction. The Great Walls of China. The Great Wall of China is famous in North America, and many tourists would like to travel there. However, most North Americans don't know very much about Chinese history. That is changing now, as China is becoming an important subject for study in the West. The settled communities of China were targets for nomadic raids since earliest times. For much of its early history, China was not fully unified. However, Shi Wang, who died in 210 BC, united the whole country. Then he set about defending China from the northern nomads. It seems likely there have been defensive walls in the north before. However, Shi Wang had a wall constructed across the entire north of China. This defensive wall extended for almost 2,000 miles and had 25,000 towers. Such walls were very expensive to build. They also required huge numbers of men to construct them and later to defend them. Even so, the Great Wall did not stop nomadic invasions altogether. Not long after Shi Wang's death, a tribe called the Huns crossed the wall. The emperor Hu Ti, who expanded Chinese power beyond the wall, defeated them. Centuries later, the Mongols to the north of China were united under Genghis Khan. The Mongols attacked China, and Kublai Khan, grandson of Genghis, became the first non-Chinese emperor of China in 1279. Eventually, the Chinese rebelled and overthrew their Mongol rulers. Nonetheless, the Mongols remained a threat. In 1449, they destroyed a Chinese army and captured the emperor. A new Great Wall was begun to keep the Mongols out. This is the wall which tourists visit today, and which is pictured on Chinese stamps. Construction continued for 200 years. While some parts were built of packed earth, much of the wall was built of stone, brick, and rubble. 
This is why it took so long. Stones had to be quarried and bricks baked and carried to the site. Laborers, peasants, soldiers, and criminals were forced to work on the wall. Large and small forts and watchtowers carefully guarded the wall. Nearly a million soldiers were stationed along it. The Chinese defenders lit fires when the enemy was sighted. Plumes of smoke and cannon shots told that the enemy was advancing and how many there were. By 1644, the new wall was almost completed. That same year, however, an internal uprising overthrew the emperor. This revolt was partly caused by the high taxes demanded to pay for the wall. The emperor's men invited the nomadic Manchu tribe to come through the gates in the wall to help put down the revolt. The Manchus came, but they stayed and ruled China for several hundred years. Since the Manchus ruled both north and south of the wall, they did not care about maintaining it. Many parts fell into disrepair, and some completely disappeared. Today, the parts that remain are a major tourist attraction. The Great Wall of China is one of the wonders of the world, even if it really didn't succeed in its purpose of keeping the northern nomads out of China. The Internet. The first working computers in the 1950s and 1960s were large mainframe machines. In some ways, they were like large calculating machines. The U.S. government, the military, and businesses and institutions used them for specific tasks. For example, they might be used to handle the payroll. As more uses were found for computers, the need to transfer data from one computer to another became a concern. In 1969, the U.S. government sponsored a program to explore ways for computers to transfer data over telephone lines. The first internet was created with four computers linked together. Of course, computer use increased beyond anyone's expectations. Standards were developed that describe how data was to be transferred between computers. A common language for commands and communications emerged. Operating programs such as MS DOS, Unix, Macintosh, and Windows came into existence. The internet quickly expanded beyond government and military uses. The PC became the standard form of computer. Private agencies acted as hosts for internet usage. Around 1982, there were 213 hosts. By 1986, there were 2,300. Today, there are millions. The role of computers expanded so quickly that the USSR, which had discouraged computer use, found itself left behind by the USA. Part of the reason for the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 was that they had fallen too far behind the United States in high-tech areas to ever catch up. One of the most popular uses of the computer is electronic mail or email. You can send a letter by computer over the internet to anywhere in the world in seconds or less, and it doesn't cost anything extra. Now data can be transferred great distances almost instantaneously. Another major internet use is the World Wide Web. In the early days, all web pages were text only. In the 1990s, it became possible to make web pages interactive and multimedia. Interactive means that readers could click on items on the web page and get more information. They could also communicate directly with the web page owner. Multimedia means that web pages were no longer text only. They could also have graphics, film, video, and audio. This has helped to turn computers into popular entertainment. Nowadays, people spend hours every day surfing the net. However, there are some problems. For some people, computers are addictive. Many businesses are trying to control employees using the net during working hours. Since the internet includes just about every kind of information, not all of it is good. You can find directions on how to become a criminal or a terrorist. There are scam artists who want to cheat you out of money. There are also aggressive. Pornography salesmen, not to mention people who want to kill your computer with viruses. Since the internet is not closely regulated, it's up to individual users to follow computer etiquette. Parents need to supervise their children's use of the net. Although the internet has some disadvantages, many people see the net as one of the greatest invention of modern times. The planetarium. All around the world, stargazing is a popular activity. The night sky lit up with stars is one of the most impressive scenes in nature. Besides its natural beauty, people study the night sky for many reasons. Some believe that they can read the future in the stars. Others think that the stars influence the weather, while some people worship the stars and the planets. There is a problem with stargazing. If the night is cloudy, people on the ground cannot see the stars. Also, bad weather makes being outside at night uncomfortable. Besides, not everybody wants to stay up late at night. 
A planetarium is an ideal solution to all these problems. A planetarium is usually a large dome-covered building. It has seating like a theater. The program here is a star show. A special projector throws a picture of the night sky on the ceiling of the planetarium theater. Like a movie projector, the planetarium projector can show a constantly changing program. It can show how the stars look right now, how they looked thousands of years ago, and how they will look in the future. Planetariums can be both entertaining and educational. School children can go to learn about the nine planets of the solar system or about the various groupings of stars. Planetarians can teach you how to find the stars and planets yourself when you're out at night. There can also be dramatic showings about changes to the universe over time. This is also a way to view special phenomena like Halley's comet, which only appears once in a lifetime. Planetarians can also show how ancient people view the skies. Shepherds living out under the sky imagine that groups of stars represented wonderful people and huge animals. Stories were told about these constellations. Sometimes the story explained how the people or animals became stars. For example, why Orion, the mighty hunter, is chasing Taurus the bull. Planetarians can project these figures on their screen. They can also speed up changes in the heavens. It takes about 28 days for the moon to travel through all its phases. Changes in the moon or in the sun can be shown easily. Planetarians can also show the sky the way it appears in another part of the world, or the way it appeared on a famous historical occasion. Special heavenly phenomena, such as a meteor shower, can also be demonstrated. Things that appear only rarely in the real sky can be shown every night. A planetarian is usually concerned to put into special programs to keep its audience coming back. Since the heavens are always moving and changing, there is no shortage of ideas for programmers. Alexander Graham Bell. The Victorian period was a time of many new inventions. Earlier discoveries, such as the steam engine, the screw propeller, the power of electricity, and the possibility of sending messages along a wire, were now applied to everyday life. Inventors such as Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla explored new methods for harnessing electric power. Some of the greatest discoveries were made by Alexander Graham Bell. Bell was born in Scotland in 1847. Both his father and grandmother taught speech methods and worked with deaf and dumb children. Alexander was also interested in this work, especially as his mother was almost deaf. Alexander's two brothers died of tuberculosis, and he himself contracted the disease. So his parents decided to leave Scotland for a drier, healthier climate. They moved to Bradford, Ontario, Canada, and lived in a roomy, comfortable house overlooking the Grand River. Today, the Bell Homestead is an historical museum that attracts visitors from all over the world. At that time, Canada did not have a lot of business opportunities, so Alexander found a job teaching speech in Boston, USA. But he returned to Brantford every summer. In Boston, Bell married one of his deaf students. His father-in-law suggested that there were good business opportunities in inventing communication devices. Bell soon developed a method for sending more than one telegraph message at the same time. While working on improving the telegraph, Bell and his assistant Thomas Watson found a way to send the human voice over wires. On August 10, 1876, Bell sent the first telephone message over wires strung between Brantford and Paris, Ontario, eight miles away. The telephone caused an international sensation, with government leaders asking to have one. But Bell didn't stop there. He worked on the recording properties of wax cylinders and other approaches to flat phonograph records. He also developed the photophone, which later led to the development of the motion picture soundtrack. Bell worked on these inventions at his laboratory in Washington, D.C. But he didn't like the hot, humid summer weather there, so Bell began looking for a new place to spend his summers. He decided to build a summer home in Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. The island reminded Bell of his native Scotland. Now he had space during the summer to do experiments outside. He soon began to experiment with flying machines. Bell designed and tested huge kites, hoping to come up with a frame for a flying machine. Along with some enthusiastic friends, Bell also experimented with airplanes. On February 23, 1909, one of these planes flew through the air for a half a mile. This was the first airplane flight in the British Empire. The Alexander Graham Bell Museum in Baddock, Nova Scotia, displays many of these inventions.
Bell was also interested in making a faster boat. Since much of a boat stays under water, the water resistance slows the boat down. Bell thought that if you could raise the boat out of the water, it would go much faster. Working on Cape Breton Island, Bell and his friends developed the hydrofoil, a boat that would skim the surface of the water at high speeds. Hydrofoils are in use in many places today. Every time people use the telephone, listen to a recording, watch a movie or television, or ride on a hydrofoil, they owe a debt to that great. Inventor Alexander Graham Bell. The story of Anne Frank. War, persecution, and economic depression affect not only adults but also old people, children, babies, the sick, and the handicapped. Since history is written mostly about politicians, soldiers, intellectuals, and criminals, we don't read very often about how events affect ordinary people. Now and then, a special book will shed light on what it was like to live in the midst of terrible events. Such a book is the diary of Anne Frank. Anne Frank was born in Frankfurt am Main, Germany, in 1929. Her father Otto Frank was a businessman who moved the family to the Netherlands in 1934. In Amsterdam, Otto started a company selling pectin to make jams and jellies. Later, he began a second company that sold herbs for seasoning meat. Otto Frank had decided to leave Germany because of the policies and personality of the new German Chancellor Adolf Hitler. Hitler had a personal hatred not only for Jewish people but also for everything Jewish. He felt that one way to strengthen Germany and solve its problems was to kill or drive out all the Jews. Hitler also felt that other groups such as blacks, gypsies, the handicapped, homosexuals, and a chronically unemployed should be eliminated. Then only strong, healthy, true Germans would be left. Since Hitler had a plan to solve Germany's economic problems, he received a lot of popular support. Very few Germans realized that he was mentally and emotionally unbalanced and would kill anyone who got in his way. The Frank family was Jewish, and they felt that they would be safe in the Netherlands. However, in May 1940, Germany invaded the Netherlands and soon took over the government. In 1941, laws were passed to keep Jews separate from other Dutch citizens. The following year, Dutch Jews began to be shipped to concentration camps in Germany and Poland. Just before this began, Anne Frank, Otto's younger daughter, received a diary for her 13th birthday. Less than a month later, the whole family went into hiding. Otto Frank had made friends with the Dutch people who worked with him in his business operations. Now these friends were ready to help him, even though hiding Jews from the authorities was treated as a serious crime. Behind Otto Frank's business offices, there was another house that was not visible from the street. Here, the Franks moved many of their things. Only a few trusted people knew they were living there. The Franks moved into these small rooms on July 6, 1942, and they lived there with another Jewish family, the Van Pels, until the police captured them on August 4, 1944. So, for more than two years, the two families never went outside. All their food and supplies had to be brought to them. During this period, Anne Frank told her diary all of her thoughts and fears. Like any teenage girl, she hoped that good things would happen to her, that she would become a writer or a movie star. She complained that her parents treated her like a child. She insisted that she was grown up. She also talked about how difficult it was to live in a small area with seven other people and not to be able to go outside. She wrote about the war and hoped the Netherlands would soon be liberated from the Germans. Anne sometimes envied her older sister Margot, who was so much more mature and who never got into trouble. She and Margot wrote letters to each other to pass the time, and even had a romance with Peter Van Pels, who was seventeen. Then all their fears came true. All the eight Jews hiding in the house were arrested and eventually sent to Auschwitz death camp in Poland. Although the war was ending, it did not end soon enough for the Frank family. Only Otto Frank survived the war. One of their helpers, Miep Gies. Saved Anne's diary and kept it. After the war, Otto Frank decided to publish it. Since 1947, more than 20 million copies had been sold in 55 languages. Anne's diary shows the terrible cost of hatred, persecution, and war better than any history. Charlotte Church. Many years ago, a German opera impresario was asked why so many of his leading ladies were physically unattractive. He replied. The ones who look like horses sing like nightingales, and vice versa. Certainly, a good voice doesn't always go with an attractive appearance, but in our day of media images, good looks seem very important. Charlotte Church recorded her first album when she was 12 years old. It was called "Voice of an Angel," 
Everyone agreed that the little girl has a very big voice, and they were delighted that Charlotte not only sounded like an angel, she also looked like one. Her sweet schoolgirl appearance and winning smile are part of her success. Charlotte Church was born in Cardiff, Wales, in February 1986. Music and singing are very important in Welsh culture, and all of Charlotte's family were musical. Although Wales is part of Great Britain, the Welsh people are very proud of their own language, history, and heritage. Now that Wales has its own parliament in Cardiff, Welsh culture is promoted even more strongly. Charlotte sings some of her songs in the Welsh language. Charlotte began singing along with the radio as an infant, and by the age of three, she could sing a number of popular songs. She began singing lessons when she was nine. Charlotte first appeared on television early in 1997. This led to a number of other TV and concert appearances. In 1998, she signed a contract with Sony to record five albums. Since Charlotte's first album appeared, she has spent a lot of time doing promotional tours. Since she's a schoolgirl, her two tutors travel along with her. Voice of an Angel was recorded in five days in Cardiff, Wales. All the songs were ones that Charlotte already knew and liked. These included Pie Jesus, The Lord's Prayer, Jerusalem, and Danny Boy. The album came out on November nine, nineteen ninety eight, and within a couple of weeks was number four on the popular music charts. She recorded her second album, Charlotte Church, in nineteen ninety nine. Traveling involves doing showcases for people in the music industry and the media. This is to encourage people to promote your music. Charlotte also appeared on various U.S. talk shows, including David Letterman and Jay Leno. She finds that she gets asked the same questions over and over again. Besides media celebrities, Charlotte has met many leading public figures. Since she is a Roman Catholic, Charlotte was especially excited to meet the Pope. This was after she'd been invited to sing at a Christmas concert at the Vatican. She was also asked to sing at Prince Charles' 50th birthday party in 1998. She saw the prince again in 1999 when she sang at the official opening of the Welsh National Assembly. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip talked to her too. Later that year, she sang for Bill and Hillary Clinton at the Ford Theater in Washington. Something that people like about Charlotte Church is that when she hasn't been spoiled by fame, many show business kids are loud, brash, noisy, and rude. But when she is away from the stage, the young singer leads a normal life with her family and friends. Even when she is on TV, she comes across as an ordinary teenager, but a very nice one. Charlotte's voice always gets comments. It seems like such a big voice for a little girl. Very few teenagers have a powerful operatic voice like hers. Some people have found it hard to believe that it is actually Charlotte singing. For the most part, she enjoys her success. She likes to travel and meet new people. Los Angeles is her favorite city, and she likes the United States and Canada. But she is always glad to get home to Wales and be with her friends. At the moment, she goes to an all-girls school, so she doesn't see boys very often. But at age 15, an interest in boys is likely to become a factor in her life. Charlotte now has recorded three albums, and we can expect a fourth in 2001. She also has written an account of her life for all her fans. It is entitled "Voice of an Angel: My Life So Far." Christmas holidays. In many ways, Christmas is the most important holiday in North America. It is the most important commercial festival. Most retail stores do half their annual business in the six weeks or so before Christmas. Christmas is an important holiday from work and school. Many workers take the whole week off between Christmas and New Year's Day. It is the biggest time of the year for parties, gift giving, home decorations, and visiting. Many homeowners compete to see who can have the best display of lights. It is also an important time for the entertainment industry. Many Christmas movies, TV shows, recordings, concerts, and plays are produced every year for the Christmas season. It is also the time of year when the largest number of people attend church, because Christmas is a religious festival too. It celebrates the birth of Jesus. How all these different things came together to become Christmas is a long story. Why, for example, is Jesus's birthday celebrated on December twenty-fifth? No one knows the exact day that Jesus was born, but Jesus was born during the Roman Empire, and for the Romans, December twenty-fifth was a very important day. The Romans had many gods and many religions. Two religions, both of which had one main god, were the worship of the Invincible Sun and Mithras. 
These gods were both honored on December 25th. Because December 25th was just after the shortest day of the year, it was a natural time to worship the sun. December was also a time to celebrate the end of the agriculture year. The Romans held one of their main festivals, the Saturnalia, beginning on December 17th. That lasted for a week. The Romans also began the custom of celebrating New Year's Day on January 1st. So the last half of December and the beginning of January was a wonderful time for partying and games. The early Christians didn't know what day Jesus was born. At first, they celebrated his birthday on January 6th. However, as most people in the Roman Empire were becoming Christians, it was decided to move the date to December 25th. The celebration lasted 12 days until January 6th and took the place of all other festivals. That way, people who were used to celebrating on December 25th would feel more comfortable. As different peoples became Christian, they brought their own customs to be part of Christmas. The people of Northern Europe used evergreen trees and mistletoe as symbols of spring and eternal life. The evergreen tree became the Christmas tree. The mistletoe is hung from the ceiling at Christmas for couples to kiss under. It was also in Northern Europe where the idea of Santa Claus or Father Christmas began. In Roman times, there was a man who became known as Saint Nicholas. He is said to have given gifts to the poor and provided dowries for poor girls who wouldn't otherwise be able to marry. The idea of the gift-giving saint became joined with the northern idea of spirit of Christmas festivities. It was a poem written in 1831 by the American writer Clement Moore, which popularized Santa Claus throughout the world. Twas the night before Christmas. Told the story of how Santa visits every house in the world on Christmas Eve and brings toys for good girls and boys. Since that time, parents have secretly bought toys for their children at Christmas. When the children awake on Christmas Day, they find toys by the chimney or under the Christmas tree. They are told that Santa Claus and his reindeer brought them. Adults also give gifts to each other at Christmas time. No wonder that the stores sell so many things then. It is often said that Christmas is becoming too commercialized. In the rush to get everything ready, to buy the gifts, decorate the house and tree, give parties, visit family and friends, and attend special Christmas events, the original reason for celebrating is sometimes forgotten. Only when people go to church or sing Christmas carols or attend musical performances about Jesus' birth, do they remember that Christmas is the birthday of Christ. Garage sales and yard sales. Every Saturday morning in our part of the world, except in winter, many people drive around the city looking for yard sales. Yard sales or garage sales often take place in the driveway of someone's home or perhaps the front lawn. The homeowners take out all the stuff they don't want and arrange it in front of their house. Usually, they put a price tag on items. People driving by will stop to see if there's anything they want. Many people spend every Saturday morning shopping at yard sales. If they find that they have bought too many things, then they have a yard sale of their own. Some of the shoppers are dealers who buy things for resale. Sometimes they resell them at their own yard sales, but some dealers are professionals who run antique stores, used bookshops, flea markets, or used furniture and appliance stores. Usually, the dealers will try to get to the yard sale before anyone else. That way, they have the best selection. Often, they'll try to buy items for less than what the price tag says. The cheaper they can buy the item, the more profit they can make when they resell it. Their motto is: buy low, sell high. Sometimes a merchant will boast that he paid one dollar for a glass or china cup at a yard sale and sold it for a hundred dollars at his store or on the internet. By having catalogs that show the value of collectibles, dealers can sometimes make large profits. Now, however, many of the people having yard sales will try to check the value of the things they are selling first, so it is getting harder to get a real bargain. One reason for yard sales is that North Americans often live in big houses, which fill up with things. People may use the basement, the attic, the spare room, and the garage to store things that they aren't using. If they store things in their garage, all they have to do is open the garage door and have a garage sale. When children grow up and move away, the parents will often sell the children's old clothes, toys, and furniture. Another reason for yard sales is that there are a lot of things that people might like but don't want to pay full price for. For example, if someone likes to read novels, they may be happy to pay one dollar for a book at a yard sale rather than twenty or thirty dollars at a retail store. 
What sorts of things are sold at yard sales? Just about anything you might find in a house or yard. There are ornaments, china, home decorations, sports equipment, bicycles, games, dolls, toys, tables, and chairs, lamps, appliances, books, records, paintings, clothes, record players, and much, much more. Some items are things that were popular a few years ago but now have gone out of fashion. This might include many toys, books, and games that relate to an old television show that is no longer being shown. While a lot of older people go to yard sales, so do a lot of students. Students and young people may need cheap furniture for their apartment or a bicycle to get to school or work. They may not be able to pay full price. If you are lucky, you can find almost anything at a yard sale. The trick is to get there early. Most yard sales are advertised to start at 9 a.m., but dealers may arrive as early as 7 30 a.m. By 10 a.m., the busiest part is already over, although most yard sales go on into the afternoon. Yard sales tend to prove the common saying that one person's trash is another person's treasure. Helen Keller What would it be like to be unable to see anything, hear anything, or say anything? Life for young Helen Keller was like that. She had an illness before she was two years old that had left her deaf, dumb, and blind. After that, it was difficult for her to communicate with anyone. She could only learn by feeling with her hands. This was very frustrating for Helen, her mother, and her father. Helen Keller grew up in Alabama, USA, during the 1880s and 1890s. At that time, people who had lost the use of their eyes, ears, and mouth often ended up in charitable institutions. Such a place would provide them with basic food and shelter until they died, or they could go out on the street with a beggar's bowl and ask strangers for money. Since Helen's parents were not poor, she did not have to do either of these things, but her parents knew they would have to do something to help her. One day, when she was six years old, Helen became frustrated that her mother was spending so much time with a new baby. Unable to express her anger, Helen tipped over the baby's crib, nearly injuring the baby. Her parents were horrified and decided to take the last chance open to them. They would try to find someone to teach Helen to communicate. A new school in Boston claimed to be able to teach children like Helen. The Kellers wrote a letter to the school in Boston asking for help. In March of 1887, a teacher, 20 year old Ann Sullivan, arrived at the Kellers' home in Tuscumbia, Alabama. Ann Sullivan herself had a very difficult life. Her mother had died when she was eight. Two years later, their father had abandoned Ann and their little brother Jimmy. Ann was nearly blind and her brother had a diseased hip. No one wanted the two handicapped children, so they were sent to a charitable institution. Jimmy died there. At age 14, Ann, who was not quite blind, was sent to the School for the Blind in Boston. Since she had not had any schooling before, she had to start in grade one. Then she had an operation that gave back some of her eyesight. Since Ann knew what it was like to be blind, she was a sympathetic teacher. Before Ann could teach Helen anything, she had to get her attention. Because Helen was so hard to communicate with, she was often left alone to do as she pleased. A few days after she arrived, Anne insisted that Helen learn to sit down at the table and eat breakfast properly. Anne told the Kellers to leave, and she spent all morning in the breakfast room with Helen. Finally, after a difficult struggle, she got the little girl to sit at the table and use a knife and fork. Since the Keller family did not like to be strict with Helen, Anne decided that she needed to be alone with her for a while. There was a little cottage away from the big house. The teacher and pupil moved there for some weeks. It was here that Anne taught Helen the manual alphabet. This was a system of sign language. But since Helen couldn't see, Anne had to make the signs in her hands so she could feel them. For a long time, Helen had no idea what the words she was learning meant. She learned words like box and cat, but hadn't learned that they referred to those objects. One day, Anne dragged Helen to a water pump and made the signs for water while she pumped water over Helen's hands. Helen at last made the connection between the signs and the thing. Water was that cool, wet liquid stuff. Once Helen realized that the manual alphabet could be used to name things, she ran around naming everything. Before too long, she began to make sentences using the manual alphabet. She also learned to read and write using the square hand alphabet, 
which was made up of raised square letters. Before long, she was also using Braille and beginning to read books. Helen eventually learned to speak a little, although this was hard for her because she couldn't hear herself. She went on to school and then to Radcliffe College. She wrote articles and books, gave lectures, and worked tirelessly to help the blind. The little girl who couldn't communicate with anyone became, in time, a wonderful communicator. Trial by jury. If you are a citizen of Canada or the United States, it is very likely that you will be summoned at some time for jury duty. A letter will come in the mail telling you to report to a certain place at a given time. There are legal penalties for not attending because jury duty is considered every citizen's responsibility. Often, a large number of people, perhaps several hundred, will be summoned at one time. When you arrive, you will join a lineup of others who are registering for duty. Eventually, you will get to a table and talk to an official. If you have a special reason for not being a juror, such as ill health, you may be excused at this point. Those not immediately exempted will become a part of a jury panel. Out of this panel, a number of juries of twelve people will be chosen. These will decide a variety of criminal cases over the next few weeks. What follows is the experience of one woman in a jury pool. She went ahead with others into a large courtroom where they spent the whole day. At the front of the courtroom were the judge and the lawyers for the prosecution and for the defense. One of the lawyers explained what the case was going to be about. The names of the jury panel were in a box at the front. When someone's name was called, they went up to the front of the courtroom. The person called up would then have a chance to explain why they couldn't serve as a juror if there was some reason preventing them. For example, one woman was dismissed because she knew the accused. The first jury to be chosen was for a burglary case. A panel member went forward and faced the accused. Then the lawyers in the trial decided whether the juror was satisfactory to them. At lunchtime, the panel was dismissed for an hour. The second jury was to try someone on a charge of murder. Usually, the panel was told approximately how long the trial might be. Since jurors are not usually paid, many would like to avoid being involved in a long trial. The woman was called forward and had to look the man accused of murder in the eye. This made her quite nervous. Judging by her expression, the two lawyers would decide whether they wanted her on the jury or not. The defense lawyer would try to choose someone who seemed sympathetic to the man accused. The prosecutor would prefer someone who was not sympathetic. The woman excused herself by saying she had a very young child to look after and no relatives to help. She was allowed to go home at the end of the day. Some people wonder whether it is fair for lawyers to dismiss jurors who may not be sympathetic in their cases. For example, defense lawyers may try to choose young people if they think these will be less severe to their clients. In the case above, the lawyers seem to prefer women to men. This means that a lot of people are dismissed from being jurors without a good reason. One principle of the jury system, however, is to protect the rights of the accused particularly well. One might say that the jury system is biased in favor of the defendant. This is why defense lawyers have an opportunity to dismiss people who they think will not be favorable to their clients. Furthermore, having 12 jurors gives the defense a good opportunity for a successful defense. If the defense attorney can raise a reasonable doubt about the guilt of his client in even one juror, then the accused has a chance of being released. This happened in the O.J. Simpson murder trial. There, even though there was strong evidence that Simpson committed the crime, the defense was able to insinuate some doubts among the jurors. Moreover, the defense lawyers may be able to appeal to the emotions of the jurors. Particularly if they can think of a way to gain sympathy for their client, for this reason, defense lawyers are more likely to choose trial by jury over trial by judge alone. A judge is less likely to be swayed by emotion than a jury, and a defense attorney may also prefer a criminal trial to a civil suit. In the latter case, the client does not have to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, but will be found liable if the preponderance of evidence is against him or her. This is why O.J. Simpson was acquitted on criminal charges, but then found liable for damages in a civil suit. A favorite place. It is good to have a favorite place where you can go to be alone and relax. Sometimes this spot is your own room or a quiet part of the house. Sometimes it is somewhere outdoors, away from people and busy streets. Or you may feel most comfortable in a shopping mall or a downtown park. 
Our favorite place is especially nice to go at times of stress. When work gets too hectic or we have trouble with other people, then our favorite place is a refuge from these difficulties. My special spot is very close to where I work. It is on a busy university campus. At one end of the university, hidden among several buildings, there is a pond. This pond is surrounded by large rocks, which rise up like a small cliff on one side. Shooting out of these rocks are water pipes, which create a small waterfall. The water is drawn up from the bottom of the pond and drops back into the middle. This keeps the water from becoming stagnant. On the other side of the pond, there is a grassy shore and a flat stone patio. Here, in the summer, people can sit out and have meals. Yet, very few people come here to sit, perhaps because they are very busy with their work. There is something very calm and pleasant about trees and grass and shade, about birds singing and water rippling, and flowers blooming all around. Green is a relaxing color for the eyes. Still water suggests peace. Running water seems full of life. There is a large weeping willow tree on the grassy side of the pond. Its branches touch the water and shade much of the pond. Rushes grow in the shallow water. The pond is only about three feet deep. In the summer, there are beautiful water lilies in bloom over much of the pond. Sometimes, I have counted over thirty blooms, and some flowers are over five inches wide. Goldfish and minnows are the pond's chief inhabitants, but there are also crayfish and other animals. At different times, there have been a turtle, a water snake, and a family of ducks. Behind the pond is a large glassy wall, which reflects the entire scene. One can also go inside and view the pond, even on rainy or snowy days. There are several gardens close to the pond. One of the gardeners told me that he could turn the waterfall off and on. Usually on the weekends, it is turned off. But if there is a special event, the waterfall is left on. Behind the glassy wall is a cafeteria. Here, visitors to the university are sometimes taken for meals. The students do not use it. In the winter, the pond freezes over. Sometimes, if the winter is very cold, the pond freezes right down to the bottom. Then, most of the goldfish and minnows die. Usually, some survive in the mud at the bottom of the pond. Occasionally, people will skate on the pond if the ice is smooth. When spring comes, a lot of the old rushes and water lily leaves from the previous year are cleared away. This makes the pond more attractive and gives the new plants room to grow. If there are too many rushes, they are sometimes cut down in summer. Then visitors can see the water lilies better. Chances are that if you ever visit Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario, you will hear about Pond Inlet. And if you come in the summer, you will probably see me there, thinking about my next article. Business ethics. What do business and ethics have to do with each other? Business is about making profits. Ethics is about right and wrong. How are they connected? Well. Business ethics is the study of right and wrong as applied to business actions. Some businessmen would say that there is no need for business ethics. If we don't break the laws of the country, we have nothing to worry about. However, we can do many bad things without breaking laws. In some countries, it would be legal for a businessman to pollute the land, sea, and air, to confine his workers to barracks, and to hire children to work in factories. But these things may not be right. On the other hand, it may be illegal for a businessman to do some good things. For example, his society may expect him to treat people unequally and discriminate against some ethnic or religious groups. In order to know what is right or wrong, we need a moral rule. This rule does not come from business itself, but from ethics. So we need a statement of what we believe to be right. The American Declaration of Independence in 1776 states an ethical principle: We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The Declaration further tells us that all men have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
Principles such as these can be used in American politics and law to decide whether an action is right or wrong. Many companies have their own ethical guidelines. IBM, for example, outlines its corporate ethics under headings such as tips, gifts, and entertainment, accurate reporting, fair competition, and not boasting. So each employee knows what to do or not to do in various situations. Ethical choices are made on three levels: individuals, by companies, and by societies, make them. An individual might choose whether or not to accept a bribe. A company might decide whether or not to bribe government officials. A government or society might decide whether or not to outlaw bribery. Similar principles of right and wrong might be used at all three levels. For example, it might be decided that bribery is simply wrong in all situations. On the other hand, it might be decided to view the situation case by case. In other words, there is a strong ethical stand and a more tentative ethical stand. The strong ethical stand applies when you have a basic moral principle, and apply it to all situations. For example, you might believe that it was always wrong to let workers handle hazardous substances without any protection. The weaker stand would consider whether it is legal to do so. If it is legal to let workers handle dangerous materials, and this conforms to social expectations, then the weak ethical stand would say, "No problem, as long as the law is not broken and no one strenuously objects, then everything is okay." However, in ethics, there is a principle called the moral minimum. This principle means that you should never harm another person knowingly. The only exception. Would be to protect some other people or yourself. So business ethics would say that the businessman who exposes his workers to hazardous chemicals is wrong. He is not practicing the moral minimum. Colonial Williamsburg. Travelers in the desert or the jungle sometimes see the remains of old cities. These cities were once large and prosperous, but something has changed. Perhaps the climate got drier or wetter. Perhaps the trade routes, which had brought merchants to the city, now went elsewhere. Perhaps enemies destroyed them, or perhaps disease or famine drove the people away. Other cities, which were once important, have become less so in time. Jamestown, Virginia, the first English colony in America, is now only an historic site. It began as the capital of Virginia, but when fire destroyed the government buildings in 1699. The capital was moved to nearby Williamsburg. Williamsburg was an important town for many years. The British governors lived there, and two of them worked on the plans for the town and its buildings. The College of William and Mary was established there in the 1690s, the second oldest college in America. As the capital, Williamsburg contained many public buildings, including a courthouse, a jail, a powder magazine, the governor's palace. And the government building, of course, there were many private houses as well. From 1699 until 1780, Williamsburg was the capital of Virginia. Many people came there for government and legal business. It was also a social center with dances, fairs, horse races, and auctions. The governor and his wife provided expensive dinners and entertainment for their guests. Most of the important people in Virginia owned tobacco plantations. In 1612, John Rolfe had first raised tobacco to sell to England. Soon, tobacco farming was Virginia's most important business. Most planters were able to build large houses and buy slaves to do their work. One plantation owner is said to have owned 300,000 acres of land and 1,000 black slaves, as well as having large amounts of money. The planters were the leaders of this colonial society, and they resented British interference in their local government. When England imposed taxes on the American colonists in 1765, it was a Virginian, Patrick Henry, who spoke against them. His words, "Give me liberty or give me death," helped to inspire the American Revolution. As complaints about British rule increased, it was Virginians who led the rebels. George Washington became commander of the Revolutionary Army, and Thomas Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence in 1776. 
In 1780, the capital of Virginia was moved to Richmond. Williamsburg was now simply a small college town of local importance. Not much changed in Williamsburg for many years. In the 20th century, the Reverend Dr. Goodwin, who was the priest at the Williamsburg Church, had the idea of restoring Williamsburg to the way it appeared in colonial days. Goodwin approached John D. Rockefeller Jr. with his idea, and Rockefeller agreed to finance this project. Beginning in 1926, the old buildings of Williamsburg were restored to their original form. First were the college buildings, then the Rally Tavern, the government building, the governor's palace, and so on. Buildings that had been destroyed over time were reconstructed from plans and descriptions. Soon the restored buildings were open to the public. Guides, dressed in 18th century costumes, show visitors through the buildings and gardens. Visitors can also travel to nearby tobacco plantations. Now, tourists who pay admission to visit this wonderful historic town finance much of the work of restoration and conservation. Winston Churchill Braces, Britons to their task. On Friday evening last, I received from His Majesty the mission to form a new administration. It was the evident will of Parliament and the nation that this should be conceived on the broadest possible basis and that it should include all parties. I have already completed the most important part of this task. A war cabinet has been formed of five members, representing, with the labor, opposition, and liberals, the unity of the nation. It was necessary that this should be done in one single day on account of the extreme urgency and rigor of events. Other key positions were filled yesterday. I am submitting a further list to the king tonight. I hope to complete the appointment of principal ministers during tomorrow. The appointment of other ministers usually takes a little longer. I trust when Parliament meets again this part of my task will be completed and that the administration will be complete in all respects. I considered it in the public interest to suggest to the Speaker that the House should be summoned today. At the end of today's proceedings, the adjournment of the House will be proposed until May 21st with provision for earlier meeting if need be. Business for that will be notified to MPs at the earliest opportunity. I now invite the House by a resolution to record its approval of the steps taken and declare its confidence in the new government. The resolution that this House welcomes the formation of a government representing the united and inflexible resolve of the nation to prosecute the war with Germany to a victorious conclusion. To form an administration of this scale and complexity is a serious undertaking in itself. But we are in the preliminary phase of one of the greatest battles in history. We are in action at many other points, in Norway and in Holland, and we have to be prepared in the Mediterranean. The air battle is continuing, and many preparations have to be made here at home. In this crisis, I think I may be pardoned if I do not address the House at any length today, and I hope that any of my friends and colleagues, or former colleagues who are affected by the political reconstruction, will make all allowances for any lack of ceremony with which it has been necessary to act. I say to the House, as I said to ministers who have joined this government, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many months of struggle and suffering. You ask, what is our policy? I say it is to wage war by land, sea, and air. War with all our might and with all the strength God has given us, and to wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark and lamentable catalog of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word. It is victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terrors. Victory, however long and hard the road may be, for without victory there is no survival. Let that be realized. No survival for the British Empire. No survival for all that the British Empire has stood for. No survival for the urge, the impulse of the ages, that mankind shall move forward toward his goal. I take up my task in buoyancy and hope. I feel sure that our cause will not be suffered to fail among men. I feel entitled at this juncture, at this time, to claim the aid of all and to say, Come then, let us go forward together with our united strength. Lou Gehrig, Farewell Speech Fans, for the past two weeks you've been reading about a bad break I got. 
Yet today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. I have been in ballparks for 17 years and have never received anything but kindness and encouragement from you fans. Look at these grand men. Which of you wouldn't consider it the highlight of his career just to associate with them for even one day? Sure, I'm lucky. Who wouldn't consider it an honor to have known Jacob Ruppert, also the builder of baseball's greatest empire, Ed Barrow, to have spent six years with that wonderful little fellow Miller Huggins, then to have spent the next nine years with that outstanding leader, that smart student of psychology, the best manager in baseball today, Joe McCarthy. Sure, I'm lucky. When the New York Giants, a team you would give your right arm to beat, and vice versa, send you a gift, that's something. When everybody down to the groundskeepers and those boys in white coats remember you with trophies, that's something. When you have a wonderful mother-in-law who takes sides with you and squabbles against her own daughter, that's something. When you have a father and mother who work all their lives so that you can have an education and build your body, it's a blessing. When you have a wife who has been a tower of strength and shown more courage than you dreamed existed, that's the finest I know. So I close in saying that I might have had a tough break, but I have an awful lot to live for. John F. Kennedy, Ich bin ein Berliner. Two thousand years ago, the proudest boast was Civis Romanus Sum. Today in the world of freedom, the proudest boast is Ich bin ein Berliner. There are many people in the world who really don't understand or say they don't, What is the great issue between the free world and the communist world? Let them come to Berlin. There are some who say that communism is the wave of the future. Let them come to Berlin. And there are some who say in Europe and elsewhere we can work with the communists. Let them come to Berlin. And there are even a few who say that it's true that communism is an evil system, but it permits us to make economic progress. Let them come to Berlin. Freedom has many difficulties, and democracy is not perfect. But we have never had to put up a wall to keep our people in, to prevent them from leaving us. I want to say, on behalf of my countrymen who live many miles away on the other side of the Atlantic, who are far distant from you, that they take the greatest pride that they have been able to share with you, even from a distance, the story of the last eighteen years. I know of no town, no city that has been besieged for eighteen years that still lives with the vitality and the force and the hope and the determination of the city of West Berlin. While the wall is the most obvious and vivid demonstration of the failures of the communist system, all the world can see we take no satisfaction in it, for it is, as your mayor has said, an offense not only against history but an offense against humanity. Separating families, dividing husbands and wives and brothers and sisters, and dividing a people who wish to be joined together. What is true of this city is true of Germany. Real, lasting peace in Europe can never be assured as long as one German out of four is denied the elementary right of free men, and that is to make a free choice. In eighteen years of peace and good faith. This generation of Germans has earned the right to be free, including the right to unite their families and their nation in lasting peace with goodwill to all people. You live in a defended island of freedom, but your life is part of the main. So let me ask you, as I close, to lift your eyes beyond the dangers of today to the hopes of tomorrow, beyond the freedom merely of this city of Berlin and all your country of Germany, to the advance of freedom everywhere. Beyond the wall to the day of peace with justice, beyond yourselves and ourselves to all mankind, freedom is indivisible. And when one man is enslaved, who are free? When all are free, then we can look forward to that day when this city will be joined as one, and this country and this great continent of Europe in a peaceful and hopeful globe. When that day finally comes, as it will. The people of West Berlin can take sober satisfaction in the fact that they were in the front lines for almost two decades. All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin, and therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words "Ich bin ein Berliner." Robert F. Kennedy, 
Speech after assassination of Martin Luther King, Jr. I have bad news for you, for all of our fellow citizens, and people who love peace all over the world, and that is that Martin Luther King was shot and killed tonight. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and to justice for his fellow human beings, and he died because of that effort. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it is perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are and what direction we want to move in. For those of you who are black, considering the evidence there evidently is that there were white people who were responsible, you can be filled with bitterness, with hatred, and a desire for revenge. We can move in that direction as a country, in great polarization, black people amongst black, white people amongst white, filled with hatred toward one another. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and to replace that violence, that stain of bloodshed that has spread across our land, with an effort to understand with compassion and love. For those of you who are black and are tempted to be filled with hatred and distrust at the injustice of such an act against all white people, I can only say that I feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed, but he was killed by a white man. But we have to make an effort in the United States. We have to make an effort to understand, to go beyond these rather difficult times. My favorite poet was a Shilas. He wrote, In our sleep, pain which cannot forget, falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own despair, against our will, comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. What we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence or lawlessness, but love and wisdom and compassion toward one another, and a feeling of justice towards those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or they be black. So I shall ask you tonight to return home, to say a prayer for the family of Martin Luther King. That's true. But more importantly, to say a prayer for our own country which all of us love, a prayer for understanding and that compassion of which I spoke. We can do well in this country. We will have difficult times. We've had difficult times in the past. We will have difficult times in the future. It is not the end of violence. It is not the end of lawlessness. It is not the end of disorder. But the vast majority of white people and the vast majority of black people in this country want to live together, want to improve the quality of our life, and want justice for all human beings who abide in our land. Let us dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man, and to make gentle the life of this world. Let us dedicate ourselves to that, and say a prayer for our country and for our people. Ronald Reagan Speech at Normandy We're here to mark that day in history when the Allied peoples joined in battle to reclaim this continent to liberty. For four long years, much of Europe had been under a terrible shadow. Free nations had fallen. Jews cried out in the camps. Millions cried out for liberation. Europe was enslaved, and the world prayed for its rescue. Here in Normandy, the rescue began. Here, the Allies stood and fought against tyranny in a giant undertaking unparalleled in human history. We stand on a lonely, windswept point on the northern shore of France. The air is soft. But 40 years ago, at this moment, the air was dense with smoke and the cries of men, and the air was filled with the crack of rifle fire and the roar of cannon. At dawn, on the morning of the 6th of June, 1944, 225 rangers jumped off the British landing craft and ran to the bottom of these cliffs. Their mission was one of the most difficult and daring of the invasion, to climb these sheer and desolate cliffs and to take out the enemy guns. The Allies had been told that some of the mightiest of these guns were here and they would be trained on the beaches to stop the Allied advance. The rangers looked up and saw the enemy soldiers at the edge of the cliffs shooting down at them with machine guns and throwing grenades. And the American rangers began to climb. They shot rope ladders over the face of these cliffs and began to pull themselves up. When one ranger fell, another would take his place. When one rope was cut, a ranger would grab another and begin his climb again. They climbed, shot back, and held their footing. Soon, one by one, 
the rangers pulled themselves over the top, and in seizing the firm land at the top of these cliffs, they began to seize back the continent of Europe. 225 came here. After two days of fighting, only 90 could still bear arms. Behind me is a memorial that symbolizes the ranger daggers that were thrust into the top of these cliffs, and before me are the men who put them there. These are the boys of Point du Hoc. These are the men who took the cliffs. These are the champions who helped free a continent. These are the heroes who helped end a war. Gentlemen, I look at you, and I think of the words of Stephen Spender's poem. You are men who in your lives fought for life and left the vivid air signed with your honor. Forty summers have passed since the battle that you fought here. You were young the day you took these cliffs. Some of you were hardly more than boys, with the deepest joys of life before you. Yet you risked everything here. Why? Why did you do it? What impelled you to put aside the instinct for self-preservation and risk your lives to take these cliffs? What inspired all the men of the armies that met here? We look at you, and somehow we know the answer. It was faith and belief. It was loyalty and love. The men of Normandy had faith that what they were doing was right, faith that they fought for all humanity, faith that a just God would grant them mercy on this beachhead or on the next. It was the deep knowledge, and pray God we have not lost it, that there is a profound moral difference between the use of force for liberation and the use of force for conquest. You were here to liberate, not to conquer. And so you and those others did not doubt your cause, and you were right not to doubt. You all knew that some things are worth dying for. One's country is worth dying for, and democracy is worth dying for, because it's the most deeply honorable form of government ever devised by man. All of you loved liberty. All of you were willing to fight tyranny, and you knew the people of your countries were behind you. Bill Clinton, Second Inaugural Address My fellow citizens, at this last presidential inauguration of the 20th century, let us lift our eyes toward the challenges that await us in the next century. It is our great good fortune that time and chance have put us not only at the edge of a new century, in a new millennium, but on the edge of a bright new prospect in human affairs, a moment that will define our course and our character for decades to come. We must keep our old democracy forever young. Guided by the ancient vision of a promised land, let us set our sights upon a land of new promise. The promise of America was born in the 18th century out of the bold conviction that we are all created equal. It was extended and preserved in the 19th century when our nation spread across the continent, save the Union, and abolished the awful scourge of slavery. Then, in turmoil and triumph, the promise exploded into the world stage to make this the American century. And what a century it has been. America became the world's mightiest industrial power, saved the world from tyranny in two world wars and a long Cold War, and time and again reached out across the globe to millions who, like us, longed for the blessings of liberty. Along the way, Americans produced a great middle class and security in old age, built unrivaled centers of learning and opened public schools to all, split the atom and explored the heavens, invented the computer and the microchip, and deepened the wellspring of justice by making a revolution in civil rights for African Americans and all minorities, and extending the circle of citizenship, opportunity and dignity to women. Now, for the third time, a new century is upon us, and another time to choose. We began the 19th century with a choice, to spread our nation from coast to coast. We began the 20th century with a choice, to harness the Industrial Revolution to our values of free enterprise, conservation, and human decency. Those choices made all the difference. At the dawn of the 21st century, a free people must now choose to shape the forces of the information age and the global society, to unleash the limitless potential of all our people, and yes, to form a more perfect union. When last we gathered, our march to this new future seemed less certain than it does today. We vowed then to set a clear course to renew our nation. 
In these four years, we have been touched by tragedy, exhilarated by challenge, strengthened by achievement. America stands alone as the world's indispensable nation. Once again, our economy is the strongest on earth. Once again, we are building stronger families, thriving communities, better educational opportunities, a cleaner environment. Problems that once seemed destined to deepen now bend to our efforts. Our streets are safer and record numbers of our fellow citizens have moved from welfare to work. And once again, we have resolved for our time a great debate over the role of government. Today we can declare, government is not the problem and government is not the solution. We, the American people, we are the solution. Our founders understood that well and gave us a democracy strong enough to endure for centuries, flexible enough to face our common challenges and advance our common dreams in each new day. As times change, so government must change. We need a new government for a new century, humble enough not to try to solve our problems for us, but strong enough to give us the tools to solve our problems for ourselves, a government that is smaller, lives within its means, and does more with less. Yet where it can stand up for our values and interests in the world, and where it can give Americans the power to make a real difference in their everyday lives, government should do more, not less. The preeminent mission of our new government is to give all Americans an opportunity, not a guarantee, but a real opportunity, to build better lives. Beyond that, my fellow citizens, the future is up to us. Our founders taught us that the preservation of our liberty and our union depends upon responsible citizenship. And we need a new sense of responsibility for a new century. There is work to do, work that government alone cannot do. Teaching children to read. Hiring people off welfare rolls. Coming out from behind locked doors and shuttered windows to help reclaim our streets from drugs and gangs and crime. Taking time out of our own lives to serve others. Each and every one of us, in our own way, must assume personal responsibility, not only for ourselves and our families, but for our neighbors and our nation. Our greatest responsibility is to embrace a new spirit of community for a new century. For any one of us to succeed, we must succeed as one America. The challenge of our past remains the challenge of our future. Will we become one nation, one people, with one common destiny or not? Will we all come together or come apart? The divide of race has been America's constant curse, and each new wave of immigrants gives new targets to old prejudices. Prejudice and contempt, cloaked in the pretense of religious or political conviction, are no different. These forces have nearly destroyed our nation in the past. They plague us still. They fuel the fanaticism of terror, and they torment the lives of millions in fractured nations all around the world. These obsessions cripple both those who hate and, of course, those who are hated, robbing both of what they might become. We cannot, we will not, succumb to the dark impulses that lurk in the far regions of the soul everywhere. We shall overcome them, and we shall replace them with the generous spirit of a people who feel at home with one another. Our rich texture of racial, religious, and political diversity will be a godsend in the 21st century. Great rewards will come to those who can live together, learn together, work together, forge new ties that bind together. As this new era approaches, we can already see its broad outlines. Ten years ago, the Internet was the mystical province of physicists. Today, it is a commonplace encyclopedia for millions of school children. Scientists now are decoding the blueprint of human life. Cures for our most feared illnesses seem close at hand. The world is no longer divided into two hostile camps. Instead, now we are building bonds with nations that once were our adversaries. Growing connections of commerce and culture give us a chance to lift the fortunes and spirits of people the world over. And for the very first time in all of history, more people on this planet live under democracy than dictatorship. My fellow Americans, as we look back at this remarkable century, we may ask, can we hope not just to follow, but even to surpass the achievements of the 20th century in America and to avoid the awful bloodshed that stained its legacy? To that question, every American here and every American in our land today must answer a resounding yes. This is the heart of our task. 
with a new vision of government, a new sense of responsibility, a new spirit of community, we will sustain America's journey. The promise we sought in a new land, we will find again in a land of new promise. In this new land, education will be every citizen's most prized possession. Our schools will have the highest standards in the world, igniting the spark of possibility in the eyes of every girl and every boy, and the doors of higher education will be open to all. The knowledge and power of the information age will be within reach not just of the few, but of every classroom, every library, every child. Parents and children will have time not only to work, but to read and play together, and the plans they make at their kitchen table will be those of a better home, a better job, the certain chance to go to college. Our streets will echo again with the laughter of our children, because no one will try to shoot them or sell them drugs anymore. Everyone who can work will work, with today's permanent underclass part of tomorrow's growing middle class. New miracles of medicine at last will reach not only those who can claim care now, but the children and hard-working families too long denied. We will stand mighty for peace and freedom, and maintain a strong defense against terror and destruction. Our children will sleep free from the threat of nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons. Ports and airports, farms and factories will thrive with trade and innovation and ideas, and the world's greatest democracy will lead a whole world of democracies. Our land of new promise will be a nation that meets its obligations, a nation that balances its budget, but never loses the balance of its values, a nation where our grandparents have secure retirement and health care, and their grandchildren know we have made the reforms necessary to sustain those benefits for their time. A nation that fortifies the world's most productive economy, even as it protects the great natural bounty of our water, air, and majestic land. And in this land of new promise, we will have reformed our politics so that the voice of the people will always speak louder than the din of narrow interests, regaining the participation and deserving the trust of all Americans. Fellow citizens, let us build that America a nation ever moving forward toward realizing the full potential of all its citizens. Prosperity and power. Yes, they are important and we must maintain them. But let us never forget, the greatest progress we have made and the greatest progress we have yet to make is in the human heart. In the end, all the world's wealth and a thousand armies are no match for the strength and decency of the human spirit. Thirty-four years ago, the man whose life we celebrate today spoke to us down there, at the other end of this mall, in words that move the conscience of a nation. Like a prophet of old, he told of his dream that one day America would rise up and treat all its citizens as equals before the law and in the heart. Martin Luther King's dream was the American dream. His quest is our quest. The ceaseless striving to live out our true creed. Our history has been built on such dreams and labors, and by our dreams and labors we will redeem the promise of America in the 21st century. To that effort I pledge all my strength and every power of my office. I ask the members of Congress here to join in that pledge. The American people return to office a president of one party and a Congress of another. Surely they did not do this to advance the politics of petty bickering and extreme partisanship they plainly deplore. No, they call on us instead to be repairers of the breach and to move on with America's mission. America demands and deserves big things from us, and nothing big ever came from being small. Let us remember the timeless wisdom of Cardinal Bernardin when facing the end of his own life. He said, It is wrong to waste the precious gift of time on acrimony and division. Fellow citizens, we must not waste the precious gift of this time, for all of us are on that same journey of our lives, and our journey, too, will come to an end. But the journey of our America must go on. And so, my fellow Americans, we must be strong, for there is much to do. The demands of our time are great, and they are different. Let us meet them with faith and courage, with patience and a grateful and happy heart. Let us shape the hope of this day into the noblest chapter in our history. Yes, let us build our bridge, a bridge wide enough and strong enough for every American to cross over to a blessed land of new promise. May those generations whose faces we cannot yet see, whose names we may never know, 
say of us here that we led our beloved land into a new century with the American dream alive for all her children with the American promise of a more perfect union, a reality for all her people, with America's bright flame of freedom spreading throughout all the world. From the height of this place and the summit of this century, let us go forth. May God strengthen our hands for the good work ahead and always, always bless our America. George W. Bush, Inaugural Address President Clinton, distinguished guests, and my fellow citizens, The peaceful transfer of authority is rare in history, yet common in our country. With a simple oath, we affirm old traditions and make new beginnings. As I begin, I thank President Clinton for his service to our nation, and I thank Vice President Gore for a contest conducted with spirit and ended with grace. I am honored and humbled to stand here, where so many of America's leaders have come before me, and so many will follow. We have a place, all of us, in a long story, a story we continue, but whose end we will not see. It is the story of a new world that became a friend and liberator of the old, a story of a slave-holding society that became a servant of freedom, the story of a power that went into the world to protect but not possess, to defend but not to conquer. It is the American story, a story of flawed and fallible people united across the generations by grand and enduring ideals. The grandest of these ideals is an unfolding American promise that everyone belongs, that everyone deserves a chance, that no insignificant person was ever born. Americans are called to enact this promise in our lives and in our laws, and though our nation has sometimes halted and sometimes delayed, we must follow no other course. Through much of the last century, America's faith in freedom and democracy was a rock in a raging sea. Now it is a seed upon the wind, taking root in many nations. Our democratic faith is more than the creed of our country. It is the inborn hope of our humanity, an ideal we carry but do not own, a trust we bear and pass along. And even after nearly 225 years, we have a long way yet to travel. While many of our citizens prosper, others doubt the promise, even the justice of our own country. The ambitions of some Americans are limited by failing schools and hidden prejudice and the circumstances of their birth. And sometimes our differences run so deep, it seems we share a continent, but not a country. We do not accept this, and we will not allow it. Our unity, our union, is the serious work of leaders and citizens in every generation. And this is my solemn pledge. I will work to build a single nation of justice and opportunity. I know this is in our reach because we are guided by a power larger than ourselves who creates us equal in His image, and we are confident in principles that unite and lead us onward. America has never been united by blood or birth or soil. We are bound by ideals that move us beyond our backgrounds, lift us above our interests, and teach us what it means to be citizens. Every child must be taught these principles. Every citizen must uphold them. And every immigrant, by embracing these ideals, makes our country more, not less, American. Today, we affirm a new commitment to live out our nation's promise through civility, courage, compassion, and character. America, at its best, matches a commitment to principle with a concern for civility. A civil society demands from each of us goodwill and respect, fair dealing and forgiveness. Some seem to believe that our politics can afford to be petty because, in a time of peace, the stakes of our debates appear small. But the stakes for America are never small. If our country does not lead the cause of freedom, it will not be led. If we do not turn the hearts of children toward knowledge and character, we will lose their gifts and undermine their idealism. If we permit our economy to drift and decline, the vulnerable will suffer most. We must live up to the calling we share. Civility is not a tactic or a sentiment. It is the determined choice of trust over cynicism, of community over chaos. And this commitment, if we keep it, is a way to shared accomplishment. America, at its best, is also courageous. Our national courage has been clear in times of depression and war, when defending common dangers defined our common good. Now we must choose if the example of our fathers and mothers will inspire us or condemn us. We must show courage in a time of blessing by confronting problems instead of passing them on to future generations. 
Together, we will reclaim America's schools before ignorance and apathy claim more young lives. We will reform Social Security and Medicare, sparing our children from struggles we have the power to prevent. And we will reduce taxes to recover the momentum of our economy and reward the effort and enterprise of working Americans. We will build our defenses beyond challenge, lest weakness invite challenge. We will confront weapons of mass destruction so that a new century is spared new horrors. The enemies of liberty in our country should make no mistake. America remains engaged in the world by history and by choice, shaping a balance of power that favors freedom. We will defend our allies and our interests. We will show purpose without arrogance. We will meet aggression and bad faith with resolve and strength. And to all nations, we will speak for the values that gave our nation birth. America at its best is compassionate. In the quiet of American conscience, we know that deep, persistent poverty is unworthy of our nation's promise. And whatever our views of its cause, we can agree that children at risk are not at fault. Abandonment and abuse are not acts of God. They are failures of love. And the proliferation of prisons, however necessary, is no substitute for hope and order in our souls. Where there is suffering, there is duty. Americans in need are not strangers. They are citizens, not problems, but priorities. And all of us are diminished when any are hopeless. Government has great responsibilities for public safety and public health, for civil rights and common schools. Yet compassion is the work of a nation, not just a government. And some needs and hurts are so deep, they will only respond to a mentor's touch or a pastor's prayer. Church and charity, synagogue and mosque lend our communities their humanity and they will have an honored place in our plans and in our laws. Many in our country do not know the pain of poverty, but we can listen to those who do. And I can pledge our nation to a goal. When we see that wounded traveler on the road to Jericho, we will not pass to the other side. America, at its best, is a place where personal responsibility is valued and expected. Encouraging responsibility is not a search for scapegoats, it is a call to conscience. And though it requires sacrifice, it brings a deeper fulfillment. We find the fullness of life not only in options but in commitments, and we find that children and community are the commitments that set us free. Our public interest depends on private character, on civic duty and family bonds and basic fairness, on uncounted, unhonored acts of decency which give direction to our freedom. Sometimes in life we are called to do great things, but as a saint of our times has said, every day we are called to do small things with great love. The most important tasks of a democracy are done by everyone. I will live and lead by these principles, to advance my convictions with civility, to pursue the public interest with courage, to speak for greater justice and compassion, to call for responsibility and try to live it as well. In all these ways, I will bring the values of our history to the care of our times. What you do is as important as anything government does. I ask you to seek a common good beyond your comfort, to defend needed reforms against easy attacks, to serve your nation beginning with your neighbor. I ask you to be citizens, citizens, not spectators, citizens, not subjects, responsible citizens, building communities of service and a nation of character. Americans are generous and strong and decent, not because we believe in ourselves, but because we hold beliefs beyond ourselves. When this spirit of citizenship is missing, no government program can replace it. When this spirit is present, no wrong can stand against it. After the Declaration of Independence was signed, Virginia statesman John Page wrote to Thomas Jefferson, We know the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong. Do you not think an angel rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm? Much time has passed since Jefferson arrived for his inauguration. The years and changes accumulate. But the themes of this day he would know. Our nation's grand story of courage and its simple dream of dignity. We are not this story's author, who fills time and eternity with his purpose. Yet his purpose is achieved in our duty, and our duty is fulfilled in service to one another. Never tiring, never yielding, never finishing. We renew that purpose today, 
to make our country more just and generous, to affirm the dignity of our lives and every life. This work continues, this story goes on, and an angel still rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm. God bless you all, and God bless America. Takako Doi The underpinnings of our lives is hope. If we have the smallest margin of hope, we can continue to exist. I believe what is sought from politics is to expand that hope even by the smallest margin. When we think of it, however, it seems politics has cast a shadow over people's hopes. I cannot ask help, but ask myself if there has ever been so much urgency embodied in the words, future of hope. However, even knowing the absolute destructive capacity of nuclear weapons and having experienced its atrocity, mankind still has not been able to walk the road to the destruction of nuclear arms. To the contrary, some countries see the retention of nuclear arms as the symbol of a national power. In the 21st century, we are going to gain richness with science and technology, or will humanity be subjugated to science and technology? We will be faced with the choice of one or the other. I believe the advances of telecommunication technology will present us with similar choices in the future. Fifty years after the war, the Japanese society is caught in a very perplexing stagnation. When I look back on the last fifty years of Japanese history, I am beset by the deepest soul searching and painful frustration when I find that we Japanese have not been able to overcome our mistakes on our own volition. We still have not been able to reach a reconciliation with many of our Asian friends. Politicians should speak of the future, of ethics, and life. A discussion of hope should be based on fundamental principles. In particular, politicians must speak with children. And young people and women, if we are to retain hope for the future. Politicians must be accountable for their decisions, and they must also question the criteria in which their responsibility would be assessed. That is, why our enlightened forebearers and predecessors who have translated ideals into reality continue to be respected and be a source of encouragement. Emmanuel Kant wrote, truly lasting peace is not an empty ideal. But a challenge given to us. This challenge will be solved gradually, and we will eventually reach our goal. We must all share a firm resolve to realize our goals. The critical stimulus for that will be the recognition of human rights and coexistence. However, there are many problems that face us, but when we think of how we can respond to such difficulties and challenges, I question where we can place our starting point. It is at this fundamental question that the future of hope must be questioned. That is the question I entertain for myself and which I believe has to be resolved. Naomi Wolf, A Woman's Place. Even the best of revolutions can go awry when we internalize the attitudes we are fighting. The class of 1992 is graduating into a violent backlash against the advances women have made over the last 20 years. This backlash ranges from a senator using The Exorcist against Anita Hill to beer commercials with the Swedish bikini team. Today, I want to give you a backlash survival kit, a four step manual to keep the dragons from taking up residence inside your own heads. My own commencement at Yale eight years ago. Was the graduation from hell. The speaker was Dick Cavett, rumored to have been our president's brother in an all male secret society. Mr. Cavett took the microphone and paled at the sight of hundreds of female about to be Yale graduates. When I was a graduate, I recall he said, there were no women. The women went to Vassar. At Vassar, they had nude photographs taken of the women in gym class to check their posture. One year the photos were stolen and turned up for sale in New Haven's red light district. His punchline? The photos found no buyers. I'll never forget that moment. There we were, silent in our black gowns, our tassels, our brand new shoes. We dared not break the silence with hisses or boos out of respect for our families who'd come so far. And they kept still out of concern for us. Consciously or not, Mr. Cabot was using the beauty myth aspect of the backlash. 
when women come too close to masculine power, someone will draw critical attention to their bodies. We might be elas, but we still wouldn't make pornography worth buying. That afternoon, several hundred men were confirmed in the power of a powerful institution, but many of the women felt the shame of the powerless, the choking on silence, the complicity, the helplessness. We were orphaned from the institution. I want to give you the commencement talk that was denied to me. Message number one in your survival kit: Redefine becoming a woman. Today, you have become women, but that sounds odd in ordinary usage. What is usually meant by "you're a real woman now"? You become a woman when you menstruate for the first time, or when you lose your virginity, or when you have a child. These biological definitions are very different from how we say boys become men. One becomes a man when he undertakes responsibility or completes a quest. But you too, in some ways more than your male friends graduating today, have moved into maturity through a solidarity quest for the adult self. Naomi Wolf, A Woman's Place. We lack archetypes for the questing young woman, her trials by fire. For how one becomes a woman through the chrysalis of education, the difficult passage from one book, one idea to the next. Let's refuse to have our scholarship and our gender pitted against each other. In our definition, the scholar learns womanhood and the woman learns scholarship. Plato and Ajuna Barnes mediated to their own enrichment through the eyes of the female body with its wisdoms and its gifts. I say that you have already shown courage. Many of you graduate today in spite of the post-traumatic syndrome of acquaintance rape, which one fourth of female students undergo. Many of you were so weakened by anorexia and bulimia that it took every ounce of your will to get your work in. You negotiated private lives through a minefield of new strains of VD and the ascending shadow of AIDS. Triumphant survivors, you have already become women. Message number two. Breaks the ultimate taboo for women. Ask for money in your lives. Expect it. Own it. Learn to use it. Little girls learn a debilitating fear of money that it's not feminine to ensure we are fairly paid for honest work. Meanwhile, women make sixty-eight cents for every male dollar, and half of marriages end in divorce. After which, women's income drops precipitously. Never choose a profession for material reasons. But whatever field your heart decides on, for God's sake, get the most specialized training in it you can, and hold out hard for just compensation, parental leave, and childcare. Resist your assignment to the class of highly competent, grossly underpaid women who run the show, while others get the case and the credit. Claim money not out of greed, but so you can tithe to women's political organizations, shelters, and educational institutions. Sexist institutions won't yield power if they're just patient long enough. The only language the status quo understands is money, votes, and public embarrassment. When you have equity, you have influence. As sponsors, shareholders, and alumni, use it to open opportunities to women who deserve the chances you've had. Your BA does not belong to you alone, just as the earth does not belong to its present tenants alone. Your education was lent to you by women of the past, and you will give some back to living women and to your daughters seven generations from now. Message number three: Never cook for or sleep with anyone who routinely puts you down. Message number four: Become goddesses of disobedience. Virginia Woolf once wrote that we must slay the angel in the house, the censor within. Young women, tell me of injustices from campus rape cover-ups to classroom sexism, but at the thought of confrontation, they freeze into niceness. We are told that the worst thing we can do is cause conflict, even in the service of doing right. Antigone is imprisoned, Joan of Arc burns at the stake, and someone might call us unfeminine. Naomi Wolf, A Woman's Place. When I wrote a book that caused controversy, I saw how big a dragon was this paralysis by niceness. The beauty myth argues that newly rigid ideals of beauty 
are instruments of a backlash against feminism, designed to lower women's self-esteem for a political purpose. Many positive changes followed the debate, but all that would dwindle away when someone yelled at me, as, for instance, cosmetic surgeons did on TV, when I raised questions about silicone implants. Oh no, I'd quail. People are mad at me. Then I read something by poet Audre Lorde. She'd been diagnosed with breast cancer. I was going to die, she wrote, sooner or later, whether or not I had even spoken myself. My silences had not protected me. Your silences will not protect you. What are the words you do not have yet? What are the tyrannies you swallow day by day and attempt to make your own until you will sicken and die of them, still in silence? We've been socialized to respect fear more than our own need for language. I began to ask each time, "What's the worst that could happen to me if I tell this truth?" Unlike women in other countries, our breaking silence is unlikely to have us jailed, disappeared, or run off the road at night. Our speaking out will irritate some people, get us called bitchy or hypersensitive, and disrupt some dinner parties. And then our speaking out will permit other women to speak until laws are changed and lives are saved, and the world is altered forever. Next time, ask what's the worst that will happen. Then push yourself a little further than you dare. Once you start to speak, people will yell at you, and they will interrupt you, put you down, and suggest it's personal, and the world won't end. And the speaking will get easier and easier, and you will find you have fallen in love with your own vision, which you may never have realized you had. And you will lose some friends and lovers, and realize you don't miss them. And new ones will find you and cherish you. And you will still flirt and paint your nails and dress up and party, because, as I think Emma Goldman said, if I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution. And at last, you'll know with surpassing certainty that only one thing is more frightening than speaking your truth, and that is not speaking. Diana, Princess of Wales. Ladies and gentlemen, I must begin by saying how warmly I welcome this conference on landmines convened by the Mines Advisory Group and the Landmine Survivors Network. It is so welcome because the world is too little aware of the waste of life, limb, and land which anti-personnel landmines are causing among some of the poorest people on Earth. Indeed, until my journey to Angola early this year, on which I'm going to speak this morning, I was largely unaware of it too. For the mine is a stealthy killer. Long after conflict is ended, its innocent victims die or are wounded singly in countries of which we hear little. Their lonely fate is never reported. The world, with its many other preoccupations, remains largely unmoved by a death roll of something like 800 people every month. Many of them women and children, those who are not killed outright, and they number another twelve hundred a month, suffer terrible injuries and are handicapped for life. I was in Angola in January with the British Red Cross, a country where there are fifteen million landmines in a population, ladies and gentlemen, of ten million, with the desire of drawing world attention to this vital but hitherto largely neglected issue. Some people chose to interpret my visit. As a political statement, but it was not. I am not a political figure. As I said at the time, and I'd like to reiterate now, my interests are humanitarian. That's why I felt drawn to this human tragedy. This is why I wanted to play down my part in working towards a worldwide ban on these weapons. During my days in Angola, I saw at first hand three aspects of this scourge in the hospitals of Luanda, the capital, and Huambo. Scene of bitter fighting not long ago, I visited some of the mine victims who had survived and saw their injuries. I'm not going to describe them because, in my experience, it turns too many people away from the subject. Suffice to say that when you look at the mangled bodies, some of them children caught by these mines, you marvel at their survival. What is so cruel about these injuries is that they are mostly invariably suffered where medical resources are scarce. I observed for myself some of the obstacles to improving medical care in most of these hospitals. Often, there's a chronic shortage of medicine, of painkillers, even of anesthetics. 
Surgeons constantly engaged in amputating shattered limbs never have all the facilities we would expect to see here. So the human pain that is to be borne is often beyond imagining. This emergency medical care, moreover, is only the first step back to a sort of life. For those whose living is the land, loss of an arm or leg is an overwhelming handicap which lasts for life. I saw the fine work being done by the Red Cross and other agencies to replace lost limbs. But making prosthesis is a costly as well as complicated business. For example, a young child will need several different fittings as it grows older. Sometimes the severity of the injury makes the fitting of an artificial limb impossible. There are never enough resources to replace all the limbs that are lost. Diana, Princess of Wales. As the Red Cross have expressed it, each victim who survives will incur lifetime expenses for surgery and prosthetic care totaling between two thousand and three thousand. That is an intolerable load for a handicapped person in a poor country. That is something to which the world should urgently turn its conscience. In Angola, one in every three hundred thirty-four members of the population is an amputee. Angola has the highest rate of amputees in the world. How can countries which manufacture and trade in these weapons square their conscience with such human devastation? My third main experience was to see what has been done slowly and perilously to get these mines out of the earth in the Kuwaitu and Huambo region. I spent a morning with a small team from Halo Trust, which is training Angolans to work on the pervasive minefields and supervising their work. I speak of our team because men of the Mines Advisory Group, or in this instance the Halo Trust, who volunteer for this hazardous work, are usually former members of our own services. I take this opportunity to pay my tribute to the work these men do on our behalf. The perils they encounter are not just confined to mines. Two members of the mines advisory group team in Cambodia, Chris Howes and Hun Horth, were kidnapped by the Khmer Rouge a year ago, and their fate is uncertain. We can only pray for their safe return. Much ingenuity has gone into making some of these mines. Many are designed to trap an unwary deminer. Whenever such tricky mines appear, the D miner will call in one of the supervising team, who will then take over. That is what keeps their lives perpetually at risk. It might be less hazardous, I reflect, after my visit to Angola, if some of the technical skills used in making mines had been applied to better methods of removing them. Many of these mines are relatively cheap; they can be bought for five apiece or less. Tracing them, lifting them. And disposing of them costs far more, sometimes as much as a hundred times more. Angola is full of refugees returning after a long war. They present another aspect of this tragedy: the refugee turns towards home, often ignorant of conditions in his homeland. He knows of mines, but homeward bound, eagerness to complete the journey gets the better of him, or he finds mines on what was once his land and attempts to clear them. There were many examples of that in Angola. These mines inflict most of their casualties on the people who are trying to meet the elementary needs of life. They strike the wife or the grandmother gathering firewood for cooking. They ambush the child sent to collect water for the family. I was impressed to see the work being done by many of the world's agencies on mine awareness. If children can be taught at school, if adults can be helped to learn what to do. And what not to do in regions that have been mined, then lives can be saved and injuries reduced. Diana, Princess of Wales. There are said to be around 110 million mines lurking somewhere in the world, and over a third of them are to be found in Africa. Angola is probably more heavily mined than anywhere else because the war went on for such a long time, and it invaded so much of the country. So that country is going to be infested with mines and will suffer many more victims. And this brings me to one of the main conclusions I reached after this experience: even if the world decided tomorrow to ban these weapons, this terrible legacy of mines already in the earth would continue to plague the poor nations of the globe. The evil that men do lives after them, and so it seems to me there rests a certain obligation upon the rest of us.
One of my objectives in visiting Angola was to forward the cause of those, like the Red Cross, striving in the name of humanity to secure an international ban on these weapons. Since then, we are glad to see some real progress has been made. There are signs of a change of heart, at least in some parts of the world. For that, we should be cautiously grateful. If an international ban on landmines can be secured, it means, looking far ahead, that the world may be a safer place for this generation's grandchildren. But for this generation, in much of the developing world, there will be no relief, no relaxation. The toll of deaths and injuries caused by mines already there will continue. This tracing and lifting of mines, as I saw in Angola, is a desperately slow business. So, in my mind, a central question remains: Should we not do more to quicken the deminers' work, to help the injured back to some sort of life, to further our own contribution to aid and development? The country is enriched by the work done by its overseas agencies and non-governmental organizations who work to help people in Africa and Asia to improve the quality of their lives. Yet mines cast a constant shadow over so much of this work. Resettlement of refugees is made more hazardous. Good land is put out of bounds. Recovery from war is delayed. Aid workers themselves are put at risk. I would like to see more done for those living in this no man's land, which lies between the wrongs of yesterday and the urgent needs of today. I think we owe it. I also think it would be of benefit to us as well as to them. The more expeditiously we can end this plague on earth caused by the landmine, the more readily we can set about the constructive tasks to which so many give their hand in the cause of humanity. Margaret Thatcher. Europe is not the creation of the Treaty of Rome, nor is the European idea the property of any group or institution. We British are as much heirs to the legacy of European culture as any other nation. Our links to the rest of Europe, the continent of Europe, have been the dominant factor in our history. For three hundred years, we were part of the Roman Empire, and our maps still trace the straight lines of the roads the Romans built. Our ancestors. Celts, Saxons, and Danes came from the continent. Our nation was, in that favorite community word, restructured under Norman and Angevin rule in the 11th and 12th centuries. This year, we celebrate the 300th anniversary of the glorious revolution in which the British crown passed to Prince William of Orange and Queen Mary. We visit the great churches and cathedrals of Britain, read our literature, and listen to our language. All bear witness to the cultural riches which we have drawn from Europe, and other Europeans from us. We in Britain are rightly proud of the way in which, since Magna Carta in 1215, we have pioneered and developed representative institutions to stand as bastions of freedom, and proud too of the way in which, for centuries, Britain was home for people from the rest of Europe who sought sanctuary from tyranny. But we know that without the European legacy of political ideas, we could not have achieved as much as we did. From classical and medieval thought, we have borrowed that concept of the rule of law, which marks out a civilized society from barbarism. And on that idea of Christendom, for long synonymous with Europe, with its recognition of the unique and spiritual nature of the individual, we still base our belief in personal liberty and other human rights. Too often, the history of Europe is described as a series of interminable wars and quarrels. Yet, from our perspective today, surely what strikes us most is our common experience. For instance, the story of how Europeans explored and colonized, and yes, without apology, civilized much of the world, is an extraordinary tale of talent, skill, and courage. We British have, in a special way, contributed to Europe. Over the centuries, we have fought to prevent Europe from falling under the dominance of a single power. We have fought, and we have died for her freedom. Only miles from here, in Belgium, lie the bodies of 120,000 British soldiers who died in the First World War. Had it not been for that willingness to fight and to die, Europe would have been united long before now. But not in liberty, not in justice. It was British support to resistance movements throughout the last war that helped to keep alive the flame of liberty in so many countries until the day of liberation. Margaret Thatcher. All these things alone are proof of our commitment to Europe's future.
The European Community is one manifestation of that European identity, but it is not the only one. We must never forget that east of the Iron Curtain, peoples who once enjoyed a full share of European culture, freedom, and identity have been cut off from their roots. We shall always look on Warsaw, Prague, and Budapest as great European cities. Nor shall we forget that European values have helped to make the United States of America into the valiant defender of freedom that she has become. It is no arid chronicle of obscure facts from the dust-filled libraries of history. It is the record of nearly two thousand years of British involvement in Europe, cooperation with Europe, and contribution to Europe. A contribution which today is as valid and as strong as ever. Yes, we have looked also to wider horizons, as have others, and thank goodness for that, because Europe would never have prospered and never will prosper as a narrow-minded, inward-looking club. The European Community belongs to all its members. It must reflect the traditions and aspirations of all its members. Let me be quite clear: Britain does not dream of some cosy, isolated existence on the fringes of the European Community. Our destiny is in Europe, as part of the Community. That is not to say that our future lies only in Europe, nor does that of France or Spain or indeed any other member. The community is not an end in itself, nor is it an institutional device to be constantly modified according to the dictates of some abstract intellectual concept. Nor must it be ossified by endless regulation. The European Community is the practical means by which Europe can ensure the future prosperity and security of its people in a world in which there are many other powerful nations and groups of nations. To try to suppress nationhood and concentrate power at the center of a European conglomerate would be highly damaging and would jeopardize the objectives we seek to achieve. Europe will be stronger precisely because it has France as France, Spain as Spain, Britain as Britain, each with its own customs, traditions, and identity. It would be folly to try to fit them into some sort of identical European personality. Margaret Thatcher. Some of the founding fathers of the community thought that the United States of America might be its model, but the whole history of America is quite different from Europe. People went there to get away from the intolerance and constraints of life in Europe. They sought liberty and opportunity, and their strong sense of purpose has, over two centuries, helped create a new unity and pride in being American, just as our pride lies in being British or Belgian or Dutch or German. I am the first to say that on many great issues, the countries of Europe should try to speak with a single voice. I want to see us work more closely on the things we can do better together than alone. Europe is stronger when we do so, whether it be in trade, in defense, in our relations with the rest of the world. But working more closely together does not require power to be centralized in Brussels or decisions to be taken by an appointed bureaucracy. Indeed, it is ironic that just when those countries, such as the Soviet Union, which have tried to run everything from the center, are learning that success depends on dispersing power and decisions away from the center, some in the community seem to want to move in the opposite direction. We have not successfully rolled back the frontiers of the state of Britain, only to see them reimposed at a European level, with a European superstate exercising a new dominance from Brussels. Certainly, we want to see Europe more united and with a greater sense of common purpose. But it must be in a way which preserves the different traditions, parliamentary powers, and sense of national pride in one's own country. For these have been the source of Europe's vitality through the centuries. Edward Kennedy, you and I have stood together many times, but no time has been more important than this. The campaign that stretches before us now is a struggle for the souls and the future of America, for we are more than a political coalition, more than a collection of programs, more than the sum of our prospects and our strategy. Most of all, we are the trustees of a dream. Twenty years ago, in 1968, we lost two of the most powerful voices of that dream, but they left us their vision, their values, and the hopes they awakened. In the countless millions of people whose hearts they touched, we remember them now to remind ourselves that the American journey is unfinished, that we stand for change in order to march again towards enduring ideals, that we do not have to settle for things as they are.
Martin Luther King Jr. told us something we need to hear anew. He said, We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now in the unfolding life and history. There is such a thing as being too late. And Dr. King also said, We must work unceasingly to lift this nation to a higher destiny, to a new plateau of compassion. And in that time, there was another voice, only briefly heard, but whose words, too, have outlasted all the loss in years. Robert Kennedy said, Each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. He was my brother. But he and Dr. King were also in the deepest sense brothers to us all. These two, these valiant two, lived for the same dream and were gone only months apart. And if they were here with us two decades later, I think I know what they would say. Now is the time. Some men see things as they are and say, Why? We dream things that never were and say, Why not? Now is the time. Abraham Lincoln, Gettysburg Address Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus so far nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Vaclav Havel, Contamination of Morality. My dear fellow citizens, For forty years you heard from my predecessors on this day different variations of the same theme. How our country flourished, how many million tons of steel we produced, how happy we all were, how we trusted our government, and what bright perspectives were unfolding in front of us. I assume you did not propose me for this office so that I too would lie to you. Our country is not flourishing. The enormous creative and spiritual potential of our nation is not being used sensibly. Entire branches of industry are producing goods which are of no interest to anyone, while we are lacking the things we need. A state which calls itself a worker state humiliates and exploits workers. Our obsolete economy is wasting the little energy we have available. A country that once could be proud of the educational level of its citizens spends so little on education that it ranks today as 72nd in the world. We have polluted our soil, our rivers, and forests, bequeathed to us by our ancestors, and we have today the most contaminated environment in Europe. Adult people in our country die earlier than in most other European countries. But all this is still not the main problem. The worst thing is that we live in a contaminated moral environment. We fell morally ill because we became used to saying something different from what we thought. We learned not to believe in anything, to ignore each other, 
to care only about ourselves. Concepts such as love, friendship, compassion, humility, or forgiveness lost their depth and dimensions. And for many of us, they represented only psychological peculiarities. Or they resembled some gone astray greetings from ancient times, a little ridiculous in the era of computers and spaceships. Only a few of us were able to cry out loud that the powers that be should not be all powerful, and that special farms, which produce ecologically pure and top quality food just for them, should send their produce to schools, children's homes, and hospitals if our agriculture was unable to offer them to all. The previous regime, armed with its arrogant and intolerant ideology, reduced man to a force of production and nature to a tool of production. In this, it attacked both their very substance and their mutual relationship. It reduced gifted and autonomous people, skillfully working in their own country, to nuts and bolts of some monstrously huge, noisy, and stinking machine, whose real meaning is not clear to anyone. It cannot do more than slowly but inexorably wear down itself and all its nuts and bolts. When I talk about contaminated moral atmosphere, I am not talking just about the gentlemen who eat organic vegetables and do not look out of the plain windows. I am talking about all of us. We had all become used to the totalitarian system and accepted it as unchangeable fact, and thus helped to perpetuate it. In other words, we are all, though naturally to differing extents, responsible for the operation of the totalitarian machinery. None of us is just its victim. We are also all its co-creators. Vaclav Havel, contamination of morality. Why do I say this? It would be very unreasonable to understand the sad legacy of the last forty years as something alien, which some distant relative bequeathed us. On the contrary, we have to accept this legacy as a sin we committed against ourselves. If we accept it as such, we will understand that it is up to us all and up to us only to do something about it. We cannot blame the previous rulers for everything, not only because it would be untrue, but also because it could blunt the duty that each of us faces today, namely the obligation to act independently, freely, reasonably, and quickly. Let us not be mistaken: the best government in the world, the best parliament, and the best president cannot achieve much on their own. And it would also be wrong to expect a general remedy from them only. Freedom and democracy include participation, and therefore responsibility from us all. If we realize this, then all the horrors that the new Czechoslovak democracy inherited will cease to appear so terrible. If we realize this, hope will return to our hearts. In the effort to rectify matters of common concern, we have something to lean on. The recent period, and in particular the last six weeks of our peaceful revolution, has shown the enormous human, moral, and spiritual potential and civic culture that slumbered in our society under the enforced mask of apathy. Whenever someone categorically claimed that we were this or that, I always objected that society is a very mysterious creature, and that it is not wise to trust only the face it presents to you. I am happy that I was not mistaken. Everywhere in the world, people wonder where those meek, humiliated, skeptical, and seemingly cynical citizens of Czechoslovakia found the marvelous strength to shake from their shoulders in several weeks, and in a decent and peaceful way, the totalitarian yoke. And let us ask: From where did the young people who never knew another system take their desire for truth, their love of free thought, their political ideas, their civic courage, and civic prudence? How did it happen that their parents, the very generation that had been considered as lost, joined them? How is it possible that so many people immediately knew what to do, and none of them needed any advice or instruction? Mazarik based his politics on morality. Let us try in a new time and in a new way to restore this concept of politics. Let us teach ourselves and others that politics should be an expression of a desire to contribute to the happiness of the community, rather than of a need to cheat or rape the community. Let us teach ourselves and others that politics can be not only the art of the possible, especially if this means the art of speculation, calculation, intrigue, secret deals, and pragmatic maneuvering. But that it can even be the art of the impossible, namely the art of improving ourselves and the world. Vaclav Havel, contamination of morality.
There are free elections and an election campaign ahead of us. Let us not allow this struggle to dirty the so far clean face of our gentle revolution. Let us not allow the sympathies of the world, which we have won so fast, to be equally rapidly lost through our becoming entangled in the jungle of skirmishes for power. Let us not allow the desire to serve oneself to bloom once again under the fair mask of the desire to serve the common good. It is not really important now which party, club, or group will prevail in the elections. The important thing is that the winners will be the best of us in the moral, civic, Political and professional sense, regardless of their political affiliations. The future policies and prestige of our state will depend on the personalities we select and later elect to our representative bodies. In conclusion, I would like to say that I want to be a president who will speak less and work more. To be a president who will not only look out of the windows of his airplane, but who, first and foremost, will always be present among his fellow citizens and listen to them well. You may ask what kind of republic I dream of. Let me reply. I dream of a republic independent, free, and democratic, of a republic economically prosperous and yet socially just. In short, of a humane republic which serves the individual and which therefore holds the hope that the individual will serve it in turn. Of a republic of well-rounded people, because without such, it is impossible to solve any of our problems, human, economic, ecological, social, or political. The most distinguished of my predecessors opened his first speech with a quotation from the great Czech educator Comenius. Allow me to round off my first speech with my own paraphrase of the same statement: "People, your government has returned to you." Arthur Scargill. Criticism of Tory policies. Today, our nation, after eight years under the Tories, is on the brink of utter chaos, facing both social and economic collapse. Our basic industries have been butchered. Our manufacturing base has been eroded, with hundreds of businesses, large and small, gone to the wall. While the nation has become increasingly dependent on imported goods, the human consequences of this industrial and economic devastation are terrible. Over eight million people struggle for survival on or below the poverty line, and four and a half million people are unemployed. Thousands of families are homeless. The number of homeless families in Britain has doubled since 1978, while the enforced repossession of homes is at an all-time record because. Because so many can no longer manage to maintain mortgage payments, even more people, meanwhile, try to cope as best they can in derelict, often dangerous dwellings. One and a quarter million homes are unfit to live in, while house building investment throughout Britain has been slashed by 60 percent since 1979. Sickness and ill health of all kinds are rampant, and they are made even more terrible by the crisis in the national health service and throughout the welfare system. The Tories have been utterly ruthless in their butchery of health and welfare provisions. The NHS, once the pride of our nation, has been reduced to a critical condition through hospital closures, medical staff cutbacks, the lack and withdrawal of resources and vital equipment, and the privatization of key services. Approximately 700,000 people await today for hospital treatment, and an increasing number will not receive that treatment before it is too late. Thousands of people who are suffering from serious, often fatal diseases are being turned away through lack of hospital beds and staff. Our social services are faced with ever-increasing family and community problems as Tory attacks take their toll, with children and old people among those most vulnerable. Our education system is also in chaos as students and teachers struggle against yet more cutbacks, fewer resources, and for our youngsters it must seem often a pointless exercise. With jobs, training, and access to higher education becoming more and more difficult to attain, their teachers, meanwhile, like many other trade unionists, have had their negotiating rights removed by the government and their commitment to teaching the nation's children treated with contempt. This has become a grim and desperate society, fueled by unemployment and its social consequences. Frustration, rage, and despair are rampant all around us. More and more people, I believe, are coming to see themselves as under attack, and they are correct.
Arthur Scargill, Criticism of Tory Policies. We are indeed facing a deliberate political attack by Britain's ruling class. A war of attrition is being waged as capitalism, in a condition of acute crisis, lashes out with increasing ferocity to protect itself. The existence of this crisis is now clear for all to see. It has been exposed by the recent collapse of stock markets throughout the capitalist world. Triggered off by the slide on Wall Street, which, according to experts, is the worst slump since 1929, this collapse will, in my view, lead inevitably to more hardship for the British people. With a massive increase in unemployment and reduced living standards, as capitalism seeks once again to make working people pay for its pursuit of profit and power. The Tories have based their savage policies on an ideology called monetarism. It is this philosophy which has led to the virtual destruction of our manufacturing industries, and in particular, to the devastation of our coal, rail, and steel industries. The steel industry has lost over 150,000 jobs, and the coal and rail industries have lost approximately 100,000 each within a period of eight years. Parts of our nation, such as South Wales, have been reduced to a lunar landscape as the Tories have systematically butchered our manufacturing and industrial infrastructure. In seeking to win that absolute control, which it must have for even limited survival, the state, through the Tory government, has introduced twin measures to destroy or render ineffective all those who oppose it. On the one hand, it has deliberately increased unemployment from just over one million to four and a half million in eight years, creating, as in the 1930s, a situation where 30 to 40 people pursue each job vacancy, driven by this emotional blackmail to increasing fear. At the same time, it has introduced vicious legal measures designed to render the British trade union movement completely ineffective. Indeed, Margaret Thatcher has made it absolutely clear that she wants to wipe socialism off the agenda of British politics. To achieve this aim, the Tories are determined also to wipe effective trade unionism off the industrial agenda. Since 1979, we have seen a whole range of anti-trade union legislation. All of it designed to dismantle the gains achieved by trade unionists in more than a century of struggle. Today, the extent of this legislation is such that Britain's trade union movement must now be regarded as one of the most oppressed in the world. Tory legislation has removed trade union immunity, made secondary action, including secondary picketing and mass picketing, illegal, and rendered all trade unions vulnerable to legal actions, which could result in their bankruptcy. Britain's trade unions have found themselves no longer free to determine their own policies in relation to industrial solidarity action. Arthur Scargill, criticism of Tory policies. Not satisfied, however, with the most vicious anti-union legislation in the world, the Tories are currently introducing new measures which are so draconian they have staggered and brought forth opposition even from some traditional enemies of the trade union movement. The steps taken against British trade unionism can probably only be compared with those taken against our German comrades by Hitler in the 1930s. If this new Tory legislation is left unchallenged, then civil liberties and human rights in Britain are in danger of being wiped out. As life in Britain becomes harder, as frustrations and tensions rise, the state must bring into play all the elements of its machinery in order to suppress any attempts to throw off its power. The police are used increasingly in paramilitary fashion. The judiciary use greater ruthlessness against any trade union that attempts to stand by its rules and constitution, as the experience of the National Union of Mine Workers over the past four years proves. The courts have dealt justice savagely with the Lambeth and Liverpool councillors who refused to betray the commitments made to their communities. Meanwhile, the media, now quite openly under the control of international capitalists such as Murdoch and Maxwell, become even more blatantly the mouthpiece of Tory philosophy. 
The British capitalist press can make no claim to either objectivity or integrity, whether through the gutter journalism of the tabloids or the more restrained style of the so-called quality papers. They both play a key role in the daily dissemination of lies and misinformation to the public. This is but an outline of the situation which today faces the British labour and trade union movement. The terrible irony about it is that whilst throughout our movement there is general agreement on the ravages of the Tory attack and agreement that it should be stopped, we have not united in an effective force to combat those ravages and challenge the system which has forced them onto our class. On the contrary, rather than uniting to fight our common enemy, our movement has been diverted time and time again by internal attacks—attacks attacks aimed disgracefully at the very sections which have fought so bravely to carry out Labour Party and TUC policies by battling to save jobs, industries, communities, and services. Margaret Thatcher has been absolutely clear in recognizing her enemy. It is socialism, and she has openly declared her intention of wiping it off the British agenda. Dwight D. Eisenhower, the military-industrial complex. This evening, I come to you with a message of leave-taking and farewell, and to share a few final thoughts with you, my countrymen. We now stand ten years past the midpoint of a century that has witnessed four major wars among great nations. Three of these involved our own country. Despite these holocausts, America is today the strongest, the most influential, and most productive nation in the world. Understandably proud of this preeminence, we yet realize that America's leadership and prestige depend not merely upon our unmatched material progress, riches, and military strength, but on how we use our power in the interests of world peace and human betterment. A vital element in keeping the peace is our military establishment. Our arms must be mighty, ready for instant action, so that no potential aggressor may be tempted to risk his own destruction. Our military organization today bears little relation to that known by any of my predecessors in peacetime, or indeed by the fighting men of World War II or Korea. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. Now, this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Harriet Tubman. Before the American Civil War, the economy of the Southern states was based on the use of slave labor. The social and political leaders of the Old South were the plantation owners. Many of these owned hundreds of black slaves. The slaves were mainly used to pick crops like cotton and tobacco. Harriet Tubman was born in 1820 in the state of Maryland. As a girl of seven, she was sent into the fields to work with the adult slaves. The slaves worked from sunrise to sunset picking the crops. Often they sang songs while they worked. Slaves were not taught to read or write. It was feared that reading and writing would help slaves to escape the plantations. Harriet Tubman was illiterate. Later in life, when she was in danger of being captured, she picked up a book and pretended to read it. This fooled the bounty hunters. When she was fifteen, Harriet helped another slave to escape. The overseer was so angry with her that he hit her over the head with an iron weight. Harriet was knocked unconscious for many days. 
All the rest of her life, she suffered from headaches and sudden sleeping spells. Harriet escaped from the plantation to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Since Pennsylvania was not a slave state, Harriet was fairly safe there. She was able to return secretly to the plantation and bring the rest of her family to freedom. There were already people working to bring black slaves up from the South to freedom. These people, both white and black, used the language of the railroad. Escaped slaves were called passengers. Safe houses were called stations, and the guides were called conductors. Harriet soon became a conductor in the Underground Railway. In 1850, the American government passed a second Fugitive Slave Act. This put more pressure on northern states to return escaped slaves to the South. Because of this, the Underground Railway went further north to Canada. In 1793, Upper Canada, Ontario, had passed a law bringing a gradual stop to slavery. In 1834, slavery was abolished in the whole British Empire. A lot of escaped slaves had come to Canada before 1850, but now nearly all escaped slaves tried to go there. Harriet Tubman rented a house in St. Catharines, Ontario. This provided a shelter for new arrivals. Harriet made about 11 trips from Canada to the U.S. during these years. In all, she brought back about 300 people. Escaped slaves had to travel by night and suffered hardships in bad weather. They had to hide during the day wherever they could. Harriet did not allow any passengers to turn back. That might endanger the whole underground railway. When the slave owners heard about Harriet, they offered a reward for her capture, but no one caught her or turned her in. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, she acted as a spy for the Northern States. After the war, she married a black American soldier, Nelson Davis. In 1869, a book was written about Harriet Tubman. Black slaves knew Harriet as Moses. The Bible tells the story of how Moses led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. He led them north to Palestine. In the same way, Harriet Tubman delivered many of her people from slavery and led them north to freedom. Dwight D. Eisenhower, the military-industrial complex. Happily, I can say that war has been avoided. Steady progress toward our ultimate goal has been made, but so much remains to be done. As a private citizen, I shall never cease to do what little I can to help the world advance along that road. So, in this my last good night to you as your president, I thank you for the many opportunities you have given me for public service in war and in peace. I trust that in that service you find some things worthy. As for the rest of it, I know you will find ways to improve performance in the future. To all the peoples of the world, I once more give expression to America's prayerful and continuing aspiration. We pray that peoples of all faiths, all races, all nations may have their great human needs satisfied. That those now denied opportunity shall come to enjoy it to the full. That all who yearn for freedom may experience its spiritual blessings, that those who have freedom will understand also its heavy responsibilities, that all who are insensitive to the needs of others will learn charity, that the scourges of poverty, disease, and ignorance will be made to disappear from the earth, and that in the goodness of time all peoples will come to live together in a peace guaranteed by the binding force of mutual respect and love. Now on Friday noon, I am to become a private citizen. I am proud to do so. I look forward to it. Thank you and good night. Prince Charles' ugly buildings. At last, people are beginning to see that it is possible and important in human terms to respect old buildings, street plans, and traditional scales, and at the same time, not to feel guilty about a preference for facades, ornaments, and soft materials. At last, after witnessing the wholesale destruction of Georgian and Victorian housing in most of our cities, people have begun to realize that it is possible to restore old buildings, and what is more, that there are architects willing to undertake such projects. For far too long, it seems to me, some planners and architects have consistently ignored the feelings and wishes of the mass of ordinary people in this country. 
Perhaps, when you think about it, it is hardly surprising as architects tend to have been trained to design buildings from scratch, to tear down and rebuild. A large number of us have developed a feeling that architects tend to design houses for the approval of fellow architects and critics, not for the tenants. To be concerned about the way people live, about the environment they inhabit, and the kind of community that is created by that environment should surely be one of the prime requirements of a really good architect. It has been most encouraging to see the development of community architecture as a natural reaction to the policy of decanting people to new towns and overspill estates where the extended family patterns of support were destroyed and the community life was lost. Now, moreover, we are seeing the gradual expansion of housing cooperatives, particularly in the inner city areas of Liverpool, where the tenants are able to work with an architect of their own who listens to their comments and their ideas and tries to design the kind of environment they want, rather than the kind which tends to be imposed upon them without any degree of choice. What I believe is important about community architecture is that it has shown ordinary people that their views are worth having. That architects and planners do not necessarily have the monopoly of knowing best about taste, style, and planning. That they need not be made to feel guilty or ignorant if their natural preference is for the more traditional designs, for a small garden, for courtyards, arches, and porches, and that there is a growing number of architects prepared to listen and to offer imaginative ideas. It would be a tragedy if the character and skyline of our capital city were to be further ruined, and St. Paul's dwarfed by yet another giant glass stump, better suited to downtown Chicago than the city of London. It is hard to imagine that London, before the last war, must have had one of the most beautiful skylines of any great city, if those who recall it are to be believed. Those who do say that the affinity between buildings and the earth, in spite of the city's immense size, was so close and organic that the houses looked almost as though they had grown out of the earth and had not been imposed upon it. Grown, moreover, in such a way that as few trees as possible were thrust out of the way. Those who knew it then and loved it, as so many British love Venice without concrete stumps and glass towers, and those who can imagine what it was like, must associate with the sentiments in one of Aldous Huxley's earliest and most successful novels, *Antic Hay*, where the main character, an unsuccessful architect, reveals a model of London as Christopher Wren wanted to rebuild it after the Great Fire, and describes how Wren was so obsessed with the opportunity the fire gave the city to rebuild itself into a greater and more glorious vision. What then are we doing to our capital city now? What have we done to it since the bombing during the war? What are we shortly going to do to one of its most famous areas, Trafalgar Square? Instead of designing an extension to the elegant facade of the National Gallery, which complements it and continues the concept of columns and domes, it looks as if we may be presented with a kind of vast municipal fire station, complete with the sort of tower that contains the siren. I would understand better this type of high-tech approach if you demolish the whole of Trafalgar Square and started again with a single architect responsible for the entire layout. But what is proposed is like a monstrous carbuncle on the face of a much-loved and elegant friend. Apart from anything else, it defeats me why anyone wishing to display the early Renaissance pictures belonging to the gallery should do so in a new gallery so manifestly at odds with the whole spirit of that age of astonishing proportion. Why can't we have those curves and arches that express feeling and design? What is wrong with them? Why has everything got to be vertical, straight, unbending, only at right angles, and functional? Robert Runcie, after the Falklands War. Our hope as Christians is not fundamentally in man's naked good will and rationality. We believe that he can overcome the deadly selfishness of class or sect or race by discovering himself as a child of the universal God of Love. When a man realizes that he is a beloved child of the Creator of all, then he is ready to see his neighbors in the world as brothers and sisters. That is one reason why those who dare to interpret God's will must never claim Him as an asset for one nation or group rather than another. War springs from the love and loyalty which should be offered to God, being applied to some God substitute. One of the most dangerous being nationalism.
This is a dangerous world where evil is at work, nourishing the mindless brutality which killed and maimed so many in this city last week. Sometimes, with the greatest reluctance, force is necessary to hold back the chaos which injustice and the irrational element in man threaten to make of the world. But having said that, all is not lost, and there is hope. Even in the failure of war, there are springs of hope. In that great war play by Shakespeare, Henry V says, "There is some soul of goodness in things evil. Would men observingly distill it out?" People are mourning on both sides of this conflict. In our prayers, we shall quite rightly remember those who are bereaved in our own country and the relations of the young Argentinian soldiers who were killed. Common sorrow should do something to reunite those who were engaged in this struggle. A shared anguish can be a bridge of reconciliation. Our neighbors are indeed like us. I have had an avalanche of letters and advice about this service. Some correspondents have asked, "Why drag God in?" As if the intention was to wheel up God to endorse some particular policy or attitude rather than another. The purpose of prayer and of services like this is very different, and there is hope for the world in the difference. In our prayers, we come into the presence of the living God. We come with our very human emotions, pride in achievement and courage, grief at loss and waste. We come as we are, and not just mouthing opinions and thanksgiving, which the fashion of the moment judges acceptable. As we pour into prayer our mourning, our pride, our shame, and our convictions, which will inevitably differ from person to person, if we are really present and really reaching out to God and not just demanding His endorsement, then God is able to work upon us. He is able to deepen and enlarge our compassion and to purify our thanksgiving. The parent who comes mourning the loss of a son may find here consolation, but also a spirit which enlarges our compassion to include all those Argentinian parents who have lost sons. Robert Runcie after the Falklands War. Man without God finds it difficult to achieve this revolution inside himself. But talk of peace and reconciliation is just fanciful and theoretical unless we are prepared to undergo such a revolution. Many of the reports I have heard about the troops engaged in this war refer to moments when soldiers have been brought face to face with what is fundamental in life and have found new sources of strength and compassion even in the midst of conflict. Ironically, it has sometimes been those spectators who remained at home, whether supporters or opponents of the conflict, who continue to be most violent in their attitudes and untouched in their deepest selves. Man without God is less than man. In meeting God, a man is shown his failures and his lack of integrity, but he is also given strength to turn more and more of his life and actions into love and compassion for other men like himself. It is necessary to the continuance of life on this planet that more and more people make this discovery. We have been the choice. Man possesses the power to obliterate himself, sacrificing the whole race on the altar of some god substitute, or he can choose life in partnership with God, the Father of all. I believe there is evidence that more and more people are waking up to the realization that this crucial decision peers us in the face here and now. Cathedrals and churches are always places into which we bring human experiences, birth. Marriage, death, our flickering communion with God, our fragile relationships with each other, so that they may be deepened and directed by the Spirit of Christ. Today we bring our mixture of thanksgiving, sorrows, and aspirations for a better ordering of this world. Pray God that He may purify, enlarge, and redirect these in the ways of His kingdom of love and peace. Amen. Salman Rushdie, Life Under Threat. A hot air balloon drifts slowly over a bottomless chasm, carrying several passengers. A leak develops. The balloon starts losing height. The pit, a dark yawn, comes closer. Good grief! The wounded balloon can bear just one passenger to safety.
The many must be sacrificed to save the one. But who should live? Who should die? And who could make such a choice? In point of fact, debating societies everywhere regularly make such choices without qualms. For of course, what I've described is the given situation of that evergreen favorite, the balloon debate, in which, as the speakers argue over the relative merits and demerits of the well-known figures they have placed in disaster's mouth, the assembled company blithely accepts the faintly unpleasant idea that a human being's right to life is increased or diminished by his or her virtues or vices. That we may be born equal, but thereafter our lives weigh differently in the scales. It's only make-believe, after all, and while it may not be very nice, it does reflect how people actually think. I have now spent over a thousand days in just such a balloon, but alas, this isn't a game. For most of these thousand days, my fellow travelers included the Western hostages in Lebanon and the British businessmen imprisoned in Iran and Iraq, Roger Cooper and Ian Richter. And I had to accept, and did accept, that for most of my countrymen and countrywomen, my plight counted for less than the others. In any choice between us, I'd have been the first to be pitched out of the basket and into the abyss. Our lives teach us who we are. I wrote at the end of my essay in Food Faith. Some of the lessons have been harsh and difficult to learn. Trapped inside a metaphor, I've often felt the need to re-describe it, to change the terms. This isn't so much a balloon I've wanted to say as a bubble within which I'm simultaneously exposed and sealed off. The bubble floats above and through the world, depriving me of reality, reducing me to an abstraction. For many people, I've ceased to be a human being. I've become an issue, a bother, an affair. Bulletproofed bubbles like this one are reality-proof too. Those who travel in them, like those who wear Tolkien's rings of invisibility, become wraith-like if they're not careful. They get lost. In this phantom space, a man may become the bubble that encases him, and then one day, pop, he's gone forever. It's ridiculous, isn't it, to have to say, "But I am a human being, unjustly accused, unjustly embubbled." Or is it I who am being ridiculous as I call out from my bubble, "I'm still trapped in here, folks. Somebody, please get me out." Salman Rushdie, Life Under Threat. Out there, where you are in the rich and powerful and lucky West, has it really been so long since religions persecuted people, burning them as heretics, drowning them as witches, that you can't recognize religious persecution when you see it? The original metaphor has reasserted itself. I'm back in the balloon, asking for the right to live. What is my single life worth? Despair whispers in my ear. Not a lot, but I refuse to give in to despair. I refuse to give in to despair because I've been shown love as well as hatred. I know that many people do care and are appalled by the crazy upside-down logic of the post-fatwa world, in which a single novelist can be accused of having savaged or mugged a whole community, becoming its tormentor instead of its tarred and feathered victim, and the scapegoat for all its discontents. Many people do ask, for example. When a white pop star turned Islamic fanatic speaks approvingly about killing an Indian immigrant, how does the Indian immigrant end up being called the racist? Or again, what minority is smaller and weaker than a minority of one? I refuse to give in to despair, even though for a thousand days and more I've been put through a degree course in worthlessness, my own personal and specific worthlessness. My first teachers were the mobs marching down distant boulevards, baying for my blood, and finding soon enough their echoes on the English streets. I could not understand the force that makes parents hang murderous slogans around their children's necks. I have learned to understand it. It burns books and effigies and thinks itself holy. But at first, as I watched the marchers, I felt them trampling on my heart. Once again, however, I have been saved by instances of fair-mindedness, of goodness. Every time I learn that a reader somewhere has been touched by the satanic verses, moved and entertained and stimulated by it, it arouses deep feelings in me. And there are more and more such readers nowadays. My post bag tells me readers, including Muslims, who are willing to give my burned, spurned child a fair hearing at long last. Sometimes I think that one day Muslims will be ashamed of what Muslims did in these times. Will find the Rushdie affair as improbable as the West now finds martyr burning. 
One day they may agree that, as the European Enlightenment demonstrated, freedom of thought is precisely freedom from religious control, freedom from accusations of blasphemy. Maybe they'll agree too that the row over the satanic verses was at the bottom of an argument about who should have power over the grand narrative, the story of Islam, and that power must belong equally to everyone. That even if my novel were incompetent, its attempt to retell the story would still be important. That if I failed, others must succeed, because those who do not have power over the story that dominates their lives, power to retell it, rethink it, deconstruct it, joke about it, and change it as times change, truly are powerless, because they cannot think new thoughts. Salman Rushdie, Life Under Threat. One day, maybe, but not today. Today, my education in worthlessness continues. And what Sal Bello would call my reality instructors include the media pundit who suggests that a manly death would be better for me than hiding like a rat, the letter writer who points out that of course the trouble is that I look like the devil and wonders if I have hairy shanks and cloven hooves, the moderate Muslim who writes to say that Muslims find it revolting when I speak about the Iranian death threats. It's not the fatwa that's revolting, you understand, but my mention of it. The rather more immoderate Muslim who tells me to shut up, explaining that if a fly is caught in a spider's web, it should not attract the attention of the spider. I ask the reader to imagine how it might feel to be intellectually and emotionally bludgeoned from a thousand different directions every day for a thousand days and more. Back in the balloon, something longed for and heartening has happened. On this occasion, Mirabel Dictu, the many have not been sacrificed but saved. That is to say, my companions, the Western hostages and the gold businessmen, have, by good fortune and the efforts of others, managed to descend safely to earth and have been reunited with their families and friends, with their own free lives. I rejoice for them and admire their courage, their resilience. And now I am alone in the balloon. Surely I'll be safe now. Surely now the balloon will drop safely towards some nearby haven, and I too will be reunited with my life. Surely it's my turn now. But the balloon is over the chasm again, and it's still sinking. I realize that it's carrying a great deal of valuable freight, trading relations, armaments deals, the balance of power in the Gulf. These and other matters of great moment are weighing down the balloon. I hear voices suggesting that if I stay aboard, this precious cargo will be endangered. The national interest is being redefined. Am I being redefined out of it? Am I to be jettisoned after all? When Britain renewed relations with Iran at the United Nations in 1990, the senior British official in charge of the negotiations assured me in unambiguous language that something very substantial had been achieved on my behalf. The Iranians, laughing merrily, had secretly agreed to forget the fatwa. The diplomat put great stress on this cheery Iranian laughter. They would neither encourage nor allow their citizens, surrogates or proxies, to act against me. Oh, how I wanted to believe that! But in the year and a bit that followed, we saw the fatwa restated in Iran. The bounty money doubled. The book's Italian translator severely wounded. Its Japanese translator stabbed to death. There was news of an attempt to find and kill me by contract killers working directly for the Iranian government through its European embassies. Another such contract was successfully carried out in Paris. The victim being the harmless and aged ex-prime minister of Iran, Shapur Bakhtiar. Salman Rushdie, life under threat. It seems reasonable to deduce that the secret deal made at the United Nations hasn't worked. Dismayingly, however, the talk as I write is all of improving relations with Iran still further, while the Rushdie case is described as a side issue. Is this a balloon I'm in, or the dustbin of history? Let me be clear: there is nothing I can do to break this impasse. The fatwa was politically motivated to begin with. It remains a breach of international law, and it can only be solved at the political level. To affect the release of the Western hostages in Lebanon, great levers were moved. Great forces were brought into play. For Mr. Richter, seventy million in frozen Iraqi assets were thawed. What then is a novelist under terrorist attack worth? Despair murmurs once again, not a plug nickel. But I refuse to give in to despair. You may ask why I'm so sure there's nothing I can do to help myself out of this jam. 
At the end of 1990, dispirited and demoralized, feeling abandoned even then in consequence of the British government's decision to patch things up with Iran and with my marriage at an end, I faced my deepest grief, my unquenchable sorrow at having been torn away from, cast out of, the cultures and societies from which I'd always drawn my strength and inspiration, that is, the broad community of British Asians and the broader community of Indian Muslims. I determined to make my peace with Islam, even at the cost of my pride. Those who were surprised and displeased by what I did perhaps failed to see that I was not some deracinated Uncle Tom Wog. To these people it was apparently incomprehensible that I should seek to make peace between the warring halves of the world, which were also the warring halves of my soul, and that I should seek to do so in a spirit of humility instead of the arrogance so often attributed to me. In In Good Faith I wrote, Perhaps a way forward might be found through the mutual recognition of our mutual pain, but even moderate Muslims had trouble with this notion. What pain, they asked, could I possibly have suffered? What was I talking about? As a result, the really important conversations I had in this period were with myself. I said, Salman, you must send a message loud enough to be heard all over the world. You must make ordinary Muslims see that you aren't their enemy and make the West understand a little more of the complexity of Muslim culture. It was my hope that Westerners might say, well, if he's the one in danger and yet he's willing to acknowledge the importance of his Muslim roots, then perhaps we ought to start thinking a little less stereotypically ourselves. No such luck, though. The message you send isn't always the one that's received. Salman Rushdie, Life Under Threat And I said to myself, Admit it, Salman, the story of Islam has a deeper meaning for you than any of the other grand narratives. Of course, you're no mystic, mister, and when you wrote, I am not a Muslim, that's what you meant. No supernaturalism, no literalist orthodoxies, no formal rules for you. But Islam doesn't have to mean blind faith. It can mean blind faith. It can mean what it always meant in your family, a culture, a civilization, as open-minded as your grandfather was, as delightedly disputatious as your father was, as intellectual and philosophical as you like. Don't let zealots make Muslim a terrifying word, I urged myself. Remember what it meant, family and light. I reminded myself that I had always argued that it was necessary to develop the nascent concept of the secular Muslim, who, like the secular Jews, affirmed his membership of the culture while being separate from the theology. I had recently read the contemporary Muslim philosopher Fuad Zakaria's Alaicite u Islamisme, and have been encouraged by Zakaria's attempt to modernize Islamic thought. But, Solomon, I told myself, you can't argue from outside the debating chamber. You've got to cross the threshold, go inside the room, and then fight for your humanized, historicized, secularized way of being a Muslim. I recalled my near namesake, the 12th century philosopher Ibn Rushd Avaros, who argued that, to quote the great Arab historian Albert Hurani, not all the words of the Quran should be taken literally. When the literal meaning of Quranic verses appeared to contradict the truths to which philosophers arrived by the exercise of reason, those verses needed to be interpreted metaphorically. But Ibn Rushad was a snob. Having pronounced an idea far in advance of its time, he qualified it by saying that such sophistication was only suitable for the elite. Literalism would do for the masses. Solomon, I asked myself, is it time to pick up Ibn Rushad's banner and carry it forward? To say, nowadays, such ideas are fit for everybody, for the beggar as well as the prince. It was with such things in mind, and with my thoughts in a state of some confusion and torment, that I spoke the Muslim creed before witnesses. But my fantasy of joining the fight for the modernization of Muslim thought, for freedom from the shackles of the thought police, was stillborn. It never really had a chance. Too many people had spent too long demonizing and totemizing me to listen seriously to what I had to say. In the West, some friends turned against me, called me by yet another set of insulting names. Now I was spineless, pathetic, debased. I had betrayed myself, my cause. Above all, I had betrayed them. I also found myself up against the granite, heartless certainties of actually existing Islam, by which I mean the political and priestly power structure that presently dominates and stifles Muslim societies. Actually existing Islam has failed to create a free society anywhere on earth, and it wasn't about to let me, of all people, argue in favor of one. Salman Rushdie, Life Under Threat
Suddenly, I was, metaphorically, among people whose social attitudes I'd fought for all my life. For example, their attitudes about women. One Islamicist boasted to me that his wife would cut his toenails while he made telephone calls, and suggested I find such a spouse. Or about gays. One of the imams I met in December 1990 was on TV soon afterwards denouncing Muslim gays as sick creatures who brought shame on their families and who ought to seek medical and psychiatric help. Had I truly fallen in among such people? That was not what I meant at all. Facing the intransigence, the Philistine scorn of so much of actually existing Islam, I reluctantly concluded that there was no way for me to help bring into the Muslim culture I dreamed of the progressive, irreverent, skeptical, argumentative, playful, and unafraid culture, which is what I've always understood as freedom. Not me, not in this lifetime, no chance. Actually existing Islam, which has all but deified its prophet, a man who always fought passionately against such deification, which has supplanted a priest-free religion by a priest-ridden one, which makes literalism a weapon and redescriptions a crime, which will never let the likes of me in. Ibn Rushd's ideas were silenced in their time, and throughout the Muslim world today, progressive ideas are in retreat. Actually existing Islam reigns supreme, and just as the recently destroyed actually existing socialism of the Soviet terror state was horrifically unlike the utopia of peace and equality of which democratic socialists have dreamed, so also is actually existing Islam a force to which I have never given in, to which I cannot submit. There is a point beyond which conciliation looks like capitulation. I do not believe I pass the point, but others have thought otherwise. I have never disowned my book, nor regretted writing it. I said I was sorry to have offended people, because I had not set out to do so, and so I am. I explained that writers do not agree with every word spoken by every character they create, a truism in the world of books, but a continuing mystery to the satanic verse's opponents. I have always said that this novel has been traduced. Indeed, the chief benefit of my meeting with the six Islamic scholars on Christmas Eve 1990 was that they agreed that the novel had no insulting motives. In Islam, it is a man's intention that counts, I was told. Now we will launch a worldwide campaign on your behalf to explain that there has been a great mistake. All this with much smiling and friendliness and handshaking. It was in this context that I agreed to suspend, not cancel, a paperback edition to create what I called a space for reconciliation. Salman Rushdie, Life Under Threat Alas, I overestimated these men. Within days, all but one of them had broken their promises and recommended to vilify me and my work as if we had not shaken hands. I felt, most probably I had been, a great fool. The suspension of the paperback began at once to look like surrender. In the aftermath of the attacks on my translators, it looks even more craven. It has now been more than three years since the Satanic Verses was published. That's a long, long space for reconciliation. Long enough. I accept that I was wrong to have given way on this point. The Satanic Verses must be freely available and easily affordable, if only because, if it is not read and studied, then these years will have no meaning. Those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. Our lives teach us who we are. I have learned the hard way that when you permit anyone else's description of reality to supplant your own, and such descriptions have been raining down on me from security advisors, governments, journalists, archbishops, friends, enemies, mullahs, then you might as well be dead. Obviously, a rigid, blinkered, absolutist worldview is the easiest to keep hold of, whereas the fluid, uncertain, metamorphic picture I've always carried about is rather more vulnerable. Yet I must cling with all my might to that chameleon, that chimera, that space shifter, my own soul, must hold on to its mischievous, iconoclastic, out-of-step clown instincts, no matter how great the storm. And if that plunges me into contradiction and paradox, so be it. I've lived in that messy ocean all my life. I fished in it for my art. This turbulent sea was the sea outside my bedroom window in Bombay. It is the sea by which I was born, and which I carry within me wherever I go. Free speech is a non-starter, says one of my Islamic extremist opponents. No, sir, it's not. Free speech is the whole thing, the whole ballgame. Free speech is life itself. 
That's the end of my speech from this ailing balloon. Now it's time to answer the question, what is my single life worth? Is it worth more or less than the fat contracts and political treaties that are in here with me? Is it worth more or less than good relations with a country which, in April 1991, gave 800 women 74 lashes each for not wearing a veil? In which the 80-year-old writer Mariam Perus is still in goal and has been tortured, and whose foreign minister says, in response to criticism of his country's lamentable human rights record, international monitoring of the human rights situation in Iran should not continue indefinitely. Iran could not tolerate such monitoring for long. You must decide what you think a friend is worth to his friends, what you think a son is worth to his mother, or a father to his son. You must decide what a man's conscience and heart and soul are worth. You must decide what you think a writer is worth, what value you place on a maker of stories and an arguer with the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the balloon is sinking into the abyss. Pope John Paul II, The Defense of Poland our Lady of Jasna Gora is the teacher of true love for all, and this is particularly important for you, dear young people. In you, in fact, is decided that form of love which all of your life will have, and through you, human life on Polish soil. The matrimonial, family, social, and national form, but also the priestly, religious, and missionary one. Every life is determined and evaluated by the interior form of love. Tell me what you love, and I will tell you who you are. I watch. How beautiful it is that this word is found in the call of Jasnagora. It possesses a profound evangelical ancestry. Christ says many times, Watch, Matthew 26.41. Perhaps also from the gospel it passed into the tradition of scouring. In the call of Jasnagora, it is the essential element of the reply that we wish to give to the love by which we are surrounded in the sign of the sacred icon. The response to this love must be precisely the fact that I watch. What does it mean, I watch? It means that I make an effort to be a person with a conscience. I do not stifle this conscience, and I do not deform it. I call good and evil by name, and I do not blur them. I develop in myself what is good, and I seek to correct what is evil by overcoming it in myself. This is a fundamental problem which can never be minimized or put on a secondary level. No, it is everywhere, and always a matter of the first importance. Its importance is all the greater, in proportion to the increase of circumstances which seem to favor our tolerance of evil, and the fact that we easily excuse ourselves from this, especially if adults do so. My dear friends, it is up to you to put up a firm barrier against immorality, a barrier, I say, to those social vices which I will not here call by name, but which you yourselves are perfectly aware of. You must demand this of yourselves, even if others do not demand it of you. Historical experiences tell us how much the immorality of certain periods costs the whole nation. Today, when we are fighting for the future form of our social life, remember that this form depends on what people will be like. Therefore, watch. Christ said to the apostles during his prayer in Gethsemane, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Matthew 26, 41. I watch also means I see another. I do not close in on myself. In a narrow search for my own interests, my own judgments. I watch means love of neighbor. It means fundamental, interhuman solidarity. Before the mother of Jasnagora, I wish to give thanks for all the proofs of this solidarity which have been given by my compatriots, including Polish youth, in the difficult period of not many months ago. It would be difficult for me to enumerate here all the forms of the solicitude which surrounded those who were interned, imprisoned, dismissed from work, and also their families. You know this better than I. I received only sporadic news about it. Pope John Paul II, The Defense of Poland May this good thing, which appeared in so many places and so many ways, never cease on Polish soil. May there be a constant confirmation of that I watch of the call of Jasnagora, which is a response to the presence of the Mother of Christ in the great family of the Poles. I watch also means I feel responsible for this great common inheritance whose name is Poland. This name defines us all. This name obliges us all. This name costs us all. 
Perhaps at times we envy the French, the Germans, or the Americans because their name is not tied to such a historical price and because they are so easily free, while our Polish freedom costs so much. My dear ones, I will not make a comparative analysis. I will only say that it is what costs that constitutes value. It is not, in fact, possible to be truly free without an honest and profound relationship with values. We do not want a Poland which costs us nothing. We watch instead beside all that makes up the authentic inheritance of the generations, seeking to enrich it. A nation then is first of all rich in its people, rich in man, rich in youth, rich in every individual who watches in the name of truth. It is truth, in fact, that gives form to love. My dear young friends, before our common mother and the queen of our hearts, I desire finally to say to you that she knows your sufferings, your difficult youth, your sense of injustice and humiliation, the lack of prospects for the future that is so often felt, perhaps the temptations to flee to some other world. Even if I am not among you every day, as was the case for many years in the past, nevertheless I carry in my heart a great solicitude, a great enormous solicitude. A solicitude for you, precisely because on you depends tomorrow. I pray for you every day. It is good that we are here together at the hour of the call of Jasnagora, in the midst of the trials of the present time, in the midst of the trial through which your generation is passing. This call of the millennium continues to be a program. In it is contained a fundamental way out. Because the way out, in whatever dimension—economic, social, political—must happen first in man. Man cannot remain with no way out. Mother of Jasnagora, you who have been given to us by providence for the defense of the Polish nation, accept this evening this call of the Polish youth, together with the Polish Pope, and help us to persevere in hope. Amen. Richard Nixon, farewell speech. You are here to say goodbye to us, and we don't have a good word for it in English. The best is au revoir. We will see you again. Sure, we have done some things wrong in this administration, and the top man always takes the responsibility, and I have never ducked it. But I want to say one thing: we can be proud of it. Five and a half years. No man or no woman came into this administration and left it with more of this world's goods than when he came in. No man or no woman ever profited at the public expense or the public till. That tells something about you. Mistakes, yes, but for personal gain, never. You did what you believed in. Sometimes right, sometimes wrong. And I only wish that I were a wealthy man at the present time. I have got to find a way to pay my taxes, and if I were, I would like to recompense you for the sacrifices that all of you have made to serve in government. But you are getting something in government, and I want you to tell this to your children, and I hope the nation's children will hear it too. Something in government service that is far more important than money. It is a cause bigger than yourself. It is the cause of making this the greatest nation in the world, the leader of the world. Because without our leadership, the world will know nothing but war, possibly starvation, or worse, in the years ahead. With our leadership, it will know peace. It will know plenty. We think sometimes when things happen that don't go the right way. We think that when you don't pass the bar exam the first time, I happened to, but I was just lucky. I mean, my writing was so poor. The bar examiner said, "We have just got to let the guy through." We think that when someone dear to us dies, we think that when we lose an election, we think that when we suffer a defeat, that all is ended. Not true. It is only a beginning. Always, the young must know it. The old must know it. It must always sustain us. Because the greatness comes not when things go always good for you, but the greatness comes and you are really tested when you take some knocks, some disappointments, when sadness comes. Because only if you have been in the deepest valley can you ever know how magnificent it is to be on the highest mountain. Tony Benn, the importance of democracy. Some people genuinely believe that we shall never get social justice from the British government, but we shall get it from Jacques Delors. They believe that a good king is better than a bad parliament. I have never taken that view. Others believe that the change is inevitable, and that the common currency will protect us from inflation and will provide a wage policy. They believe that it will control speculation and that Britain cannot survive alone. None of those arguments persuade me because the argument has never been about sovereignty.
I do not know what a sovereign is apart from the one that used to be in gold and the Pope, who is sovereign in the Vatican. We are talking about democracy. No nation, not even the great United States, which could, for all I know, be destroyed by a nuclear weapon from a third world country, has the power to impose its will on other countries. We are discussing whether the British people are to be allowed to elect those who make the laws under which they are governed. The argument is nothing to do with whether we should get more maternity leave from Madame Papandreou than from Madame Thatcher. That is not the issue. I recognize that when the members of the three front benches agree, I am in a minority. My next job, therefore, is to explain to the people of Chesterfield what we have decided. I will say first, my dear constituents, in future you will be governed by people whom you do not elect and cannot remove. I am sorry about it. They may give you better creches and shorter working hours, but you cannot remove them. I know that it sounds negative, but I have always thought it is positive to say that the important thing about democracy is that we can remove without bloodshed the people who govern us. We can get rid of a Callahan, a Wilson, or even a Right Honourable Lady by internal processes. We can get rid of a Right Honourable Member for Huntington, Mr. Major. But that cannot be done in the structure that it is proposed. Even if one likes the policies of the people in Europe, one cannot get rid of them. Secondly, we say to my favorite friends, the Chartists and suffragettes, all your struggles to get control of the ballot box were a waste of time. We shall be run in future by a few white persons, as in 1832. The instrument, I might add, is the royal prerogative of treaty making. For the first time since 1649, the Crown makes the laws, advised, I admit, by the Prime Minister. We must ask what will happen when people realize what we have done. We have had a marvelous debate about Europe, but none of us has discussed our relationship with the people who sent us here. Honorable members have expressed views on Albania and the Baltic states. I have been dazzled by the knowledge of the continent of which we are all part. No one has spoken about how he or she got here and what we were sent here to do. Tony Ben, the importance of democracy. If people lose the power to sack their government, one of several things happens. First, people may just slope off. Apathy could destroy democracy. When the turnout drops below 50 percent, we are in danger. The second thing that people can do is to riot. Riot is an old-fashioned method for drawing the attention of the government to what is wrong. It is difficult for an elected person to admit it, but the riot at Strangeways produced some prison reforms. Riot has historically played a much larger part in British politics than we are ever allowed to know. Thirdly, nationalism can arise. Instead of blaming the Treaty of Rome, people say it is those Germans or it is the French. Nationalism is built out of frustration that people feel when they cannot get their way through the ballot box. With nationalism comes repression. I hope that it is not pessimistic. In my view, it is not to say that democracy hangs by a thread in every country of the world, unless we can offer people a peaceful route to the resolution of injustices through the ballot box. They will not listen to a house that has blocked off that route. There are many alternatives open to us. One honourable member said that he was young and had not fought in the war. He looked at a new Europe, but there have been five Europes this century. There was one run by the king. The Kaiser and the Czar—they were all cousins, so that was very comfortable. They were all Queen Victoria's grandsons, and there was no nonsense about human rights when Queen Victoria's grandsons repressed people. Then there was the Russian Revolution. Then there was the interwar period. Then there was the Anglo-Soviet alliance. Then there was the Cold War. Now we have a Boris Yeltsin who has joined the Monday Club. There have been so many Europes. This is not the only Europe on offer. I understand that my honourable friend, the member for Sunderland South, Mr. Muleri, is a democratic federalist, as is my honourable friend, the member for Derbyshire North East, Mr. Barnes. They want an American-type constitution for Europe. It could be that our laws would hang on which way the Albanian members voted. I could not complain about that because that is democracy. However, it is unworkable. It is like trying to get an elephant to dance through a minefield.
but it would be democratic. Tony Benn, The Importance of Democracy Another way would be to have a looser, wider Europe. I have an idea for a Commonwealth of Europe. I am introducing a bill on the subject. Europe would be rather like the British Commonwealth. We would work by consent with people. Or we could accept this ghastly proposal, which is clumsy, secretive, centralized, bureaucratic, and divisive. That is how I regard the Treaty of Rome. I was born a European, and I will die one. But I have never put my alliance behind the Treaty of Rome. I object to it. I hate being called an anti-European. How can one be anti-European when one is born in Europe? It is like saying that one is anti-British if one does not agree with the Chancellor of the Exchequer. What a lot of nonsense it is. I ask myself why the House is ready to contemplate abandoning its duties, as I fear that it is. I was elected 41 years ago this month. This chamber has lost confidence in democracy. It believes that it must be governed by someone else. It is afraid to use the powers entrusted to it by its constituents. It has traded power for status. One gets asked to go on the telly if one is member of parliament. The chamber does not want to use its power. It has accepted the role of a spectator and joined what Bagho called the dignified part of the constitution, leaving the crown under the control of the prime minister to be the executive part. If democracy is destroyed in Britain, it will not be the communists, Trotskyists, or subversives, but this house which threw it away. The rights that are entrusted to us are not for us to give away. Even if I agree with everything that is proposed, I cannot hand away powers lent to me for five years by the people of Chesterfield. I just could not do it. It would be theft of public rights. Therefore, there is only one answer. If people are determined to submit themselves to Jacques Delors, Madame Papandreou, and the Council of Ministers, we must tell the people what is planned. If people vote for that, they will have all capitulated. Julius Caesar said, we are just merging our sovereignty. So did William the Conqueror. It is not possible to support the government's motion. I have told the chief whip that I cannot support the labor motion. I invite the House to vote against the government's motion and not to support a motion which purports to take us faster into a community which cannot reflect the aspirations of those who put us here. That is not a nationalist argument, nor is it about sovereignty. It is a democratic argument, and it should be decisive in a democratic chamber. Sir Geoffrey Howe, Resignation Speech As long ago as 1962, it was Lord Stockton, formerly Harold Macmillan, who first put the central point clearly. He argued that we had to place and keep ourselves within the community. He saw it as essential, then, as it is today, not to cut ourselves off from the realities of power, not to retreat into a ghetto of sentimentality about our past, and so diminish our control over our own destiny in the future. The pity is that the Macmillan view had not been perceived more clearly a decade before in the 50s. It would have spared so many of the struggles of the past 20 years had we been in the community from the outset, had we been ready in the much too simple phrase, to surrender some sovereignty at a much earlier stage. Had we been in from the start, we should have had more, not less, influence over the Europe in which we live today. We should never forget the lesson of that isolation, of being on the outside looking in for the conduct of today's affairs. We have done best when we have seen the community not as a static entity to be resisted and contained, but as an active process which we can shape often decisively provided we allow ourselves to be fully engaged in it with confidence and enthusiasm and in good faith. We must at all costs avoid presenting ourselves yet again with an oversimplified choice, a false antithesis, a bogus dilemma between one alternative starkly labeled cooperation between independent sovereign states and a second equally crudely labeled alternative, a centralized federal superstate, as if there were no middle way in between. We commit a serious error if we think always in terms of surrendering sovereignty and seek to stand pat for all time on a given deal by proclaiming, as the Prime Minister did two weeks ago, that we have surrendered enough. The European enterprise is not and should not be seen like that, as some kind of zero-sum gain. 
Sir Winston Churchill put it much more positively forty years ago when he said, "Is it not possible and not less agreeable to regard this sacrifice or merger of national sovereignty as the gradual assumption by all the nations concerned of that larger sovereignty which can alone protect their diverse and distinctive customs and characteristics and their national traditions?" I find Winston Churchill's perception a good deal more convincing and encouraging for the interests of our nation than the nightmare image sometimes conjured up by the Prime Minister, who sometimes seems to look out on a continent that is positively teeming with ill-intentioned people scheming, in her words, to extinguish democracy, to dissolve our national identity, to lead us through the back door into a federal Europe. Sir Geoffrey Howe, resignation speech. One kind of vision is that for our business people who trade there each day, for our financiers who seek to make London the money capital of Europe, or for all the young people of today. These concerns are especially important as we approach the crucially important topic of EMU. We must be positively and centrally involved in this debate, and not fearfully and negatively detached. The cost of disengagement here could be very serious indeed. The tragedy is, and it is for me personally, for my party, for our whole people, for the Prime Minister herself, a very real tragedy, that the Prime Minister's perceived attitude towards Europe is running increasingly serious risks for the future of our nation. It risks minimizing our influence and maximizing our chances of being once again shut out. We have paid heavily in the past for late stars and squandered opportunities in Europe. We dare not let that happen again. If we detach ourselves completely as a party or as a nation from the middle ground of Europe, the effects will be incalculable and very hard ever to correct. In my letter of resignation, which I tendered with the utmost sadness and dismay, I said that cabinet government is about trying to persuade one another from within. That was my commitment to government by persuasion, persuading colleagues and nation. I have tried to do that as foreign secretary and since, but realize now that the task has become futile of trying to stretch the meaning of words beyond what was credible, of trying to pretend there was a common policy when every step forward risked being subverted by some casual comment or impulsive answer. The conflict of loyalty is loyalty to the prime minister, and after more than two decades together, that instinct of loyalty is still very real, and the loyalty to what I perceive to be the true interests of this nation. That conflict of loyalty has become all too great. I no longer believe it is possible to resolve that conflict from within this government. That is why I have resigned. In doing so, I have done what I believe to be right for my party and my country. The time has come for others to consider their response to the tragic conflict of loyalty with which I have wrestled myself for perhaps too long. Mario Cuomo. Ten days ago, President Reagan admitted that although some people in this country seem to be doing well nowadays, others were unhappy and even worried about themselves, their families, and their futures. The president said he didn't understand that fear. He said. Why this country is a shining city on a hill? The president is right. In many ways, we are a shining city on a hill. But the hard truth is that not everyone is sharing in this city's splendor and glory. A shining city is perhaps all the president sees from the portico of the White House and the veranda of his ranch, where everyone seems to be doing well. But there's another part of the city, the part where some people can't pay their mortgages and most young people can't afford one. Where students can't afford the education they need, and middle-class parents watch the dreams they hold for their children evaporate. In this part of the city, there are more poor than ever, more families in trouble, more and more people who need help but can't find it. Even worse, there are elderly people who tremble in the basements of the houses there. There are people who sleep in the city streets, in the gutter where the glitter doesn't show. There are ghettos where thousands of young people, without an education or a job, give their lives away to drug dealers every day. There is despair, Mr. President, in faces you never see, in the places you never visit in your shining city. In fact, Mr. President, this nation is more a tale of two cities than it is a shining city on a hill. Maybe if you visited more places, Mr. President, you'd understand. Mario Cuomo. 
Maybe if you went to Appalachia, where some people still live in sheds, and to Lackawanna, where thousands of unemployed steel workers wonder why we subsidized foreign steel while we surrender their dignity to unemployment and to welfare checks. Maybe if you stepped into a shelter in Chicago and talked with some of the homeless there, Maybe, Mr. President, if you asked a woman who'd been denied the help she needs to feed her children because you say we need the money to give a tax break to a millionaire or to build a missile we can't even afford to use, maybe then you'd understand. Maybe, Mr. President, but I'm afraid not, because the truth is, this is how we were warned it would be. President Reagan told us from the beginning that he believed in a kind of social Darwinism, survival of the fittest. Government can't do everything, we were told, so it should settle for taking care of the strong and hope that economic ambition and charity will do the rest. Make the rich richer, and what falls from their table will be enough for the middle class and those trying to make it into the middle class. The Republicans called it trickle down when Hoover tried it. Now they call it supply side. It is the same shining city for those relative few who are lucky enough to live in its good neighborhoods. But for the people who are excluded, locked out, all they can do is stare from a distance at that city's glimmering towers. It's an old story, as old as our history. The difference between Democrats and the Republicans has always been measured in courage and confidence. The Republicans believe the wagon train will not make it to the frontier unless some of our old, some of our young, and some of our weak are left behind by the side of the trail. The strong will inherit the land. We Democrats believe that we can make it all the way with the whole family intact. We have, more than once, ever since Franklin Roosevelt lifted himself from his wheelchair to lift this nation from its knees, wagon train after wagon train. Mario Cuomo, to new frontiers of education, housing, peace, the whole family aboard, constantly reaching out to extend and enlarge that family, lifting them up into the wagon on the way. Blacks and Hispanics, people of every ethnic group, and Native Americans—all those struggling to build their families and claim some small share of America. For nearly 50 years, we carried them to new levels of comfort, security, dignity, even affluence. Some of us are in this room today only because this nation had that confidence. It would be wrong to forget that. So we are here at this convention to remind ourselves where we come from and to claim the future for ourselves and for our children. Today, our great Democratic Party, which has saved this nation from depression, from fascism, from racism, from corruption, is called upon to do it again. This time, to save the nation from confusion and division, from the threat of eventual fiscal disaster, and most of all, from a fear of a nuclear holocaust. We must win this case on the merits. We must get the American public to look past the glitter, beyond the showmanship, to reality, to the hard substance of things. And we will do that not so much with speeches that sound good as with speeches that are good and sound. We must make the American people hear our tale of two cities. We must convince them that we don't have to settle for two cities, that we can have one city, indivisible. Shining for all its people, to succeed, we will have to surrender small parts of our individual interests to build a platform we can all stand on at once, comfortably, proudly singing out the truth for the nation to hear in chorus. Its logic so clear and commanding that no slick commercial, no amount of geniality, no martial music will be able to muffle it. We Democrats must unite so that the entire nation can. Surely the Republicans won't bring the convention together. Their policies divide the nation into the lucky and the left out, the royalty and the rabble. The Republicans are willing to treat that division as victory. They would cut this nation in half into those temporarily better off and those worse off than before, and call it recovery. We should not be embarrassed or dismayed if the process of unifying is difficult, even at times wrenching. Unlike any other party, we embrace men and women of every color, every creed, every orientation, every economic class. In our family are gathered everyone from the abject poor of Essex County in New York to the enlightened affluent of the Gold Coast of both ends of our nation, and in between is the heart of our constituency, the middle class, 
the people not rich enough to be worry-free, but not poor enough to be on welfare. Those who work for a living because they have to. White collar and blue collar. Young professionals. Men and women in small business desperate for the capital and contracts they need to prove their worth. We speak for the minorities who have not yet entered the mainstream. For ethnics who want to add their culture to the mosaic that is America. For women indignant that we refuse to etch into our governmental commandments the simple rule, Thou shalt not sin against equality. A commandment so obvious it can be spelled in three letters. E-R-A. For young people demanding an education and a future. For senior citizens terrorized by the idea that their only security, their social security, is being threatened. For millions of reasoning people fighting to preserve the environment from greed and stupidity and fighting to preserve our very existence from a macho intransigence that refuses to make intelligent attempts to discuss the possibility of nuclear holocaust with our enemy, refusing because they believe we can pile missiles so high that they will pierce the clouds and the sight of them will frighten our enemies into submission. That struggle to live with dignity is the real story of the Shining City. It's a story I didn't read in a book or learn in a classroom. I saw it and lived it like many of you. I watched a small man with thick calluses on both hands work 15 and 16 hours a day. I saw him once literally bleed from the bottoms of his feet. A man who came here uneducated, alone, unable to speak the language, who taught me all I needed to know about faith and hard work by the simple eloquence of his example. Mario Cuomo I learned about our kind of democracy from my father. I learned about our obligation to each other from him and from my mother. They asked only for a chance to work and to make the world better for their children and to be protected in those moments when they would not be able to protect themselves. This nation and its government did that for them. And that they were able to build a family and live in dignity and see one of their children go from beyond their little grocery store on the other side of the tracks in South Jamaica where he was born to occupy the highest seat in the greatest state of the greatest nation in the world we know is an ineffably beautiful tribute to the democratic process. We Democrats still have a dream. We still believe in this nation's future. And this is our answer, our credo. We believe in only the government we need, but we insist on all the government we need. We believe in a government characterized by fairness and reasonableness, a reasonableness that goes beyond labels, that doesn't distort or promise to do what it knows it can't do, a government strong enough to use the words love and compassion and smart enough to convert our noblest aspirations into practical realities. We believe in encouraging the talented, but we believe that while survival of the fittest may be a good working description of the process of evolution, a government of humans should elevate itself to a higher order, one which fills the gaps left by a chance or a wisdom we don't understand. We would rather have laws written by the patron of this great city, the man called the world's most sincere Democrat, St. Francis of Assisi, than laws written by Darwin. We believe, as Democrats, that a society as blessed as ours, the most affluent democracy in the world's history that can spend trillions on instruments of destruction, ought to be able to help the middle class in its struggle, ought to be able to find work for all who can do it, room at the table, shelter for the homeless, care for the elderly and infirm, hope for the destitute. We proclaim as loudly as we can the utter insanity of nuclear proliferation and the need for a nuclear freeze, if only to affirm the simple truth that peace is better than war because life is better than death. Mario Cuomo We believe in firm but fair law and order, in the union movement, in privacy for people, openness by government, civil rights and human rights. We believe in a single fundamental idea that describes better than most textbooks and any speech what a proper government should be. The idea of family, mutuality, the sharing of benefits and burdens for the good of all, feeling one another's pain, sharing one another's blessings, reasonably, honestly, fairly, without respect to race or sex or geography or political affiliation. We believe we must be the family of America, 
recognizing that at the heart of the matter we are bound one to another, that the problems of a retired school teacher in Duluth are our problems, that the future of the child in Buffalo is our future. The struggle of a disabled man in Boston to survive, to live decently, is our struggle. The hunger of a woman in Little Rock, our hunger. The failure anywhere to provide what reasonably we might to avoid pain is our failure. For 50 years, we Democrats created a better future for our children, using traditional democratic principles as a fixed beacon, giving us direction and purpose, but constantly innovating, adapting to new realities. Roosevelt's alphabet programs, Truman's NATO and the GI Bill of Rights, Kennedy's intelligent tax incentives and the Alliance for Progress, Johnson's civil rights, Carter's human rights, and the nearly miraculous Camp David Peace Accord. We will have America's first woman vice president, the child of immigrants, a New Yorker, opening with one magnificent stroke a whole new frontier for the United States. It will happen if we make it happen. I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, for the good of all of us, for the love of this great nation, for the family of America, for the love of God, please make this nation remember how futures are built. King Edward VIII At long last, I am able to say a few words of my own. I have never wanted to withhold anything, but until now, it has not been constitutionally possible for me to speak. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor, and now that I have been succeeded by my brother, the Duke of York, my first words must be to declare my allegiance to him. This I do with all my heart. You all know the reasons which have impelled me to renounce the throne. But I want you to understand that in making up my mind, I did not forget the country or the empire, which as Prince of Wales and lately as King, I have for twenty-five years tried to serve. But you must believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. And I want you to know that the decision I have made has been mine, and mine alone. This was a thing I had to judge entirely for myself. The other person most nearly concerned has tried up to the last minute to persuade me to take a different course. I have made this the most serious decision of my life only upon the single thought of what would, in the end, be best for all. This decision has been made less difficult to me by the sure knowledge that my brother, with his long training in the public affairs of this country and with his fine qualities, will be able to take my place forthwith without interruption or injury to the life and progress of the empire. And he has one matchless blessing, enjoyed by so many of you, and not bestowed on me, a happy home with his wife and children. During these hard days, I have been comforted by Her Majesty, my mother, and by my family. The ministers of the Crown, and in particular, Mr. Baldwin, the Prime Minister, have always treated me with full consideration. There has never been any constitutional difference between me and them, and between me and Parliament. Bred in the constitutional tradition by my father, I should never have allowed any such issue to arise. Ever since I was Prince of Wales, and later on when I occupied the throne, I have been treated with the greatest kindness by all classes of the people wherever I have lived or journeyed throughout the Empire. For that, I am grateful. I now quit altogether public affairs, and I lay down my burden. It may be some time before I return to my native land, but I shall always follow the fortunes of the British race and empire with profound interest, and if at any time in the future I can be found of service to His Majesty in a private station, I will not fail. And now we all have a new king. I wish him and you, his people, happiness and prosperity with all my heart. God bless you all. God save the King. Edward Kennedy, speech at 1980 Democratic Party Convention. There were hard hours on our journey, and often we sailed against the wind. But always we kept our rudder true, and there were so many of you who stayed the course and shared our hope. You gave your help, 
but even more, you gave your hearts. Because of you, this has been a happy campaign. You welcomed Joan, me, and our family into your homes and neighborhoods, your churches, your campuses, your union halls. When I think back of all the miles and all the months and all the memories, I think of you. I recall the poet's words, and I say, "What golden friends I have!" Among you, my golden friends across the land, I have listened and learned. I have listened to Kenny Dubois, a glassblower from Charleston, West Virginia, who has ten children to support, but has lost his job after thirty-five years, just three years short of qualifying for his pension. I have listened to the grandmother in East Oakland, who no longer has a phone to call her grandchildren because she gave it up to pay the rent on her small apartment. I have listened to young workers out of work, to students without tuition for college, and to families without the chance to own a home. I have seen the closed factories and the stalled assembly lines of Anderson, Indiana, and Southgate, California, and I have seen too many, far too many, idle men and women desperate to work. I have seen too many, far too many working families desperate to protect the value of their wages from the ravages of inflation. Yet I have also sensed a yearning for new hope among the people in every state where I have been, and I have felt it in their handshakes. I saw it in their faces, and I shall never forget the mothers who carried children to our rallies. I shall always remember the elderly who have lived in an America of high purpose and who believe that it can all happen again. Tonight, in their name, I have come here to speak for them, and for their sake, I ask you to stand with them. On their behalf, I ask you to restate and reaffirm the timeless truth of our party. I congratulate President Carter on his victory here. I am confident that the Democratic Party will reunite on the basis of democratic principles, and that together we will march towards a democratic victory in 1980. And some day, long after this convention, long after the signs come down and the crowds stop cheering and the bands stop playing, may it be said of our campaign that we kept the faith. May it be said of our party in 1980 that we found our faith again. And may it be said of us, both in dark passages and in bright days, in the words of Tennyson that my brothers quoted and loved, and that have special meaning for me now. I am a part of all that I have met. Though much is taken, much abides. That which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. For me, a few hours ago, this campaign came to an end. For all those whose cares have been our concern, the work goes on. The cause endures. The hope still lives. And the dream shall never die. Abraham Lincoln, Second Inaugural Address. Fellow countrymen, at this second appearing to take the oath of the presidential office, there is less occasion for an extended address than there was at the first. Then a statement, somewhat in detail, of a course to be pursued seemed fitting and proper. Now, at the expiration of four years, during which public declarations have been constantly called forth on every point and phase of the great contest, which still absorbs the attention and engrosses the energies of the nation, little that is new could be presented. The progress of our arms, upon which all else chiefly depends, is as well known to the public as to myself, and it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. With high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to it is ventured. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it. All sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, insurgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the Union and divide effects by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. 
One eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. All knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union even by war, while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with, or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men would dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, but let us judge not, that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has His own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through His appointed time, He now wills to remove, and that He gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to Him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's two hundred and fifty years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said three thousand years ago, so still it must be said: the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Come to the fair. Fall fairs have been a feature of North American life since early in the 19th century. At the end of the harvest, people from rural areas have come together to celebrate. Usually, these fairs take the form of a competition regarding the best of all farm products of that year. Depending on the part of the country and its most important crop, fall fairs can begin as early as August or as late as November. They usually last several days. When the United States and Canada were organized, they were divided into small units called counties. Larger units were called states or provinces. Many of the best-known fairs are county fairs or state fairs. There are also smaller local fairs and larger ones too, like the Canadian National Exhibition in Toronto, Ontario. Since these fairs are usually annual events, many have developed permanent buildings over the years. Most of these are large barn-like structures. These buildings are used to display new products for farm life, such as tractors, home furnishings, and water systems. Several barns are usually necessary to house all the horses, cows, pigs, goats, sheep, chickens, and other animals in competition. There must also be room to display all the vegetables, berries, and fruits in competition. Finally, there is space for handicrafts, artwork, baked goods, and jams and jellies. Usually, there is a grandstand, which is a stage with wooden seats around it. Here, entertainers perform for an audience during the fair. Country and western singers are usually popular at fairs, but so are comedians, clowns, dancers, and musicians. 
There may also be other contests, such as a beauty competition for Queen of the Fair, tests of strength for the men, or pie-eating events. Most fairs also have a race track, which is used for horse racing, or in some cases, auto racing. Fairs have helped to improve animal breeds, and races encourage the breeding of fast horses. Plowing contests test the strength and steadiness of horses, and so do pulling contests. This spirit of competition has led to improvements in all areas of farming. Every kind of grain, fruit, vegetable, berry, and animal is tested, and only the best win a ribbon. This encourages fairness to improve their products. Farm women compete to produce the best homemade food and crafts. Many kinds of fruit and vegetables are stored in glass jars for the winter. The best of these also receive prizes. Most fairs have a dining area where there is good food served to the public. The goal of improving farming is sponsored by the governments of Canada and the USA. 4-H clubs are youth organizations that encourage farm children to take an interest in farming. 4-H clubs aim at improving the heads, hearts, hands, and health of their members. There are also women's organizations, such as the Women's Institutes in Canada, which work to make the life of farm families better. Fall fairs have taken over the idea of the midway from the circus. The midway has rides like Ferris wheels, merry-go-rounds, and roller coasters. It also has games of chance and skill, such as trying to throw a small hoop over a large bottle. One nice thing about fall fairs is that they are fun for the whole family. Children enjoy the midway and the farm animals. Women like the crafts, food, and household exhibits. Men like the machinery, the horse races, and the crop exhibits. Everyone likes the grandstand shows. Nowadays, not so many people live on farms, but people from towns and cities still enjoy going to fall fairs. They are part of our North American heritage. Hiroshima. North American children know about Hiroshima. They are taught about the dangers of nuclear war. Sometimes they learn the details of the damage that was done. They learn about what happened at 8:15 a.m. on August 6, 1945. People were eating breakfast. Children were going to school and adults going to work. There was a blinding flash of light, a scorching heat, and a mushroom cloud rose up. People close to the explosion were instantly vaporized. Many of those further away would die from burns and radiation. Sixty thousand houses were destroyed immediately. One concrete structure remained standing, although it was damaged. The local government left the atomic dome standing as a memorial to the explosion. Even those who were not seriously injured in the explosion later became very ill. They became very sick from radiation poisoning. Many developed leukemia. Sadako Sasaki was two years old when the bomb exploded. She was apparently uninjured and grew up normally until she was twelve. Then she developed leukemia, a disease of the blood and bone marrow. Sadako began to fold paper cranes to protect her from the illness. However, she died in 1955 before she reached 1,000 paper cranes. Her example inspired the Children's Monument at Hiroshima. There is a peace museum in Hiroshima which has objects left by the explosion. These include bottles, metal, stones, and tiles twisted into strange shapes by the heat. There are objects on which people were vaporized so that their shape appears like a shadow on the material. There are bits of burnt clothing and many photographs. Why was the bomb dropped? World War II was a long and bitter war. The rules of war, which said not to kill civilians, were forgotten. Hitler bombed London, hoping to break the spirit of the English. Then England bombed Germany to destroy the factories and kill the people who worked in them. Americans wanted revenge for the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The U.S. government had spent six billion dollars developing the A bomb and wanted to use it. Some say that they also wanted to warn the Russians not to cause trouble for America. When American forces advanced on Japan in 1945, they had to decide what to do: would Japan surrender or would they fight to the last soldier? 
American leaders feared that they might lose many men by an invasion. Dropping the atomic bomb would end the war very quickly. President Truman made the decision to use it. Since then, most people have felt that this decision was wrong. It was such a terrible thing to do to people, children, old people, women, men, and babies. Hiroshima inspired many people to try to ban the bomb. They wanted to ensure that atomic bombs would not be used again. Even some of the scientists and air crews involved in making and dropping the bomb at Hiroshima wanted it banned. Perhaps if we can all remember what happened that day, there will be no more Hiroshimas. Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls is one of the world's leading tourist attractions. Millions of people around the world visit here each year. Summers at the falls are especially busy with traffic jams and parking problems. However, the falls are beautiful in winter too. Many have asked why people travel so far to see water falling over a cliff. The size and beauty of Niagara Falls help to make it special. While many falls are higher than Niagara, very few are as wide or have such a volume of water. It also helps that Niagara is relatively easy to travel to. When the first Europeans came to Niagara, the falls were surrounded by forest. The noise of the falls could be heard miles away before they were actually seen. The first visitors were filled with horror at the sight. Later, fear ceased to be the main emotion inspired by the falls. Later, visitors were impressed by the beauty and grandeur of the falls, which overwhelmed them with wonder. By the 1830s, people were able to come to the falls by railway. As more and more people came, the tourist industry developed. Early tourism was not well regulated, and there were many complaints about cheats and swindles. Today, there are similar complaints about tourist junk and high prices. The majority of tourists stay on the Canadian side. There are two falls separated by an island. Since the Niagara River forms the boundary here between Canada and the United States, each country has one of the falls. The Canadian Horseshoe Falls is wider and more impressive than the American Rainbow Falls. About nine times more water goes over the Canadian falls. Nonetheless, there is much to be seen on the American side. The island in the middle, Goat Island, is one of the best places to view the falls and rapids. It is on the American side. Newly married couples began coming to Niagara Falls when it was still a secluded, peaceful, and romantic spot. It is still popular with newlyweds as a relatively inexpensive and convenient place to spend their honeymoon. Besides being beautiful, Niagara Falls is also very useful. Their falling water is the power behind several of the largest hydroelectric stations in the world. Much of the electric power used in this part of North America comes from Niagara Falls. In order to harness this power, half of the flow of water is channeled away from the falls during the night and during the non-tourist season. Probably most visitors don't notice the difference. Niagara has attracted many kinds of people over the years. Businessmen have come to profit from the tourists. Daredevils have come to make a name for themselves. Some have gone over the falls in a barrel, while others have walked above the falls on a tightrope. Poets and artists have visited here to capture its beauty. Lovers have come to gaze on its romantic scenery. All of these and many others have helped to make Niagara Falls world famous. Cowboys. The golden age of the American cowboy was short-lived. It began in the 1860s with the great cattle drives from Texas north to Kansas. By 1890, when railroads had reached remote areas, there was no more need for large-scale cattle drives. Of course, cowboys have a history before 1860. In fact, there were Mexican cowboys long before that. The Spanish conqueror of Mexico, Hernan Cortez, brought cattle with him in 1521. Cortez also branded his cattle with a three-cross design. The Spanish sharp-horned cattle roamed the deserts and prairies freely. Eventually, they found their way to Texas. American settlers in Texas interbred their animals with the Spanish breed. The Texas Longhorn cow was the result. It was famous for its bad temper and aggressiveness. 
The longhorn was a dangerous animal, with each of its horns measuring up to three and one half feet long. After the American Civil War ended in 1865, disbanded soldiers who were former black slaves and young men seeking adventure headed west. At that time, there were about five million cattle in Texas. Back in the east, there was a big demand for beef. By this time, railways from the east extended as far west as Kansas. It was still more than 600 miles from South Texas to the railway. Between the two places, there were rivers to cross, Indian tribes, badlands, and other problems. A fur trader named Jesse Chisholm had driven his wagon north in 1865. Cowboys and cattle followed the Chisholm Trail north to Abilene, Kansas. This cattle trail became the most famous route for driving cattle until it was barred with barbed wire in 1884. In 1867, cattle dealer Joseph G. McCoy built pens for 3,000 cattle in the little town of Abilene. Soon, Abilene was the most dangerous town in America. After the long cattle drive, cowboys who had just been paid went wild. Sheriff Wild Bill Hickok tamed Abilene in 1871 by forcing cowboys to turn over their guns when they arrived in town. Other towns replaced Abilene as the wildest town in the West: Newton, Wichita, Ellsworth, and Dodge City. In Kansas, a herd of 3,000 Texas Longhorns might sell for $100,000, making the rancher rich. The cowboys might get $200 in wages, which often disappeared on drink, women, and gambling. Getting cattle to Kansas was far from easy. One of the biggest difficulties was getting the herd across rivers, especially when the river was high. There were no bridges. In 1871, 350 cowboys driving 60,000 cattle waited two weeks for the water level in the Red River to go down. Food for men and animals was also difficult to find at times. An early cattleman developed the chuck wagon, which were both a supply wagon and a portable kitchen. In the 1870s, there were probably 40,000 cowboys in the West. After the prairies were fenced in, there was less work. Large ranches still employ cowboys to round up the cattle for branding or for sale. Even today, about 20,000 cowboys still work in North America. George W. Bush Jr. George W. Bush Jr. was inaugurated as the 43rd President of the United States on January 20th, 2001. Of course, people knew that he was the son of the 41st President, George H. W. Bush. He had also been Governor of Texas since 1994. However, aside from this, he was not very well known outside of Texas. Why then did so many people want him to run for president in 2000? Many Republicans thought that the Democrats could be defeated in 2000, but they themselves lacked a candidate with strong appeal. As the election approached, leading Republicans worried about whom to support. Some of the most powerful Republicans were state governors. They began to look around at each other for a possible candidate. Most eyes turned to George W. Bush, the governor of Texas. In November 1998, Bush was re-elected as governor by an impressive margin. By now, Bush was the leading Republican candidate in the polls. Of course, one advantage that Governor Bush had was a familiar name. In fact, when he did well in some early polls, it is likely that some people really voted for his father. They thought that George H. W. Bush was running again. The Bush family was able to swing a lot of support to George W. It also helped that his brother Jeb was now governor of Florida. Parents George and Barbara were both born in Eastern United States, but in 1948 George moved to Texas, where he made a fortune in the oil business. He went into politics in the 1960s and 70s and served in a number of important positions. He was Ronald Reagan's vice president from 1981 to 1989, and president from 1989 to 1993. George W. was born in 1946, the oldest of the Bush children. Three more brothers and two sisters were also born. The youngest sister died of leukemia as a child. George W. attended the same prestigious Eastern colleges as his father. Then he came back to Texas and was a fighter pilot with the Texas Air National Guard. 
During the early 70s, he wandered from place to place, trying different jobs. After attending Harvard Business School from 1972 to 1975, he came back to Texas and started his own oil exploration company. Although it wasn't as profitable as his father's company, he eventually sold his stock shares for a considerable amount of money. In 1978, he ran for the Senate of the United States, but was defeated. He became closely involved in his father's campaign for president in 1988. Here, he developed a lot of the political skills he was later able to use to run for office himself. In 1989, back in Texas, George W. organized a group that bought the Texas Rangers baseball team. He later sold the team in 1998 and made a $14 million profit. In 1994, he surprised the political world by defeating the incumbent governor of Texas. As governor, he pushed ahead with an energetic program, which reflected neoconservative values. However, George W. did not appear as an ideologist to people. Even his opponents were willing to work with him. When he ran for president in 2000, Bush described himself as a compassionate conservative. Only time will tell how successful Bush will be as U.S. president. Handel's Messiah George Frederick Handel was a native of Germany and spoke with a German accent all his life. Most of that life, however, was spent in London, England. As a young musician, Handel's sponsor was the Elector of Hanover. Later on, when the Elector became King George I of England, he continued to sponsor Handel. The young Handel went to Italy to study opera. Opera had become a very fashionable entertainment for the upper classes. Handel traveled to England in 1711 and made an immediate success with his operas. Queen Anne granted him a royal pension for life in 1713. Because of this initial success, Handel tried to start a permanent opera company in London, but this failed and Handel lost money. Since operas used full stage settings with costumes, scenery, and props, they were expensive to produce. Handel decided to produce oratorios in which the parts were simply sung without actions. On August 22, 1741, Handel began to work on his oratorio, The Messiah. The text was made up of passages from the Bible relating to the birth, life, and death of Jesus. Handel worked on it feverishly, missing meals and going without sleep. He finished it 24 days later. When he was asked how he felt on completing it, Handel said, I thought I saw all heaven before me and the great God himself. In the fall of 1741, Handel received an invitation from the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland to present operas and concerts there. Handel traveled from London to Dublin with his entire luggage and many of his singers. However, in order to rehearse on the way, he had to hire local people to fill in. Once, the composer soundly criticized one local singer who failed to meet his standards. Handel was warmly received in Dublin, where his concerts were sold out. Even his rehearsals were considered newsworthy by the local papers. The Messiah was first publicly performed on April 13, 1742. 700 people squeezed into a 600-seat theater to hear it. A notice had requested that ladies attend in hoopless skirts and that gentlemen come without their swords. A Dublin paper reported, Words are wanting to express the exquisite delight it afforded to the admiring crowded audience. All proceeds were donated to charity, as the church choirs had refused to participate except on those conditions. Handel returned to London in August 1742 and prepared the oratorio for the London stage. The Messiah made its London debut on March 23, 1743, with King George II in the audience. It was during the Hallelujah Chorus that the king jumped to his feet and so initiated a tradition that has lasted ever since. With such oratories, Handel was able to re-establish his popularity and restore his finances in London. The Messiah continued to be performed. After conducting it on April 6, 1759, the old composer collapsed and had to be carried home. He died eight days later. The Messiah remains Handel's most popular work, combining wonderful music with inspiring religious sentiments. The biblical text speaks of hope and salvation, and the music allows the text to soar into angelic songs. Ireland 
Ireland is an island in the Atlantic Ocean, just west of Britain. For much of its history, it has been an advantage to Ireland to be far from the mainland. The Romans or the other early empires never conquered Ireland. It was the remoteness of Ireland that helped preserve much of Christian and classical culture. After the fall of the Roman Empire, wandering tribes destroyed much of what remained on the continent. Finally, it was Ireland's turn to be invaded. First, the Norsemen or Vikings attacked during the 800s and 900s. Then, in the 1100s, the English invaded Ireland. Since that time, there has always been an English presence in Ireland. The conflict between the English and the Irish grew worse in the 1500s. Then the English became Protestant, and the Irish remained Catholic. In the 1600s, Oliver Cromwell tried to make Ireland Protestant by driving out the Catholics and bringing in Protestant settlers. In the centuries following, Irish Catholics had very few rights in their own country. The Catholic Irish were not allowed to vote until 1829. Since Irish Catholics were not allowed to own land, they were poor tenant farmers. They paid rent to the English landlords. The main food crop in the 1840s was potatoes. When these became infected by blight, thousands of Irishmen starved. Many others were evicted from their dwellings because they couldn't pay the rent. Hundreds of thousands of Irish took ship for North America. The Catholic Irish preferred to go to the United States because Canada was under British influence. However, many Protestant Irish went to Canada. The influence of the Irish on North American culture has been very great in many areas. Prominent Irish Americans include Presidents John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan. Meanwhile, in Ireland itself, a strong independence movement developed. A rebellion against England in 1916 began a struggle that resulted in independence for most of Ireland. Some Protestant areas in Northern Ireland preferred to stay with England. Republican groups such as the Irish Republican Army wanted to liberate the North from British rule. Nowadays, conflict between Protestants and Catholics is limited to these northern counties. Constant attempts are being made to bring the conflict there to an end. Meanwhile, the Irish Republic of Air has become prosperous again. It can sell its agricultural products to the European Common Market. Irish beer and whiskey are sold all over the world. Ireland is also becoming known for its high-tech industries. Because of this relative prosperity, the population is increasing again after a century and a half of decline. The Irish differ from other people because the vast majority of Irishmen live away from their homeland. However, this exodus from Ireland has helped to spread Irish music, culture, and products around the world. On St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, nearly everyone becomes Irish for the day. Then there is a great party with Celtic music, Irish dancing, green beer, and the wearing of the green. Louisa May Alcott. New England in the early and middle years of the 19th century had a flourishing culture. People were passionately interested in ideas and education. Most New Englanders were strongly opposed to slavery. They were also concerned about other social issues. New ideas resulted in new kinds of writing. These ideas included the importance of doing what seemed right for them, no matter how different it was from what other people thought. People also believed that nature gave them guidance in our lives, and that it was important to live close to nature. These and other ideas were expressed through teaching and writing. Bronson Alcott was one of those who looked at the world in a new way. He looked for work as a teacher so that he could pass on his ideas to others. However, very few parents wanted Mr. Alcott to teach their children, and very few people were interested in hearing his speeches or reading his books. As a result, the Alcott family was very poor. Fortunately for Bronson, he married a very capable and energetic woman. Mrs. Abigail Alcott helped to earn money to support the family and did most of the work involved in looking after the four Alcott girls. The oldest daughter, Anna, was quiet and serious. She rarely got into trouble and was a good helper at home. The second daughter was Louisa May Alcott, who became a writer. She was adventurous and cared very little for rules. She was always saying and doing things that got her into trouble. The third daughter, Elizabeth, was very kind and good-natured. All the others loved her. 
As a young woman, Elizabeth had a severe case of scarlet fever and never fully recovered. She died at age 23. The youngest sister, May, was talented, but she was rather spoiled. Because there was never enough money, the Alcott girls felt pressure to work at an early age, but this did not stop them from having fun. Louisa wrote little plays that she and her sisters performed at home. They all enjoyed the woods and ponds around Concord, Massachusetts, where they lived most of these years. When they moved back to Boston in 1848, Anna took a job looking after other people's children, and Louisa looked after the house. Meanwhile, their mother worked outside the home. While working on laundry or sewing, Louisa was thinking up stories. At night, she would write them down. When she was 18, she began selling poems and stories to magazines. Within 10 years, Louisa was earning a substantial income from writing. One day, her publisher suggested that she write a story for girls. At first, Louisa didn't like the suggestion, but when she started to write, the ideas came rapidly. Her book was based on her own family and her own childhood. Little Women was published in 1868 and was an immediate success. The March family was very much like the Alcotts. Mrs. Alcott resembles Marmee. Meg is like Anna, and Joe is like Louisa herself. Beth is based on Elizabeth, and Amy on May Alcott. Many of the situations in the book happened to the Alcott family. Nonetheless, many characters and incidents were invented. Little Women and its sequel opened up a new kind of writing for children. While these books did have a moral, they were more lively and interesting than earlier children's writing. Little Women inspired many writers later to write more realistic accounts of childhood. Niagara on the Lake Niagara on the Lake is a little town at the mouth of the Niagara River. It is only 12 miles north of Niagara Falls. It used to be true that very few tourists would bother to travel from the falls down to Niagara-on-the-Lake. Nowadays, however, the little town itself is a major tourist attraction. The town has a remarkable history. The area played an important role in both the American Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. As a result, the little town has two forts, Fort George and Fort Mississauga. When Fort George was reconstructed for the public in the 1930s, Niagara-on-the-Lake got its first big tourist attraction. Because Niagara-on-the-Lake was the first capital of Ontario, it has many significant firsts. There was the first parliament in the province, the first legal society, the first library, the first newspaper, the first museum building, and many more firsts. Besides its history, the town, which is bordered by Lake Ontario and the Niagara River, has beautiful scenery. On a summer's day, visitors can watch the sailboats going out the river to the lake. On the land side, Niagara is part of the fruit belt of Ontario. Peaches, pears, apples, cherries, and strawberries grow here in abundance. There are also long rows of vines, and winemaking has recently become a major industry. The mild, humid climate allows plants to flourish. The trees, especially the oaks, grow to remarkable heights. Flowering trees and shrubs perfume the air in the spring. Gardens are often spectacular for much of the year. Because of this, Niagara-on-the-Lake attracts many painters and photographers. Many of the private homes also have a long history, and great care is taken to keep them looking their best. The biggest single attraction is the Shaw Festival Theatre. The festival was founded in 1962 by a group of Shaw enthusiasts. Early productions were often held in the historic courthouse on the main street, and plays still take place there. In 1973, however, a new 861-seat Shaw Theatre was built at the south end of town. Since then, traffic to Niagara-on-the-Lake has been steady all through the long summer season. In 1996, Niagara-on-the-Lake was voted the prettiest town in Canada. Partly, it is the scale of things that makes the old town so attractive. The old town is only about eight blocks long by eight blocks wide. 
It has a population of little more than 1,000 people. Nonetheless, there is a lot for people to do and see. There are many interesting shops, old hotels, bookstores, art galleries, museums, a golf course, a marina, historic churches and cemeteries, several parks, three theaters, and lots of restaurants. Because it is small, Niagara on the Lake is a good place to walk around or bicycle around. There are also horse and wagon rides. Although the main street can be hectic in tourist season, one doesn't have to go far off the main street to get in touch with an older, slower time. Most of the downtown buildings haven't changed much since the days of Queen Victoria, and tourists can still imagine that they are back in the days before computers and television. Newspapers All the great cities in the world now have newspapers. But newspapers, as we know them today, are not that old. The very first newspapers began long after the invention of printing. They started in Europe in the 1600s and were usually only a couple of pages long. For a long time, newspapers were not very common. Governments didn't want public discussion of their policies and decisions. Often, they closed down papers or taxed them heavily. The stamp tax on newspapers and pamphlets was one of the causes of the American Revolution. Newspapers began to grow in size when they discovered advertising as a source of income. Nowadays, advertising is the main revenue source for most newspapers. As newspapers became more widely circulated, they could ask for more money for their advertisements. By the late 18th century, newspapers were in common use in Europe. The 1800s and early 1900s was the golden age of newspapers. Improvements in transportation, communication, and printing processes made it easier to collect news from near and far and to publish papers more quickly and more cheaply. The Weekly Dispatch and The Times, both of London, England, were leading newspapers through much of the 1800s. The Times was one of the first papers to include illustrations. It was the first newspaper to use a steam engine to turn the presses. When the tax on newspapers was reduced in 1836, the Times was able to increase its size considerably. In 1840, it began to use the telegraph to collect news stories. In 1855, the tax on newspapers was finally lifted. The Times made its greatest reputation during the Crimean War between Britain and Russia. British armies fighting in Russia's Crimean Peninsula were not only unsuccessful in the war, but were suffering severely from illnesses. The Times sent out the world's first war correspondent, William Howard Russell, in 1854. His reports from the battle lines had a powerful effect on the British public. A war fund was organized to help the soldiers. Russell forced the government to accept the offer of Florence Nightingale to organize nurses to travel to Crimea. A photographer, Roger Fenton, sent back photos from the war, which were published in the Times. Meanwhile, in America, a more popular approach to newspapers had developed. The newspaper had spread west with the pioneers, and nearly every little settlement had its own paper. American newspapers were cheaper and livelier than British ones. They were aimed at the average person rather than the governing class. Examples of the new style of editing and publishing were Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. Hearst, especially, employed sensational and emotional writing, which aimed at stirring up the public to action. Hearst is sometimes accused of starting the Spanish American War of 1898 with his overheated editorials. Nonetheless, his methods were successful in raising circulation and were widely imitated. The modern newspaper contains more than hard news. In fact, news may be a fairly small part of it. Advertisements, gossip, show business, photos of celebrities, sports, stock market prices, horoscopes, comic strips, weather reports, and much more are found in its pages. The modern newspaper is a total entertainment package. A question for the future is whether electronic newspapers will replace paper newspapers. Paul Kane, Frontier Artist. Since Christopher Columbus first met American Indians in 1492,
Many Europeans had been fascinated by Indian life and culture. As a result, there was a demand in Europe for drawings and paintings of Native Americans. European artists who had never seen an Indian supplied most of this demand. But in the 19th century, several painters traveled into Indian territory to make an authentic record of Native life. One of the first artists to do this was the American painter George Catlin. In 1841, Catlin published a book of his work. Catlin's work helped inspire another important frontier artist, the Canadian Paul Kane. Paul Kane was born in Ireland in 1810. His family moved to Toronto, Ontario, Canada, when Paul was nine years old. The young boy was not very interested in school. At that time, there were still Indians living in wigwams in the Toronto area. Young Paul liked visiting the Indian village instead of going to school. Since Paul spent little time in school, he was largely a self-taught artist. He also became a surprisingly good writer, considering that he had not spent much time studying spelling or grammar. After working some years making and decorating furniture, Kane was ready to travel. He spent the years from 1836 to 1841 living and traveling in the United States. Then he traveled in Europe from 1841 to 1843, studying the great painters of the past. He was back in the USA until 1845, and then he returned to Toronto. Immediately upon his return, Kane headed into the wilderness areas around Georgian Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, and Lake Michigan. His plan was to sketch Indian life before it disappeared forever. American Indians were dying so rapidly from European diseases such as measles and smallpox that many people believed they would soon vanish as a race. Their culture was threatened too. As white settlers demanded more land, Indians were being herded into small pieces of land called reservations. Here they could no longer practice their traditional way of life. Kane wanted to capture Native American life while it still existed. Kane returned to Toronto at the end of 1845. He had received one good piece of advice, and that was if he wanted to travel into the wilderness, he would have to go with experienced people. He was able to get the support of the governor of the Hudson's Bay Company, Sir George Simpson. In May 1846, Kane joined the annual canoe fleet of fur traders going west. Kane would travel all through the wilderness areas of Western Canada and northwestern USA. During this time, he made hundreds of sketches of Indian life. Although Kane faced incredible hardships during his travels, he was able to see what he wanted to see. He was able to take part in one of the last great buffalo hunts and killed two large bison himself. Traveling west with the fur traders, he visited many forts and trading posts. He saw and painted a prairie fire. He shot a grizzly bear at close range and killed several wolves that attacked his horses. He learned to travel long distances on snowshoes in winter. Finally, he arrived at the Pacific Coast, where he made some fine drawings of the West Coast Indians. European diseases had reached there just before Kane. Fifteen hundred Indians had died near Fort Vancouver in the summer of 1848. One wealthy chief had ruled one thousand warriors and had ten wives, four children, and eighteen slaves. Now he had only one wife, one child, and two slaves. Kane had not come too soon. However, there were tribes still unaffected by Western culture and Western diseases. Kane also traveled widely around the Columbia River in northwestern USA. Everywhere he went, he sketched Indian chiefs and scenes of native life. On his return trip, he encountered a large war party of fifteen hundred braves on the warpath against their traditional enemies. He was able to sketch the leading chief, Big Snake. Who was later killed in single combat during the battle? When he arrived back in Toronto, Kane gave an exhibit of his sketches and watercolors. Most of the rest of his life was spent turning these drawings into finished paintings. Plains Indians. The best-known picture of an American Indian is a warrior in buckskin riding a horse, wearing a headdress of eagle feathers, and carrying a spear or bow and arrow. This is a picture of a plains Indian, and it appears in many Hollywood westerns and on the American five-cent piece. There were many tribes of plains Indians, 
for the northern American prairies or plains stretch from the northern forest of western Canada down to the states of Oklahoma and Texas in southern USA. It's interesting that our image of the Plains Indian is only true for the last couple hundred years. It was not until the 1600s that Plains Indians began to ride horses. There were no horses in America until Spanish soldiers brought them in the 1500s and 1600s. Some of these horses escaped and ran wild on the prairies of America. It was these wild horses that the Plains Indians learned to tame. Before they had horses, the Indians hunted buffalo on foot. Buffalo were huge bison or wild cattle which traveled in very large herds. A big herd might have millions of buffalo. It was difficult to cross the prairie because these animals blocked your way. The Plains Indians had various ways of killing buffalo. Before they had horses, Indian hunters would quietly creep up close to the herd. Then they would fire their arrows together. There was always the danger that the herd would stampede and trample the hunters. Another method was to drive the buffalo over a steep cliff. There are a number of places on the plains where this was done. Once the Plains Indians had horses, they preferred to hunt buffalo on horseback. When the tribe started to use guns, they could kill many buffalo. Artist Paul Kane describes a buffalo hunt in the Red River Valley in 1846. The hunters carried their bullets in their mouths so that they could shoot faster. They could ride right into the herd, shooting at close quarters. They would drop an article of clothes on the slain buffalo to mark it for themselves. Then they would continue the hunt. After the hunt, the Indians would skin the animals, and the women would dry the meat and store it in fat. A single hunt might kill more than 30,000 buffalo. The Plains Indians received nearly everything they needed from the buffalo. Of course, they used buffalo meat for food. They also used the buffalo skins for clothing, blankets, and the covering of their teepees. These teepees were cone shaped tents, which were easy to put up and take down. The Plains Indians were nomadic and followed the animals they hunted. Since these animals were plentiful, Plains Indians usually led a comfortable life. They developed complex religions and social rituals, as well as specialized societies or clubs. There were also rituals and customs for hunting and warfare. Many Plains Indians fought hard against the settlement of the Great Plains. The American government discouraged the hunting of buffalo because without the buffalo, the Plains Indians would not be able to fight. With the buffalo disappearing, the Plains Indians had to give up fighting and move into government sponsored reservations. Pocahontas and John Smith In 1606, King James of England approved the establishment of two colonies along the eastern coast of America. The northern colony in Maine lasted only a year. The southern one at Jamestown in Virginia became England's first permanent settlement in America. In 1607, the Virginia Company sent 104 settlers to Virginia. The settlers lived in tents all summer. By September, more than 60 were dead because they lacked good food or water. The leaders of the colony were not energetic and did little to make the settlers find food. One member of the company, Captain John Smith, was determined that the colony would survive. Smith pressured the colonists to build huts, a storehouse, and a church. He made daring trips to Indian villages, demanding that they give the settlers food in return for beads and copper. He threatened settlers who were trying to leave the colony and go back to England. On one of his trips to the interior, Indians attacked John Smith. They killed his two companions, but captured him alive. He was taken first to the local chief. This chief was impressed by Smith's compass and spared his life. His captors dragged Smith from village to village. He finally arrived at the town belonging to Powhatan. Powhatan was a great chief for all of the tribes in that region. Powhatan and his advisers talked about what to do with Smith. Suddenly, Smith was dragged forward and his head was pushed against a stone. The warriors raised their clubs to kill Smith. Then Pocahontas, who was Powhatan's twelve year old daughter, begged for his life. Her words had no effect, so Pocahontas ran to Smith. She took his hand in her arms and laid her own head against his head. Smith was released and went back to Jamestown. Soon after Smith returned, one hundred new settlers from England arrived. It was a very cold winter, and in January, Jamestown was accidentally set on fire. The settlers suffered from cold and hunger the rest of the winter. 
every four or five days, Pocahontas and her attendants came. They brought food for the hungry settlers. Even so, half of them died. In the summer, John Smith explored that part of the coast of America. He made a map that would be very valuable for future sailors and settlers. On his return, Smith was elected leader of the colony at Jamestown. However, some settlers did not like having to follow rules. Some encouraged the Indians to try to kill Smith. Chief Powhatan agreed. He also refused to supply food to the colony, hoping to starve them out. Pocahontas warned Smith about the plot against his life. Smith had to fight off several attempts to kill him. Finally, the colony seemed to be growing, and the Indians became peaceful. But in late 1609, Smith was injured in an explosion and returned to England. Pocahontas remained a friend to the colony. She married John Rolfe, one of the settlers. In 1616, she traveled to England with her husband and son. There, she saw John Smith once again. She was so surprised to see him that she was unable to speak for several days. Pocahontas had believed that Smith was dead. The following year, she died and was buried in England. Pocahontas's love for Smith and Smith's determination to fight for the colony had saved Jamestown and given the English their first colony in America. Remember the Alamo. The first Europeans in the American Southwest were Spanish explorers and conquerors. They were followed by religious orders that set up missions to Christianize the Indians. One of these missions was San Antonio de Valero. It was founded in 1718 in what is now San Antonio, Texas. Later, the mission structure became known as the Alamo. In 1821, Moses Austin had persuaded the Spanish authorities to give him a charter to settle 200,000 acres in Texas. The elder Austin died shortly after this. Five weeks later, his son Stephen Austin traveled to San Antonio to have this charter confirmed by the Spanish governor. In 1822, Austin led 150 settlers into Texas. When Austin learned afterwards that Mexico was now independent of Spain, he journeyed to Mexico City to have his charter reconfirmed. The Mexicans appointed Austin regional administrator for his colony. Texas grew rapidly. Cotton farming and cattle ranching were profitable and attracted American settlers. By 1830, there were 16,000 Americans in Texas, four times the Spanish-Mexican population. Sam Houston had been a successful soldier and politician. He was a friend and supporter of President Andrew Jackson. However, personal problems and political difficulties led him to leave the USA for Texas. Meanwhile, the struggle for control of Mexico had been won in 1833 by Santa Anna. However, the independent thinking of the Texans infuriated Santa Anna. He had Stephen Austin thrown in jail and sent an army into Texas. Austin was released from jail in time to organize the defense of Texas. The Mexican army was besieged inside the Alamo, and after fierce fighting, surrendered. The Mexicans were allowed to go home. Sam Houston was now elected the state's supreme commander. Not long after this, Santa Anna approached Texas with an army of six thousand men. Houston decided not to meet Santa Anna in open battle, but to wait for an advantage. He sent frontiersman Jim Bowie to the Alamo. Bowie's orders were to leave San Antonio and destroy the Alamo. When Bowie arrived, however, Texas volunteers were preparing the Alamo for a siege. Bowie and his men pitched in to help. Other volunteers came. The fiery William Travis arrived with twenty-five men. Then the famous frontiersman Davy Crockett came with a dozen Tennessee sharpshooters. When Santa Anna attacked, there were one hundred eighty-three Americans inside the fort. Santa Anna brought up cannon to bombard the Alamo. As the walls began to crumble, four thousand Mexicans attacked from all four sides. The Mexicans overcame all resistance because of their large numbers, but they suffered very heavy losses. All the American defenders were killed. While the battle was raging, the Texans back at the colony declared their independence from Mexico. Sam Houston now gathered men to fight the Mexican army. At first, he retreated while waiting for a suitable opportunity. When Santa Anna's rapid advance left the bulk of the Mexican army behind, Houston prepared to fight. Santa Anna's advance troops moved into swampy land by the San Jacinto River. Houston's men attacked while the Mexicans were having their midday siesta. Their battle cry was, "Remember the Alamo!" 
the battle was soon over. Many Mexicans were killed, but only a couple of Texans were killed. Santa Ana was a prisoner. Santa Ana readily agreed now to recognize Texas as an independent republic. Ninety years later, in 1845, Texas became the 28th state of the USA. Gribio St. Francis of Assisi, who lived in Italy in the early 13th century, was known for his love of animals. He was the first person who celebrated the birth of Jesus by gathering live animals around a manger. He often talked to the birds as he traveled along. Sometimes the birds would fly down and sit on his head, shoulders, knees, and arms. But the best-known animal story concerns St. Francis and the wolf of Gribio. St. Francis was known for his humility and his unwillingness to hurt anyone. Once, when one of his followers spoke harshly to some bandits, St. Francis told the man to run after the bandits and apologize. In the same way, St. Francis thought of animals as his brothers and sisters. Once, when he was warned about some dangerous wolves, he replied that he had never harmed Brother Wolf and didn't expect the wolf to harm him. While St. Francis was staying in the hill town of Gribio, he heard about a large, fierce wolf. The townspeople were terrified of this wolf and had eaten both domestic animals and humans. St. Francis decided to help the people and went out to talk to the wolf. The people watched in horror as the wolf came running to attack St. Francis. But the saint made the sign of the cross. Then he said to the wolf that, in the name of Jesus, it should stop hurting people. The wolf then lay down at St. Francis's feet. St. Francis addressed a little sermon to the wolf. He recounted all the terrible things that the wolf had done, but he added that he wanted to make peace between the wolf and the townspeople. The wolf nodded its head in approval. In return for the wolf's agreement to keep the peace, St. Francis promised him that he would arrange for the townspeople to feed him. When he asked the wolf never again to harm any person or animal, the wolf nodded again. Then the wolf put out its paw as a sign that it would keep its promise. The wolf walked beside St. Francis back into Gribio. When a crowd assembled, the saint preached to them about how God had allowed the wolf to terrify them because of their sins. He told them to repent, and God would forgive them. Then he spoke of the promise that the wolf had made, and what he had promised the wolf in return. The people agreed to feed the wolf regularly, and the wolf again indicated that it would not hurt anyone. Again, it put its paw in St. Francis's hand. The wolf and the people kept the agreement. Two years later, the wolf died. The people remembered how it no longer hurt anyone, and that not a single dog ever barked at it. The townspeople of Gribio lamented its death. Whenever it went through town, it had reminded them of the virtues and holiness of St. Francis. Summertime In North America, July and August are holiday months. Most schools and colleges are not in session then. Families look for activities to keep the children amused. Although not all workers get a full two months of holidays, most people take a holiday in the summer. The summer begins with a national holiday. In Canada, July 1st is Canada Day. In the USA, July 4th is Independence Day. A lot of families are soon on the road. Some travel to cottages by the lake. Some go sightseeing or camping. In Canada especially, the summers are short, so people try to make the most of them. In much of Canada and parts of the northern USA are woodlands dotted with lakes. These regions of rocks, rivers, pine trees, and wild animals are not usually suitable for farming. However, they are ideal places to spend a summer holiday. They are far from the cities. The woods are quiet and peaceful. People fish, go boating or swimming, have barbecues outside, or play outdoor sports. Some people spend their whole summer at the cottage. Others go for a week or two. City people who don't have a cottage like to go to parks and swimming pools in the city. If they are near a lake or ocean, they may go there for the day. Many museums, libraries, and art galleries have programs for children in the summer. Swimming is probably the favorite summer sport. It feels wonderful on a very hot day to jump into the cool water. Swimming is also excellent exercise. Besides swimming, baseball and football are also popular in the summer. Spending an afternoon or evening at a baseball game is a favorite summer pastime. 
Summer is also a favorite time to catch up on reading. Stories of adventures and love novels are favorite light reading, but summer is especially a time for traveling across the country. Some people have a camper or trailer that they can live in. Some stay in campgrounds and sleep in tents. Others stay at hotels or motels, while others rent cottages or cabins for a week or two. Most trips are by car. Many people visit national parks and other wildlife areas. Of course, trips along the ocean and the lakes are favorites. Along the Atlantic Ocean, the coasts of New England and Canada's maritime provinces are especially popular. On the Pacific Coast, tourists travel from California all the way up to Alaska. Boat cruises along the shores of British Columbia and Alaska are especially popular. Of course, some people find it most relaxing just to stay at home. Others cannot afford to travel. If you have an air-conditioned house with a television, video player, CD player, and computer, then it can be very pleasant to stay at home. A lot of new movies are released at the theaters in the summer. Air-conditioned theaters with new movies and lots of pop and popcorn are favorite summer places. After two months of summer activities, most people are ready to go back to school and work, but they usually have lots of happy memories to take back with them. Telephone systems. When Alexander Graham Bell developed the telephone in the 1870s, it was fairly simple to use. You talked into the mouthpiece and then held it to your ear to listen. For a century or so, using the telephone meant either contacting the operator to dial a number or dialing yourself. After that, all you had to do was talk or listen. Nowadays, the telephone has become a very complex instrument. It rivals the computer as to the number of possible uses. Answering machines have been around for several decades, but they are now being replaced by voicemail. Voicemail does away with the need for an answering machine. Messages are stored on the system. That means it's possible to forward the message to someone else's phone or transfer the call to a more convenient phone of your own. You can also use call pickup so that anyone on your group can answer another's phone. Conference calls have become very common. This is when one person phones first one person, then another. And keeps adding people to the telephone conversation. This can regularly be done with up to six people. It is very useful for business discussions where different people need to talk about the same thing. It also speeds up the process of consensus and allows everybody to be in on the decision or discussion. The modern phone has many more features. If you don't want the caller to know what is being said in your office, you can push the mute button. If you want to hang up without putting the receiver down, press goodbye. If you don't want to receive calls, just forward them all into your voicemail. Newer phones will indicate when you have voicemail messages. If you have trouble with these features, an automatic voice will tell you your options. This help system is built into the telephone. For example, the help voice will tell you how to set up a distribution list so that you can send the same voice message to a number of people. It will also tell you how to send a message directly into someone's voicemail. You can designate your message to go to the top of the recipient's voicemail list. You can also program it so that the recipient cannot forward it. Some systems have limits on how much space can be used for individual voicemail. There are a number of courtesies that voicemail users should follow. Your greeting on your voicemail should be simple. If you are unable to take calls for any reason, you might want to explain that in your recorded greeting. If you are on vacation, you might want to include that information in your greeting. Don't use voicemail as a way to avoid answering the telephone. Some people use voicemail to screen calls. This can be annoying to someone who can never contact you directly. Check your messages regularly and reply to them promptly. Enjoy the telecommunications revolution. Texas, the state of Texas is famous for having the biggest and best of everything. Before Alaska became a state, Texas was the largest American state. It was also famous for its huge cattle ranches. Cotton is a major crop, but much of the wealth comes from oil and gas. People think of Texans as being wealthy because there have been lots of cattle and oil millionaires. In the late 19th century, Texas cattlemen used to drive their herds north to Kansas. There, a train to the east shipped the cows. Eventually, the railroad came to Texas, and the great cattle drive stopped. By then, many Texans owned large ranches and were quite wealthy. In the 20th century, oil has made many Texans wealthy. Oil refining has led to chemical industries and synthetic products. 
Most Texans now live in cities. Many oil companies have their headquarters in Dallas. Other large manufacturing cities are Houston, Corpus Christi, Fort Worth, and Austin, which is the capital of Texas. Several cities, such as San Antonio and El Paso, have a strong Spanish influence. This dates back to the first Spanish visitors in the 16th century. The old mission at San Antonio is famous as the Alamo, where an important battle for Texas independence was fought. Texas is a huge area with mountains, deserts, prairies, rivers, and islands. The rugged beauty of its grasslands and deserts attracts many tourists. For a state that is mostly dry, Texas has a remarkable variety of wildflowers in the spring. Its animals and birds differ from other parts of the USA. Texas has the armored insect eater, the armadillo, the swift running bird, the road runner, prairie dogs, jackrabbits, kangaroo rats, wild pigs, horned lizards, and 100 species of snakes. As might be expected, also, it has many beautiful kinds of cacti and other desert plants. At its largest, Texas is more than 600 miles wide by 600 miles long. Such a large area develops a distinct culture of its own, and Texans are widely recognized by their accent and manner of speaking, their attitudes and interests, and their sense of independence and self-reliance. Texas is also known for its beautiful women. Who regularly win national beauty contests? Its men have a reputation for being rugged, for not talking more than they have to, and for being straightforward and honest. Although many people think of cowboys and Indians when they think of Texas, it is a center for high-tech industries. The American Space Program has its headquarters in Houston, and Mission Control Center is there. Texas is also an important manufacturer of computers and other high-tech products. Oil production is still important in Texas, but it ranks third as a source of revenue behind manufacturing and tourism. The colorful history of Texas and its wonderful scenery contribute to a thriving tourist industry. Texas is also an important business and financial area. Yes, even though times have changed, Texans proudly maintain that their state still has the biggest and best of everything. The Ford Pinto case. Businessmen often complain that their profits are negatively affected by government regulations. On the other hand, history has proven that it is necessary to regulate business in at least one area: public safety. There is ample evidence that consideration for the safety of the public is not always a priority in business decisions. Back in 1912, the Titanic smashed into an iceberg, killing hundreds of people. It was going too fast through a large collection of icebergs while attempting to set a speed record. Unfortunately, there were not enough lifeboats to accommodate the passengers. Usually, when such a tragedy occurs, the company is not found guilty. Instead, safety regulations are enacted for future cases. In the future, ships were ordered to carry a sufficient supply of lifeboats. In 1978, the Ford Motor Company was indicted on the charge of homicide. This was the first time such a charge had been brought against an American corporation. It related to the deaths of three teenage girls who were burned up when their Ford Pinto was hit from behind. The prosecution charged that the Ford Company knowingly manufactured a dangerous car. Behind this story is the pressure on Ford to produce a small car to compete with imported vehicles. The Pinto was rushed into production in spite of warnings that the gas tank was in a dangerous position. It would have cost Ford an additional eleven dollars per car to fix the problem. Ford decided not to. Later, Ford produced a cost-benefit analysis to justify their position, estimating that the faulty design would cause 180 additional deaths. Ford valued these at $200,000 per person. This cost was far less than equipping 12.5 million vehicles with $11 protectors. So Ford felt that they had made the right decision. Ford executives were acquitted on the charge of homicide. Nonetheless, Ford had to pay out millions of dollars in out-of-court settlements. These were paid to families who had lost relatives in Pinto accidents. This case shows how far a company will go to protect its profits. For more than eight years, Ford lobbied the government not to tighten safety standards on cars. As long as the Pinto was profitable, Ford did not want to change the design. 
Although Ford made a lot of money on the Pinto, their reputation was tarnished. The Ford Pinto case is one of many which point to the need for governments to set safety standards. No business wants to recall its products or leave them sitting idly in a warehouse or expend large sums of money for upgrading and repairs. No airplane company wants to have its planes in the hangar when they could be in the air making money for the corporation. As a result, commercial companies are seldom motivated to look closely at product or service safety. This is especially true today, when the bottom line in business is seen as a justification for every decision. For this reason, governments have to oversee issues of public safety. Most businesses are too busy working on profits to have much time or concern for doing so. The Golden Man, El Dorado. When Christopher Columbus sailed west from Spain in 1492, he was trying to reach the Spice Islands, which today are called Indonesia. Spices were very scarce and valuable in Europe at this time. No one knew that two vast oceans and the American continents lay between Europe and Asia. Columbus did not find spices in America, but he did bring home some gold trinkets. The American Indians wore these as jewelry. Gold, not spices, was to become the biggest motive for exploration. Expeditions into the interior of the Americas were very costly and very risky. Only by promising the authorities huge profits could sailors and soldiers raise money for their expeditions. They also needed to promise rich rewards in order to get followers and crews. If a leader returned to Europe without gold and jewels, he might end up in jail. No wonder the Spanish conquerors were always searching for gold. At first, the Spaniards stayed around the coasts of the Caribbean Sea, but stories of gold in the interior tempted them to explore inland. They asked the Indians where their gold jewelry came from. The Indians would point further inland. They said that a wealthy people lived in the high mountains that traded gold and emeralds for pearls, cotton, and shells. The Spanish emperor had given the rights to exploit present-day Venezuela and Colombia to his German bankers in 1528. So Germans Dalfinger, Featherman, and Hohermuth led a series of expeditions into the jungles, grasslands, and mountains. Meanwhile, Spanish conquerors had found immense riches in gold and silver. Hernando Cortez had captured the kingdom of the Aztecs in Mexico in 1519. He had sent immense treasures to Europe. Soon after this, Francisco Pizarro began to explore the west coast of South America. In 1531, Pizarro invaded Peru and destroyed the kingdom of the Incas. Pizarro melted down the gold and silver treasures of the Incas and sent gold and silver bricks back to Spain. The rush to find more gold became very heated. Rumors came down from the mountains of Colombia about a golden man, El Hombre Dorado. There were stories about a king so rich that he wore gold dust instead of a coat. Colombia was the kingdom of the Chipchas. They were a trading people who traded salt and emeralds for gold, cotton, pearls, and shells. The actual gold did not come from their kingdom. It was found in the mountain rivers and brought to the Chipchas for refining and metalwork. Several armies converged on Chipcha territory. The first to arrive was the Spaniard Quesada, coming up the Magdalena River from the Caribbean. He found the chief cities of the Chipchas and seized their gold and emeralds. Shortly afterwards, one of Pizarro's captains arrived from Peru and Ecuador. Then the German Federman arrived from Venezuela. Quesada gave the latecomers some gold and jewels to ease their disappointment. Casada's men also found out about the Golden Man. High in the mountains was a lake created by a meteorite. The Indians believed that the Golden God from the sky now lived at the bottom of the lake. When a new leader of the tribe was elected, he was covered in grease, and fine gold dust was blown over his body so that he appeared to be made of gold. He was taken out to the middle of the lake on a raft. He would jump into the lake and stay in the water till the gold dust was washed off. It was considered an offering to the god. Gold ornaments were also tossed in the lake. Then the king and his followers would return to the shore. The ceremony was stopped several generations before the Europeans arrived. Many people were unwilling to believe that this was the whole story. They began to search for a golden city hidden in the jungle. Many explorers perished in this search. In their search for gold, the Spanish conquerors destroyed the great Indian civilizations of America. Towns and villages had been ruined. Thousands of people killed, and wonderful pieces of art melted down. 
Some Indians believe that gold must be a food that Europeans desperately needed to stay alive. In many cases, the Europeans destroyed the trading and social systems that had produced their wealth. When we think about the great achievements of a few conquerors and explorers, we are also sad about how much death and damage they caused. Clothing. I change my clothes a lot. If I am going somewhere fancy, I wear a dress. I wear stockings on my legs, and I wear a pair of nice shoes. If I am going to play sports, I wear a sweatshirt and jeans. If I am going to the beach, I wear a bathing suit or a bikini. My brother wears swimming trunks to the beach. At work, I wear a skirt and a blouse. Underneath my clothes, I wear underwear. A lady wears a bra and panties as underwear. A man wears boxer or jockey shorts as underwear. Today, I am wearing a blouse and a pair of jeans over my underwear. I have socks and shoes on my feet. In the summer, I often wear sandals on my feet. In the summer, the tops that I wear are usually sleeveless. I usually wear shorts in the summer. Sometimes I wear a sweater or a jacket if the weather is cool. I wear a cap or a hat on my head. I wear a belt to hold up my jeans or my slacks. Women sometimes wear a dress or a skirt. Men wear a pair of slacks and a shirt. Some men wear a suit and a shirt and tie. If it is very cold outside, I wear a winter coat. If it is cold, I like to wear gloves or mittens on my hands. Sometimes I wrap a scarf around my neck to keep warm. I wear a toque on my head in cold weather. I wear boots on my feet in the winter. If it is raining, I wear a raincoat. The way that I dress depends a lot on the weather. Colors. Red is a vibrant color. Roses are sometimes red. Blood is red. White is the color of snow. Clouds are very often white. Blue is the color of the sky and the ocean. Black isn't really a color at all. Tar is black. A crow is black. Green is the color of grass. It is also the color of leaves on the trees in the summer. Brown is the color of dirt. Many people have brown hair. Yellow is a bright color. Most people use yellow when they draw a picture of the sun. Orange is an easy color to remember. That is because an orange is orange. Pink is the color that we dress baby girls in. We dress baby boys in blue. Purple is the color of some violets. The Canadian flag. Is red and white. What color is your flag? Wild animals. Some animals are wild. They don't live in homes or cages. They live in jungles or on plains. The lion is the king of the beasts. He is very mighty. He roars loudly. The giraffe has a long neck. He eats leaves from the tallest trees. The elephant is very large. He has a trunk and two tusks. A tiger has stripes. Some bears are black and some are brown. There are even white bears called polar bears. A kangaroo lives in Australia. That is the only place that you would find a kangaroo except in a zoo. It might be frightening to run into a wolf or a fox. Monkeys run and play in the trees. In Canada, we don't see lions, tigers, giraffes, or monkeys running wild. There are squirrels in my backyard. Sometimes I see a raccoon or a chipmunk. In northern Ontario, you might see a moose or a bear. I have seen a deer in the forest. There are many wild animals. You can see wild animals if you go to the zoo. 
months. There are 12 months in the year. January is the first month of the year. It is usually cold in January. February is the second month of the year. It is still winter when February comes. They say that March comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. That means that it is still usually cold and sometimes stormy when March begins. By the time that March ends, the weather is starting to get a little better. April is the rainy month. April showers bring May flowers. Many of the spring flowers bloom in May. The weather can be quite mild in May. June is usually a nice warm month. Many people get married in June. July can be hot. People have vacations in July. It is a month to do summer things. It is still summer in August, but the summer is winding down. August is the time to have last minute vacations. In September, we go back to school. The autumn winds begin to blow. October really feels like autumn. October is Halloween time. November is when we really start to feel the chill. December is the Christmas month. Most people do a lot of Christmas shopping in December. They spend quite a bit of time getting ready for Christmas. All of the months are different. Which month were you born in? Days of the week. There are seven days of the week. Sunday is a day of rest for some people, but many people still have to work. Quite a few people go to church on a Sunday. On Monday morning, we go back to school after the weekend. Many people say they don't like Monday because it is the beginning of the work week. Tuesday is a school day and a working day. I don't think that there is anything special about a Tuesday. Wednesday is the middle of the work week. On Thursday, many of the stores and malls stay open later. It gives you a chance to run some errands on a Thursday night. On Friday, you feel like the work week is nearly over. Some people say, Thank goodness it is Friday. They look forward to the weekend. On Saturday, many people can sleep in late. People get errands done on Saturday. You see a lot of people in the grocery store on a Saturday. Most children look forward to Saturday so that they can play with their friends. Then Sunday comes again. The weeks turn into months and the months turn into years. Time goes by quite quickly. Describing things. Some things are different shapes. They can be described by their shape. A circle is round. A compact disc is a circle. A square has four equal sides. A rectangle is similar, but two of the sides are longer. A triangle has only three sides. Have you ever seen anyone play a triangle in an orchestra? The word triangle can stand for an instrument or a shape. An oval is rounded, but it is not round. An egg is an oval shape. The floor is flat. If something is smooth, it has no bumps or lumps. Silk is smooth. Some things are rough. Sandpaper is rough. If something is dull, it is not sharp or pointed. A dull knife will not cut bread because the blade is not sharp. If something is pointed, it has a sharp end. A sharp pencil has a pointed end. A pencil that has been used a lot and hasn't been sharpened has a dull end. Some things are soft. A teddy bear is soft. It feels good to touch. Some things are hard. A rock is hard. Soft can also represent a noise level. If you have a soft voice, it is not very loud. If someone tells you to speak softly, they want you to speak quietly. Loud is the word used to describe noises that hurt your ears. A big truck will make a loud noise. Sometimes your mother will tell you that your music is too loud. Fruit Some fruit grows on trees. Apples grow on trees. You can get red, yellow, or green apples. Some apples are green until they ripen. Then they turn red. 
Peaches grow on trees. Peaches have a fuzzy skin. Cherries grow on trees. You can climb a ladder and pick cherries from the tree. Cherries and peaches have pits inside them. The pits are not edible. Pears also grow on trees. Lemons grow on trees. They are very sour. Have you ever picked strawberries? Strawberries do not grow on trees. You have to bend down to pick strawberries. Have you ever tried strawberry shortcake? It is very good. Grapes grow on vines. People use grapes to make wine. There are many types of berries. There are blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, and cranberries, just to name a few. Some fruits are more exotic. There are mangoes and papayas. They don't grow in Canada. Bananas and oranges don't grow in a Canadian climate either, but we are able to buy them here. Some fruits have to be peeled, and some can be eaten as they are. It is always a good idea to wash fruit before you eat it. The farmers spray the crops with pesticides to kill bugs, so it is good to wash that off. Bugs. Many people are afraid of bugs. Some bugs do bad things, like eating crops or clothes. Some bugs, such as termites, even eat wood. Other bugs can be good. Spiders catch flies. Flies are not good because they carry germs. Insects get caught in the web that the spider builds. Ants get into homes and eat food. Bees are good because honey comes from bees. It is not good if you get stung by a bee. A caterpillar turns into a butterfly. Butterflies can be very beautiful. You can find grasshoppers outside on a sunny day. Grasshoppers hop through the grass. Crickets make a noise by rubbing their legs together. Dragonflies usually live near water. They have large, colorful wings. Ladybugs are red with little black dots. There are many types of beetles. Nobody wants to have cockroaches in their house. Centipedes have many legs. Fleas get onto your pets and bite them. They make your dog or cat itchy. Mosquitoes can make you itchy when they bite you. Have you ever had a mosquito bite? The kitchen. The kitchen is where we make and eat our meals. There is a stove in the kitchen. Inside the stove, there is an oven where you bake things. You can put a cake into the oven to bake. On top of the stove are burners. The burners get hot. You put pots or pans on the burners. The refrigerator is where we store the food that needs to be kept cold. We keep milk, eggs, cheese, and vegetables in the refrigerator. At the top of the refrigerator is the freezer. The freezer keeps things frozen. We have frozen vegetables, ice cream, and ice cubes in the freezer. We have a toaster in the kitchen. You put the bread in the toaster, and it turns into toast. We have an electric kettle. We boil water to make tea in the kettle. There is a double sink in the kitchen. That is where we wash the dishes. We turn on the hot tap and put some dish detergent into the sink to wash the dishes. Sometimes we put the dishes into the dishwasher, and the dishwasher washes the dishes. There are other things in the kitchen. There are utensils like knives, forks, and spoons. There are tea towels and dishcloths. There are oven mitts and pot holders to take hot things out of the oven. There are pots to cook and boil things in. There are pans to fry things. We have dishes that we eat from. We have plates for our dinner and bowls that we can put our soup in. We drink from cups or coffee mugs or glasses. We keep our juice in a pitcher or a jug. There is a timer that you can set when you are cooking. The timer buzzes when the food is ready. We also have a microwave oven in the kitchen. If we are in a hurry, we cook our food in the microwave. Questions and answers. Here are some questions that you might be asked and some responses that you might make. Hello, how are you today? I am fine, thanks. How are you? It is a beautiful day today, isn't it? Yes, it is a lovely day.
I wish the weather would clear up, don't you? Yes, I'm getting tired of all this rain. How old are you? I am twelve years old. Where are you going? I am going to my friend's house. Do you know how much this costs? Yes, it costs twelve dollars. What is your name? My name is Mary Jones. Would you like a ride to school? No, thank you. I never accept rides from strangers. How do I get to Main Street? Turn right at the next corner. Walk about two blocks, and you will see Main Street. Have you seen that movie? No, but I have heard that it is very good. What is your favorite color? My favorite color is blue. Is your father home? Yes, just a minute. I will get him for you. May I help you? Yes, I am looking for the shoe department. Vegetables. Vegetables are very good for you. They say that you should have three servings of vegetables every day. I like green peas. Peas come in pods. I also like snow peas. You eat the pods on the snow peas. I like corn when it is on the cob. Carrots are good to eat raw. Beans are good for you. There are many different types of beans. There are string beans, kidney beans, baked beans, and lots of other types of beans. Some people don't like green vegetables like broccoli and Brussels sprouts. I like broccoli and Brussels sprouts. You can make a salad and put lots of different vegetables into the salad. In my salads, I like lettuce, tomatoes, celery, cucumber, radishes, cauliflower, and spring onions. I try to have a salad with dressing on it every day. My dad likes root vegetables like beets and parsnips. My brother will only eat potatoes. He likes his potatoes baked. My mother likes to buy her vegetables at the market. She says they are fresher there. My mother buys a lot of onions. She puts onions in almost all the meals that she cooks. Some children won't eat their vegetables. I didn't like some vegetables at first, but I have become used to them. I like having vegetables with my meals. Pets. There are many different animals that you can have for pets. The most common pets are cats and dogs. I think the second most common pets are birds and fish. You can hug a cat or a dog. You can play with a cat or a dog, but it is difficult to play with a bird or a fish. Some birds are very smart and they can be taught to do things. Parrots are very clever. Some of them even talk. Birds usually stay in bird cages. Fish have to stay in the water in a tank or a fishbowl. Some people have gerbils or guinea pigs as pets. There are even people who have ferrets as pets. I have a friend who has a lizard for a pet. She has to buy live crickets for her lizard to eat. Another friend of mine has a pet snake. I don't think I would like to have a pet snake. There are different types of dogs. Some dogs are very big and some are small. A Labrador Retriever is a big dog. A poodle is usually a small dog, although there are some large poodles. Some dogs are noisy and they bark a lot. Other dogs are quiet and obedient. I once had a dog. It was a cocker spaniel. I used to take it for walks. There are different types of cats too. My favorite type of cat is a Siamese cat. Siamese cats have blue eyes. My mother had a Persian cat. It was very furry. My mother said that it used to shed fur all over the house. Pets are a lot of fun, but they are a lot of work too. To be a good pet owner, you have to be very responsible. Parties. Parties can be a lot of fun. People get invited to parties. You can have a party because it is a special occasion, or just because you want to have a party. Sometimes people wear paper hats at parties.
These are called party hats. Some people decorate with streamers and balloons. At some parties, there is a cake. Sometimes there are just snacks and drinks. At some parties, people play games. There are also parties where people just stand around and talk. People wear different things to parties. You can go to some parties in casual clothes. At other parties, you need to be dressed up in good clothes. There are other parties where you are supposed to wear a costume. There are many different kinds of parties. There are Christmas parties, birthday parties, going away parties, and parties for no reason at all. I have been to parties for people who are retiring, or for people who have just had a new baby. There are hundreds of reasons for having a party. At some parties, you take a gift. If it is a birthday party, then you take a gift and a birthday card to the person who is having the birthday. Sometimes people will ask you to bring food or drinks to the party. All parties are different. It is nice to be invited to parties. Grocery shopping. What do you see when you go to the grocery store? The aisles are filled with food. There are also refrigerators and freezers filled with food. There are sometimes things in bins in the middle of the aisles. There are different departments in the grocery store. There is the bakery. In the bakery, there are sweet things such as cakes, pies, cookies, and tarts. There are also things that you would eat with your dinner, like bread and buns. There are other things in the bakery department, like bagels and biscuits. The baker works in the bakery. There is the canned goods section. This is where you might find sauces and soups. Vegetables and fruits also come in cans. There is the section for dairy products. Here you would find milk and cream. The dairy section would also have cheese and butter. Yogurt is also found in the dairy section. In the meat department, there is beef and pork. Poultry is also found in the meat department. Poultry is chicken, duck, and goose. There are also cold cuts in the meat department. Cold cuts are the meats that are sliced up for sandwiches. Some examples of cold cuts are ham and bologna. The butcher works in the meat department. The produce department is full of fruits and vegetables. Clerks spray water on the fruits and vegetables to keep them fresh. There is a section in the grocery store for personal hygiene. This is where you would find shampoo and toothpaste. Soap and skin products would also be in this section. There is even a section for your pets. You can buy cat food and dog food. There are toys for cats and dogs. Oh. Differences. Are you tall or short? Are you big or small? People come in many different shapes and sizes. Some people wear size small clothes. Other people wear size medium clothes. There are people who wear large size clothes. Some people even wear extra large clothes. Some people are thin. Some people are fat. Some people are in between. There are people with short hair. Other people have long hair. Some people have no hair at all. No two people are exactly alike. Some people have long legs. I have short legs. I don't walk as fast as a person with long legs. I am not a tall person. In fact, I am quite short. My feet are a size seven. My mother has size five feet. My father has size twelve feet. We are all different sizes. It is not a bad thing. It is a good thing that we are all unique. The restaurant. When you go to a restaurant, you might see a sign that says, "Please wait to be seated." A host or hostess will ask you how many people are in your party. Then they will want to know if you want to sit in the smoking or non-smoking section. The host or hostess will take you to your seat. You might sit at a table or at a booth. The host or hostess will give you a menu to look at. Sometimes there are different menus for different meals. There can be a breakfast menu, a lunch menu, and a dinner menu. Sometimes there is also a wine list and a dessert menu. The food and the prices of the food are listed on the menu. On your table there will be cutlery. Cutlery is the knives, forks, and spoons. 
There will also be a napkin. You are supposed to put your napkin on your lap when you eat. Your waiter or waitress will take your order. You might want an appetizer before your meal. Some people want a salad or soup before their meal. After your meal, you might have a dessert or tea or coffee. When it is time to go, you will pay your bill and leave a tip for the waiter or waitress. Traffic. Traffic moves along on the streets and highways. There are rules that drivers must follow to make the traffic flow smoothly. You must wear a seat belt. The seat belt helps to keep you safe. You must stop at all stop signs. You must also stop at a red light. A green light means go, and a yellow light means to be careful. If you see a sign that says school crossing, you have to be careful because you are near a school and children might be crossing the street. Some places are crosswalks. Those are places where people cross the street. People who are walking have the right of way. If you hear a siren behind you, you must pull over. An emergency vehicle like a police car or an ambulance might need to get somewhere fast. When a school bus puts on its flashing signals, you have to stop. You can't go past the school bus because children may be crossing the street from the bus. You should always obey the speed limit. It is not good to drive too fast. People should never drink and drive. Driving is a serious business. You have to obey all the rules to be a good driver. Music. If you were in an orchestra, what would you play? Would you play a tuba, a trumpet, or a saxophone? Perhaps you would prefer a stringed instrument like a violin or a cello. Maybe you would enjoy percussion more. You could play the kettle drum. There are instruments that have keyboards. A piano and an organ have keyboards. There are instruments that have strings on them. A guitar, banjo, and mandolin have strings on them. There are instruments that you blow into. A flute, a French horn, and a harmonica are all instruments that you blow into. There are instruments that you hit with a stick. A drum and a cymbal are two things that you would hit with a stick. If you are in an orchestra, you have to watch the conductor. He will lead you through the piece of music. You might just want to be in a band for fun. You could join a rock band or a dance band. Some people learn to read music. Music notes are written on a staff. Each note represents a sound. There are whole notes, half notes, quarter notes, and eighth notes. Each one of these is held for a different number of beats. It is good to learn about music. You have to learn your scales and learn about sharps and flats. If you want to learn how to play an instrument, it is best to take music lessons. Who, what, where, and why? These are important words. They are all words that begin questions. Who is about a person? Who is the girl with the blue dress on? Who stole my watch? Who will come with me to the game? Who is driving us to the party? What is about a thing? What is that big thing on the sidewalk? What should I do when I get to your house? What kind of clothes should I wear to the party? What shall I buy you for your birthday? Where is about a place? Where are you going for your vacation? Where did I leave my glasses? Where did my brother go? Where on earth is Timmins? Why is the word that asks for an explanation? Why did you take the last piece of pie? Why is the world round? Why should I give you any money? Why did the chicken cross the street? They say that you should answer all of these questions if you are writing a good story. You have to give the who, what, where, and why to write a good story. Which direction? Which direction should I go in? Should I go up? If I go up, I will head toward the sky. I can go up the stairs. Should I go down? I can go down the stairs to the basement. I can climb down into a hole. Should I go left or right? I am right-handed, so I know which way right is. Should I go backwards? I would be going away from the things that I am facing now if I went backwards. 
If I went backwards from the thing that I am facing, I would go away from it. Should I go forward? I will just go straight ahead if I go forward. If I am facing something and I go forward, then I will go toward the thing that I am facing. Maybe I should go sideways, but which side? Left or right? It sounds very complicated, but it is not. Directions are very easy to follow if you just stop and think about them. The office. Some people work in an office. There are special tools that people in an office need to do their work. There is a computer in the office. There is a telephone. Most of the time, the secretary answers the telephone. The secretary sits at a desk. The secretary has pens and pencils on the desk. The secretary writes on a notepad. Some other things that you would find in an office would include the following: a stapler to staple pages together, a photocopier to copy pages, a pencil sharpener to sharpen pencils, a water cooler where the employees could get a drink of water, a hole punch to make holes in sheets of paper, and liquid paper which is used to blank out errors on a page. Some offices have many employees in them. All of the employees have their own desks. Other offices just have one person at a desk. In some offices, there is a secretary or a receptionist, and then there is the boss in another room. There are often many important papers in an office. Important papers can be called documents. You might have to sign a document or fill out a form in an office. Some offices have bookshelves filled with books. The books are filled with information that the people in the office need. You will have to visit an office sometime. Maybe it will be a doctor's office or a lawyer's office. There are many different types of offices. Money. I keep my money in the bank. I have saved up my money. I saved all my pennies in a jar. A penny is only worth one cent. I have nickels. A nickel is worth five cents. A dime is worth ten cents. A quarter is worth twenty-five cents. A quarter is a quarter of a dollar. Four quarters make up a dollar. A dollar is worth one hundred cents. I saved up all of my dollars. Our dollars used to be paper, but now they are coins. We call our dollars loonies. It's a funny name. We also have two-dollar coins. We call those toonies. We have five-dollar bills and ten-dollar bills. If you are lucky, you will have twenty-dollar bills, fifty-dollar bills, and even hundred-dollar bills. Our bills in Canada are different colors. That makes them easy to recognize if you go somewhere to spend them. It is wise to save your money. If you save enough, you could have hundreds or thousands of dollars. Manners. It is good to be polite. People like you more when you are polite. Always say please and thank you. If you ask for some milk, you should say, "Please, may I have a glass of milk?" When someone gives you the milk, you should respond with, "Thank you." It is not difficult to be polite. You should not push or shove people. You should cover your mouth when you cough or sneeze. You should address people properly. If you are trying to get someone's attention, you would say, "Excuse me." You wouldn't say, "Hey, you." There are table manners. That is where you eat properly and politely at the dinner table. You don't shove food into your mouth. You don't reach over other people's plates. You don't talk with your mouth full. All of these things are common sense. Being polite is mostly thinking about how you would like to be treated. You wouldn't want people to be impolite to you. It is not polite to point at people. It is not polite to burp out loud. It is not polite to use someone else's things without asking first. Being polite just comes naturally if you have been brought up in a home where everyone was polite. The two sexes. There are two sexes or genders. There is the male gender and there is the female gender. Males and females are different, both physically and mentally. Humans are both male and female, and animals are both male and female. If you have a dog, it is either a girl dog or a boy dog. Boys grow up to be men. Men grow hair on their faces. Men are usually more muscular than women. Men dress differently than women. Men are males. Males are masculine. Girls grow up to be women. Only women can have babies. Women are females. 
females are feminine. Another word for women is ladies. It is good that we have males and females. Your father is a male. Your grandfather, brother, and uncle are males. Your mother is a female. Your grandmother, sister, and aunt are females. Else, else, me. I am special. Nobody in the world is exactly like I am. They might have the same hair color and eyes that I do, but they are not exactly like me. I am the only person in the world who thinks my thoughts. No two people in the world are exactly alike. It is good to be your own person. It is good to be creative, and be natural. People have to follow the laws and the rules. People should always be kind to others. I try to follow all the rules. I am kind to others. I am a lot like many other people, yet I am different. I am like my friend Jane, but she has red hair, and I have dark hair. She has a loud voice, and I have a soft voice. She likes to eat vegetables, and I do not. Jane and I are the same height. We both like movies, and we are both afraid of spiders. We wear the same size shoes, and we both have the same favorite color. We are best friends, but sometimes we disagree about things. We are alike in many ways, and different in many ways. If we were all exactly the same, the world would be a very boring place. I am myself. And I am glad that I am special. You are special too. Use your own special talents, and take the time to meet other people. The world is made up of a lot of different people, and that's what makes life exciting. My cat. I got my cat when she was just a tiny kitten. I named her Puff. Because her fur is soft and fluffy, she has white fur, but her tail, paws, and ears are black. She has a little pink nose and yellow eyes. She says meow whenever she wants a bowl of milk. I feed her cat food and treats. She washes her face with her paw when she is finished eating. My whole family loves her, and we can tell that she loves us. She loves to curl up in our laps. She purrs whenever we pet her. She is very playful. We sometimes roll up a piece of paper and throw it to her. She loves to chase the paper and hit it with her paws. She also chases bugs. Last night she chased a spider, but she was afraid to touch it. At night she curls up in my bed with me. She likes to be warm. I have given her a blanket of her own, but when I put her on it, her tail twitches. Her tail twitches whenever she's upset or angry. I know she doesn't want to be on her blanket. She wants to be in my bed. I let her into my bed, and she falls asleep, purring loudly. Music. My family is very musical. My father plays the guitar. He plays in a band. The band plays country music. My mother is a singer in the band. She also plays the piano. I took the flute in music class at school. I play the flute in the school band. I also sing in the school choir. I have a low voice. My sister has a high voice. She is a soprano. At home. I like to practice the drums, but my mother says that it's too loud. Sometimes I play so loudly that I break a drumstick. I practice whenever she goes out. I would like to be in a rock band. Some of my friends and I are thinking of starting our own rock band. My sister is a very good piano player. She has won many awards at music festivals. She likes to play classical music. But sometimes I get her to play rock music with me. She is also a very good singer. I like to sing with her. We sing in harmony. 
I listen to music all the time on the radio. I know a lot of songs. I can sing along with most of the songs that come on the radio. I memorize the lyrics of the songs. My sister and I sometimes get together and sing our favorite songs. Maybe someday we will start our own rock band, and I will be the drummer. Spring. It rains a lot in the spring. The trees are full of buds, and the flowers are starting to bloom. My favorite spring flowers are tulips and daffodils. The birds come back from the south. I can always tell that spring is here when I see my first robin of the season. The robins pull worms from the wet ground. When it isn't raining, my friends and I go outside and toss a ball around. We look forward to the summer, but we are glad to get outside after the long winter. The air smells so fresh in the spring. My mother always tells me not to track mud into the house. It's very muddy in our yard in the springtime. I wipe my muddy feet before I go into the house. There are a lot of puddles in my yard. I sometimes splash in the puddles, and I get wet and cold, so I have to go into the house. I like it when the snow has melted, the rain has stopped, and the sun comes out. On sunny days. I always get together with my friends. On those days, we either ride our bikes or play ball. My parents like to go for walks on spring evenings. They also like to clean up the yard in the spring. Everyone seems to be outside. The springtime brings people out of their houses. The birthday party. Yesterday, I went to a birthday party. My friend Jane had her tenth birthday. Her house was decorated with balloons and streamers. Her mother had baked a big birthday cake. The cake had "Happy Tenth Birthday, Jane" written on it. There were ten candles on the cake. Jane blew out the candles and made a wish. I wonder what she wished for. Your wish won't come true if you tell anyone what it was. We sang "Happy Birthday to You." At the party, we played some games. I won one of the games, so I got a prize. We also swam in Jane's swimming pool. Jane opened her gifts. Her gifts were wrapped in bright paper and bows. She got lots of nice gifts. She got some compact discs, some clothes, and some computer games. Jane thanked everyone. We ate a lot of food at Jane's party. We had hot dogs. I put mustard and ketchup on my hot dog. Then we ate cake and ice cream. We had pop to drink. I think I had too much cake and ice cream. I was very full by the time the party was over. We thanked Jane and her mother before we all went home. It was a very good party. Everyone had a good time. I hope Jane had a happy tenth birthday. My classroom. My classroom is a large room. It's full of brightly colored pictures. My teacher hangs pictures up all over the walls. There are blackboards at the front of the room. My teacher always has writing all over the blackboards. Sometimes the chalk squeaks when she writes on the blackboard. We cover our ears when that happens. Our classroom is full of desks. There are a lot of students in our class. Our desks are full of books, notebooks, and pens. I try to keep my desk neat, but I have a lot of things in there. My ruler and pencils are always falling out of my desk. At the back of the room is a bookcase full of books. We can sign those books out and take them home to read. I have read a lot of the books. I like mysteries and biographies, so I have taken many of those home. There are also tables at the back of the room. That's where we do our artwork. We spread out big sheets of paper and use paints or crayons to make pictures. Sometimes we cut things out of magazines with scissors and we glue pictures to the paper. I like art class. After school, my friends and I often erase the blackboards for the teacher. Then we take the erasers outside and clap them together to get the chalk dust out of them. My friends and I walk home together and talk about what we did in school and what we're going to do after supper.
Vacation My family and I went on vacation to Lake Huron. The water is beautiful and blue there, and the sand is nice and white. The week that we were there was very hot. The sun was hot, but the water was still very cold. I went swimming and tried to catch little fish in my hands. I was careful not to get sunburned. We stayed at a hotel that had a pool and a game room. I played pinball and video games sometimes. I like to swim in the hotel pool, but I like the beach better. I would lie on a big beach towel and get warm. Then I would jump in the water and cool off. Sometimes I would just lie on the sand and watch the waves roll up on shore. I found some seashells and saw a crab walking on the sand. At first, I was a bit lonely because I didn't know anyone there. It wasn't long before I met some other kids my age. We built sandcastles together and swam in the lake. The other kids were from different towns, so we told each other stories about our schools and friends. We found that we had a lot in common, even though we were from different places. Our families got together and went to restaurants together. We played volleyball on the beach, and we sat around a campfire at night and sang songs. At the campfire, we would roast marshmallows on a stick. I always burn my marshmallows. That is okay. I like them that way. Mostly, we just swam in the lake until we were very tired. I was sorry when our vacation was over. I had a good time at Lake Huron. I met some very good friends there. We still write to each other. Maybe we'll see each other next summer. My house. I live in a two-story house. The bottom of the house is painted white. The upper part of the house is made of red brick. The chimney is also made of red brick. If you go through the front door and turn right, you'll see the living room. The living room is very large and comfortable. There are easy chairs, a coffee table, and a sofa in there. I like to sit in there and relax. Next to the living room is the dining room. There are a dining table and chairs in there. We use this room whenever we have visitors over for dinner. Beside the dining room is the kitchen. The kitchen has a stove and a refrigerator in it. There's also a kitchen table with some benches at it. Most of the time, we eat in the kitchen. Upstairs, there are three bedrooms. My parents' bedroom is very big. They have a large, queen-sized bed in there, and there are two closets for their clothes. My room is smaller. My room is painted pink, and I have ruffled curtains on the windows. From my bedroom window, you can see the front yard. There's a pine tree in the front yard. My brother's bedroom is painted blue. He has blinds on the windows. He has a bunk bed in his room. If he has a friend stay over, one of them can sleep on the top bunk and the other can sleep on the bottom bunk. You can see the backyard from his bedroom window. There are rose bushes and a picnic table in the backyard. There is also a white fence that has a gate in it. In the basement, there is a recreation room. This is where we watch television and have friends over to visit. The laundry room is also in the basement. There's a washing machine and a dryer in there. Beside our house is a garage. We keep the car in the garage whenever the weather is bad. Our house is just the right size for our family. Friends are always welcome at our house. My family. My grandparents are coming to visit us from Calgary, Alberta. My father is very happy because they are his parents and he's glad that he will see them. We don't see them very often because Calgary is a long way from Toronto. My grandparents have two sons, my father and my Uncle Bill. Uncle Bill is married to my Aunt Susan. They have a daughter who is my cousin. My cousin is a lot older than I, so we do not have a lot in common. They also have a son who is the same age as me. He is my favorite cousin because we both like the same television shows and the same games. I have two brothers and one sister. My brothers are both younger than I. They are twins, so they have the same birthday. My sister is one year older than I. 
People say that my sister and I look alike. We both have blonde hair and blue eyes. My mother's parents live near us. They are my grandmother and grandfather who visit us often. My mother does not have any brothers or sisters. She is an only child. I like it when all my family is together. I don't have a lot of cousins, like some people do, but I have fun with my relatives. My uncle will often take my cousin and me to the movies. I like to take my grandparents for walks so they can see my school and they can meet my friends. My parents talk to my brothers and my sister and I a lot. We are a very close-knit family. People who have close families are very lucky. Winter Once the fall is over and the snowflakes start to fall, I get very excited. I can hardly wait for the ground to be covered with a blanket of white snow. I put on my mittens, my scarf, my hat, coat, and winter boots, and I run out into the fluffy snow. I have to be careful not to slip on the ice. It can get very icy and cold in the winter. The first thing that I do is to build a snowman. I sometimes build a snow fort, too. My friends and I have a good snowball fight. We laugh a lot, and our cheeks and noses get very red. When we get too cold, we go into the house and have a cup of hot chocolate. My father fills the backyard with water that freezes and turns into an ice rink. When the ice is hard enough, my friends and I get our skates, and we go out on the ice to play hockey. All of my friends own hockey sticks. I am usually the goalie, and I have to keep the puck from going into the net. My sister and her friends don't really like to play hockey. They would rather just skate around on the ice. I took skating lessons, so I don't usually fall down. My little brother is just learning to skate, so he falls down a lot. My father has to shovel the snow off the paths and the driveway in the winter. I help him. Shoveling snow is hard work. When my dad and I finish shoveling the driveway, we go into the house and warm our hands and feet in front of the fireplace. There is probably nothing more beautiful than fresh fallen snow on the trees. In the morning, when the sun shines on the snow, it glistens. I like to leave my footprints in the snow. Winter can be very beautiful and exciting. Autumn Some people call autumn the fall. You can call it either one. Autumn is the time when the leaves change color. They change from green to beautiful shades of gold, orange, and red. It looks like an artist has come along and painted all the trees. The air starts to get a little colder in the autumn. We begin to wear jackets or sweaters. We go back to school in the autumn. The teacher sometimes gets us to make leaf collections. We collect different types of leaves and make a display of them. Autumn is the time when old friends get back together and talk about what they did on their summer vacations. Halloween comes in the autumn. We dress up in costumes. Some of them are scary, and some of them are funny. We go from door to door and say, Trick or treat, and people give us candies. We wear masks on our faces, and we have a lot of fun. The autumn winds start to blow. The wind blows the leaves right off the trees until the trees have bare branches. My friends and I have a lot of fun outside before the winter leaves us shivering. We play football and soccer at school. After school, we ride our bikes through the piles of dry leaves. The leaves go flying through the air as we drive through them. My parents rake the leaves up and put them in a big pile. I like to jump in the big piles of leaves, but then my parents just have to rake them up again. The skies get a little cloudier in the autumn and we know that soon there will be snow, so we enjoy the brisk autumn weather while we can. Summer Yahoo! School is over! We are free for the summer. My friends and I run out on the last day of school into the bright summer sun. We sing a song about no more pencils and no more books. We can hardly wait to do all the summer things that we like to do. We go swimming. We play baseball. We ride our bikes and we go to the beach. We go on vacations, or some of us go to summer camp. It is just nice to run barefoot through the grass or lie on your back and look up at the clouds. 
Summer days are lazy days. We don't have to do schoolwork. We listen to the buzzing of the bees. We watch the birds as they fly from tree to tree. We go down to the pond and toss rocks into the water. We eat ice cream and we have barbecues. Some of my friends' parents have boats, so we go for rides in their boats. Some of my friends go to their cottages. They have cottages on lakes. Some of my friends even have summer jobs. My best friend works at a supermarket. My father pays me to do jobs for him. I cut the grass, take out the garbage, and wash the car. I like to be outside in the sunshine. On Sundays, my mother will pack a picnic lunch, and we go down to the park. Sometimes we play baseball. There is also a tennis court at the park. I'm a very good tennis player. My sister just likes to swing on the swings and slide down the slide. We eat our sandwiches and watch out for the ants that always seem to be at picnics. After we have our lunch, my sister and I run off to play with the other children. My dad has a nap, and my mother reads her book. My skin gets brown from the sun in the summer. Summer is my favorite season. I like the sounds, smells, and feelings that come with the summer sun. Summer is a lot of fun. I wish summer could go on forever. The doctor. I didn't feel very well last week. I had a sore throat and a fever. My mother took me to see the doctor. When we got there, the nurse took my name and said that the doctor would be with me soon. The doctor was a very nice man in a white jacket. I had seen the doctor before when I had my tonsils out at the hospital. The doctor took a light and looked in my ears. He put a stick on my tongue and he shone his light into my mouth. He looked at my throat. He said that my throat was a bit swollen and red. He felt my neck and said my glands were swollen. He took my temperature and said that it was quite high. He listened to my heart. And he made me cough. He asked me some questions. He said he might have to do some tests. He sent me to get some blood taken out of my arm. I was scared, but it didn't really hurt. The doctor gave me some pills and told me to take one in the morning and one at night. He told me to drink lots of fluids. He told me to get plenty of sleep. I did exactly what the doctor told me to do. It wasn't very long before I was feeling well again. I think that I might like to be a doctor when I grow up. I would like to make people feel better. The dentist. My friend's father is a dentist. He has an office near my house. I went to see him on Thursday. His nurse told me to sit in a very big chair. She tied a bib under my chin. The dentist came in. He examined my teeth with some shiny silver tools. He looked at my front teeth and my back teeth. He told me that the back teeth were called molars. He told me to open wide. He had a little mirror that he used to look at my teeth. He said that I had good, strong teeth. He told me that I didn't have any cavities. I told him that I didn't eat a lot of candies and that I always brush my teeth after every meal. He said that was very good. He asked me if I flossed my teeth, and I said, "Yes, I use dental floss every day." He told me that my teeth were healthy because I took very good care of them. He left and told me to keep up the good work. The dental hygienist came in, and she said that she would clean my teeth for me. She scraped my teeth with a sharp tool, and then she put some polish on my teeth and began to clean them. When she was done, she told me to spit into a bowl. And then I rinsed my mouth out with water. I looked into a mirror and saw that my teeth were very shiny and white. If I take care of my teeth, I'll have them forever. I would like to keep my teeth healthy and white. I like to smile. The school play. We are putting on a play at school. Some of the students are actors in the play. Some people are building the sets. Some people will sew costumes, and some people will be makeup artists. The teacher is the director of the play. The play will be held on a big stage in the gymnasium. The curtains will open, the lights will go on, and the play will begin. It will be very exciting. All of our families will come to see the play. 
they will clap when the play is over. My friend is very good at cutting wood and building things. He's helping to build the set. My other friend, Michael, is an artist, so he is painting the set so that it looks like a forest. My friend Marie likes to put makeup on people, so she is a makeup artist. She will put makeup on me so that I will look like an old woman. Some of the mothers help to sew the costumes. The play is called Hansel and Gretel. I will play the part of the witch. The boy who plays Hansel has to wear shorts and a shirt. I wear a witch's hat and a black dress. I also carry a broom. Some of the people in my class will be dressed like trees and flowers. This is a musical play, and the trees and flowers will sing to Hansel and Gretel as they walk through the forest. I can hardly wait for opening night. I want my family and friends to see me acting on stage. I hope they will like the play. We have all learned our lines and worked very hard at making this play a success. Emotions. Do you ever think about your emotions? What kinds of things make you sad? I get sad when I get a bad mark in school or when someone that I like moves away. I sometimes see sad movies that make me cry. I don't like to be sad. I don't like to have a frown on my face. I like to be happy. I'm happy most of the time. Parties make me happy. Being with my friends makes me happy. Lots of things make me happy. If someone tells me a joke, I laugh. I enjoy laughing. Funny movies make me laugh. I think that people look the best when they smile. What kinds of things make you mad? I get mad when my brother breaks one of my toys. I try not to show it when I get mad. My parents get mad at me if I come home late. I don't think anger is a good emotion. It is best to stay calm and talk things over. Emotions come from inside you, but they show on your face. People can tell when you're mad or sad or happy. I prefer to look happy. Sometimes I even smile when I'm feeling sad, and the smile makes me feel a little better. My first job. I just got a job at the grocery store. This is my first job. I will receive a paycheck every two weeks. I wear a uniform. The uniform has the name of the grocery store on it. I have many jobs at the grocery store. I have to collect all the carts from the parking lot and bring them back into the store. I have to put all the produce out for the people to see. I will be putting out the vegetables. There are carrots, lettuce, cabbages, cucumbers, and beans to put out this morning. I also have to put the fruit out on the stand so that it looks nice. The oranges roll away when I put them out, so I have to be careful. I put out the apples, bananas, and grapes. I stack boxes up so that people can buy cereal and cookies. I have to be careful, or the boxes will fall. There are cans of things which also need to be placed on the shelves. Yesterday, I filled the shelves with canned vegetables and soup. I like talking to people at the grocery store. This morning, a lady asked me where the bakery department was. She needed a loaf of bread. I have directed people to the meat department and to the dairy products. I would like to work in the bakery. I think I would like to bake cakes and decorate them. It would be fun to bake breads and cookies. Or maybe I would like to be a cashier and work at the cash register. I am very good at counting money. I am enjoying my job at the grocery store. I hope that I can continue to work here part time during the school year. The lie. Yesterday, I told a lie. I don't feel very good about it. I was bouncing a ball in the kitchen, and the ball bounced up and broke a cup. It was one of my mother's best cups, so I was afraid that she would be mad. I put the broken cup back on the table, and I didn't tell anyone that I had broken it. That night, my mother asked who had broken the cup. My brother said, "Not me." My sister said, "I didn't do it." I said, "I didn't break the cup," but I was lying. My mother said that we would all be punished if someone didn't tell the truth and say who broke the cup. I still did not tell her that I had broken it. She gave us one more chance. And she said she wasn't mad about the cup; she just wanted us to be honest. I still didn't say anything. 
My brother, sister, and I all got sent to our rooms. We had to stay in our rooms all morning. My brother said it wasn't fair. I felt very bad because my brother and sister were being punished because of me. I went to my mother and told her that I had broken the cup. She said that she was not upset about the broken cup. She knew that it was an accident. She was disappointed in me because I hadn't come forward and told the truth. She said that she wouldn't have punished me if I had been honest with her. I told my brother and sister that I was sorry. I felt bad because they were punished because I was dishonest. I told my mother that I was sorry that I had lied to her. I told her that I had learned a lesson. Honesty is the best policy. It is better to tell the truth. It is not a good feeling when people don't trust you. I have learned that lying just hurts people. Sometimes it is hard to be honest, but it is the best way to be. Hobbies. A lot of people have hobbies. Hobbies are interesting things that people like to do in their spare time. My father has a hobby. He has a model railroad set that he put together. A tiny electric train runs through make believe villages and travels through tunnels and over mountains. My father also enjoys sailing. He has a real sailboat that he takes us out on. He is teaching me how to sail. I like to collect things. I collect comic books, stamps, and coins. I trade comic books with some of my friends, and sometimes I buy comic books at stores. Some of the very old comic books are worth a lot of money. I have stamps from all over the world. Whenever any of my friends get a letter from a faraway place, they save the stamps for me. I have stamps from England, Japan, Australia, and even Russia. I use a magnifying glass to look at the stamps. And I keep them in a special album. I don't have too many coins yet, but I have a very old dime from Canada, and I have a coin with a hole in it from Africa. My mother used to collect dolls when she was a little girl. The dolls wore costumes from different countries. My friend John's hobby is painting. He does oil painting. He has even sold some of his paintings. He is a good artist. My friend Linda sews. She has made clothes for herself and some of her friends. Maybe Linda will be a fashion designer when she gets older. Sometimes people's hobbies lead them into their careers. Christmas. In December, Christmas comes. We get a holiday from school, and our parents get a few days off from work. Our family gets ready for Christmas by decorating the house. We decorate inside and out. On the outside of the house, we put up lights that twinkle and glow. We have a wooden Santa Claus and a reindeer set that my father puts up on the roof. Inside, we put up a Christmas tree. Some years, we have a real tree. Real pine trees smell nice, but you have to be careful that they don't dry out and start a fire. This year, we have an artificial tree. We hang tinsel and ornaments on the tree. We also hang strands of light on the tree and put a star at the top. Everyone thinks that the tree is beautiful when we turn on the lights. We place gifts under the tree. There is a gift for me under the tree. It is wrapped in red paper and it has a big green bow on it. Red and green are the Christmas colors. On Christmas Eve, my brother and sister and I will hang our stockings near the fireplace. Santa Claus comes down the chimney and fills our stockings full of toys and goodies. On Christmas morning, it is exciting to see what Santa has left for you. My mother will make a big turkey dinner for us on Christmas Day. We have lots of vegetables and good-tasting foods to go with the turkey. We will have dessert too. Some of my family like Christmas pudding, but I will just have ice cream. Last year, some carolers came to the door. It was snowing outside. They stood in the snow and sang Christmas carols to us. My father gave them some money, and my mother gave them some hot chocolate to warm them up. They had lovely voices, and they sang some of my favorite carols. We also collect food, gifts, and money for some of the people in town who cannot afford to have Christmas. My family is collecting things for a poor family who live near here. We had fun deciding which toys to buy for the children in that family. It was a good feeling to share with people who do not have as much as you do. My parents have always taught us that Christmas is a time for giving, not receiving. I think they're right.
at home. One. Where is Jane? She is in the living room. What is she doing? She is playing the piano. Where is the car? It is in the garage. Where is the dog? The dog is in front of the door. What is the dog doing? The dog is eating. At home, two. Where are you? I am in the kitchen. What are you doing? I am cooking dinner. Where are Bill and Mary? They are in the living room. What are they doing? They are watching TV. Where is the cat? She is in the dining room. What is she doing? She is sleeping. My favorite photographs. One. Who is she? She is my sister. What's her name? Her name is Jennifer. Where is she in this photograph? She's in Toronto. What is that building behind her? She's standing in front of the CN Tower. Location, one. Where is the school? It's between the library and the park. Where is the post office? It's across from the movie theater. Where is the Royal Bank? It's next to the supermarket. Where is the gas station? It's around the corner from the church. Where is the barber shop? It's near the bus station. Location two. Excuse me, can you tell me the way to the nearest bank? Yes, it's on Geneva Street. As a matter of fact, I'm going that way myself. So if you come with me, I will show you. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Color, one. May I help you? Yes, please. I am looking for an umbrella. What's your favorite color? It's black. Sorry, we have no black umbrellas right now. Here is a nice umbrella. But this umbrella is yellow. That's okay. Yellow umbrellas are very popular this year. Color two. Excuse me, is this your umbrella? No, it isn't. Are you sure? Yes, I am sure. That umbrella is brown, and my umbrella is yellow. No questions. Are you married? No, I'm not. I'm single. Tell me about your new car. Is it large? No, it's not. It is small. Tell me about the questions in your English book. Are they difficult? No, they're not. They are easy. Tell me about your new neighbors. Are they quiet? No, they aren't. They are noisy. Short answer. Is Alice young or old? She is young. Is Bill tall or short? He is short. Is Albert's apartment big or little? It's small. Were the last examinations easy or difficult? They were difficult. Is Julie married or single? She is single. Telephone call two. Hello, Jack. This is Dave. I want to return the book I borrowed from you last night. Will you be home at about six o'clock? Yes, I will. I'll be cooking dinner. Oh well, then I won't come over at six. Why not? I don't want to disturb you. Don't worry, you won't disturb me. Okay, I'll see you at six. What's a grant? My daughter is going to college. That's great, but it must be expensive. Yes, but she has a grant. A grant? What's a grant? The government is giving her money to pay for her education. That's right. Does it pay for everything? No, she has a loan too. What's the difference between a loan and a grant? You have to pay back a loan. A grant is a gift. I'm busy on Friday. Would you like to go to a pop concert? Well, I'd like to, but when is it? On Friday evening. What a pity! I'm busy on Friday. Maybe you could change your plans. It's going to be a really great concert. Maybe I will. I wouldn't want to miss it. Great. I'll see you Friday. Bless you. Ach! God bless you. Thank you. You have a cold? Yes. That's why I'm sneezing so much. I hope you feel better soon. I get a bad cold every winter. Are you taking anything for your cold? I'm taking Contac. Does it help? Yes, but it makes me sleepy. You'd better not drive then. I don't feel well. What are you looking for? My jacket. I'm going to the doctor. Why? What's the problem? I'm not sure, but I don't feel well. Do you have a fever? 
No, but I have a pain in my chest. What time is your appointment? 11.30. I'm going now. Bye. Goodbye. I hope it's nothing serious. Thanks. See ya. Can you help me? Can you help me, officer? I'll try. What's the problem? I can't get into my car. Where are your keys? They're in the car. Don't worry. I can open it. How can you do that? With a coat hanger. It's easy. Where can we get a coat hanger? There's one in the police car. Wait here. Thanks a lot. You're very kind. Taking a cab. Hello. Hello. Where do you want to go? 70 Maple Street, please. 70 Mibble Street? No, Maple Street. Maple Street. Let's see. Is that near St. David Street? I don't know. I've only been here one week. Oh, where are you from? Toronto. I hate to get up. I hate to get up in the morning. Me too. What time do you get up? At six o'clock. Why do you get up so early? I have to be at work by seven. I don't get up until eight. You're lucky. What do you do? I own a bookstore. What time does your store open? At 8.30. A hot day. This heat is killing me. Me too. It must be 95 degrees. I would like a cold drink. I'll get you one. Thanks. Mmm, this tastes good. It does. Jeez, this hot weather makes me lazy. Me too. Get me another drink? I guess if you're lazy, no one else is allowed to be. <laughs> Thanks for understanding. Phone out of order, one. Hey, hey. What's wrong? There's something wrong with the phone. I'm getting a strange noise. Are you? I can hear you clearly. Hello? Hello? This pay phone might be out of order. I'll call you again with another phone. Hello? How about now? Is there still a strange noise? Yes. Perhaps my phone is out of order. You should get in touch with the phone company. Phone out of order, two. Hey, what's the matter with the phone? Here, listen to this peculiar noise. It doesn't sound like a dial tone. It must be out of order. We'd better notify the phone company. How do we do that? We can't use the phone. Let's go next door and use our neighbor's phone. He's always complaining about people. I don't want to ask any favors of him. How about across the street? I forgot about Mrs. Riley. I'm sure she'd let us use her phone. Getting a visa. Does it take long to get a visa? It depends on the season. Anywhere from one month to two months. What do I need to do? Fill out an application form and wait. Will there be a long waiting period? Not if you don't run into any government delays. Employing a new member. Well, this woman may be suitable for the job, but is she energetic enough? Yes, she certainly seems to have lots of energy. Hmm, she's got to be ambitious too, is she? Yes, she has plenty of ambition. And we really need a flexible sort of person. Do you think she is? Hmm, she seems to be determined enough, but she's a little tough. Well, I guess we'll give her a try and see how she works out. A date. What are you so happy about? You're grinning from ear to ear. Sandy and I are going to go out this weekend. Oh, yeah? That's fast work. That's great. Which night are you going to see her? Friday or Saturday? On Friday. She isn't going to be in town on Saturday and Sunday. She's going to visit a friend in Quebec. What are you going to do on Friday? I don't know yet. Do you have any ideas? How about taking her to a Chinese restaurant? I've heard that she likes Chinese food. That's a great idea. What are you going to wear on your date? I'm going to wear my new suit. That's too formal. Wear your jeans and a t-shirt. How about your sports jacket? Are you going to wear it on Friday night? No, I am not. Go ahead and wear it. What did you do yesterday? Hi, how are you? You look tired. Did you sleep okay last night? No, I didn't. Why? What did you do yesterday? I went to a nightclub last night and danced all night. Oh, yeah? Did you have a good time? I had a wonderful time, but I'm beat today. What time did you leave the nightclub? I left at about 3 a.m. I'm not surprised that you're tired. Which nightclub did you go to? Fantastic. It's on Ontario Street. It's really nice. Traveling by air. Do I check in here for Air Canada to Mexico? Do you already have your ticket? Yes. Here you are. Thank you. Can you put your luggage up here, please? Sure. I have three suitcases. We allow only two pieces. You'll have to pay an extra charge. Oh, can I carry this one with me? No, I'm sorry. It won't fit under your seat. That's $45. Here you are. Thank you. You can choose your seat. A window seat or aisle seat? I'd like a window seat, please. Fine. Seat 15A. Here's your ticket and your boarding pass. Enjoy your flight. At the Customs. Good morning. 
Can I see your passport? Certainly. Here it is. Yes, that's all right. Have you got anything to declare? Yes, I have. I've got some whiskey and some cigarettes. How much whiskey have you got? A liter. That's all right. And how many cigarettes have you got? Two hundred. Fine. What about perfume? Uh, no, I haven't. Good. Open your case, please. Pardon? Open your case, please. Open it now. Oh dear! Look at this. You've got three bottles of whiskey, four hundred cigarettes, and a lot of perfume. Does that mean I can't go? A new baby. Well, hello, Mr. Wallace. You seem unusually happy today. I just became a father. Congratulations! A boy or a girl? You never saw such a cute girl. Nine pounds three ounces, and as cute as a button. Doesn't this call for cigars? Oh yes, I forgot about the cigars. Here, have one. Thank you. How's your wife? She's just fine. Is English difficult? Where are you going? To Canada. Why are you going there? I'm going to learn English. There's a school there that has an excellent program. Is learning English going to be difficult? Yes, I have to study and practice a lot. Where is your school? It's in a town called Saint Catharines in Ontario. I'm jealous. I'll bet you're excited. Yes, but I'm also really nervous. Washing his car. Where's Kevin? He's in front of the house. What is he doing? Washing his car. Not again. Yes, he takes good care of his car. But he never cleans his room. I know it's always dirty. And nothing is in order. You're right. His room is a mess. Maybe he should move into the car. At the restaurant. This is a big menu. Yeah. What are you getting? Chicken, peas, and baked potatoes. I don't know what to get. They have very good turkey. I had turkey yesterday. How about steak? Perfect. I'll get steak and mashed potatoes. What vegetable are you getting? I'm not getting any. I don't like vegetables. When's the baby due? I have some good news. What is it? Lisa is going to have a baby. That's great. I'm so happy for her. Me too. Do they want a boy or a girl? A girl. When's the baby due? In the beginning of September. I'm going to phone Lisa tonight. That's nice. Say hello for me. Bus stop. Jean, Barbara, do you work around here? Yes, I work in that building across the street. Really? What do you do? I work in a law office. I'm a secretary. Oh, that's interesting. What about you? What do you do? I work at Duro Restaurant. Oh, are you a cook? No, I'm a waitress. That's a really hard job. I don't envy you. Me neither. In the bus. Do you live alone, Jean? No, I don't. I live with my family. How about you? I'm married now. I got married last year. Really? Congratulations. Who did you marry? His name's Jeff Hunt. He lives in my building. Oh, what does he do? He's a doctor. How wonderful! I'm very happy for you. Gardening. Your garden is really lovely. Thank you. I enjoy working in the garden. Do you do everything yourself? I trim the bushes and weed the flower beds myself. Who cuts the grass? Oh, it's so big that I hire one of the boys in the neighborhood to do it for me. Well, I must say he does a good job. Yes, his work is more than satisfactory. A lazy boy. I'm very angry with my son Harry. Why? What's the problem? He's not doing well in school. That's a surprise. Harry's a smart boy. Yes, but he never studies. Did you talk to his teachers? Yes, I did. What did they say? He's a nice boy, but he's very lazy. Maybe they're right. I'm afraid so. Have you thought about getting him a tutor? Maybe that's a good idea. I really want him to excel. Let's go look in the phone book now, then. Can I drive there? What time is it? It's three o'clock. Oh no, I'm late. Where are you going? To the dentist. Can I drive you there? Sure, that will help. Do you have a toothache? Yes, and it's very bad. I'm sorry to hear that. I've had it for weeks, and this is the first time that I could get in. My dentist is always so busy. I guess that's a good thing. It means a lot of people like him. A new dress. Who is it? It's me, dear. Don't you have your key? No, let me in. Let's her in. What's in that box? What did you get? A new dress, honey. But you have a closet full of dresses. I know, but I need a new one. What's wrong with all the other dresses? They're not this one. A picnic. Let's go for a picnic. That's a great idea. Where shall we go? Let's go to the park. How far is it? About a mile.
Is it a nice place? Sure. It has picnic tables and a beautiful lake. Good. I'll make some sandwiches. I'll bring soda and cookies. The kids will love it. I'm going skiing. We've got ten inches of snow. Wow, that's terrific. What's so terrific about it? I'm going skiing. Skiing? Are you serious? Yes, it's a lot of fun. Maybe, but it's also dangerous. You need to live on the edge, and you need to make sure you don't fall off of it. Traffic rules. Sarah, you can't park here. It's a bus stop. Oh, we'll be back in a few minutes. It's okay. Oh no, it isn't. You'll get a parking ticket if you leave it here. No, I won't. It's half past five. All the traffic wardens have gone home. Sarah. Yes. Is this your car, ma'am? Housework. Whew, I'm really tired, and now I have to go home and cook. Do you make dinner every night? Yes, I usually make dinner, and my husband washes the dishes. I live alone, so I do everything. Sometimes I eat out, though. There are some good restaurants in my neighborhood. Where do you live? Near the Penn Center. Oh, that's good. There aren't any good restaurants near my house. Does your husband help you do housework much? Um, yes. He sets the table almost every night, and he makes our bed every morning. But I usually make all the meals. How about cleaning? We clean the house together every weekend. I vacuum the rooms, and he usually sweeps the floor of the kitchen, and he does yard work. Your husband helps you so much. Does he help do the laundry too? Well, he's never helped me do the laundry. Oral exams. Hey, Cindy, have you finished the exam? Yes, I have. Phew. Was it hard? Well, yes, it was hard, pretty hard. Did you pass? I don't know. Mrs. Lester didn't tell me. What questions did she ask? First, she asked me what my name was. Well, that was easy, wasn't it? Yes, except I couldn't remember. Then she asked me where I came from and how long it took to get here from my country. And what else did she ask? She asked how long I'd been studying English here in Canada, and she asked how I would use English in the future. Yes, yes, go on. Then she asked me to explain the difference between my country and Canada. Anything else? I'm trying to remember. Oh yes, she asked if I spoke any other language. Is that all? Oh, there were a lot of other questions. She asked me what my hobbies were, where I visited in Canada. Then I was asked to read a passage. What did she say at the end? Hmm. Let's see. Oh yes, she asked me to tell you to go in right away. Would you call me? Well, see you tomorrow. I'd better go too. Oh, would you do me a favor? Sure. Would you call me tomorrow at six o'clock in the morning? Tomorrow's my daughter's birthday. I want to get her a new robe, and I have to pick up the dry cleaning and pick up the cake from the bakery. Anyway, I have lots of things to do, but I'm not sure I can get up early. Do you need a hand? Oh, can you? That would be great. Can you go to the mall and buy her a new robe, pick up the dry cleaning, and get the cake from the bakery? And what will you be doing? Sleeping in, of course. Can I let you know? Are you going out with Leonard tonight? Uh huh. He's supposed to pick me up at six thirty. What time is it now? Quarter to six. You'd better get going. You're kidding. I haven't even taken a shower. Where are you going? We haven't made up our minds yet. Maybe to a movie. Maybe to a party. Go and see Forrest Gump. It's supposed to be interesting. Oh, maybe we will. I've heard the Sixth Sense is good too. Well, personally, I prefer Forrest Gump. I really should be going. Do you want to go shopping tomorrow? I'd like to go, but it depends. I might have to go to the store tomorrow and do some work. Can I let you know first thing in the morning? Okay, that would be all right. Ring, ring. Oh, there's the phone. It must be Leonard. Well, I'll be going. Call me tomorrow. I will. Have a good evening. You too. On the phone, a less formal call. Good afternoon, Scott and Smith. May I help you? May I speak to Mr. Scott or Mr. Smith, please? I'm sorry, they aren't here right now. Who's calling, please? George Martin. Is there any message I can take, Mr. Martin? No, I'll call back later. Thank you for calling, Scott and Smith. A cup of coffee. Can I get you something to drink? A cup of coffee, please. With milk and sugar? A little milk, but no sugar. I never drink coffee at night. Why not? It keeps me awake. What do you drink with supper? Tea. It helps me relax. I don't like tea. There are so many kinds of tea. Maybe you should shop around and try to find one you like because coffee is bad for you. That's a good idea. How about a drink? How about a drink tonight? I'd love to. Where can we meet? How about the relax bar? All right. What time? Is eight o'clock okay? Yes, that's fine. I will meet you there. I'm really looking forward to it. Me too. I have a sore throat. You sound terrible. I have a sore throat. You should rest your voice. I know it hurts when I talk. What are you taking for your throat? 
Hot tea and honey. That should help. Are you going to work today? No, I'm staying home. Good idea. I'll feel better tomorrow. I hope so. On sale. Do you like my new coat? It looks terrific. I'm glad you like it. How much was it? Eighty dollars. That's a good price. Yeah, it was on sale. Where did you get it? At Sears. I'd like to shop there too. They always have really good sales. Maybe you should go there today. They have a sale on shirts if you're interested. Good idea. I need some. Not a cloud in the sky. What a beautiful day! Yes, there's not a cloud in the sky. What's the temperature? It's seventy degrees. I love October. Me too. It's not too hot and not too cold. Fall is my favorite season. Mine too. The weather is almost perfect, and the leaves are very pretty when they change colors. Cold and windy. Is it cold out? Yes, it's cold and windy. I'm going to wear my heavy coat. Good idea. Where are you going? To the post office. Why? To mail this package. Would you buy some stamps for me? Sure. How many do you want? Ten. Here's the money for the stamps. Okay. I'll be back in twenty minutes, unless I get blown away. It's beginning to snow. Do you like snow? No, I hate it. Why? Snow is so pretty. Yes, but I don't like to drive in it. Well, it's beginning to snow. And I have to drive to work. How far is it to work? Six miles. Are we going to get much snow? About twelve inches, they say. Oh no! Driving will be dangerous. Please be careful. I will. By the way, can I borrow your car? A house at the shore. When is your vacation? It starts next week. Where are you going? We're renting a house on the shore. That's wonderful. Yes, we love the ocean. Do you swim a lot? Not very much. Then why are you going to the shore? Because we all bought new swimsuits. A soccer game. I'm going to play soccer. Who are you playing with? Some friends from work. Are you a good soccer player? Yes, but I'm not the best player on the team. What time does the game begin? Nine o'clock. Why don't you come with me? I can't today. I'm very busy. Okay. See you later. I hope your team wins. Not so young. My son is graduating from high school today. And my daughter is graduating next year. How old is she? She's sixteen. I remember when she was a baby. I know. We're getting old. Don't say that. Why not? It's true. No, it isn't. We were young when we got married. That's right. But we got married twenty-five years ago. Is she single? Today is my cousin's birthday. What's your cousin's name? Kathy. I'm going to her house after dinner. How old is she? She's twenty-four. Hmm. She's my age. Is she pretty? Yes, and she's very nice too. Is she single? No, she's married and has two children. Oh, that's too bad. Not for her. <laughs> to buy a birthday present. What are you getting Jim for his birthday? I don't know yet. You can always get him a shirt. But I got him one last year. Oh, that's right. Let me think. I want to get him something different. How about a briefcase? Good idea. His briefcase is getting old, and it's something he'll use every day. Of course. Why didn't I think of that? Telephone. Hello. Hello. Is Mary there? I'm sorry, you have the wrong number. Oh, is this six eight five five two nine zero? No, it's not. I'm sorry. That's okay. A light eater. Would you like anything else? You haven't eaten very much. No thanks. I'm already full. Oh come on, have some more. No, I really can't. I've never been much of an eater. Have some coffee then. That would be nice. How do you take it? With sugar, please. No cream. Here you are. Thank you. A nice flat. One. This is a nice flat. Hmm. There's a living room. There's a kitchen, a bedroom, and a bathroom, and there's a bidet. What's a bidet? It's like a toilet, only better. I'll let you figure it out. Well, none of my friends have a bidet, and even if I don't know what it is, they will be very jealous when I tell them. A nice flat, two. 
Well, here's the kitchen. Hmm, it's very small. Yes, it isn't very large, but there's a cooker and a fridge. There are some cupboards under the sink. Are there any plates? Yes, there are. Good. Are there any chairs in here? No, there aren't, but there are some in the living room. Hmm, there aren't any glasses. Yes, there are. They're in the cupboard. And、uh, where's the toilet? Afraid of flying. Where is your meeting? In Dallas, Texas. How are you going? By plane. Do you like to fly? Sure. It's fast and comfortable. I'm afraid of flying. That's silly. Flying is very safe. Maybe, but I don't feel safe in a plane. I understand. A lot of people feel that way. A plane reservation. I'd like to reconfirm my plane reservation. What flight are you taking? Flight two o seven. And your name, please. Henry Chandler. Yes, sir. You're booked on flight two zero seven. Please check in at the airport an hour before flight time. Thank you. Getting together. Are you free Friday night? I might not be in town. I'm not sure yet. A friend suggested I go to Vancouver. Well, a few of us are getting together, and I thought you might want to come too. What are you thinking of doing? We're not sure yet. We might go to a bar, but we'll probably go to see AI. Oh, I haven't seen it yet. Well, come then. Sure. If I'm in town, I'll call you and let you know. How's your new job going? Oh, Miss Wallace, long time no see. How are you? Good, thank you. How's your new job? I started working today. How does it seem so far? It's demanding, but I'm happy to be working. What's your boss like? He appears to be very thoughtful and kind, but they all do at first. I guess we will have to wait and see. Well, I wish you the best of luck. Thanks. Take care. We eat a lot. Did you see my car keys? They're on top of the TV. You're right. Thanks. Where are you going? To the supermarket. Again? Yes. We eat a lot. Do you want me to go with you? Sure, if you can. Good. The packages will be heavy. There is a new health store right up the road. Maybe since you guys eat a lot, you should try and eat more healthily. Maybe you're right. We have all put on a little weight. I'll take you, Diana. Oh, George. Hi. How are you? Listen, I'm in a terrible hurry. The bank closes in twenty minutes. Is your bank near here? Yes, it's only four blocks away on Vine Street. Well, get in. I'll take you. Are you sure it's not out of your way? No, not at all. That is so nice of you, George. Thank you. You're welcome. We must be out of them. Hi. Sorry, I'm late. I missed the bus. Oh, that's okay. I had time to clean up before you came. You don't look very good. I must be getting a cold. I've been sneezing all day. <gasps> Bless you. Thank you. You must be getting a cold. Why don't you go lie down? I'll bring you some aspirin. I don't see any aspirin in the medicine cabinet. We must be out of them. I'll go to the drugstore. Is there anything else we need? Could you get some? <gasps> I don't know if they sell at you here, but I'll check. Doctor's appointments. When can I see Doctor No? He won't be free until tomorrow. Can I make an appointment? Sure. How about tomorrow at ten o'clock? Can you make it at nine? I'll check to see if he's available. I'm sorry, but he's tied up until ten o'clock. Well, can't you squeeze me in somehow? I'm afraid not. How about after lunch? Will one o'clock be all right? That's perfect. Thank you. Traffic rules two. Excuse me, may I see your license? I'm afraid I've left it at home. In that case, you'll have to take it to the police station within five days. But but why? You were speeding, ma'am. But I was only doing seventy-five. There's a seventy-kilometer-hour speed limit on this road, ma'am. Is there? I didn't see a sign. Well, ma'am, we've been following you. So you were doing seventy-five too. No, ma'am. We were doing ninety kilometers an hour, and we couldn't catch you. Eating out. Waiter, could we have the bill, please? Can I put it all on one bill? No, we'd prefer separate checks. Your bill's eighteen dollars. That seems expensive. Would you check it again, please? Sorry, ma'am. This is your friend's bill. Here is yours. It's twenty-four dollars and sixteen cents. To buy a bus ticket. Excuse me. Yes, can I help you? Yes, I'd like some information about buses, please. Where to? To Toronto. When? This Saturday. Morning or afternoon? 
In the afternoon, about three o'clock. There's one at three twenty. Thank you. That sounds perfect. I'll take it. On the phone. Good morning, Scott and Smith Law Office. May I help you? Yes. May I speak to David Waller, please? I'm sorry, he isn't here yet. May I take a message? Yes. Could you ask him to call Marjorie Vale? How do you spell your last name? V A L E. What's your phone number? Does Mr. Waller have it? Uh, no, he doesn't. It's six eight zero five two nine zero. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Six eight zero five two nine zero. I'll give him the message. Thank you. You're welcome. Operating room. Mrs. Martin, I'm Doctor Thomas. Oh, Doctor, how is he? Well, I'm afraid we'll have to operate. Oh no, he's always been afraid of operations. Don't worry. If we operate now, he'll be all right. Oh, doctor, do you really have to? I'm afraid so. He's lost a lot of blood. If we don't operate, he'll die. Oh, please do whatever you have to. A car loan. I want to go to the bank this afternoon. I'll drive you there. Thanks. I'm going to apply for a loan. Why do you need a loan? I have to buy a new car. What's wrong with your car? It won't start, and it's ten years old. How much will a new car cost? About fifteen thousand dollars. Wow, that's a lot of money. I know. That's why I need a loan. A cashier. What kind of work do you do? I'm a cashier at a supermarket. Do you like your job? No, it's not very interesting. And you don't make much money. That's right. I make very little. I think you should look for another job. I am, but it's not easy to find one. Keep looking; you'll get one. Thanks. I hope you're right. Settling down. How are you settling in? Oh, we're still in a bit of a mess, but Lisa seems to like it here. That's good. Is there a garden for her to play in? Yes, it's not very big, but we've got a small swimming pool. Have you found a school for Jerry? Yes, there's one near here. It only takes five minutes by car. That's good. So you like it there, do you, Neil? Yes, this is a very good place for my children. Will you get some bread for me? Is there a bakery near here? Yes, you can get there in five minutes. That's good. I don't have much time. Why are you going to the bakery? To buy a birthday cake. Whose birthday is it? My daughter's. She's ten. That's nice. Will you get some bread for me? Sure. Do you want anything else? No, thanks. I'll pay you when you get back. Buying a present in a jeweler's shop. I'm trying to find a wedding anniversary present for my wife. Yes, sir. What exactly are you looking for? I'm not sure, really. Perhaps you can help me. Right. I'll show you some pendants. No, I bought a pendant for her birthday. Maybe a necklace then. These necklaces are made of gold. Yes, I like this one. What's the stone? It's a ruby, sir, and it's only twelve hundred dollars. Uh, well, perhaps you could show me some bracelets then. Buying a present in a toy shop. Good morning. Perhaps you can advise me. Yes, ma'am. I'm looking for a toy for my niece. Oh yes.、Uh, how old is she? She'll be seven years old on Sunday. Skateboards are still very popular. Hmm. I don't want her to hurt herself. What about a Barbie doll set? I don't think so. She has many Barbie dolls. Have you got anything educational? You see, she's a very intelligent girl. I've got the perfect thing—a do-it-yourself kit where you can build your own Barbie doll who rides a skateboard. Making a reservation. Can I get some tickets for plays? Yes. Is there a specific play that you want to see? What plays are on tonight? Cats, but it's sold out. Are there any seats left for tomorrow night? Yes. How many tickets do you want? Two, please. Where would you like to sit? I'm not sure. Well, here's a seating plan of the concert hall. How much、uh, is it in the middle section? Fifty dollars. Fifty dollars? That's a little too expensive for us. How much is it in the back? Thirty-five dollars. That's fine. What time does the play start? At seven o'clock. What time will the play be over? At nine thirty. Ready to go. Are you ready? Grace is still in her room. She needs to rush. We don't have enough time. What time does the movie begin? It starts at seven thirty. What's the time now? About seven ten. There's no hurry. It only takes ten minutes by car to get there. I know, but there aren't enough parking spaces around the theater. 
Well, I'd better tell Grace to hurry up. She can take hours to get ready. An interesting movie. I thought that movie was terrific, didn't you? I don't know. It didn't seem to have any meaning. Come on. It seems that you expect intellectual stimulation from every movie. I just think that a good movie should have a central theme, at least. Yes, but it doesn't hurt you to watch a funny movie once in a while. Relax and enjoy it. You're right. I'm too serious sometimes. In the bus. I see you're reading Harry Potter. How do you like it? I can't put it down. Have you read it? Yes. In fact, I just finished it. The ending's great. Don't tell me. I have only 50 pages to go. Okay, I won't tell you who dies. Don't tell me anything. Okay, but I'm biting my tongue. Good, bite hard. Such a shame, though. What is? That Harry dies. Oh! A new job. Mr. Adams, have you seen this ad in the recruit news? Yes, I saw it. But I'm not interested in finding a new job. I've been here since I graduated from my university. I like working here. Really? I've only been here one year, and I'm already tired of doing the same thing every day. I'm afraid of getting really bored. Oh, come on. It's not that bad. Wherever you work, you have to do the same thing every day to a certain degree. Well, what's more, I've been working about 10 hours a day since last month. But you've been getting paid more money for it, haven't you? Yes, but I'm not interested in making more money. I'm going to apply for another job. What kind of job? A secretarial job. Well, good luck. Thank you very much. A date. Two. Hello? Sandy? Is that you? Yes, uh-huh. Who's this? It's Gil. Gil? Gil who? What do you mean, Gil who? Gil Dixon, of course. Oh, Gil. I'm sorry. Yes, we had a date last night. Where were you? I waited for one hour. Oh, I'm sorry, Gil. I couldn't come. Couldn't come? Why not? Well, I had to pack my stuff for my trip. Why didn't you call me? I wanted to call you, but, um, I couldn't remember your phone number. And now I'm going to forget yours. Smoking. Do you smoke? I've never known that. When did you start smoking? I started smoking when I was 18. So how long have you been a smoker? I've smoked for 20 years. How many cigarettes do you smoke a day? I smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. Have you ever tried to quit? Yes, I have quit twice. Once when I was expecting my baby, Paul, and the other time when I had a bad sore throat. But I had a hard time. If you knew what it was doing to your lungs, you would think twice about it. A death. Did you hear about the Smith family? No. What happened? Mrs. Smith passed away this morning. That's a shame. What from? Heart attack, I think. That's a terrible thing. Yes, Mrs. Smith went into hospital last night by ambulance and died this morning. Had she been suffering from heart disease? Yeah, Mrs. Smith had it for five years before she died. Did they try surgery? She had two operations, but they weren't effective. I feel sorry for Mr. Smith. A birth. Have you heard about the good news in the Wallace family? No, I've been out of town. Mrs. Wallace went into the hospital last night and gave birth to a baby girl seven hours later. That's very good. But they already have a little girl, don't they? No, they have a five-year-old boy. So they wanted a girl this time, right? Yes, they wanted a girl for a long time. Was it natural childbirth? No, she had to have a cesarean. A coincidence. Teresa! What a surprise! What are you doing here? Timothy, I don't believe it. I'm going to see my daughter. She will marry this weekend. How about you? I'm going to visit my parents. When is your daughter's wedding? Sunday. Wow! This Sunday is the 45th wedding anniversary of their wedding, too. This is a surprise. Anyway, where is your train leaving from? My train leaves from Platform 3, over there. How long will you... Now leaving from Platform 3, train from Vancouver... That's my train. I have to run. Sorry we didn't get more time to talk. That's okay. I'll see you when you get back. Have a good time and say congratulations to your parents. How have you been? Raymond! Oh, hi, Grace. How have you been? Good. I hear you've been to Toronto for a few days. Yes, I just got back yesterday. Did you have a nice visit? Really nice. It was very good going around downtown and shopping. And I saw the Toronto Blue Jays game at Skydome. It seems that Toronto is a very exciting city. My brother Stanley was there, too. 
You've met Stanley, haven't you? Sure. I met him when he was here in Hamilton last year. What's he doing these days? Still teaching baseball? Yes. As a matter of fact, he just began to teach elementary school. Great. How's everything with his kids? Have you met my nieces? Yes. They visited you once in the summer, didn't they? Right. They're both fine. I haven't seen them in a long time. They must be really big. Well, they will come over this Christmas. Let's have a great Christmas party together. That's a good idea. At home, one. Where is Jane? She is in the living room. What is she doing? She is playing the piano. Where is the car? It is in the garage. Where is the dog? The dog is in front of the door. What is the dog doing? The dog is eating. At home, two. Where are you? I am in the kitchen. What are you doing? I am cooking dinner. Where are Bill and Mary? They are in the living room. What are they doing? They are watching TV. Where is the cat? She is in the dining room. What is she doing? She is sleeping. My favorite photographs. One. Who is she? She is my sister. What's her name? Her name is Jennifer. Where is she in this photograph? She's in Toronto. What is that building behind her? She's standing in front of the CN Tower. Location, one. Where is the school? It's between the library and the park. Where is the post office? It's across from the movie theater. Where is the Royal Bank? It's next to the supermarket. Where is the gas station? It's around the corner from the church. Where is the barber shop? It's near the bus station. Location two. Excuse me, can you tell me the way to the nearest bank? Yes, it's on Geneva Street. As a matter of fact, I'm going that way myself. So if you come with me, I will show you. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Color one. May I help you? Yes, please. I am looking for an umbrella. What's your favorite color? It's black. Sorry, we have no black umbrellas right now. Here is a nice umbrella. But this umbrella is yellow. That's okay. Yellow umbrellas are very popular this year. Color two. Excuse me, is this your umbrella? No, it isn't. Are you sure? Yes, I am sure. That umbrella is brown, and my umbrella is yellow. No questions. Are you married? No, I'm not. I'm single. Tell me about your new car. Is it large? No, it's not. It is small. Tell me about the questions in your English book. Are they difficult? No, they're not. They are easy. Tell me about your new neighbors. Are they quiet? No, they aren't. They are noisy. Short answer. Is Alice young or old? She is young. Is Bill tall or short? He is short. Is Albert's apartment big or little? It's small. Were the last examinations easy or difficult? They were difficult. Is Julie married or single? She is single. Telephone call two. Hello, Jack. This is Dave. I want to return the book I borrowed from you last night. Will you be home at about six o'clock? Yes, I will. I'll be cooking dinner. Oh well, then I won't come over at six. Why not? I don't want to disturb you. Don't worry, you won't disturb me. Okay, I'll see you at six. What's a grant? My daughter is going to college. That's great, but it must be expensive. Yes, but she has a grant. A grant? What's a grant? The government is giving her money to pay for her education. That's right. Does it pay for everything? No, she has a loan too. What's the difference between a loan and a grant? You have to pay back a loan. A grant is a gift. I'm busy on Friday. Would you like to go to a pop concert? Well, I'd like to, but when is it? On Friday evening. What a pity! I'm busy on Friday. Maybe you could change your plans. It's going to be a really great concert. Maybe I will. I wouldn't want to miss it. Great. I'll see you Friday. Bless you. 
Achoo! God bless you. Thank you. Do you have a cold? Yes, that's why I'm sneezing so much. I hope you feel better soon. I get a bad cold every winter. Are you taking anything for your cold? I'm taking contact. Does it help? Yes, but it makes me sleepy. You'd better not drive then. I don't feel well. What are you looking for? My jacket. I'm going to the doctor. Why? What's the problem? I'm not sure, but I don't feel well. Do you have a fever? No, but I have a pain in my chest. What time is your appointment? 11.30. I'm going now. Bye. Goodbye. I hope it's nothing serious. Thanks. See ya. Can you help me? Can you help me, officer? I'll try. What's the problem? I can't get into my car. Where are your keys? They're in the car. Don't worry. I can open it. How can you do that? With a coat hanger. It's easy. Where can we get a coat hanger? There's one in the police car. Wait here. Thanks a lot. You're very kind. Taking a cab. Hello. Hello. Where do you want to go? 70 Maple Street, please. 70 Mibble Street? No, Maple Street. Maple Street. Let's see. Is that near St. David Street? I don't know. I've only been here one week. Oh, where are you from? Toronto. I hate to get up. I hate to get up in the morning. Me too. What time do you get up? At 6 o'clock. Why do you get up so early? I have to be at work by 7. I don't get up until 8. You're lucky. What do you do? I own a bookstore. What time does your store open? At 8.30. A hot day. This heat is killing me. Me too. It must be 95 degrees. I would like a cold drink. I'll get you one. Thanks. Mmm, this tastes good. It does. Jeez, this hot weather makes me lazy. Me too. Get me another drink? I guess if you're lazy, no one else is allowed to be. <laughs> Thanks for understanding. Phone out of order, one. Hey, hey. What's wrong? There's something wrong with the phone. I'm getting a strange noise. Are you? I can hear you clearly. Hello? Hello? This pay phone might be out of order. I'll call you again with another phone. Hello? How about now? Is there still a strange noise? Yes. Perhaps my phone is out of order. You should get in touch with the phone company. Phone out of order, two. Hey, what's the matter with the phone? Here, listen to this peculiar noise. It doesn't sound like a dial tone. It must be out of order. We'd better notify the phone company. How do we do that? We can't use the phone. Let's go next door and use our neighbor's phone. He's always complaining about people. I don't want to ask any favors of him. How about across the street? I forgot about Mrs. Riley. I'm sure she'd let us use her phone. Getting a visa. Does it take long to get a visa? It depends on the season. Anywhere from one month to two months. What do I need to do? Fill out an application form and wait. Will there be a long waiting period? Not if you don't run into any government delays. Employing a new member. Well, this woman may be suitable for the job, but is she energetic enough? Yes, she certainly seems to have lots of energy. Hmm, she's got to be ambitious too, is she? Yes, she has plenty of ambition. And we really need a flexible sort of person. Do you think she is? Hmm, she seems to be determined enough, but she's a little tough. Well, I guess we'll give her a try and see how she works out. A date. What are you so happy about? You're grinning from ear to ear. Sandy and I are going to go out this weekend. Oh, yeah? That's fast work. That's great. Which night are you going to see her? Friday or Saturday? On Friday. She isn't going to be in town on Saturday and Sunday. She's going to visit a friend in Quebec. What are you going to do on Friday? I don't know yet. Do you have any ideas? How about taking her to a Chinese restaurant? I've heard that she likes Chinese food. That's a great idea. What are you going to wear on your date? I'm going to wear my new suit. That's too formal. Wear your jeans and a t-shirt. How about your sports jacket? Are you going to wear it on Friday night? No, I am not. Go ahead and wear it. What did you do yesterday? Hi, how are you? You look tired. Did you sleep okay last night? No, I didn't. Why? What did you do yesterday? I went to a nightclub last night and danced all night. Oh, yeah? Did you have a good time? I had a wonderful time, but I'm beat today. What time did you leave the nightclub? I left at about 3 a.m. I'm not surprised that you're tired. Which nightclub did you go to? Fantastic. It's on Ontario Street. It's really nice. Traveling by air. Do I check in here for Air Canada to Mexico? Do you already have your ticket? Yes. Here you are. Thank you. 
Can you put your luggage up here, please? Sure. I have three suitcases. We allow only two pieces. You'll have to pay an extra charge. Oh, can I carry this one with me? No, I'm sorry. It won't fit under your seat. That's $45. Here you are. Thank you. You can choose your seat. A window seat or aisle seat? I'd like a window seat, please. Fine. Seat 15A. Here's your ticket and your boarding pass. Enjoy your flight. At the customs. Good morning. Can I see your passport? Certainly. Here it is. Yes, that's all right. Have you got anything to declare? Yes, I have. I've got some whiskey and some cigarettes. How much whiskey have you got? A liter. That's all right. And how many cigarettes have you got? Two hundred. Fine. What about perfume? Uh, no, I haven't. Good. Open your case, please. Pardon? Open your case, please. Open it now. Oh, dear. Look at this. You've got three bottles of whiskey, 400 cigarettes, and a lot of perfume. Does that mean I can't go? A new baby. Well, hello, Mr. Wallace. You seem unusually happy today. I just became a father. Congratulations. A boy or a girl? You never saw such a cute girl. Nine pounds, three ounces, and as cute as a button. Doesn't this call for cigars? Oh, yes. I forgot about the cigars. Here, have one. Thank you. How's your wife? She's just fine. Is English difficult? Where are you going? To Canada. Why are you going there? I'm going to learn English. There's a school there that has an excellent program. Is learning English going to be difficult? Yes, I have to study and practice a lot. Where is your school? It's in a town called St. Catharines in Ontario. I'm jealous. I'll bet you're excited. Yes, but I'm also really nervous. Washing his car. Where's Kevin? He's in front of the house. What is he doing? Washing his car. Not again. Yes, he takes good care of his car. But he never cleans his room. I know, it's always dirty. And nothing is in order. You're right, his room is a mess. Maybe he should move into the car. At the restaurant. This is a big menu. Yeah, what are you getting? Chicken, peas, and baked potatoes. I don't know what to get. They have very good turkey. I had turkey yesterday. How about steak? Perfect. I'll get steak and mashed potatoes. What vegetable are you getting? I'm not getting any. I don't like vegetables. When's the baby due? I have some good news. What is it? Lisa is going to have a baby. That's great. I'm so happy for her. Me too. Do they want a boy or a girl? A girl. When's the baby due? In the beginning of September. I'm going to phone Lisa tonight. That's nice. Say hello for me. Bus stop. Jean. Barbara, do you work around here? Yes, I work in that building across the street. Really? What do you do? I work in a law office. I'm a secretary. Oh, that's interesting. What about you? What do you do? I work at Duru Restaurant. Oh, are you a cook? No, I'm a waitress. That's a really hard job. I don't envy you. Me neither. In the bus. Do you live alone, Jean? No, I don't. I live with my family. How about you? I'm married now. I got married last year. Really? Congratulations. Who did you marry? His name's Jeff Hunt. He lives in my building. Oh, what does he do? He's a doctor. How wonderful. I'm very happy for you. Gardening. Your garden is really lovely. Thank you. I enjoy working in the garden. Do you do everything yourself? I trim the bushes and weed the flower beds myself. Who cuts the grass? Oh, it's so big that I hire one of the boys in the neighborhood to do it for me. Well, I must say, he does a good job. Yes, his work is more than satisfactory. A lazy boy. I'm very angry with my son, Harry. Why? What's the problem? He's not doing well in school. That's a surprise. Harry's a smart boy. Yes, but he never studies. Did you talk to his teachers? Yes, I did. What did they say? He's a nice boy, but he's very lazy. Maybe they're right. I'm afraid so. Have you thought about getting him a tutor? Maybe that's a good idea. I really want him to excel. Let's go look in the phone book now, then. Can I drive there? What time is it? It's 3 o'clock. Oh, no. I'm late. Where are you going? To the dentist. Can I drive you there? Sure, that will help. Do you have a toothache? Yes, and it's very bad. I'm sorry to hear that. I've had it for weeks, and this is the first time that I could get in. My dentist is always so busy. I guess that's a good thing. It means a lot of people like him. A new dress. Who is it? It's me, dear. Don't you have your key? 
No, let me in. Let's her in. What's in that box? What did you get? A new dress, honey. But you have a closet full of dresses. I know, but I need a new one. What's wrong with all the other dresses? They're not this one. A picnic. Let's go for a picnic. That's a great idea. Where shall we go? Let's go to the park. How far is it? About a mile. Is it a nice place? Sure. It has picnic tables and a beautiful lake. Good. I'll make some sandwiches. I'll bring soda and cookies. The kids will love it. I'm going skiing. We've got ten inches of snow. Wow, that's terrific. What's so terrific about it? I'm going skiing. Skiing? Are you serious? Yes, it's a lot of fun. Maybe, but it's also dangerous. You need to live on the edge, and you need to make sure you don't fall off of it. Traffic rules. Sarah, you can't park here. It's a bus stop. Oh, we'll be back in a few minutes. It's okay. Oh no, it isn't. You'll get a parking ticket if you leave it here. No, I won't. It's half past five. All the traffic wardens have gone home. Sarah. Yes. Is this your car, ma'am? Housework. Whew, I'm really tired, and now I have to go home and cook. Do you make dinner every night? Yes, I usually make dinner, and my husband washes the dishes. I live alone, so I do everything. Sometimes I eat out, though. There are some good restaurants in my neighborhood. Where do you live? Near the Penn Center. Oh, that's good. There aren't any good restaurants near my house. Does your husband help you do housework much? Um, yes. He sets the table almost every night, and he makes our bed every morning. But I usually make all the meals. How about cleaning? We clean the house together every weekend. I vacuum the rooms, and he usually sweeps the floor of the kitchen, and he does yard work. Your husband helps you so much. Does he help do the laundry too? Well, he's never helped me do the laundry. Oral exams. Hey, Cindy, have you finished the exam? Yes, I have. Phew. Was it hard? Well, yes, it was hard. Pretty hard. Did you pass? I don't know. Mrs. Lester didn't tell me. What questions did she ask? First, she asked me what my name was. Well, that was easy, wasn't it? Yes, except I couldn't remember. Then she asked me where I came from and how long it took to get here from my country. And what else did she ask? She asked how long I'd been studying English here in Canada, and she asked how I would use English in the future. Yes, yes, go on. Then she asked me to explain the difference between my country and Canada. Anything else? I'm trying to remember. Oh yes, she asked if I spoke any other language. Is that all? Oh, there were a lot of other questions. She asked me what my hobbies were, where I visited in Canada. Then I was asked to read a passage. What did she say at the end? Hmm. Let's see. Oh yes, she asked me to tell you to go in right away. Would you call me? Well, see you tomorrow. I'd better go too. Oh, would you do me a favor? Sure. Would you call me tomorrow at six o'clock in the morning? Tomorrow's my daughter's birthday. I want to get her a new robe, and I have to pick up the dry cleaning and pick up the cake from the bakery. Anyway, I have lots of things to do, but I'm not sure I can get up early. Do you need a hand? Oh, can you? That would be great. Can you go to the mall and buy her a new robe, pick up the dry cleaning, and get the cake from the bakery? And what will you be doing? Sleeping in, of course. Can I let you know? Are you going out with Leonard tonight? Uh huh. He's supposed to pick me up at six thirty. What time is it now? Quarter to six. You'd better get going. You're kidding. I haven't even taken a shower. Where are you going? We haven't made up our minds yet. Maybe to a movie. Maybe to a party. Go and see Forrest Gump. It's supposed to be interesting. Oh, maybe we will. I've heard the Sixth Sense is good too. Well, personally, I prefer Forrest Gump. I really should be going. Do you want to go shopping tomorrow? I'd like to go, but it depends. I might have to go to the store tomorrow and do some work. Can I let you know first thing in the morning? Okay, that would be all right. Ring, ring. Oh, there's the phone. It must be Leonard. Well, I'll be going. Call me tomorrow. I will. Have a good evening. You too. On the phone, a less formal call. Good afternoon, Scott and Smith. May I help you? May I speak to Mr. Scott or Mr. Smith, please? I'm sorry, they aren't here right now. Who's calling, please? George Martin. Is there any message I can take, Mr. Martin? No, I'll call back later. Thank you for calling, Scott and Smith. A cup of coffee. Can I get you something to drink? A cup of coffee, please. With milk and sugar? A little milk, but no sugar. I never drink coffee at night. Why not? It keeps me awake. What do you drink with supper? Tea. It helps me relax. I don't like tea. There are so many kinds of tea. Maybe you should shop around. And try to find one you like because coffee is bad for you. That's a good idea. How about a drink? How about a drink tonight? I'd love to. Where can we meet? How about the relax bar? All right. 
What time? Is eight o'clock okay? Yes, that's fine. I will meet you there. I'm really looking forward to it. Me too. I have a sore throat. You sound terrible. I have a sore throat. You should rest your voice. I know it hurts when I talk. What are you taking for your throat? Hot tea and honey. That should help. Are you going to work today? No, I'm staying home. Good idea. I'll feel better tomorrow. I hope so. On sale. Do you like my new coat? It looks terrific. I'm glad you like it. How much was it? Eighty dollars. That's a good price. Yeah, it was on sale. Where did you get it? At Sears. I'd like to shop there too. They always have really good sales. Maybe you should go there today. They have a sale on shirts if you're interested. Good idea. I need some. Not a cloud in the sky. What a beautiful day! Yes, there's not a cloud in the sky. What's the temperature? It's seventy degrees. I love October. Me too. It's not too hot and not too cold. Fall is my favorite season. Mine too. The weather is almost perfect, and the leaves are very pretty when they change colors. Cold and windy. Is it cold out? Yes, it's cold and windy. I'm going to wear my heavy coat. Good idea. Where are you going? To the post office. Why? To mail this package. Would you buy some stamps for me? Sure. How many do you want? Ten. Here's the money for the stamps. Okay. I'll be back in twenty minutes, unless I get blown away. It's beginning to snow. Do you like snow? No, I hate it. Why? Snow is so pretty. Yes, but I don't like to drive in it. Well, it's beginning to snow. And I have to drive to work. How far is it to work? Six miles. Are we going to get much snow? About twelve inches, they say. Oh no! Driving will be dangerous. Please be careful. I will. By the way, can I borrow your car? A house at the shore. When is your vacation? It starts next week. Where are you going? We're renting a house on the shore. That's wonderful. Yes, we love the ocean. Do you swim a lot? Not very much. Then why are you going to the shore? Because we all bought new swimsuits. A soccer game. I'm going to play soccer. Who are you playing with? Some friends from work. Are you a good soccer player? Yes, but I'm not the best player on the team. What time does the game begin? Nine o'clock. Why don't you come with me? I can't today. I'm very busy. Okay. See you later. I hope your team wins. Not so young. My son is graduating from high school today. And my daughter is graduating next year. How old is she? She's sixteen. I remember when she was a baby. I know. We're getting old. Don't say that. Why not? It's true. No, it isn't. We were young when we got married. That's right. But we got married twenty-five years ago. Is she single? Today is my cousin's birthday. What's your cousin's name? Kathy. I'm going to her house after dinner. How old is she? She's twenty-four. Hmm. She's my age. Is she pretty? Yes, and she's very nice too. Is she single? No, she's married and has two children. Oh, that's too bad. Not for her. <laughs> to buy a birthday present. What are you getting Jim for his birthday? I don't know yet. You can always get him a shirt. But I got him one last year. Oh, that's right. Let me think. I want to get him something different. How about a briefcase? Good idea. His briefcase is getting old, and it's something he'll use every day. Of course. Why didn't I think of that? Telephone. Hello. Hello. Is Mary there? I'm sorry, you have the wrong number. Oh, is this six eight five five two nine zero? No, it's not. I'm sorry. That's okay. A light eater. Would you like anything else? You haven't eaten very much. No thanks. I'm already full. Oh come on, have some more. No, I really can't. I've never been much of an eater. Have some coffee then. That would be nice. How do you take it? With sugar, please. No cream. Here you are. Thank you. A nice flat. One. This is a nice flat. Hmm. 
There's a living room, there's a kitchen, a bedroom, and a bathroom, and there's a bidet. What's a bidet? It's like a toilet, only better. I'll let you figure it out. Well, none of my friends have a bidet, and even if I don't know what it is, they will be very jealous when I tell them. A nice flat, too. Well, here's the kitchen. Hmm, it's very small. Yes, it isn't very large, but there's a cooker and a fridge. There are some cupboards under the sink. Are there any plates? Yes, there are. Good. Are there any chairs in here? No, there aren't, but there are some in the living room. Hmm, there aren't any glasses. Yes, there are. They're in the cupboard. And、uh, where's the toilet? Afraid of flying. Where is your meeting? In Dallas, Texas. How are you going? By plane. Do you like to fly? Sure. It's fast and comfortable. I'm afraid of flying. That's silly. Flying is very safe. Maybe, but I don't feel safe in a plane. I understand. A lot of people feel that way. A plane reservation. I'd like to reconfirm my plane reservation. What flight are you taking? Flight 207. And your name, please? Henry Chandler. Yes, sir. You're booked on flight 207. Please check in at the airport an hour before flight time. Thank you. Getting together. Are you free Friday night? I might not be in town. I'm not sure yet. A friend suggested I go to Vancouver. Well, a few of us are getting together, and I thought you might want to come too. What are you thinking of doing? We're not sure yet. We might go to a bar, but we'll probably go to see AI. Oh, I haven't seen it yet. Well, come then. Sure. If I'm in town. I'll call you and let you know. How's your new job going? Oh, Miss Wallace, long time no see. How are you? Good, thank you. How's your new job? I started working today. How does it seem so far? It's demanding, but I'm happy to be working. What's your boss like? He appears to be very thoughtful and kind, but they all do at first. I guess we will have to wait and see. Well, I wish you the best of luck. Thanks. Take care. We eat a lot. Did you see my car keys? They're on top of the TV. You're right. Thanks. Where are you going? To the supermarket. Again? Yes. We eat a lot. Do you want me to go with you? Sure, if you can. Good. The packages will be heavy. There is a new health store right up the road. Maybe since you guys eat a lot, you should try and eat more healthily. Maybe you're right. We have all put on a little weight. I'll take you. Diana. Oh, George. Hi. How are you? Listen, I'm in a terrible hurry. The bank closes in twenty minutes. Is your bank near here? Yes, it's only four blocks away on Vine Street. Well, get in. I'll take you. Are you sure it's not out of your way? No, not at all. That is so nice of you, George. Thank you. You're welcome. We must be out of them. Hi. Sorry, I'm late. I missed the bus. Oh, that's okay. I had time to clean up before you came. You don't look very good. I must be getting a cold. I've been sneezing all day. <gasps> Bless you. Thank you. You must be getting a cold. Why don't you go lie down? I'll bring you some aspirin. I don't see any aspirin in the medicine cabinet. We must be out of them. I'll go to the drugstore. Is there anything else we need? Could you get some? <gasps> I don't know if they sell achoo here, but I'll check. Doctor's appointments. When can I see Doctor No? He won't be free until tomorrow. Can I make an appointment? Sure. How about tomorrow at ten o'clock? Can you make it at nine? I'll check to see if he's available. I'm sorry, but he's tied up until ten o'clock. Well, can't you squeeze me in somehow? I'm afraid not. How about after lunch? Will one o'clock be all right? That's perfect. Thank you. Traffic rules two. Excuse me. May I see your license? I'm afraid I've left it at home. In that case, you'll have to take it to the police station within five days. But but why? You were speeding, ma'am. But I was only doing seventy-five. There's a seventy-kilometer-hour speed limit on this road, ma'am. Is there? I didn't see a sign. Well, ma'am, we've been following you. So you were doing seventy-five too? No, ma'am. We were doing ninety kilometers an hour, and we couldn't catch you. Eating out. Waiter, could we have the bill, please? Can I put it all on one bill? No, we'd prefer separate checks. 
Your bill's eighteen dollars. That seems expensive. Would you check it again, please? Sorry, ma'am. This is your friend's bill. Here is yours. It's twenty-four dollars and sixteen cents. To buy a bus ticket. Excuse me. Yes. Can I help you? Yes. I'd like some information about buses, please. Where to? To Toronto. When? This Saturday. Morning or afternoon? In the afternoon, about three o'clock. There's one at three twenty. Thank you. That sounds perfect. I'll take it. On the phone. Good morning, Scott and Smith Law Office. May I help you? Yes. May I speak to David Waller, please? I'm sorry, he isn't here yet. May I take a message? Yes. Could you ask him to call Marjorie Vale? How do you spell your last name? V A L E. What's your phone number? Does Mr. Waller have it? Uh, no, he doesn't. It's six eight zero five two nine zero. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Six eight zero five two nine zero. I'll give him the message. Thank you. You're welcome. Operating room. Mrs. Martin, I'm Doctor Thomas. Oh, Doctor, how is he? Well, I'm afraid we'll have to operate. Oh no, he's always been afraid of operations. Don't worry. If we operate now, he'll be all right. Oh, doctor, do you really have to? I'm afraid so. He's lost a lot of blood. If we don't operate, he'll die. Oh, please do whatever you have to. A car loan. I want to go to the bank this afternoon. I'll drive you there. Thanks. I'm going to apply for a loan. Why do you need a loan? I have to buy a new car. What's wrong with your car? It won't start, and it's ten years old. How much will a new car cost? About fifteen thousand dollars. Wow, that's a lot of money. I know. That's why I need a loan. A cashier. What kind of work do you do? I'm a cashier at a supermarket. Do you like your job? No, it's not very interesting. And you don't make much money. That's right. I make very little. I think you should look for another job. I am, but it's not easy to find one. Keep looking; you'll get one. Thanks. I hope you're right. Settling down. How are you settling in? Oh, we're still in a bit of a mess, but Lisa seems to like it here. That's good. Is there a garden for her to play in? Yes, it's not very big, but we've got a small swimming pool. Have you found a school for Jerry? Yes, there's one near here. It only takes five minutes by car. That's good. So you like it there, do you, Neil? Yes, this is a very good place for my children. Will you get some bread for me? Is there a bakery near here? Yes, you can get there in five minutes. That's good. I don't have much time. Why are you going to the bakery? To buy a birthday cake. Whose birthday is it? My daughter's. She's ten. That's nice. Will you get some bread for me? Sure. Do you want anything else? No, thanks. I'll pay you when you get back. Buying a present in a jeweler's shop. I'm trying to find a wedding anniversary present for my wife. Yes, sir. What exactly are you looking for? I'm not sure, really. Perhaps you can help me. Right. I'll show you some pendants. No, I bought a pendant for her birthday. Maybe a necklace then. These necklaces are made of gold. Yes, I like this one. What's the stone? It's a ruby, sir, and it's only twelve hundred dollars. Uh, well, perhaps you could show me some bracelets then. Buying a present in a toy shop. Good morning. Perhaps you can advise me. Yes, ma'am. I'm looking for a toy for my niece. Oh yes.、Uh, how old is she? She'll be seven years old on Sunday. Skateboards are still very popular. Hmm. I don't want her to hurt herself. What about a Barbie doll set? I don't think so. She has many Barbie dolls. Have you got anything educational? You see, she's a very intelligent girl. I've got the perfect thing: a do-it-yourself kit where you can build your own Barbie doll who rides a skateboard. Making a reservation. Can I get some tickets for plays? Yes. Is there a specific play that you want to see? What plays are on tonight? Cats, but it's sold out. Are there any seats left for tomorrow night? Yes. How many tickets do you want? Two, please. Where would you like to sit? I'm not sure. Well, here's a seating plan of the concert hall. How much、uh, is it in the middle section? Fifty dollars. Fifty dollars? That's a little too expensive for us. How much is it in the back? Thirty-five dollars. That's fine. What time does the play start? At seven o'clock. 
What time will the play be over? At 9 30. Ready to go. Are you ready? Grace is still in her room. She needs to rush. We don't have enough time. What time does the movie begin? It starts at 7 30. What's the time now? About 7 10. There's no hurry. It only takes 10 minutes by car to get there. I know, but there aren't enough parking spaces around the theater. Well, I'd better tell Grace to hurry up. She can take hours to get ready. An interesting movie. I thought that movie was terrific, didn't you? I don't know. It didn't seem to have any meaning. Come on. It seems that you expect intellectual stimulation from every movie. I just think that a good movie should have a central theme, at least. Yes, but it doesn't hurt you to watch a funny movie once in a while. Relax and enjoy it. You're right. I'm too serious sometimes. In the bus. I see you're reading Harry Potter. How do you like it? I can't put it down. Have you read it? Yes. In fact, I just finished it. The ending's great. Don't tell me. I have only 50 pages to go. Okay, I won't tell you who dies. Don't tell me anything. Okay, but I'm biting my tongue. Good, bite hard. Such a shame, though. What is? That Harry dies. Oh! A new job. Mr. Adams, have you seen this ad in the recruit news? Yes, I saw it. But I'm not interested in finding a new job. I've been here since I graduated from my university. I like working here. Really? I've only been here one year, and I'm already tired of doing the same thing every day. I'm afraid of getting really bored. Oh, come on. It's not that bad. Wherever you work, you have to do the same thing every day to a certain degree. Well, what's more, I've been working about 10 hours a day since last month. But you've been getting paid more money for it, haven't you? Yes, but I'm not interested in making more money. I'm going to apply for another job. What kind of job? A secretarial job. Well, good luck. Thank you very much. A date. Two. Hello? Sandy? Is that you? Yes, uh huh. Who's this? It's Gil. Gil? Gil who? What do you mean, Gil who? Gil Dixon, of course. Oh, Gil. I'm sorry. Yes, we had a date last night. Where were you? I waited for one hour. Oh, I'm sorry, Gil. I couldn't come. Couldn't come? Why not? Well, I had to pack my stuff for my trip. Why didn't you call me? I wanted to call you, but, um, I couldn't remember your phone number. And now I'm going to forget yours. Smoking. Do you smoke? I've never known that. When did you start smoking? I started smoking when I was 18. So, how long have you been a smoker? I've smoked for 20 years. How many cigarettes do you smoke a day? I smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. Have you ever tried to quit? Yes, I have quit twice. Once when I was expecting my baby, Paul, and the other time when I had a bad sore throat. But I had a hard time. If you knew what it was doing to your lungs, you would think twice about it. A death. Did you hear about the Smith family? No. What happened? Mrs. Smith passed away this morning. That's a shame. What from? Heart attack, I think. That's a terrible thing. Yes. Mrs. Smith went into hospital last night by ambulance and died this morning. Had she been suffering from heart disease? Yeah. Mrs. Smith had it for five years before she died. Did they try surgery? She had two operations, but they weren't effective. I feel sorry for Mr. Smith. A birth. Have you heard about the good news in the Wallace family? No, I've been out of town. Mrs. Wallace went into the hospital last night and gave birth to a baby girl seven hours later. That's very good. But they already have a little girl, don't they? No, they have a five year old boy. So they wanted a girl this time, right? Yes, they wanted a girl for a long time. Was it natural childbirth? No, she had to have a cesarean. A coincidence. Teresa! What a surprise! What are you doing here? Timothy! I don't believe it. I'm going to see my daughter. She will marry this weekend. How about you? I'm going to visit my parents. When is your daughter's wedding? Sunday. Wow! This Sunday is the 45th wedding anniversary of their wedding, too. This is a surprise. Anyway, where is your train leaving from? My train leaves from platform three, over there. How long will you? Now leaving from platform three, train from Vancouver. That's my train. I have to run. Sorry we didn't get more time to talk. That's okay. I'll see you when you get back. Have a good time and say congratulations to your parents. 
How have you been, Raymond? Oh, hi, Grace. How have you been? Good. I hear you've been to Toronto for a few days. Yes, I just got back yesterday. Did you have a nice visit? Really nice. It was very good going around downtown and shopping, and I saw the Toronto Blue Jays game at Sky Dome. It seems that Toronto is a very exciting city. My brother Stanley was there too. You've met Stanley, haven't you? Sure, I met him when he was here in Hamilton last year. What's he doing these days? Still teaching baseball? Yes, as a matter of fact, he just began to teach elementary school. Great. How's everything with his kids? Have you met my nieces? Yes, they visited you once in the summer, didn't they? Right. They're both fine. I haven't seen them in a long time. They must be really big. Well, they will come over this Christmas. Let's have a great Christmas party together. That's a good idea. The garden. The garden is very interesting. I sometimes go outside, and I watch all the things that go on in the garden. It smells wonderful in the flower garden. There are red, white, pink, and yellow roses that have a sweet smell. I watch the bees as they take pollen from the roses. There are tiny bugs that live on the rose bushes. My mother tries to get rid of the little bugs, but it is difficult to get rid of them. She is glad to see the red ladybugs who eat the little bugs. The birds like the sunflowers; they like to eat sunflower seeds. There is a bird bath in the garden. The blackbirds and swallows go in there to take a drink or have a bath. I sometimes see a robin. Or a blue jay in there too. In the dirt, there are little holes where the ants go in and out. The ants are hard workers. I watch them as they work together as a team to bring food to their nests. There are snails in the garden too. They carry their homes on their backs. They move slowly and leave a silvery trail as they go. They eat the leaves from my mother's plants. My mother also has vegetables growing in her garden. She grows green peas. We like to pick those and eat the peas raw, right out of their pods. She grows lettuce and tomatoes too. We have so many tomatoes that we always give some to our neighbors. My mother sends us outside to pick lettuce and tomatoes whenever we have a salad. My favorite vegetables are carrots. Their tops grow above the earth, but the carrots are below the dirt. When you pick them, you have to pull the carrots out from under the soil. Weeds also grow in the garden. After a good rainfall, it seems that the weeds just spring up. I pull the weeds out by their roots, so they won't grow back. Weeds choke the good plants, so we don't want them in our garden. Gardening is a good hobby. You get fresh air, sunshine, and exercise. You even get beautiful, colorful flowers and nice fresh food. The pet store. On Saturday. My parents took us to the pet store. They had everything that you would need if you had a pet. They had dog food, collars, and leashes for dogs. They had treats to give your dog and brushes to brush your dog. For cats, they had food, toys, and litter boxes. For birds, they had seed and cages. There was a section for fish. They had fish in big tanks and little bowls. In the big tanks, there were colorful fish swimming around. The girl who worked there said that they were tropical fish. There were goldfish in the smaller fish bowls. I saw the girl get a goldfish out with a little net. She sold it to a boy who said he had another goldfish at home. There was a very large cage with a parrot in it. I walked up to the cage, and the parrot said hello. I was surprised that the parrot could talk. 
it could say a few things. It said, I love you, pretty bird, and bye-bye. I told my mother that I would like a parrot, but she said that parrots need a lot of care and attention. At the back of the store, there were some puppies. They seemed glad to see me. I stuck my hand into the cage, and one of them licked my hand. They were very lively. They were running around and chasing their own tails. In the next cage, there were two kittens. One of them was playing with a toy, and the other one was asleep. The kittens were very small. The one that was sleeping was curled up into a ball. I couldn't even see her face. I didn't want to leave the pet store. I was wishing that I could take all of the animals home with me. My first day of school. I remember my first day of school. I was excited, but I was afraid. I held my mother's hand as we walked to the school. When we got near the school, I wouldn't let her hold my hand anymore. I didn't want to look like a baby. We got to the school. The school looked very big and frightening. There were children outside on the playground. They all looked very big. I looked at them, and some of them looked at me. I felt very small. My mother and I went into the school and found the kindergarten room. There were children in there. Most of them were the same size as me. My mother spoke to the kindergarten teacher. The teacher was very nice. She said my name, and she introduced me to some of the other children. I already knew some of the children because they lived near me. I began to play with some of the things that were in the classroom. There were toy trucks, coloring books, and even a dollhouse. I soon forgot to be scared, and I began to play with the other children. I didn't even notice that my mother had left the room. In school, we sang songs, played some games, and listened as the teacher read us a story. I had a lot of fun on my first day of school. I even drew a picture of my teacher. I took the picture home, and my mother put it on the refrigerator. I like school. It is a good place to meet new friends. And learn all about the world. Transportation. People move from place to place. There are lots of ways you can move around from one place to another. Sometimes you can just move your feet and walk. Walking is good for you. Some places are too far to walk to. You might have to ride a bicycle or ride on a skateboard. Some places are too far away to ride your bicycle to. You might have to drive in a car, or a van, or even a truck. My father has a car. My uncle has a van. I have never been in a big truck. Trucks are usually used to carry big loads from one city to another. I would like to be a truck driver. I would travel all over and sit high up in the cab. I have been in a taxi cab. Once my mother and I took a taxi to the hospital. There was a special meter in the taxi. When we finished our taxi ride, the driver looked at the meter to find out how much money we owed him. I once rode a horse. I sat in the saddle. And held on tight to the reins, the horse ran very fast. It was a bumpy ride, and I was afraid that I would fall off the horse. Not too many people around here use horses for transportation. They used to use horses for transportation in the old days. If you want to travel very far away, you have to go on a train, a plane, or a boat. If you are in a hurry, it is best to take a plane. Planes fly through the air very fast. 
Trains go along the tracks. Sometimes I can hear the train whistle from my house. Boats take a long time to cross the ocean. Great big boats that cross the oceans are called ships. If you like to take it easy and look out at the water, then ships are a good way to travel. They say that the world is a lot smaller now because of transportation. People can travel to all parts of the world quickly and easily. The world is not really smaller, but it has become easy to get to faraway places. Television. Do you watch television? My mother says that I watch too much television. I watch cartoons on Saturday mornings. Cartoons make me laugh. My brother and I each have our favorite cartoons. We have trouble deciding which cartoons we will watch. On Saturday afternoons, we like to watch sports. My brother really likes to watch baseball, but usually my mother tells us to go out and play on a Saturday afternoon. On weeknights, we have our own favorite shows. I like shows about outer space and monsters. My brother likes comedies. He likes to laugh. My mother likes shows about real life situations. She likes to watch the news. She says that the news is important. She watches the news and weather to find out what is going on in the world. Sometimes she watches real life shows about doctors or policemen. My father doesn't watch television. He says that he would rather read a good book or the newspaper. My dad gets all his news from the newspaper. My favorite thing is to sit in front of the television with a bag of popcorn and a bottle of pop. I sit there. And change the channels with the remote control. I change channels and watch a few different shows at once. My mother won't let me watch too much television. She doesn't want me to get lazy. Television is good if you don't spend too much time watching it. You can learn a lot from television if you watch the educational channels. I learned about dinosaurs and rainforests last week. Just from watching television. My country. I live in Canada. It is a very large country that is made up of ten provinces and three territories. Most of the provinces and territories are quite unique. For example, in Saskatchewan, the land is flat and it is not surrounded by water. They grow wheat in Saskatchewan. British Columbia has mountains. I have never been to British Columbia, but I hear that it is very beautiful. Nova Scotia is on the Atlantic Ocean, so there are many fishermen out there. The people in the provinces are even different from each other. In Quebec, many of the people speak French. In the Maritime provinces, the people like to play their own kind of music. They play fiddles and accordions, and many of them dance very well. Nunavut is in the north, so life is quite different there. The people who live in the new territory of Nunavut are very close to wildlife. They do a lot of hunting and fishing. It can get very cold up in the Arctic, where Nunavut is. I live in Ontario. Even within Ontario, life can be quite different. The capital of Ontario is Toronto. Toronto is a very busy city with lots of apartments, offices, and shops. Toronto is an exciting place, and it has a lot to offer. There are theaters and restaurants to suit every taste. The culture in Toronto is very diverse. If you drive a few miles north of Toronto, you will find places that are tranquil and peaceful. Many people leave Toronto on the weekends and drive to their cottages, where they find rest and relaxation.
Canada is made up of many different cultures. People of many different ethnic backgrounds live in harmony in Canada. That is why I like Canada. In Canada, we celebrate our differences. Food. What kinds of food do you like to eat? I am lucky because in Canada there are many foods to choose from. I like to eat hot dogs, hamburgers, and steak. These are all meat products. I also like cheese, ice cream, and yogurt. These are all dairy products. I like vegetables. My favorite vegetables are broccoli, cabbage, carrots, and peas. I eat a lot of fruit. I eat whichever fruit is in season. In strawberry season, I eat a lot of strawberries. In peach season, I eat many peaches. Sometimes my mother will make a peach pie. Many different crops grow in Canada. We have many orchards and farms. Fresh fruit and vegetables are plentiful in Canada. Meat and fish are also plentiful here. In Canada, we have a lot of different foods to choose from. In my city, there are a lot of Italian restaurants. My favorite food at the Italian restaurant is pizza. My parents would rather have spaghetti or lasagna. There are Greek restaurants, Mexican restaurants, and Chinese restaurants. In fact, there are restaurants from most cultures. I can go around from restaurant to restaurant and pretend that I am traveling the world and trying all the different foods from around the world. Sometimes I eat things that aren't good for me. I eat potato chips and candies. These foods aren't part of a nutritious diet, but they are fun to eat. The zoo. My class took a trip to the Toronto Zoo. I had a wonderful time there. My favorite animals were the lions. They look very powerful and strong. They say that the lion is the king of the forest. And I think that title suits him. The monkeys were funny; they were looking at us just as much as we looked at them. They were swinging from branches and doing tricks to impress us. There was a baby monkey that was clinging to its mother's back. It was very cute. The tigers were pacing back and forth. They seemed restless. The stripes on a tiger are very beautiful. We watched the tall giraffes as they nibbled leaves off the tallest trees. We spoke to a colorful parrot that spoke back to us. We saw exotic animals that we had never seen before. Some of them were very strange. There were different types of bears there. There were black bears. I saw a black bear once when I was camping up north. We saw polar bears. Polar bears are white. They like the cold. We even saw panda bears. One of my friends bought a toy panda bear from the gift shop because she thought that the pandas were so cute. We saw slithery snakes. Some of the snakes had very bright skins. Most of the girls were afraid of the snakes. The zookeeper was looking after the snakes. And one of them hissed at him. He has to be very careful when he works with the snakes. The last thing that we saw at the zoo was the elephant. He was enormous. He looked at us, then he raised his trunk and made a loud sound. It made us jump. The museum. The museum was very interesting. There were so many things in the museum that I would need more time to really see everything. There were clothes from the past. I don't know how people wore some of those things. They look like they would be uncomfortable. I like to wear my jeans. There were things from wars. There were bullets and cannons. 
and even uniforms from the soldiers. I don't think that war is a good thing, but it is good to remember the past and honor the people who died for your country. There was an old fire truck at the museum. This fire truck was pulled by a horse. There were some very old photographs of the firemen putting out fires. There were rooms in the museum that were set up like an old house. There were antique irons and sewing machines. The women used to clean the clothes with a washboard. There were no modern appliances back then. I'm glad that we have electricity and modern appliances. The things that we have make life so much easier. There were mummies from Egypt at the museum. I was fascinated by those. There were artifacts from the Indians. There were arrowheads and cradles that the babies slept in. I tried my best to see everything, but it was almost impossible. The museum is a good place to learn about your past. I tried to imagine my grandparents using some of the things that were on display at the museum. The police. My mother always told me that if I was lost, I could go up to a policeman, and that he would help me to find my way home. I never did get lost, but I always remembered what my mother told me about the police. I think policemen look very nice in their uniforms. I see police officers drive by in their police cars. In my town, we even have police officers on bicycles. Policemen and police women have a job that can sometimes be dangerous. They have to catch people who break the law. Sometimes they have to chase people or try to calm people down. To be a police officer, you need a lot of training. It's important to be able to deal with people effectively. A police officer came to our school. He had a police dog with him. The officer showed us how the dog could track down criminals. The dog was very smart. He could even find things that were hidden. Criminals sometimes hide things that they don't want the police to find. The policeman told us. That he and his dog were partners. His dog lives at his house with the policeman and his family. Sometimes I see police cars on the side of the road. The police stop people who are speeding or are not wearing their seat belts. The police officers warn people or give out tickets. Sometimes they even have to arrest people. Police officers are just doing their job when they arrest people. Some people need to be arrested and put in jail to make it safer for the rest of us. Pretending. I like to pretend. I like to make up things that aren't real. I use my imagination. I was pretending that I was in a time machine. I set the date for a prehistoric time. I turned on the time machine, and it buzzed and whirred and spun madly. When it stopped spinning, I opened the door and stepped out into a very thick jungle. I listened carefully to the sounds of the jungle. I could hear strange animal noises, and the leaves were rustling. I wasn't sure if I'd gone back in time or had just landed in a jungle somewhere in the 21st century. It didn't take me long to realize that I had indeed gone back in time. A very strange bird-like creature with a large beak flew overhead. I had never seen anything like it in my life. I took a few steps out into the long grass and ferns. I didn't want to go too far away from my time machine. I heard a noise over on my right side. There was a man who looked quite different from me. He was dressed in an animal skin and he carried a big stick. I didn't want him to see me, so I hid behind a tree. He didn't speak any language that I could understand. He grunted at someone who must have been in the distance. Then I felt the earth shake beneath my feet. I heard giant thumps on the ground as the floor of the jungle shook. The man in the animal skin began to run. I saw why he was running. A giant dinosaur appeared above the tops of the trees. It was bigger than anything I had ever seen. 
my heart began to pound in my chest. It was coming toward me. I ran toward my time machine and jumped in. I set the dial for the 21st century. The machine whirred and buzzed. My time machine landed in the 21st century. I got away just in time. A baby. My aunt just had a baby girl. We went to the hospital to visit my aunt and to see the new baby. My aunt was feeling fine, although she was just a bit tired. She walked with us to a big window that had lots of babies behind it. She pointed to a crib with a baby in it. The baby was wrapped in a pink blanket. We all said how pretty the baby looked. I couldn't believe how tiny the baby was. She was asleep, so we couldn't see her eyes. When the baby went home, we went to visit her. We heard the baby. She was crying. My aunt said the baby was hungry. My aunt had a baby bottle full of warm milk. She fed the baby with it. The baby was happy after that. My aunt patted the baby on the back until the baby burped, and then the baby fell asleep. I held the baby. I looked at her tiny fingers and tiny toes. I was very careful with her. She opened her eyes and looked at me. I spoke to the baby, but I knew that she could not understand me. Babies have to learn to walk and talk. My aunt changed the baby. Babies wear diapers, so they need to be changed often. The baby has a lot of toys, but she is still too young to play with them. My aunt says that it won't be long before the baby is crawling and trying to talk. Babies are cute. I have seen pictures of myself when I was a baby, and it's hard to believe that I was once that small. A wedding. The church bells are ringing. I am inside the church, waiting for my cousin to walk down the aisle. Today is her wedding day. She is a bride. The organist is playing a song on the organ. We all stand up and watch my cousin walk down the aisle. She is arm in arm with her father. She is dressed in a long white dress and a veil. She looks so beautiful. She looks like a princess. The man who she is going to marry is standing at the front of the church. He is the groom. He looks nice too. He is wearing a suit and he has a flower in his lapel. The minister says words to the couple, which will make them man and wife. The bride and groom smile at each other, but they seem to be a little bit nervous. They give each other gold rings to wear to symbolize that they are married. They kiss each other and walk out of the church as the organist plays joyous music. Some of the people in the church cried at the wedding, but not because they were sad. Everyone in the church is very happy for the couple. A photographer takes pictures of the happy couple. We wish them well and look forward to the reception where we will have dinner and we will dance and have a good time until it is very late. The bride will throw her bouquet of flowers, and it is said whoever catches the bouquet will be the next bride. The next day, the bride and groom will leave for their honeymoon. My cousin and her husband are going to Mexico for their honeymoon. My dad. My dad is the man whom I respect the most in my life. He works very hard to make the money that supports us. My mother has a job too, and she also works very hard. My dad is the principal of a high school. He works at the school all day and often has to go to meetings at night. He deals with parents, students, and staff. There is always something that he has to deal with. He has a lot on his mind. It doesn't matter how much work my dad has to do. He always has time for my brothers, my sister, and me. If I go to him with a problem, he will sit down and discuss it with me. He doesn't yell. He is always very logical, and he tries to think of the best way to deal with things. My dad is a very patient man. Once I spilled some ink on papers that he was working on. I thought he would be mad, but he didn't get angry. He said it was okay. He takes time out to do things with us. He has taken my brother's fishing. He takes me to the arena to skate, and he helps my sister to write her essays and assignments. He always makes us laugh, and he makes us feel like we are very special to him. He is a very good father, and on Father's Day, I always buy him a card that tells him just how much he means to me. I think it is important to have good parents. I hope that when I have children, I will be a good parent like my parents are to me. Parents give children the foundation they need to live good lives. My mother.
My mother does so many things. She has a job at a dress store. She cooks our meals. She cleans the house. She feeds the pets, and she still finds time to spend with us. My mother is always busy, but she says that her favorite time is time that she spends with us. My mother works from Monday to Friday. When she comes home from work, she makes something for supper. We usually do the dishes so that she won't have to do them. After supper, she helps us with our homework, or she sits down to watch television. Some nights she goes shopping, and she takes whoever wants to go with her. Mothers are a little bit of everything. My mother is like a teacher when she helps us with our homework. She is like a nurse when she looks after us all when we're ill. She is like a cook when she makes meals for us. She says that cleaning the house is her least favorite thing. She says that the house gets dirty again right after you clean it. She gets my father, my brothers, sister, and me to help her with the cleaning. My mother washes all our clothes, and sometimes she irons them if they need it. My mother says that there are not enough hours in a day. We try to help my mother as much as we can. There is a lot of work involved in keeping a home neat and organized. Most of my friends' mothers work. Mothers are the people who you go to when you need to be comforted. Mothers are the people who can make you feel better. I'm glad that I have the mother that I have. My mother is caring and funny. She is fun to be around. A surprise. Last Friday, my dad came home from work and said that he had a surprise for us. We tried to guess what the surprise might be. My brother guessed that we were going out for dinner. My dad said no. My other brother asked if my father had tickets to a hockey game. My dad said no. My sister asked if we were going on a trip. My dad said no. My mother knew what the surprise was, so she just stood and smiled at us. I guess that we might be getting a swimming pool. My dad said no.、Nope. We were getting very frustrated trying to guess what the surprise might be. My brother asked how big the surprise was. My dad said that the surprise was quite small. We were not sure what the surprise could be. Will we all like it? I asked. Yes, my dad replied. Every one of you will love this surprise. We heard a noise. It was a crying noise. Your surprise wants to see you, my dad said. He opened the door to the bedroom, and a tiny puppy came running out. We were all very excited. Our surprise was a puppy. It was a little baby spaniel. The puppy loved all of us. She ran around and licked all of our faces. We had always wanted a dog. We take turns feeding the puppy and taking her out for walks. She is growing quickly and will soon be an adult dog. We all agree that the puppy was the nicest surprise my dad could have given us. Rhyming words. Sometimes my friends and I play a game. It's something we made up, so it doesn't have a name. We like to take words that rhyme. We put them together line by line. Do you get the picture now? We're playing the game, and this is how. I might say I like to drive a car. I really don't like to go very far. If I decide to take a walk, I'd go with a friend so that we could talk. Do you see that these lines rhyme? Play the game if you have the time. We could talk about school or even playing. Do you know what I am saying? Rhyming words is easy to do. It's fun for me. It can be fun for you. Just join in and say something, or make it into a song that you can sing. There are so many words that rhyme with others, like smile and mile, and mothers and brothers. I could spend all day just making up these things. I could let my imagination fly on wings, up to the clouds and back to my mind. There are so many rhymes that I can find. There are some words that are hard to find rhymes for. I don't use those words any more. I like to choose words that are easy to rhyme, like cat and bat, or lime and time. So give it a try. I know you'll have fun. I'll say goodbye. My rhyming is done. Homework. Sometimes my teacher gives us homework. I don't mind doing my homework except when the weather is really nice and all my friends are outside. On those nights, I'd rather be outside with them, so I try to get my homework done quickly. Tonight, I have some English homework. We have been reading a book. We have to read a chapter of the book and answer the questions at the end of the chapter.
It is an interesting book, so the homework for this is quite easy. My math homework is not so easy. I have to do some addition and subtraction. I don't mind that, but there are some problems that need to be solved. The problems involve addition, subtraction, and multiplication. I am not too good with numbers. I need to work harder on my math. I just finished a project for history. I had to make a map of Canada with diagrams showing the routes of all the explorers. It was an interesting project because I have been to some of the places that the explorers went to. I don't have any science homework. At school, we are growing bean plants. We go in every day and see how the plants have grown. We write down all the changes that occur in the plant every day. The only other homework that I have is geography. I have a map of Canada, and I have to write the names of all the provinces and their capitals on it. It won't take me long to do that because I know all the provinces. When my homework is all done, I will go outside and play ball with my friends until it is time to come in. I am a good student. I get good marks because I like school. My favorite subjects are physical education, English, and history. Math is my least favorite subject, but I'm trying to improve my marks in that. Opposites. Some things are opposites of each other. The opposite of black is white. The opposite of happy is sad. If I am at the opposite side of the room from you, it means that I am at the other side of the room that you are on. The opposite of up is down, and the opposite of left is right. Do you know what the opposite of young would be? Old is the opposite of young. What is the opposite of dirty? Clean is the opposite of dirty. Big is the opposite of small. Man is the opposite of woman. Boy is the opposite of girl. Sometimes people think the opposite things than other people. Someone might be wrong and someone might be right. The opposite of mother is father. See if you can think of some opposites. It is cold in the winter and it is hot in the summer. My father is very tall. And my brother is very short. A rock is hard, but a pillow is soft. An ocean is deep, but a puddle is shallow. I might tell the truth, but I might tell a lie. All of these things are opposites. The morning is bright, but the night is dark. A feather is light, but an elephant is heavy. Sugar is sweet, but a lemon is sour. A jet plane is fast, but a turtle is slow. I can go out in the day, or I can go out at night. I might love to swim, or I might hate to swim. It is interesting to see how many opposites you can think up. I could say hello, but I think it's time to say goodbye. The smart paper boy. In my town, there is a paper boy who just got an award for his actions. This boy delivered the local newspaper every morning. One of the people to whom he delivered the paper was an elderly man. This man lived alone. The paper boy had often spoken to the man, so he knew that the man lived alone. The paper boy always left the newspaper in the man's mailbox. One morning, the boy noticed that the man had not picked up his newspaper or his mail from the day before. The boy felt that something was not right. All day at school, the boy had a feeling that something might be wrong with the man. After school, the boy went back to the man's house to see if he had taken his mail and newspapers. The newspapers and mail were still in the mailbox. The boy knocked on the man's door. He could hear a faint voice, but could not hear what the person was saying. He tried to open the door, but it was locked. The boy knew that something wasn't right, so he went home and called the police station. He explained to the police that the man lived alone. He gave the address of the man's house to the police. The police knocked on the door, and they also heard the faint voice. The police got into the house and found the man lying at the bottom of the stairs. The man had fallen and broken his hip. The man had not been able to get up. He had been afraid that nobody would find him. He was very grateful to the paper boy for caring enough to get the police. The boy got an award. The man said the boy was a hero. The police said that the boy was an example of a very good citizen. The paper boy and the man are very good friends. The man will never forget what the paper boy did for him. Niagara Falls. I live in Niagara Falls. 
Niagara Falls is a famous place. A lot of tourists visit here every year. Most of the tourists come to see the waterfalls. The waterfalls are very beautiful and powerful. At night, they shine lights on the falls that make them even more dramatic. Tourists line up against the railings to watch the water as it tumbles into the Niagara River. There are other things in Niagara Falls that the tourists like to visit. There are a lot of gift shops and museums. There are many hotels that the tourists can stay at. Tourism is very important to Niagara Falls. Many people work in the tourism industry. There are many jobs in the tourism industry. You can take a special bus and tour Niagara Falls. You can ride in a horse-drawn carriage in Niagara on the lake, or you can take a balloon ride over the falls from the American side. You can even ride in a helicopter over the falls. Niagara Falls is very busy in the summertime. Summer is the time when most tourists visit here. Sometimes the tourists think it's raining near the falls, but it is only the mist that rises from the mighty waterfalls. There are many legends and stories connected to Niagara Falls. There is a special legend called the Maid of the Mist. There are stories about the daredevils who thought that they were more powerful than the falls. Some of them went over the falls in barrels, and others walked on tight ropes over the falls. Both of those things are very dangerous. I stay behind the railings when I look at the falls. I know just how powerful the falls are. It is interesting to discover all the stories that there are about Niagara Falls. The library. One of my favorite places is the library. I go there to get books for school, and I go there to get books for pleasure. I often read mysteries for fun. In the summer, I read lots of mysteries. I like to sit outside and read. In the winter, I have to read books for school. I go to the library to find out things for my projects. I often use the dictionary and the atlas. Some of my friends go with me, and we sit at the tables and do our homework. We can't make a lot of noise in the library. People have to be quiet when they are in a library. When I first went to the library, I was confused about how to find books. The librarian showed me how to use the computer to find books. Now I am able to do all my research myself. I have read some very interesting books. I have learned a lot from library books. I always bring the books back on time so I don't get a fine. I am collecting books at home. People often give me books for gifts. Soon I will have my own library. Reading is a good hobby. Everyone in my family likes to read. The library has other things besides books. There are videos at the library. There are also compact discs at the library. I have a library card so I can get books, videos, or compact discs whenever I want to. My mother sometimes goes to the library to look at the magazines. She gets some good recipes from the magazines. My father looks for books on how to build things. He is building some bookshelves for me at the moment. He found the instructions in a book. My little brother reads children's books. He likes books about trains. I have liked books ever since I was very small. My mother says that reading is a good habit to get into. When I grow up, I have been thinking about what I'd like to be when I grow up. There are so many choices. I could be a principal like my father. I could be a teacher. I like animals. Maybe I should be a veterinarian. My cat just went to the veterinarian to get her shots. I don't think my cat was too happy to be there. I could be a farmer and grow vegetables. Maybe I could be a doctor and cure people. If I was good enough, I could be a famous sports person or a singer. 
I could be an actor on television or in the movies. Maybe I would like to be a policeman or a fireman. I could rescue people. I can play the piano. Maybe I should be a musician. I could be a lawyer. I sometimes watch shows about lawyers defending people. Lawyers have to be able to speak well. I could be a carpenter and work with wood, or I could be a welder and work with metal. There are just so many jobs. I could work in a restaurant. I could cook food, or I could serve food. I could be an airline pilot or the captain of a ship. I could be a repairman or an artist. The world is full of jobs. Some of the jobs require a lot of education. Some require a little bit of training, and some require a lot of training. It's all up to me. I can be whatever I want to be. Favorite colors. My very favorite color is purple. There are not a lot of things that are purple. Some grapes are purple. Sometimes the sky looks purple. My second favorite color is blue. Some things are blue. The sky is blue, and water is blue. Many people have blue eyes. Green is a very common color in nature. Trees are green in the summer. Some trees are green all year long. Grass is green. Sometimes water looks green. Many people have green eyes. Many vegetables are green: broccoli, cabbage, beans, lettuce, peas, and cucumbers. Are all green. Green vegetables are very good for you. Yellow is a bright color. The sun looks yellow. Bananas are yellow. Some people have yellow hair. Daffodils and dandelions are yellow. White is a common color, especially in the winter. Snow is white. Clouds are white. Polar bears, some dogs, and some cats are white. There are white flowers that grow. Some flowers are red. Roses can be red. Blood is red. Sometimes the sky is red at night or in the morning. Artists use all these colors to make beautiful paintings. Nature used all these colors to make the beautiful earth. We are fortunate to be surrounded by beauty. We should do our part to make sure that nature stays beautiful and clean. Making friends. I used to be very shy. I would not go up to someone that I did not know and say hello. I was afraid that people would not want to talk to me. I have changed. I have become less shy. I have learned that making friends is easy to do. All you have to do is say hello. Most people will respond to a smile and a friendly hello. People will begin to talk to you about little things in their lives. You will soon realize that you have something in common with that person. Whenever I start talking to a new person, I find that there is some interest that we share. Maybe we know some of the same people, or we went to the same school. Often we find that we like the same music or the same movies. It is easy to have a conversation with someone once you find a topic that you can both relate to. The most important part in making friends is to listen to what the other person says. If you take an interest in them, they are sure to take an interest in you. I have learned many things from meeting people. I have had many fascinating conversations, and I have made a lot of good friends. One day, a girl came up to me and said that she was lost. She couldn't find her way to her English class. I said that I was going to that class too. I told her to come with me. We began talking, and we became very good friends. That was a few years ago. She is still one of my best friends. Just think, if she hadn't been lost, we might never have become friends. Getting old. My grandfather is getting old. When I was younger. My grandfather would carry me on his shoulders, and we would go for a walk. Now my grandfather cannot put me on his shoulders. He has a hard time walking, and he uses a cane. 
My grandfather used to have lots of hair. Now he is bald. His skin doesn't look like it used to. It is more wrinkled. My grandfather takes more naps than he used to. He goes to the doctors and takes pills for his heart. I love my grandfather very much. I don't like the fact that he is getting older, but my mother says that growing older is just a fact of life. She says that we will all get older. Sometimes my grandfather forgets things. My mother says to be patient. I am patient. I try to help my grandfather as much as I can. I sometimes go for walks with him. I help him to walk when he has trouble. I cheer him up if I think he might be sad. I get things for him, and I even read to him at night. He used to read to me when I was little. Now his eyesight is bad, and he can't see very well. My grandfather tells me stories about when he was a boy. The world was a very different place then. He tells me, his stories are interesting. Sometimes I wish we could trade places for a day so that I would know what it felt like to be old. My grandfather doesn't complain; he jokes about his old bones. I spend a lot of time with my grandfather. I hope that he is around for a long time. Time. Time is something you should never waste. Once an hour is gone, it is gone forever. You should make the most of every minute. Time is a funny thing. Some days go by so slowly. Those are the days that you do things that aren't fun. When you are having fun, time just flies by. Time is made up of different units. Seconds turn into minutes. Minutes turn into hours. Hours turn into days. Days turn into weeks. Weeks turn into months, and months turn into years. We measure our lives by time. We are very concerned with time. Even little children are very conscious of time. Little children often want to appear older. So if you ask a three-year-old how old he is, he will often say three and a half. Many of our sayings are based on time. Give me a minute. Hold on a second. I'm running out of time. Time's up. I just want an hour of your time. All of these are common things that we say, and they're all based on time. We are a society that lives by the clock. We almost all wear watches, and we glance at our watches a lot. Time is something that we can't see, but it is a big factor in our lives. How many times a day do you look at a watch or a clock? I bet you'd be surprised at just how many times you do. Amy. Amy was a girl who came into our classroom. She had many things wrong with her. Amy was in a wheelchair and she couldn't talk. She couldn't make her hands and feet do what she wanted them to do. We wondered why Amy would even be in our class because she really couldn't do much of anything. Amy had a teaching assistant who had to stay with her all the time. One day the teaching assistant got called away. I had to look after Amy. I was afraid to look after her. I really didn't know what to do. I sat beside Amy and I smiled at her. She smiled back at me. I never realized before she had such a nice smile. Amy made a noise. It seemed like she wanted a crayon that was lying beside her. I put the crayon into her hand. She had trouble holding it, but eventually she got the crayon into her hand well enough so that she could make marks on the paper that was on the tray in front of her. Amy spent a long time making marks on the paper. She tried so hard to create whatever it was that she was drawing. She worked for a long time. I just watched her, and I gave her a lot of credit for not giving up when she obviously had so many problems. When she was finally done. She picked up the paper with great difficulty. With a look of pride on her face, she handed me the picture. It was for me. I was very touched that she spent all that time drawing something for me. I thanked Amy and smiled at her. I told her I loved the picture. I still have that picture, although I'm not sure what it is a picture of. I learned a lot from Amy that day. I saw a brave girl who wouldn't give up. 
Whenever I think my problems are too big to handle, I think of Amy and I remember her smile. Memories Somebody once asked me what the most valuable things that I owned were. I thought about that for a long time. Then I realized that most of the things that I had could be replaced. What I would not be able to replace were the photographs that I had of my friends and family. Photographs are memories that are captured on film. Some of the photographs are of people who are no longer with us. I would hate to lose them. Memories are precious. They are all we have sometimes to link us to days gone by. I remember the good times. I try to relive them in my mind sometimes. I remember the sad times. Some of the sad memories are painful, but they are all a part of my life, and I don't want to lose any of my memories. People come into our lives, and people leave our lives, but most people leave a memory for us. I have lots of memories, and when I look at my photographs, the memories come flooding back into my brain. I remember what people were like when they were younger. I remember vacations that I took. I remember days that seemed ordinary at the time, but you never get to relive even the ordinary days. Memories are so precious. Cherish your memories and keep them in a place close to your heart. Roommate Wanted Spacious two-bedroom apartment with kitchen facilities. On the bus route to Brock University. Looking for quiet female roommate. Must be a non-smoker. Available from September 1, $300 a month, Hydra was included. Call Barb after 5, 905-111-1111. For sale, 10-speed men's bike for sale. Excellent condition, $100 or best offer. Call Fred, 905-111-1111. Apartment for rent. Three-bedroom apartment in the downtown area, $450 a month. Within walking distance to stores and bus route. Utilities not included. Call 905-111-1111. Please leave a message on the machine and I will get back to you. Roommate wanted. Responsible, quiet roommate wanted to share two-bedroom apartment. Some furniture included. First and last month's rent required. $300 a month. Utilities included. Call before 6. 905-111-1111. Ask for George. Help wanted. Friendly, reliable person wanted to work part-time hours at shoe store. No experience necessary. We will train you. Please leave resume at Friendly Feet Shoe Store, 34 Main Street, Niagara Falls. For sale. Textbooks for sale. Included are second year English and American history texts. Excellent condition. For complete list of texts, call Marie at 905-111-1111 anytime after 5. Upper half of duplex for rent. Within walking distance to Brock University. Two bedrooms and balcony. Laundry facilities in basement. Very spacious and clean. Hydro not included. References required. $700 per month. Call 905-111-1111 and ask for Mr. Bridges. For Mr. Places to live. I live in a house. My house is in a town. My uncle lives in an apartment building. His apartment building is in a busy city. My cousin lives in a dormitory in a school. He shares his room with a classmate. My uncle lives out in the country. He lives on a farm. The police caught a criminal. Now the criminal lives in prison. When I go to summer camp, I live in a tent. When my parents go on vacation, they live in a motel or a hotel. A motel only has one or two floors. A hotel 
usually has many floors. My aunt and uncle live in a trailer. They like to move around from place to place. My friends live in a cottage by a lake. My grandfather lives in a retirement home. Many people who are about the same age as he live there. I would like to live in a palace. I think you have to be a king or a queen or a prince or a princess to live in a palace. Bathroom. There is a bathtub in my bathroom. On the wall over the bathtub, there is a shower head. We have a shower curtain hanging on the rod over the bathtub. If you want to take a shower, we close the curtain. There is soap and shampoo in the bathroom. The soap is used for washing yourself, and the shampoo is used to wash your hair. Towels are hanging on the racks. There are washcloths or face cloths to wash yourself with. The sink has hot and cold taps. There is a plug for the drain. When you pull the plug, the water runs out of the sink. There is a toilet in the bathroom. When you flush the toilet, the water swooshes out of it. There is toilet tissue hanging beside the toilet. We keep other things in the bathroom too. There is a medicine cabinet which holds painkillers, toothpaste, and makeup. My mother likes to wear a lot of makeup on her face. There is also hairspray and gel. There are brushes and combs for our hair. There are toothbrushes and dental floss for our teeth. We only have one bathroom, so we line up to use it. It is good to have more than one bathroom in a house. The Bedroom My bed is nice and soft. I have a pretty bedspread on my bed. I have sheets and a blanket on my bed also. I use two feather pillows. My pillows have pillowcases on them. My dresser has a mirror on it. I have a lamp on top of my dresser. I also have some picture frames with pictures of my friends and family on top of my dresser. There is an alarm clock beside my bed so that I can wake up on time in the morning. I keep many clothes in my dresser drawers. The drawers are nice and deep. My closet is large. It is a walk-in closet. I have my clothes hanging in my closet. All of the clothes are hung on hangers. My shoes are all lined up on the floor of my closet. There are shelves at the top of my closet. I keep games up there. There is a rug on my bedroom floor. My bedroom window looks out over the backyard. There are curtains on my bedroom window. My bedroom is very cozy. At night, I turn off the lamp and get under the covers. I set my alarm clock for 7 o'clock. I lay my head on the pillow and I fall asleep. The Grand Canyon The Grand Canyon is one of the most spectacular sights in nature. It is found in one section of the valley of the Colorado River. The river begins its course high in the Rocky Mountains of the state of Colorado. The river travels a total of 1,400 miles through Colorado, Utah, and Arizona, and into the Gulf of California. It forms part of Arizona's border with Nevada and California. The Colorado River is a very swift and muddy river. It carries dirt and rocks down from the mountains. The story is told of an old fur trader who was attacked by Indians high up the river. His only escape was down the Colorado River in a small boat. It was a terrifying trip through rapids and around rocks at top speed. The fur trader was found some days later in very rough shape hundreds of miles down the river. No one would believe that he had come so far so fast. 
The Grand Canyon stretches for about 250 miles in the state of Arizona. The canyon was carved out by the flow of the river itself. In places, the canyon is more than a mile deep. It stretches from four to 18 miles wide at the top. The canyon valley contains worn rocks that rise up like a mountain range. The canyon has been worn down through many layers of rock. The river has cut its way down through layers of sandstone, limestone, and shaped to the granite bedrock. The different layers are of different colors, and the rocks appear very beautiful, especially at sunrise and sunset. Because the canyon is so deep, the climate changes as you go down into the valley. At the top, the climate is typical of a mountain area with evergreen trees. Next, you have typical forest trees. Third, there are plants like cacti that grow in warm deserts. Finally, there are subtropical plants at the valley bottom. Tourists can ride down the narrow trails to the bottom of the valley on mules. On one side is the rock wall of the canyon, and on the other side is a steep drop down to the bottom. Tourists have to trust their guide and the mule that they are riding to get them down safely. The trails zigzag back and forth, and the tourist going down travels much more than a mile. Some 1,000 square miles of the area became the Grand Canyon National Park in 1919. Because the Colorado River is very swift and runs through dry country, several dams have been built along it. These are designed to harness its power, save its water, and provide recreational opportunities. The best known dam is Hoover Dam, formerly Boulder Dam, on the Arizona-Nevada border. This impressive structure is 727 feet high and 1,282 feet long. Elevators are used to carry workers up and down inside the dam. The water, which is backed up by the Hoover Dam, forms Lake Mead. Lake Mead is used to irrigate nearby land as well as for boating and fishing. The dam itself is a major source of electric power for this section of the country. Visitors to the Grand Canyon are often filled with awe by the size and beauty of the canyon. People seem very small in comparison to the immense cliffs, valleys, and the mighty river. The Niagara Parks Commission. Niagara Falls, Canada, became a major tourist attraction in the mid 1830s. By this time, roads, canals, and railways were able to bring people from urban centers like New York and Boston. However, the chance for big profits attracted dishonest businessmen. One hotel in the 1860s was popularly known as the Cave of the Forty Thieves. There were many complaints from tourists about tricks that were used to get their money. Some businessmen tried to put up fences around the falls so that all visitors would have to pay them to see the falls. In time, these complaints reached the ears of important people. In 1873, Lord Dufferin, the Governor General of Canada, proposed that the government buy all the land around the falls. On the American side, New York State bought 412 acres around the American Rainbow Falls in 1885. In the same year, land was bought near the Canadian Horseshoe Falls and named Queen Victoria Park. A commission was formed to obtain control of all land along the Niagara River. This was made easier because a narrow strip along the river was already government land. However, the commission wanted to preserve all the beautiful scenery along the river and near the falls for the general public. The first commissioner of the park was Sir Kazimierz Gzowski, a distinguished engineer of Polish birth. Before the Queen Victoria Park Commission began to buy up land besides the falls, tourists had to pay for everything. There were no public washrooms, no drinking fountains, and no safety barriers around the falls. As a result, it was not uncommon for tourists crowding close to the falls or hypnotized by the flow of the river to step too close and fall in. The commission took care of these problems and also set up parks and picnic areas. In 1927, the commission's name was changed to the Niagara Parks Commission. It now supervises numerous attractions and parks from Niagara on the Lake on Lake Ontario down to Fort Erie on Lake Erie. Each section of the 56-kilometer stretch of Niagara Parks has its own places of interest. These are joined by the Niagara Parkway, a road that runs the whole length of the river. Sir Winston Churchill called the parkway the prettiest Sunday afternoon drive in the world. The Niagara Parks Commission operates restaurants, parks and gardens, rides, museums, and historic houses, golf courses, native sites, and gift shops. 
Near the falls are restaurants, parks, greenhouses, the journey behind the falls, and the Maid of the Mist boat ride. North of the falls at Niagara Gorge are the Spanish Arrow car ride and the Great Gorge Adventure. The commission also operates a school of horticulture with large gardens. Queenston Heights is a park commemorating one of Canada's heroes, General Isaac Brock. In nearby Queenston are historic houses connected with two other important Canadians, Laura Secord and William Lyne Mackenzie. The commission also operates two historic forts dating from the War of 1812, Fort George and Old Fort Erie. The Niagara Parks Commission has played a major role in making Niagara Falls and the Niagara River. One of the leading tourist areas in the world. The commission shows how governments can work to make visits to natural wonders like Niagara Falls a good experience for the general public. The Welland Canal. Before railways and automobiles became common, transporting goods over long distances was a difficult chore. In early North America, roads were often bad or non-existent. In the winter, snow and cold weather made travel difficult. Frontier farmers had trouble selling their crops because it was hard to get them to the cities. Often, rivers and lakes were the best ways to travel. Fur traders carried their furs and other supplies in canoes, but even large canoes were not big enough to hold a shipment of wheat. Rapids and waterfalls meant that goods had to be taken out of the canoe and carried to the next body of calm water. One way to improve water transportation was to build a canal. In New York State, Governor Dewitt Clinton had constructed the Erie Canal from the Niagara River to the Hudson River soon after the War of 1812. Because relations between the United States and Canada were still not very friendly, this was another reason to build a canal on the Canadian side. Canals could be used to move supplies and troops during wartime. Sometimes the British government would forbid Canadian farmers to sell food to the USA. Without a canal to move their farm produce, crops were sometimes left to rot. A Saint Catharines, Ontario merchant named William Hamilton Merritt thought about all these things in the 1820s. He also thought that flour mills needed a more reliable source of water to operate. Saint Catharines is on 12 Mile Creek below the Niagara Escarpment. This creek runs towards Lake Ontario. It rises above the escarpment, which stands from 150 to 300 feet high, then runs towards Lake Ontario. If Merritt could join the 12 Mile Creek to one of the rivers, which ran to Lake Erie, the canal would provide transportation and water power. The problem was to find a way to move boats up the escarpment. From 1824 to 1829, Merritt and his friends hired laborers to dig away tons of dirt and rock. Nearly all the work was done with shovels, pickaxes, horses, and wagons. In places, the ground was soft and landslides occurred. In other places, the men had to dig through solid granite rock. Merritt's main problem, however, was raising the money to pay for the construction. After sinking all the money that he, his family, and friends had into the canal, more was needed. Merritt went to Toronto, New York, and finally London, England, to get the financial support he needed. The problem of getting the boats to climb the escarpment was solved by a series of 35 wooden locks. These carried a ship 327 feet upwards. The ship would enter a lock with a small amount of water. More water would come into the lock, lifting the boat another 10 or 15 feet. Then the ship would move into the next lock and be lifted up again. Boats going in the opposite direction were lowered instead of lifted. The Welland Canal has been rebuilt three times since the first canal opened in 1829. Now, large seagoing and lake vessels cross the Niagara Peninsula from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie. They carry grain, coal, iron ore. Oil and many other bulk products. The Welland Canal remains one of the most important commercial waterways in the world. Walmart stores. Walmart is now the world's largest retail organization. Walmart employs around 1.2 million people worldwide. In 2000, Walmart had sales of more than 191 billion dollars, with profits of 6.3 billion dollars. Profits increased 16 percent from the previous year. 
People have come to expect that Walmart's profits will increase substantially every year. Each year, more stores are opened and Walmart expands into new countries. Walmart also enters new areas of business nearly every year. Few people know that Walmart is also a major real estate company. Sam Walton opened his Walton's Five and Dime in Bentonville, Arkansas, in 1950. Twelve years later, he opened the first Walmart in Bentonville. His business philosophy was simple: good prices, great selection, and a friendly greeting. Walton was known for the ten-foot attitude. This means that any employee should greet any customer who is within ten feet of them. He emphasized that it is important to speak to people before they speak to you. Walton also believed that good deals from suppliers should be passed along to customers. The combination of low prices and friendly service is basic to Walmart's success. That one store in Bentonville has become 4,203 stores in the USA, plus another 1,000 outside the United States. Walton died in 1992, but his business philosophy continues to be preached at Walmart's. Each store has greeters who meet the customers at the door and deal with any special needs they have. Having greeters gives the effect of having more service clerks than Walmart really has. Compared to some other department stores, Walmart has relatively fewer employees. Walmart also has the Walmart Foundation, which sponsors numerous good causes. Among their programs are high school scholarships, fundraising for local hospitals and sick children, environmental concerns, and community matching grant outreach. So, what's not to like about Walmart? The main complaint is that their business style is extremely aggressive. Walmart's attitudes towards manufacturers and suppliers are: "You do it our way, or we won't do business with you." This puts Walmart at an advantage over smaller retails who don't have the same retailing power. Walmart has been known to demand that its suppliers provide products at discount for Walmart store openings, levy fines for shipment errors, tell manufacturers what products, styles, and colors to make, etc. Walmart expects product delivery in two days and expects manufacturers to cooperate with its promotional and retailing strategies. In effect, any company that works with Walmart becomes one of their employees. Any company which so dominates one area of the market will have a lot of power. So far, Walmart has been successful in getting what it wants and providing customers with what they want. Yellowstone National Park. The Rocky Mountains of North America are quite old. Even though they were very volcanic millions of years ago, only a couple were still active today. In Yellowstone National Park, however, there is a large area of land which indicates recent volcanic activity. This area contains hot springs, geysers, and mud springs. Hot springs like geysers are caused by underground water being heated by hot rocks down in the earth. This hot water is then forced to the surface. When the surface rock is soft or porous, then the hot water bubbles. Bubbles up like a spring. When the surface rock is hard, then the hot water shoots up through any hole in the rock that it can find. These spurts of hot water are called geysers. Yellowstone also contains mud pots or mud springs. These happen when the hot water is turned to steam, and the steam carries mud and clay to the surface. Yellowstone Park is high up in the Rocky Mountains of Wyoming. Very few white people went there until the 1860s. It is said that Indians avoided the area because they thought that evil spirits lived there. In 1869, three men from Montana decided to explore this remote area. They were very impressed with its natural wonders and talked about it to others. Two other exploring expeditions followed in the next two years. These visitors were so enthusiastic about the beauty and majesty of Yellowstone that they asked that it be made a national park. At that time, there was no national park system in America. Nonetheless, in 1872, the American government agreed to set aside these lands as a public park. Why were the early visitors to Yellowstone so impressed? First, the scenery is spectacular. The Yellowstone River has created its own Grand Canyon through years of eroding its rocky banks. It is the yellow color of these canyon walls that gave Yellowstone its name. The area has many waterfalls, including the 308-foot-high Lower Falls in the Yellowstone River. There are many beautiful lakes, and the largest is Yellowstone Lake. The area is rich in wildlife. 
Among the mammals are black bears, grizzly bears, elk, moose, mule deer, bison, bighorn sheep, coyotes, pronghorn antelope, beaver, and wolves. Birds, especially waterfowl, are common all year. These include the trumpeter swan, blue heron, cormorants, bald eagles, osprey, pelicans, Canada geese, and many kinds of ducks. Sport fish are also plentiful. About 80 percent of the forest consists of lodgepole pine, but there are many other evergreens. Wildflowers are numerous and varied, but the chief attractions are the geysers and hot springs. They occur in what was a very volcanic area a million years or so ago. Here, hot molten lava from the center of the Earth has remained close to the surface of the Earth. This lava heats the surface rocks, which in turn heats the underground water. The heated water shoots up to the surface as geysers or bubbles up as hot springs. The most famous geyser is Old Faithful, which shoots its plume of water 150 feet into the air every 65 minutes or so. The eruption lasts up to five minutes. There are 200 geysers in Yellowstone Park, and about 50 of them are spectacular. Some shoot their spray over 200 feet high. Visitors from all over the world are delighted that this region has been preserved as a national park. Student newspapers. In North America, most colleges and universities, as well as many high schools, have a student newspaper. These newspapers focus on happenings at the school. They inform the student population about activities on campus and often include world news, which is relevant to student interests. In addition, there are opinion pieces by the student editors, which reflect their views on the school and the world. Sometimes these editorials oppose the way that the school is being run. Occasionally, school officials will try to shut down or censor student papers if they find their writing embarrassing or offensive. But usually, these disagreements are resolved by discussion. At some colleges, the student newspaper is connected to a professional program in journalism. But most of the time, the idea behind the paper is to get students to research the facts, debate the issues, and learn how to get their opinions expressed. If these students go on to become professional journalists, that is fine, but it is not really expected. You might wonder whether enough things happen at a college to fill out a weekly paper. Yes, indeed, schools and universities reflect the real world. There are often problems with the budget and cuts to programs. New buildings go up or are torn down. Policies change. Tuition goes up. Classrooms become crowded, and personnel come and go. University morale and funding often reflect government policies and social attitudes. These tie the college to the larger world. Editorials often comment on how national and world events affect the university. At the same time, there are many things going on within the university. Construction disturbs classes. Offices are broken into. Computers are stolen. Accidents happen in the parking lot. Students die on the roads during the holidays. Sports teams win or lose. Graduation takes place. Students and instructors win awards. Plays are put on. Distinguished visitors speak. Rock bands are in concert. Then there is always the question of student rights and responsibilities. What kinds of student behavior are unacceptable? Should the university pay attention to student activities off campus? Committees meet with student representation to set guidelines for these matters. Another issue is who sets the agenda for the university. Corporate sponsors today are buying exclusive rights to distribute their products on campus. Governments are expecting universities to follow official policies in order to receive funding. Social groups are demanding that university policies reflect their special interests. So there is no shortage of topics for student journalists to address. Of course, they also write about everything that young people are interested in: music, movies, computers, sports, travel, and pop culture. Student newspapers are an important training group for democracy. They are also very interesting to read. Canadian colleges and universities. Canada has about 50 accredited universities spread across 10 provinces. All except one are primarily government-funded. This means that there is considerable uniformity regarding programs, administration, and policy. Private colleges tend to be smaller and are mostly based on a religious curriculum. 
Most universities offer programs in the humanities, social sciences, and pure sciences. Many have additional faculties such as education and physical education. Many programs that lead directly to a position in the workplace are given at community colleges. Community colleges differ from universities because their programs involve job training and practical experience. For example, they might offer courses in areas such as computer programming, journalism, photography, social work, dentistry, and nursing. Their programs are considered to be less abstract and academic than university programs. Many students see university as being more fun than community college. They don't have to worry immediately about getting a job, and the social life is often better at university. However, a university degree may be less likely to lead directly to a job. Nowadays, university programs which are work-related, such as business administration, education, child studies, and psychology, seem especially popular. Universities, however, were founded mainly as liberal arts institutions. This means that their original intent was to prepare people to be well-rounded human beings and knowledgeable citizens. So, nearly all universities have programs in literature, languages, philosophy, culture, music, history, and politics, as well as studies that are more job-related. A past BA or BSc degree in Canada. Is normally three full years of study after secondary school. A bachelor degree with honors includes one more year of study. A master's degree is a further one or two years. A doctorate usually requires four or more years. This is similar to the United States, except that their bachelor degree is normally three years, and their master's degree may be up to three years. To gain entrance to university. You usually need to graduate from secondary school with a B average. Some programs will require an A average. Tuition costs have gone up in recent years as governments have handed over less money to colleges and universities. More students now have to work during the school year to pay their expenses. Attending college and university is known to be one of the most carefree periods in a person's life. As long as you keep up with your readings and assignments, you should be able to avoid major difficulties. Facilities for athletics, student radio and newspapers, pubs and lounges, and generally pleasant surroundings make campus life agreeable. It is a good time to make friends, learn new skills, and take calculated risks. Moreover. Colleges and universities are a good practical investment as they help to prepare young people for a changing world. Coffee and donuts. Let's go for coffee. All over North America, friends like to meet at the coffee shop. Here, people sit and talk about the day's business, news, and sports, personal concerns, shop talk, or simply gossip. Coffee shops have an informal atmosphere that encourages conversation. You don't have to dress up either. Students drop in wearing T-shirts and blue jeans and sit beside businessmen wearing suits and ties. Many coffee shops are open 24 hours a day, including Sundays and holidays. That way, people who work at night or who have trouble sleeping can drop in at any time. Because coffee and donuts are relatively inexpensive, people feel comfortable sitting for a while, knowing that they are not spending a lot of money. Although coffee and donuts are the main items sold at coffee shops, many also serve other beverages and desserts, and sometimes a light lunch. Many patrons have a favorite kind of coffee or other drink, and will drive past other coffee shops to go to one that serves the flavor they like. Visitors from other countries are often surprised at how roomy these coffee shops can be. Some are as large as regular restaurants. Having a nice bit of space around them encourages people to relax. Some people arrange regular dates and meet every day or every week at the same time. For example, retired friends may get together every weekday morning at 10 a.m. Others stop every morning at the drive-in line to get their coffee for work. Even people who have coffee machines at home or at work like to go to coffee shops to get a special kind of coffee or a favorite treat. It might seem that the business owners would not make much money just selling a few items, but in fact, many coffee shops do extremely well, especially if they are located in a busy traffic area. 
then business tends to be steady all through the day. Not only do people come in and sit down, but there is usually a lot of takeout business as well. People go to coffee shops not only to socialize with family and friends, but also to discuss business or treat their employees to a snack. Others go there to read the newspaper or a favorite magazine. Some people even go there to do work. This article was written in a coffee shop. Of course, people who come here usually like coffee and donuts. Coffee is the favorite hot drink in North America, but most shops also serve tea, hot chocolate, and cappuccino, as well as some other cold beverages. Donuts are usually round and are small, deep-fried breads with various toppings. Most donuts have a hole in the middle. Even these holes, which are punched out of the donut, can be sold separately as a kind of mini donut. Everywhere you go in North America, you will see coffee shops. So take half an hour to stop in and relax. You'll enjoy the great North American coffee break. Medical missionary. During the reign of Queen Victoria, 1837 to 1901, British people traveled around the whole world. They charted the seas, mapped out distant countries, and studied plants, animals, and people. They also claimed many lands for England. This kind of international travel was made easier by improved transportation and communication. New inventions such as steamships, trains, telegraphs, and telephones made long distances seem smaller. Of course, people had different reasons for going to distant lands. Some were businessmen who saw economic opportunities overseas. Soldiers wanted fame and a chance to enlarge the British Empire. Big game hunters wanted to be the first to shoot strange animals and bring back trophies to England. Scientists intended to study unknown animals and plants. Missionaries planned to be the first to introduce Christianity to faraway people. In 1836, a young Scotsman called David Livingstone began to study medicine in Glasgow. Livingstone intended to become a medical missionary. This means that he would be a doctor as well as a preacher and teacher. Livingstone, 1813 to 1873, came from a poor family. From an early age, he had worked 14 hours a day in a clothing factory for very little pay. But he was determined to learn. He took his books with him to the factory and read as he worked. Then, after work, he would go to his teacher to learn more. Livingston's goal was to teach faraway people about Jesus. However, unlike some missionaries, he was also interested in science, geography, and exploring. He had planned to go to China in 1839, but because of the Opium Wars, no missionaries were being sent there. Instead, he asked to go to South Africa. Europeans had traveled around the coasts of Africa for hundreds of years. But very few white people had traveled inland. A missionary named Robert Moffat, who had begun a mission at Kuriman in the interior, inspired Livingston. Livingston arrived in Kuriman in 1841. This was the farthest outpost of white settlement, and no one seemed to want to go further inland. Livingston felt that the missionaries should go to the Africans rather than waiting for the Africans to come to them. With a fellow missionary, he set out. When they came to an African tribe, they would talk to the chief and ask permission to preach to his people. Livingston would also set up a tent and treat the people who had diseases. After a while, he would move on to the next tribe. Once Livingston learned the Bantu language, he would talk to many Africans. But sometimes he needed interpreters. There were many diseases, including malaria and sleeping sickness. Livingston suffered much of his life from river fever. He was also so weak that he rode on the back of an ox. Livingston wanted to stop the slave trade. At this time, the slave trade was the most profitable business in Africa. Livingston hoped that if other kinds of trade were developed, then slavery could be abolished. In order to open up trade, he wanted to find an easy route into the center of Africa. Livingston kept going further into the interior. He was probably the first European to cross the Kalahari Desert before reaching Lake Nagami in present-day Botswana. Not long after, he traveled further inland. 
He explored the sources of the Zambezi and Kansai rivers, and eventually reached the west coast of Africa and Luanda, Angola. Livingston was being criticized for neglecting missionary work in order to explore. Livingston replied that he was opening up the continent for missionaries. Meanwhile, he was becoming famous as a great explorer. The British government commissioned him to explore the Zambezi River. They hoped that ships could sail up the river into the interior. Unfortunately, the Zambezi had too many rapids. However, Livingston did find a route up the Shire River to Lake Nyasa. He continued to struggle against the slave trade, which is now being taken over by Arabs. Livingston died in Africa in 1873. He was the first white man to explore Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi, and surrounding areas. He was not only a great explorer, but also a fine doctor and a good missionary. Nowadays, the countries that Livingston visited are nearly all Christian, just as he had hoped they would be. Favorite cookies. North Americans are known for their sweet tooth. This means that they like snacks with lots of sugar. Americans drink a lot of coffee, tea, and hot chocolate, and usually they have something sweet with their drink. Cookies are one of America's favorite desserts. The word cookie comes from a Dutch word meaning little cake. People from Europe brought their favorite recipes with them when they came to America. The English brought their custom of having tea in the afternoon. Usually, with their tea, they would have cakes or biscuits. Biscuits are usually hard wafers, like, for example, ginger snaps. In fact, the Italian slang word for Englishman is cake eater. In the early days, all cookies were homemade, but in the late 19th century, biscuits began to be manufactured in large quantities by machine. In 1912, the National Biscuit Company (Nabisco) in the USA introduced Oreo cookies. This cookie has a rich cream vanilla filling between two crispy chocolate wafers. This product was designed to meet the demand for an English-style biscuit. Oreos were good to dunk in a drink, to eat whole, to eat in parts, or to use in cooking. Oreos have become both America's and the world's favorite commercial cookie. New varieties of Oreos are added regularly to the original product. Although commercial biscuits like Oreos are very popular, many people prefer home baked ones. In fact, there is a whole line of commercial cookies called home style, which try to imitate homemade cookies. The most popular cookie in America can be either bought in a package or baked at home. These are chocolate chip cookies. Ruth and Kenneth Wakefield operated the Toll House Inn in Whitman, Massachusetts. One day in 1930, Mrs. Wakefield ran out of baking chocolate for her baking cookies. She broke up a chocolate bar and added the pieces to her cookie mix. She expected that the chocolate bits would melt into the dough when she baked them, but they didn't. Soon. Chocolate chip cookies were being made commercially by adding small chunks of chocolate to regular chocolate cookie dough. Lots of people like to make their own by adding commercial chocolate chips to their dough. Now, chocolate chip cookies are the most popular kind of cookie in North America. Over seven billion are eaten annually here. Half of all the cookies baked in American homes are chocolate chip cookies. Experiments in baking and packaging have led to new kinds of cookies. Recently, soft cookies have become very popular. Since they are packaged in foil, they can stay fresh and soft for many months. It seems likely that the love of cookies will be around for a long time. Florence Nightingale. It could be said that Florence Nightingale was responsible for inventing modern nursing. Indeed, Nightingale did open up the professions to women generally. Her example and influence during the mid to late 19th century were an important factor in opening doors to women. Nightingale's own life reflects many of these changes. She was born in 1820 and was one of two daughters of a wealthy English family. Her mother was a beautiful society lady who had once turned down a favored suitor because he was not wealthy enough. 
She wanted both her daughters to be socially popular and to marry rich and important men. Florence's father ensured that she had a good education, but she was frustrated because girls and women were always under parental supervision. She felt called to a life of action, but her family insisted that she divide her time between being with her family and attending social functions. She was not allowed to do anything on her own. When she was sixteen, Nightingale said that God spoke to her and called her to do His work. But Florence didn't know what work she was being called to do. Years passed away while she sat with her mother and sister, or attended dances and concerts, or traveled to Europe. Nightingale became more angry and rebellious. She offended her family and friends by refusing to marry several prominent men who wanted to marry her. By the time she was twenty-four, she had decided to be a nurse. But how did one become a nurse? At that time, the profession didn't seem promising. The only respectable nurses were those women in religious orders that ministered to the patient's spiritual health, but were not trained in medicine. The majority of nurses were poor, untrained women who were suspected of being too fond of men or alcohol or both. In fact, one hospital preferred to hire unwed mothers as nurses because they had no reputations to lose. Nightingale's family was horrified by her plans. Their opposition delayed her plans, but could not stop them. In 1850, she visited a hospital in Germany for the first time. In 1853, she was appointed superintendent of a women's nursing home in London. But Florence was still waiting for her true calling. In 1855, the Times of London was printing reports from the Crimean War. France and England were fighting Russia in the Crimean Peninsula. After one Allied victory, the wounded French soldiers were well taken care of, but the wounded English soldiers were left to die. Back in England, there was a public outcry. It was Florence's opportunity. She was soon on her way to Istanbul, Turkey, with thirty-eight nurses. Scutari, Turkey, was the hospital where the British wounded were brought. This so-called hospital was a death pit, where forty-two out of every one hundred men died. The army was unwilling to listen to Miss Nightingale or to let her tend the wounded. She had to wait until conditions became so bad that the regular medical officers were overwhelmed. As soon as the army turned to her, she immediately went to work. She had the entire hospital cleaned, a new kitchen set up, and a good water supply obtained. The death rate dropped to twenty-two out of every one thousand. Nightingale became famous overnight. Although her efforts in the Crimean War injured her health, she continued her work back in London. She published a 1,000-page report on medical conditions in the British Army, several books on nursing, and her own proposals and suggestions. She also set up a training school for nurses. Long before her death in 1910, she had seen nursing become a well-established profession. Almost single-handedly, she had helped to bring about proper treatment of the sick. And injured. Harriet Tubman. Before the American Civil War, the economy of the Southern states was based on the use of slave labor. The social and political leaders of the Old South were the plantation owners. Many of these owned hundreds of black slaves. The slaves were mainly used to pick crops like cotton and tobacco. Harriet Tubman was born in 1820 in the state of Maryland. As a girl of seven, she was sent into the fields to work with the adult slaves. The slaves worked from sunrise to sunset, picking the crops. Often they sang songs while they worked. Slaves were not taught to read or write. It was feared that reading and writing would help slaves to escape the plantations. Harriet Tubman was illiterate. Later in life, when she was in danger of being captured, she picked up a book and pretended to read it. This fooled the bounty hunters. When she was fifteen, Harriet helped another slave to escape. The overseer was so angry with her that he hit her over the head with an iron weight. Harriet was knocked unconscious for many days. All the rest of her life, she suffered from headaches and sudden sleeping spells. 
Harriet escaped from the plantation to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Since Pennsylvania was not a slave state, Harriet was fairly safe there. She was able to return secretly to the plantation and bring the rest of her family to freedom. There were already people working to bring black slaves up from the South to freedom. These people, both white and black, used the language of the railroad. Escaped slaves were called passengers. Safe houses were called stations, and the guides were called conductors. Harriet soon became a conductor in the Underground Railway. In 1850, the American government passed a second Fugitive Slave Act. This put more pressure on northern states to return escaped slaves to the South. Because of this, the Underground Railway went further north to Canada. In 1793. Upper Canada, Ontario, had passed a law bringing a gradual stop to slavery. In 1834, slavery was abolished in the whole British Empire. A lot of escaped slaves had come to Canada before 1850, but now nearly all escaped slaves tried to go there. Harriet Tubman rented a house in St. Catharines, Ontario. This provided a shelter for new arrivals. Harriet made about eleven trips from Canada to the U.S. during these years. In all, she brought back about three hundred people. Escaped slaves had to travel by night and suffered hardships in bad weather. They had to hide during the day wherever they could. Harriet did not allow any passengers to turn back. That might endanger the whole underground railway. When the slave owners heard about Harriet, they offered a reward for her capture, but no one caught her or turned her in. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, she acted as a spy for the Northern States. After the war, she married a black American soldier, Nelson Davis. In 1869, a book was written about Harriet Tubman. Black slaves knew Harriet as Moses. The Bible tells this story. Of how Moses led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, he led them north to Palestine. In the same way, Harriet Tubman delivered many of her people from slavery and led them north to freedom. Hernias repaired here. A hernia occurs when there is a tear or weakness in the muscle layers of the abdomen. This allows the intestines to push forward into the gap. Usually, the person feels some discomfort and may notice an egg-shaped swelling. In a few cases, the muscle layers may clamp down on the protruding intestine and cut off its oxygen supply. This can result in death if medical help is not readily available. Hernias are more common in men than women, and are often related to lifting heavy materials. Although most hernias are not a serious threat to health, they usually get worse over time. The only cure is surgery to repair the cut, tear, or weakness. As with any surgery, time in a hospital is usually required for recovery. This proved to be a problem in Canada during World War II. Many young men were declared unfit for military service because they had hernias. During the war, there was a shortage of doctors and beds for hernia repair. A Toronto doctor, Dr. Edward Schuldeis, decided to address this problem. He personally operated on seventy of these young men using a technique of his own. This Schuldeis technique allowed the patients a quicker recovery time than the usual method. It also had a much lower rate of complications and failures. After the war, Dr. Schuldeis opened his own hernia clinic for the public. In 1953, a second hospital was started in Thornhill, just north of Toronto, and today all surgery is done there. The Shouldeis Hospital is located on a beautiful piece of land with a valley on one side and a golf course on the other. The large grounds have wonderful gardens and flowering trees. There are nature paths for patients to walk on. The building itself is not a regular hospital, but more like a hotel or residence where patients can play the piano, shoot pool, play shuffleboard, or practice their putting. The hospital now has 89 beds, and an average of 30 hernia operations are performed daily. Since all the surgeons are specialists, their level of skill is very high, and less than one percent of operations need to be corrected. The worldwide rate of failure is around 20 percent. 
For patients, the good news is that everything at the hospital is directed to repairing their hernia and aiding their recovery as quickly as possible. The staff encourages its patients to walk and exercise within four or five hours of surgery. Patients usually stay on for several more days until they are fully recovered and ready to go home. Schuldeis's best advertisements are his satisfied customers. Hernia patients come not only from Canada and the United States, but also from many countries of the world to receive the best possible treatment. Schuldeis remains the most famous hospital in the world, devoted entirely to the repair and treatment of hernias. Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews, born Julia Elizabeth Wells, was born on October first, nineteen thirty-five. She lived in a small town called Walton on the Thames in England, which is south of London. Her father Ted Wells was a teacher, and mother Barbara was a pianist and piano teacher. She also played piano for her sister's dancing school. Julie learned ballet and tap as a toddler from her aunt Joan Morris. By the time Julie was three, she could read and write. When Julie was four, her parents divorced, and Barbara married Ted Andrews, a performer during the war and an excellent tenor. He soon began giving Julie singing lessons. At seven years of age, Julie had an unbelievable range of four octaves. She soon changed her last name to Andrews, the last name of her stepfather. As she grew older, Julie became one of England's most popular performers. In early childhood, Julie loved to play with her two younger half brothers, but soon went on to stardom. At age twelve, Julie was cast in a London play and stopped the show with her remarkable talent. She starred in many different BBC productions during the forties. Later, she starred in many Broadway plays such as The Boyfriend, My Fair Lady, and Camelot. It was the latter play that Walt Disney made a special trip to New York to see, and he decided then and there that Julie was perfect for the role of Mary Poppins in the film of the same name. Mary Poppins was the high-spirited, magical nanny of Jane and Michael Banks, two small British children. Julie also starred in many other films, such as The Americanization of Emily, Hawaii, Thoroughly Modern Millie. And my personal favorite, *The Sound of Music*. In this production, she plays Maria, the lively governess of Austrian naval captain George von Trapp's seven children: Liesel, Frederick, Louisa, Kurt, Brigida, Marta, and Gretel. Another of Julie's talents is writing. Two of her best-known books are *The Last of the Really Great Wang Doodles* and *Mandy*. Julie also has five children: a daughter. Emma Kate Walton from her marriage to Tony Walton, four children from her second marriage to Blake Edwards, two of whom were from Blake's previous marriage, Jennifer and Jeffrey, and two who were adopted from Vietnam, Amy and Joanna. In 1998, tragedy struck Julie. She lost her extraordinary talent for singing due to surgery on her throat in order to remove a benign tumor. A year later, she made an attempt to sing again. However, her voice will never be the same. Julie has recently been on Britain's royal honor list and is now a dame. Potato chips and corn chips. The story goes that the potato chip was invented in Saratoga Springs, New York, in 1853. Multi-millionaire Cornelius Vanderbilt complained to the chef that his fried potatoes were sliced too thickly. Chef George Crum responded by slicing the potatoes paper thin and frying them in hot oil. The potato chip became an instant success. Many companies have made large profits on chips. The most successful brands are associated with the Frito Lay Company. Herman W. Lay of Nashville, Tennessee, was selling potato chips from the back of his car in the early 1930s. He soon became a successful distributor for a brand of potato chips, which were made in Atlanta, Georgia. When that company ran into financial problems, Lay arranged to buy them out. It now became H. W. Lay and Company. Meanwhile, in Texas, Elmer Doolin was trying to sell chips made from corn dough. This was an old Mexican recipe which Doolin had found in San Antonio, Texas. 
At first, these Fritos corn chips were made in Mr. Doolin's mother's kitchen. It took a few years before they sold very well. Mr. Doolin moved the company to Dallas and began to expand his market. In 1945, he granted the H. W. Lay Company the rights to make Fritos corn chips for the American Southeast. In 1961, the two companies merged to become Frito Lay Incorporated. In 1965, Frito Lay merged with Pepsi to become PepsiCo Incorporated, one of the largest snack food and beverage companies in the world. In 2000. Frito Lay sold 58 percent of all the snack chips in the USA. In Canada and the United States, Frito Lay products had sales of 9.9 billion dollars. The most popular brand was Lay's potato chips, followed by Doritos, Ruffles, Tostitos, Cheetos, and Fritos. Internationally, Frito Lay has 28 percent of the market worldwide. That amounts to 5.9 billion dollars annually. Why are potato chips and corn chips so popular? Well, they are versatile. You can eat them by themselves or with a sandwich for lunch. They can replace other forms of potatoes and corn. They can also come in various flavors. For example, potato chip flavors include ketchup, salt and vinegar, barbecue, dill pickle, and cheddar. Potato chips can be thick or thin, ridged or flat, spicy or bland. Chips can be made from many things besides potatoes. There is corn dough and tortilla dough, of course, but chips can also be made from sweet potatoes, parsnips, taro root, peppers, and other vegetables. One caution about potato chips is that they are not a good source of nutrition. Parents who send their children to school with a bag of potato chips for lunch need to remember that these are just a snack. Because snack chips usually contain a lot of fat, they can also lead to weight gain. It is better not to eat snack chips too often and not to eat them instead of healthier foods. In Canada, nearly two billion dollars is spent on snack foods every year, and half of this is spent on chips. People are always looking for new flavors to try. Spicy chips are gaining in popularity. The snack chip industry just keeps on growing. The Stratford Festival. The Shakespearean Festival in Stratford, Ontario, is one of the greatest theatrical festivals in the world. This is the story of how this small town, which is far from any theatrical centers, became so important for drama. For most of its history, Stratford was the county town for the local farming region. It was also a railway center, but it was hardly known for the arts. An Irishman who opened an inn there founded Stratford in 1832. He called his roadhouse Shakespeare's Inn after England's great dramatist. Soon. The little town became known as Stratford after the town in England where Shakespeare was born. The local river was likewise called the Avon after the English River. The little town grew gradually and became the local center for government and law. Stratford people seemed to enjoy the association with Shakespeare. Many streets were given Shakespearean names, such as Arden Park, Portia Boulevard, Romeo Street, and Viola Court. Local schools received names such as Hamlet Public School or Falstaff School. There was still no attempt at Shakespearean theater in Stratford, Ontario. In 1913, the Canadian Pacific Railway threatened to take over the town. They proposed a railway line running through the center of Stratford, which would have taken over much of the town's parkland. The townspeople voted down this proposal. Instead, they expanded the parkland along the Avon River. These parks were enhanced with gardens, and in 1918, a pair of swans was added. These swans were an imitation of the swans on English rivers. In 1950, it appeared that the railway would be closing some of its workshops in Stratford. The town was looking for ideas that might lead to new employment opportunities. This was when one citizen, Tom Patterson, suggested that the town sponsor a drama festival. Patterson was able to get Irish director Tyrone Guthrie to come to Stratford in 1952. Guthrie agreed to head up the 1953 season. Everyone in Stratford pitched in to raise the necessary money and prepare the stage. 
Since there was no time to put up a building, the plays were staged under a huge tent. Two plays were put on during a six-week season and with great success. In 1957, a permanent theater was built. The Stratford season in 2001 runs for more than six months, from late April to early November. There are 14 plays in production at three different theaters. Altogether, there are 668 performances, with a total attendance of 580,000 people. About 40 percent of the audience comes from the United States. Tom Patterson's plan to ease unemployment in Stratford has worked well. The festival has helped to create nearly 6,000 jobs and generate wages and salaries of $110 million annually. In total, the festival brings about $170 million of revenue into the Stratford area. Of course, to the audiences who come back every year, the main attraction is seeing some of the best Shakespearean theater in the world. The Stratford Festival Company is Canada's leading acting company, and many of its actors have become internationally known. The two cultures. In 1956, English writer and scientist C.P. Snow wrote an essay on the two cultures. By this, he meant that in the West there's a scientific culture and a literary culture. Scientists do not talk very much to literary men, and vice versa. Neither group seems to know or want to know very much about the other. Snow argues that the scientific people and the literary people are moving further and further apart. Few scientists or engineers read literature. Very few writers or intellectuals know or care anything about science. This Snow thinks is a major problem in the world today. Literary culture seems to be anti-science and anti-technology. This affects Western reluctance to train more scientists and engineers. The standard of living in the West and throughout the world depends on having scientists and engineers. Nonetheless, relatively little effort is given to encouraging and developing these areas of education. Westerners, who are part of the literary culture, do not encourage or understand the scientific revolution. As a result, they are insensitive to the desire of third world peoples to improve their lives through technology. Snow talks about how the standard of living in England has improved since 1800. Snow's grandfather did not go far in school. But he did learn to read and write. Living in 1900, he realized that he was better off than his grandfather, who lived in the early 1800s. Snow's great great grandfather was a farm laborer who didn't know how to read or write. Snow feels that a similar transformation could happen even in very poor countries. It could happen in a short time if the West supplied capital and engineers. Snow believes that this is the industrial revolution that has transformed the West. This is what has allowed the farm laborers to go on to school and to learn employable skills. In 1800, only a small portion of society could expect to live well. Now, nearly everyone has access to education and training. The same industrial revolution can happen in third world countries. It is the only way to improve the lot of the poor. Snow agrees that most scientists and engineers do not read novels or cultivate the arts. However, he doesn't consider this to be as dangerous as when literary people ignore science and technology. Science and technology are too important to our standard of living to be ignored. Our education systems have to be changed to reflect our need of them. Snow's article was quite controversial. Not everyone agreed with him that science and technology are being ignored by our educational system. But Snow certainly has a point when he says that scientific people and literary people view the world differently. These two different mindsets often lead to conflict in the workplace. Snow may be right that it is too easy for literary-minded students to ignore science and scientifically-minded students to ignore literature. The war that both sides won. Today, the 3,000-mile boundary between Canada and the United States is known as the longest undefended boundary in the world. But for three years in a row—1812, 1813, and 1814—U.S. armies invaded Canada. When both sides failed to win a clear victory and the costs of the war kept growing, the two countries decided that peace was the best policy. On June 18, 1812, the United States declared war on Great Britain. 
The United States had proclaimed their independence from Britain in 1776, 36 years earlier. There were still bad feelings between the two countries. Great Britain was not treating the United States as an equal, independent country. British ships were stopping American ships from trading with Europe. British sailors went aboard American ships looking for deserters from the British Navy. If an American sailor could not prove that he was an American, he was taken to work for the British. At the same time, the population of the United States was expanding. Americans wanted to move west into lands held by various American Indian tribes. Some Americans felt that Britain was encouraging the Indians to fight them and was supplying guns to the Indians. In 1812, Canada was made up of a small number of British colonies just north of the American border. Americans felt it would be easy to take over Canada. Then Canadian land would provide homes for their growing population. Since Americans outnumbered Canadians ten to one, the U.S. government thought that no one in Canada would dare oppose them. Moreover, Britain was fighting a terrible war in Europe against Napoleon, the Emperor of France, and could not spare any troops to help defend Canada. But in 1812, Canada had one advantage over the USA: good leadership. British General Isaac Brock had served in Canada for ten years. He knew how to inspire both his own soldiers. And the ordinary people of Canada to fight for their country. He was a bold and energetic leader who moved quickly to attack American positions before they could attack him. Brock found a valuable ally in the American Indian chief Tecumseh. Tecumseh had been trying to unite the scattered groups of Indians to fight together against American expansion. He convinced the Indians that their best chance for success was to join the British and Canadians against the Americans. Although both Brock and Tecumseh were killed in battles, their example continued to inspire the defenders of Canada to fight against the American invasions. Before the end of 1814, all American forces had been driven out of Canada. By 1814, Britain had defeated the French Emperor Napoleon. Now it was the turn of the United States to be invaded. A large British force attacked the heart of the United States and burned the government buildings at Washington. Another British force attacked the USA near the mouth of the Mississippi River, but it was defeated at the Battle of New Orleans. Both sides were tired of fighting by this time, and a peace treaty was signed on December twenty fourth, eighteen fourteen. This agreement restored everything to the way it had been when the war began. Although this really meant that no one had won the war. Both sides claimed victory. The Americans felt that they had gained full recognition of their independence. Britain would no longer board their ships or encourage the Indians to fight them. Canadians felt that they had shown Americans that they wanted to develop their own country in their own way, separate from the United States. But the biggest result of the war was the decision by both countries never to fight each other again. North American death and burial. Most people in North America die either in hospital or at home. When someone dies, arrangements are made with a funeral home to get the body and prepare it for burial. Funeral homes are private businesses. They usually handle most or all aspects of a funeral, except for providing the burial plot. That usually has to be purchased separately. Funeral homes may operate in many kinds of buildings. Old, roomy private homes and new, modern one-level buildings are common types. When the funeral director receives the body, his staff embalms it so it will not decay quickly and will look lifelike at the funeral service. For one or two days before the burial, friends, relatives, and acquaintances are invited to visit the funeral home and pay their respects to the dead person. The deceased person is usually dressed in their best clothes and lying on their back in a coffin. A coffin is a large wooden or metal chest designed to hold the body. Members of the dead person's immediate family usually act as hosts for the funeral home visitation. They greet the mourners and talk to them about the deceased. Usually, there are happy photographs of the dead person near the coffin. Gifts of flowers also surround the coffin. Usually, the mourners are asked to sign a guest book. The funeral service may take place at a church if the deceased person wanted that. Frequently, however, the service is held at a chapel at the funeral home. Attending a funeral is considered a sign of respect, and people will often travel a long distance to attend.
Usually, friends and relatives will take a day off work for the occasion. Notices are put in the newspaper for several days before, so that people will know when to come. A minister or priest usually conducts the funeral service. There will be hymns, prayers, and perhaps a sermon, like a regular church service. Sometimes the minister will speak at length about the dead person. Sometimes a member of the family does this. Opportunity is allowed for other people to talk about their memories of the dead person. At the end of the service, the coffin is wheeled out to a waiting car called a hearse, which drives the dead person to the burial place. The mourners go to their cars and follow the hearse to the cemetery. At the cemetery, a hole has already been dug to receive the coffin. Usually, there's a short ceremony at the grave. Sometimes, flowers are put on top of the coffin as it is lowered into the grave. A handful of soil is tossed on the coffin, indicating burial. Usually, the mourners leave before the cemetery workers cover the coffin with earth. Then the mourners may go back to a church hall or restaurant for a meal. A funeral can be quite costly. Even an inexpensive coffin can be several thousand dollars. Sometimes the deceased will be placed in an expensive rental coffin for the visitation and funeral, but buried in a less expensive coffin. Even so, a full funeral rarely costs less than five thousand dollars, and is usually quite a lot more. This does not include the price of the burial plot or the stone grave marker. Sometimes poor people are buried at government expense. It is traditional in North America to bury the whole body in the ground. However, cremation is becoming more popular. The advantage of cremation is that it is less expensive, uses less land, and it appeals to people who don't want an elaborate funeral. Some people may wonder why so much attention is paid to a dead person, but funerals are really for the living. They are a way of saying goodbye to the dead person and receiving mutual support and encouragement from friends and family. Some funeral homes help to organize grief counseling or support groups to grieving family members. Usually, the funeral service is performed in the Christian tradition and refers to the hope of resurrection or rebirth from the dead that Christians believe in. It is now becoming common for people to plan their own funeral service before they die, and usually attempts are made to make the service appropriate to the person who died. This makes it more satisfying and memorable for family and friends. Anastasia and the Russian Revolution. The 20th century brought many changes to traditional cultures around the world. Some of the most radical changes occurred in the Russian Empire, which had one of the oldest monarchies in Europe. In 1917-18, the rule of the Tsars was replaced by the world's first communist government, led by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. No one was more affected by these changes than Anastasia, the Tsar's youngest daughter. Between 1895 and 1901, Tsar Nicholas II and his wife Alexandra became the parents of four beautiful and healthy daughters: Olga, Tatiana, Marie, and Anastasia. However, since a girl could not inherit the throne of Russia, it was important for Alexandra to give birth to a son. Finally, in 1904, the Tsar and Tsarina had a son, Alexei. This event, which should have made the whole family very happy, proved to be a source of great sorrow. Alexei was soon found to have an incurable disease. This disease, hemophilia, meant that Alexei regularly suffered from uncontrollable internal and external bleeding, which left him very weak. This caused anxiety for all the family, especially his mother and father. The Tsar and Tsarina loved their children. The girls, who didn't have to worry about becoming rulers, led a fairly carefree existence. Anastasia and her sisters lived in a palace with hundreds of servants. They attended many society parties with their parents. The most elaborate parties were grand balls, where everyone dressed in their finest clothes and danced all through the night. The absolute rule of the Tsar was not popular with everybody. The majority of the population was poor peasant farmers who could barely keep themselves and their families alive. If they moved into the city to get jobs in the factories, they had to work long hours for very low wages and live in slum conditions. Popular opposition forced the Tsar in 1905 to give up some of his power to an elected parliament. None of the girls married; they all lived a happy life together. 
They moved from palace to palace, attended by their private tutors, visiting the beach and sailing on the royal yacht. Anastasia was the clown of the family. She didn't like schoolwork, but she enjoyed painting and photography. Many of her photos of the royal family in happy times survive. Soon the czar's problems worsened. The Empress Alexandra worried about her son and became ill. War with Germany broke out in 1914, and the Russians suffered many defeats and losses. In March 1917, there was a popular revolution, and the czar was deposed. From that time on, the royal family were prisoners. At first, they were treated kindly, but in November, the Bolsheviks or communists gained control of the revolution. Lenin and his followers hated the czar. The royal family had been living in Tobolsk in Siberia. Because of fears that they might escape, they were brought back to Ekaterinburg in the Ural region. Here, after midnight on June nineteenth, nineteen eighteen, the entire royal family was shot by the Bolsheviks. To some, this news was too dreadful to be believed. The thought that the czar's lively and beautiful daughters had been killed was too hard to bear. Within a couple of years, a woman who went by the name of Anna Anderson appeared in Western Europe. She claimed to be Anastasia. Some believed her story, and some did not. With the fall of the Soviet Union, it was possible to investigate the murder of the royal family. It was also possible to prove that Anna Anderson was not the real Anastasia. After a long search, the bodies of Anastasia and Alexei were found. They had died with the rest of the family. A great mystery was finally solved. First snowfall. Today is November twenty-sixth. It snowed all day today. The snow is beautiful. The snow finally stopped. My sister and I are excited. My mom doesn't like the snow. My mom has to shovel the driveway. My sister and I get to play. I put on my hat and mittens. My mom puts on my scarf. My mom zippers my jacket. My sister puts on her hat and mittens. My mom puts on her scarf. My mom zippers her jacket. My sister and I go outside. We begin to make a snowman. My mom starts to shovel the snow. My sister and I make snow angels. My sister and I throw snowballs. It starts to snow again. We go inside for hot chocolate. Jessica's first day of school. Today is Jessica's first day of kindergarten. Jessica and her parents walk to school. Jessica's mom walks with her to her classroom. Jessica meets her teacher. His name is Mr. Parker. The school bell rings at 8:45 a.m. Jessica hugs and kisses her mom goodbye. Jessica's mom says, "I love you." At 9 a.m., Jessica stands for the national anthem. Mr. Parker calls out children's names. Each child yells back, "Here!" Mr. Parker teaches them about letters. Mr. Parker teaches them about numbers. At 10:15 a.m., the students have recess. Recess is fun. The students get to play and eat. At 10:30 a.m. The students go to gym class. At 11:15 a.m., the students return to Mr. Parker's classroom. Mr. Parker tells the students to sit on the carpet. Mr. Parker reads the students a story. Mr. Parker teaches the students a song. The lunch bell rings. Jessica's first day of school is over. My flower garden. My name is Anne. I love flowers. I have a flower garden. My garden is in front of my house. My neighbor has a garden too. 
My garden has different types of flowers. I have roses in my garden. I have tulips in my garden. I have petunias in my garden. My garden has different colors. I plant red flowers. I plant orange flowers. I plant blue flowers. I plant purple flowers. I take care of my garden. I water my garden every day. I kill the weeds in my garden. I kill insects that eat my flowers. I love my beautiful garden. Going camping. The Bright family went camping on the weekend. The Bright family went to Silent Lake. The Bright family left on Friday. They camped for three days. The Bright family brought a big tent. They brought a lot of food. They brought insect repellent. The Bright family had a campfire on Friday. They roasted marshmallows. They sang campfire songs. On Saturday, they went canoeing. On Saturday, they went fishing. On Saturday, they went swimming. They went hiking on Sunday. The Bright family saw many birds. They saw blue jays. They saw hummingbirds. The Bright family saw many animals. They saw a raccoon. They saw a squirrel. But they didn't see a bear. The Bright family had a fun vacation. My house. I live in a house. My house is small. My house has two bedrooms. My mom and dad sleep in one bedroom. My sister and I share the other bedroom. My house has a kitchen. My mom and dad cook dinner there every night. My house has a living room. My family watches television there every night. My house has a big bathroom. My house has a lot of closets. My house has a basement. My dad has a workshop in the basement. My dad makes wood furniture. My house does not have a second floor. My house has a garage. My house has a big backyard. My backyard has a maple tree. My backyard has a swimming pool. My backyard has a vegetable garden. My family likes our house. My first pet. My name is Sarah. I am 14 years old. I have a pet cat. My cat's name is Milo. My cat is black and white. Milo's paws are white. Milo's body is black. She is very cute. Milo's fur is very soft. Milo was a very small kitten. Milo is a very big cat. Milo cannot have kittens. She is fixed. Milo likes to eat. Milo likes to play outside. Milo likes to hunt for birds. Milo likes to hunt for mice. She likes her ears scratched. Milo likes to sit in my lap. Milo likes to sleep on my bed. Milo is a good pet. Jennifer the Firefighter Jennifer Smith is a firefighter. She is one of the first female firefighters. Jennifer works hard every day. Jennifer exercises every day. She lifts weights. She wants her muscles to be very strong. She saves people's lives every day. She is very strong. Jennifer is married. Her husband is a school teacher. Jennifer's husband is proud of her. Jennifer is a mother. She has two daughters. Jennifer's daughters are proud of her, too. Jennifer is happy being a firefighter. Jennifer is happy being a wife. Jennifer is happy being a mother. 
Mark's Big Game Mark's favorite sport is hockey. He is 15 years old. Mark practices three times a week. Practices are two hours long. Mark plays one game a week. Mark is a good hockey player. He plays on Friday nights. Friday night hockey games are popular. Mark's family watches him play. Mark's friends watch him play, too. There are always many fans. Tonight is the big game. Coaches are coming to watch Mark play. Mark wants to play in the National Hockey League. Mark wants to make a lot of money. It is very hard to play in the NHL. Mark's parents want him to go to college. They want him to have an education. They want Mark to be successful. They want Mark to be happy. The Easter Egg Hunt Samantha is going to an Easter Egg Hunt. Tracy is going to an Easter Egg Hunt. The Easter Egg Hunt is at Sydney's house. It is going to be fun. Sydney's mom hid chocolate eggs. Sydney's mom hid chocolate bunnies. Everybody is here. Everybody has an Easter basket. The Easter egg hunt can start. Everybody must close their eyes. One, two, three, go! Samantha finds an Easter egg. The Easter egg is behind a table. She puts it in her basket. Tracy finds a chocolate Easter bunny. It's under the couch. Tracy puts it in her basket. Sydney finds a chocolate Easter bunny, too. It's in front of the television. She puts it in her basket. Everybody finds lots of chocolate. Everybody shares their chocolate. Samantha, Tracy, and Sydney love Easter. Easter. Joe's first car. Joe is 18 years old. Joe works at McDonald's. Joe saves all his money. Joe has $2,500 in the bank. He wants to buy a sports car. Joe starts to look for a new car. Joe looks in the newspaper. Joe looks in magazines. Joe finds a car he likes. Joe goes to see the car with his dad. He really likes it. Joe doesn't have enough money. Joe's dad tells him to keep saving his money. Joe wants this car a lot. Joe asks his dad to help him. Joe and his dad make a deal. Joe's dad will lend him the money. Joe must work hard. He must pay the money back to his dad. Joe is very happy. Joe owns his first car. Summer Vacation Today is the last day of school. It is summer vacation. Grace is very excited. This summer will be fun. Grace is going to visit her grandparents. They have a cottage. The cottage is on Lake Erie. It is a lot of fun. Grace is going to swim. She is going to play board games. She is going to talk with her grandparents. Grace is going to have fun. Grace is going to a summer camp. She will sleep in a cabin. She will make lots of new friends. Grace will learn campfire songs. Camp will be fun. Grace is going to Cape Cod with her parents. We are going for two weeks. We are going to drive. Grace will see the ocean. Cape Cod will be beautiful. Summer vacation is fun. Cleaning up leaves. The leaves are changing colors. I see red maple leaves. I see orange maple leaves. I see yellow maple leaves. The leaves are beautiful. It is starting to get cold. The wind is strong. Winter is coming. The leaves fall off the trees.
On Saturday, we will clean them up. The whole family helps. My dad gets the rake. My mom gets the garbage bags. My brother and I help too. We gather leaves with our hands. We make a big pile. My brother and I jump in the leaves. We make a big mess. Our parents don't mind. Our parents fill our coats with leaves. We look really big. Everyone laughs. Playtime is over. Back to work. Susan's wedding day. Susan is getting married. Her fiance's name is Michael. They are in love. They are getting married today. Susan wakes up early. She is getting her hair done. Susan is having her makeup done too. Susan looks beautiful. She puts on her white wedding dress. She puts on her veil. Susan needs something blue. Her garter is blue. Susan needs something old. Her grandmother's ring is old. Susan needs something borrowed. She is wearing her mother's jewelry. Susan needs something new. Her shoes and dress are new. Susan needs a penny for her shoe. It will bring her good luck. Susan is ready to get married. Remembrance Day. My grandfather fought in World War II. My grandmother was a nurse in World War II. Today is November 11th. Today is Remembrance Day. Today we celebrate soldiers. Everyone wears a poppy. Poppies are red flowers. Poppies remind me of my grandparents. Poppies remind me of their sacrifice. At 11 a.m., there are two minutes of silence. People remember their friends and family. People recite the poem, In Flanders Field. It is a sad poem. It helps us remember. Today we wish for peace in the world. Halloween Night Halloween is fun. My mom buys candy. My mom buys potato chips. My mom buys chocolate bars. It is for the trick-or-treaters. My mom buys me a costume. It is a ghost costume. I am going to be scary. My sister is going to dress up as a princess. She will have a wand. She will have a crown. She will look beautiful. My dad buys a pumpkin. It is going to be a jack-o'-lantern. We draw a face on the pumpkin. We carve the face with a knife. Our jack-o'-lantern looks funny. We go trick-or-treating. We knock on the neighbor's door. We say, trick or treat. Our neighbors give us candy. We say thanks. We go to many houses. We go home. Our parents check our candy. It's safe. We eat lots of candy. We don't feel very good. We go to bed. Christmas Eve Ben and Melissa are getting ready for Christmas. Ben and Melissa's house has lots of lights on the roof. The lights are many colors. Inside, they listen to Christmas music. Ben and Melissa drink eggnog. Eggnog tastes good. Ben and Melissa hang stockings on the fireplace. They string popcorn. Ben and Melissa put the popcorn string on the Christmas tree. They put Christmas lights on the tree. They put tinsel on the tree. Ben and Melissa put ornaments on the tree. They put a star on top of the tree. They get ready for Santa Claus. They leave milk and cookies for Santa. Ben opens one present. Melissa opens one present. They go to sleep. Ben and Melissa wake up early. They run downstairs. There are a lot of presents under our tree. They wake up their mom and dad. 
Ben and Melissa open their presents. They love our presents. Everyone cleans up the wrapping paper. It is time for breakfast. Thanksgiving. We are having Thanksgiving at our house. My whole family is coming. My parents bought a turkey. It weighs 30 pounds. It takes a long time to cook. My mom wakes up early to cook the turkey. I clean the house with my dad. The house smells good. We help mom in the kitchen. I peel potatoes and carrots. My dad makes pumpkin pies. My mom cooks squash. I help my mom make stuffing. I mix the bread and spices. We make good stuffing. It goes inside the turkey. We put on nice clothes. I set the table. My dad carves the turkey. My mom makes the gravy. Our relatives arrive. We say thank you for all we have. We eat and eat. It is a good Thanksgiving. Learning how to drive. Amy is 16 years old. She lives in a small town. Amy is learning how to drive. Amy's dad is giving her lessons. Amy's dad's name is Howard. Amy has had three lessons. Amy and her dad argue during the lessons. Amy's mom is giving her driving lessons. Amy's mom's name is Jane. Jane has given Amy a lesson. Jane has decided to stop giving Amy lessons. Jane and Amy argue during the lessons too. Amy's parents call a driving school. Amy is going to get lessons from a professional. The classes cost $300 for 10 lessons. The lessons are very good. Amy learns how to drive. Amy gets her license. Housework. There is always housework to do when you live in a house. You have to wash the windows so that you can see outside. The floors and the carpets need to be vacuumed. The floors also need to be washed and some of them need to be waxed. The furniture has to be polished. The bathroom has to be kept clean. After you have a bath, you need to clean out the bathtub. Laundry needs to be done regularly or you will run out of clothes to wear. The clothes go into the washing machine and then they have to be dried in the dryer. Sometimes we hang the clothes out on the line to be dried. Some of the clothes need to be ironed. You have to buy groceries and put them away. Meals need to be made. You can't let the dishes pile up in the kitchen. The dishes have to be washed and the counters need to be wiped. The stove needs to be cleaned and sometimes the refrigerator and the cupboards need to be cleaned out. You can dust the furniture and sweep up the dirt. You can make the beds. The beds have to be changed too. They need to have clean sheets put on them. There are just so many things to do. Household chores take up a lot of time. Working outside. Today I was working outside. It was a sunny day and I was very hot. I wore a hat on my head. I watered all the plants. I weeded the flower beds. I cut back all of the plants that were growing too big. I gave some of the plants plant food. I cut the lawn. I raked the lawn. I filled up the bird baths with water. I swept the sidewalks and the paths. I took out the garbage. I filled the car up with gas. I washed the car. I hung out the clothes on the clothesline. I washed down the lawn furniture. I washed all of the windows on the house from the outside. I was so tired, so I had a glass of lemonade. I talked to my neighbor, and I helped her trim a tree. I planted some bulbs, and then I went into the house. I was exhausted. Daily Schedule I wake up every morning at 7 o'clock. I take a shower. 
I eat my breakfast. I usually have toast or cereal. I brush my teeth. I put on my clothes. I catch the school bus. I ride to school. In my class, we have math and English before recess. At recess time, the girls skip or walk around and talk. The boys play in the playground or play baseball. After recess, we have physical education and geography. We eat lunch, and then we play outside. When the bell rings, we line up to go back into the classroom. After lunch, we have history and science. At recess, we play ball again. Some of the girls play ball too. In the winter, we build snowmen. If it is too cold, we stay indoors and talk to each other. After recess, we have music and health. We get out of school at three thirty. I sometimes walk home with my friends, or I take the bus. I have a snack and change my clothes when I get home. If it is raining, I watch television. If it is nice outside, I play with my friends. I have supper at five thirty. On some nights, I help my mother to do the dishes. After supper, I do my homework. I wash my face and hands and brush my teeth. I change into my pajamas. I go to bed at nine o'clock. Meals. Breakfast is very rushed at our house. My brothers and sisters and I have toast or cereal. We also have orange juice. On weekends, my mother makes bacon and eggs for us. My father just has a cup of coffee for breakfast. My mother packs a lunch for all of us. We usually have a sandwich, a piece of fruit, and a drink of juice or milk. My favorite sandwiches are egg salad, tuna, roast beef, and ham. My brother always wants peanut butter and jam sandwiches. My mother sometimes packs a treat for us. Today we had cookies with our lunch. At supper time, the family sits around the table and talks about what they did all day. My mother makes good suppers. We sometimes have spaghetti. My mother makes a roast of beef with potatoes and vegetables quite often. She makes many different dishes out of chicken. She makes soups or stews. She also makes casseroles. My brothers and sisters and I have milk with our dinner. My parents sometimes have wine with their dinner. Sometimes we have salad before our dinner. I set the table for my mother. I put out the forks, the knives, and spoons. I also put out glasses and fill them full of milk or water. For dessert, we sometimes have ice cream, cake, or pie. My mother says that it is better to have fruit because it is better for you. Tonight I ate a peach for dessert. My favorite fruits are apples, peaches, plums, and bananas. After supper, my mother always has a cup of tea with sugar and cream in it. After dinner, I help my mother with the dishes. Usually, she washes the dishes, and I will dry them. Seasons. There are four seasons. Winter is the cold season. It snows in the winter. The winds blow, and ice forms on the water. We play hockey on the ice. We play in the snow. After winter is the spring. That is when it begins to get warmer. Trees get buds on them. Flowers start to bloom. It rains a lot in the spring. Spring is followed by the summer. It can get very hot in the summer time. The sun shines brightly. We go swimming in the summer. We spend a lot of time outdoors. Many people go on vacations in the summer. We get a summer vacation from school. Summer is followed by the fall or autumn. The leaves on the trees change colors. They change from green to red, orange, and brown. The leaves fall off the trees. 
The weather gets cooler. The days get shorter. We go back to school in the fall. Then winter comes again. The seasons follow one after each other. Weather. You can watch the weatherman on TV to find out what the weather will be like. It might be a nice clear day with no clouds in the sky. The sun might be shining. It could be a cloudy day. Sometimes cloudy days are just dull. On some cloudy days, it begins to rain or snow. Some days are rainy. You need a raincoat, umbrella, and boots on a rainy day. Rain makes the flowers and grass grow. The weather forecast might say that it will be windy. You could have a gentle breeze. It might be very gusty, so that the wind pushes you. It is dangerous if the wind is very strong. A hurricane or tornado is very dangerous. Once in a while, the weatherman says there will be hail. Hailstones are hard, cold pellets of ice that fall from the sky. Sometimes the weatherman will say that there will be snow flurries. Sometimes there is just a light dusting of snow. Sometimes there is a blizzard or a snowstorm. It can be dangerous driving through a blizzard. If there is a lot of snow, the streets have to be plowed. You need a hat, coat, mittens, and boots on a very cold day. Sometimes the weather forecast is wrong. The weatherman might say that it will be a sunny day, but then the clouds come in and it rains. That is not good if you are planning a picnic. I prefer sunny days that are warm but not too hot. I like to feel a gentle breeze to cool me down. House. A house is divided into different rooms. In my house, there is a living room. There is a couch, two chairs, a coffee table, and a television set in the living room. In the kitchen, there is a stove and a refrigerator. There is also a sink and a dishwasher in the kitchen. There is a kitchen table and chairs. We eat most of our meals at the kitchen table. We have a dining room. There is a dining table and chairs in there. There is a washroom or bathroom. There is a toilet, sink, and bathtub in the bathroom. There is also a shower in the bathroom. We have three bedrooms. The bedrooms are upstairs. My brother's room, my room, and my parents' room all have beds in them. We also have dressers in our rooms. There are closets in all of the bedrooms. We keep our clothes in the closets. There is a basement in our house. We store things in the basement. There is a laundry room in the basement. There is a washing machine and a dryer in the laundry room. This is where we wash and dry our clothes. There is a garage attached to the house. We keep the car in the garage. You drive up the driveway and into the garage. We also have a front yard and a backyard. There is a vegetable garden in the backyard. There are some flowers and a tree planted in the front yard. School. There are different types of schools. There is an elementary school. The children at the elementary school are young. There is a playground for them to play in. The classrooms are bright and airy. There are blackboards in the classrooms. The children sit in desks to do their work. There is a parking lot for the teachers to park in. There is a cafeteria for the students to get food. The principal has an office. Nobody wants to go to the principal's office. It usually means that you are in trouble if you have to go to the principal's office. When you finish elementary school, you go to high school. Most of the students in high school are teenagers. There is a parking lot outside 
the high school. There is also a football field outside. The students go to classes in different classrooms. They move from classroom to classroom for each subject. There is a cafeteria where they can get their lunches or eat the lunches that they have brought from home. There is a gymnasium where students have physical education. Dances are also held in the gymnasium. Some students go on to university from high school. Students at the university are older. Some of the students are even senior citizens. People come from all over the world to attend the university. There are lots of different things at the university. There is a theater where plays and concerts are held. There is a bookstore where students can buy their textbooks. There is a physical education building that has a swimming pool in it. The parking lot at the university is very big. They call the land that the university is on a campus. Some of the students live on campus in residence. Subjects. There are many subjects that you can take at school. My favorite subject is music. I like to sing and to play the clarinet. I also like art. I am quite good at drawing and painting. History is a good subject. I like learning about the past. Geography is very interesting. We look at many maps in geography. We learn where there are deserts and mountains. I know the names of all the continents and all the oceans. Mathematics is my least favorite subject. I'm not very good with numbers. I am good at addition and subtraction, but I'm not good at division and multiplication. In my school, we learn to speak French. We learn French because Canada has French and English speaking citizens. English literature is a good subject. I enjoy reading books. I also like to write compositions and poetry. Science is my brother's favorite subject. He is interested in plants and he likes to do experiments. We also take drama at my school. I like to act. I got the lead role in the school play. International students. We have many international students at my school. Some of the students come from England. They speak English, but they have an accent that is different from a Canadian accent. Many students are from Japan. They are learning our language and our customs. We have students from Germany, Italy, China, Korea, and Iran. We try to make those students feel welcome here. The students like to see what is here. They go sightseeing. They visit all the places that the tourists like to go to. Niagara Falls and Toronto are interesting places to visit. The students practice their English by talking to Canadians. When they first get here, we show them around. They do many exercises to learn the language. They listen to English songs. They read storybooks that are written in English. They listen to English language tapes. The best way to learn the language is to talk to other people. It is good to ask questions in English. Canadians try to be helpful to international students. Some of the international students live with host families. The host families have the students living in their homes. It is a good way for the host families and the students to make friends. Many of the international students stay in contact with their friends and host families even after they have gone back to their homelands. The international students learn a lot from their host families because they eat Canadian foods and they learn what it is like to live in a Canadian household. Interests and hobbies. It is very rewarding to have different interests and hobbies. Some people like to play computer games. Other people spend a lot of time watching television. There are people who would rather watch movies. Some people prefer more physical things. 
they would rather play a sport, like baseball, hockey, or basketball. Some people do exercises at a gym, or they just go for walks. There are many ways to exercise. They can ride a bicycle or lift weights. There are people who like to collect things. They can collect all kinds of different things. You can collect stamps, coins, dolls, postcards, movies, rocks, or posters. Some people even collect bugs or leaves. Some people are lucky enough to be able to travel. You can travel to a nearby place, or you can travel far away to a different country. There are people who like to listen to music. People have different tastes in music. Some people like rock music, rap, classical music, or folk music. There are many different types of music. Some people would rather play music than listen to it. You can play an instrument, or you can sing. Many people learn to play the guitar, or the piano. Some people join bands or orchestras. There are people who like to read books. There are a lot of different hobbies. It depends on what you consider to be fun. You can have more than one hobby or interest. It is good to be interested in a lot of different things. Movies. I go to the movies almost every week. Sometimes I rent movies from the video store. My favorite films are action films. I like to watch car chases. I like it when the bad guy has a shootout with the good guys. I like the good guys to win. I also like science fiction movies. I like things that take place in the future. I like movies that have aliens from different planets in them. Some of the science fiction movies can be silly and unbelievable. I don't like those ones. My mother likes dramas. She has a lot of favorite actors and actresses. She sometimes watches sad movies that make her cry. She also likes comedies. She laughs out loud if a comedy is very funny. My father likes horror movies. He likes movies with monsters in them. He also likes thrillers. I have watched some thrillers that keep you tense and on the edge of your seat. Sometimes I have to shut my eyes if the movie gets too scary. My brother likes animated films. In animated films, there are no actors, just cartoon characters. My brother goes to the movies on Saturday afternoons with his friends. He goes to the matinee. He gets popcorn, candy, and pop. He usually comes back with a stomach ache because he eats so much. Sometimes my father watches documentaries. Documentaries are about real things. You can learn a lot from watching a documentary. I watch documentaries with him sometimes, but I would rather see a good action film. Flowers. There are hundreds of different types of flowers. Most people like roses. Roses grow on bushes, and they smell beautiful. You have to be careful that you don't prick your finger on a rose thorn. Roses come in many colors. There are red, pink, yellow, and white roses. In the spring, tulips are in bloom. In Ottawa, there are many tulips. Some people go there just to see all the tulips in the spring. Forget-me-nots are also spring flowers. They are tiny and blue. Lilies of the valley look like white bells. Where I live, many of the trees have blossoms on them in the springtime. The apple and cherry trees look particularly beautiful when they are in blossom. We have a blossom festival in my town. My neighbors like to plant geraniums, petunias, and marigolds in the summer. 
Some people plant sunflowers. Sunflowers grow very tall. They have bright yellow petals. All of those flowers grow best in the sunshine. If your garden is shady, you have to plant different things. Hostas grow well in a shady garden. Chrysanthemums are fall flowers. Chrysanthemums come in many colors also. There are purple, yellow, and white chrysanthemums. Flowers are good to give as gifts. Women like to receive a dozen roses on Valentine's Day. Carnations also make a nice gift. They have a very sweet smell. Many people give away lilies for Easter. Poinsettias are very festive at Christmas time. If someone goes to a dance, they often give their partner a flower to wear. Sometimes a girl will get an orchid from her date. If you go to a wedding, you will probably see a lot of flowers there. Flowers help to make places beautiful. The Shopping Mall There are many different stores in the shopping mall. There are ladies' wear stores. They sell dresses, blouses, and many kinds of clothes for women. In the men's wear stores, there are suits, ties, shirts, and slacks. There are also clothing stores that appeal just to teenagers. Some clothing stores only sell children's clothes. There is even a store that sells bathing suits and cover-ups for the beach or pool. There are lingerie stores that sell ladies' underwear and nightwear. There are hardware stores that sell tools. There are shoe stores. You buy shoes and boots in a shoe store. There are book stores. You can buy a book on almost any topic at the bookstore. There are stores that sell compact discs. Those stores also have tapes and videos. There are sports stores that sell special shoes and clothes for sports. They also sell sports equipment and t-shirts and hats with the logo of your favorite teams. There are gift stores that sell all kinds of things that someone might want for their house. There are kitchen stores where you can buy utensils and pots and pans. Those kinds of stores also sell aprons and napkins and anything you might need for your kitchen. There is a movie theater at the mall. There is a jewelry store that has a lot of gold and silver jewelry. There is a hairdresser in the mall. Sometimes I go in there to get my hair cut. There are fast food places in the mall. You can get a quick lunch like a hamburger or some french fries. There are also fancier restaurants in the mall. You can sit down for a nice meal. There is a furniture store in the mall. You can buy a new sofa or bed at the furniture store. There are bulk food stores. At a bulk food store, all the foods are in bins. You take as much as you want and pay for it at the counter. There is even a telephone store and an electronics store at the mall. My brother's favorite store is the toy store. He could spend hours in there. There are also department stores at the mall. Department stores sell all kinds of things. They sell perfume, clothes, shoes, kitchen utensils, or just about anything you might need. You can get almost anything you want at the shopping mall. Travel It is fun to take a trip to a faraway place. My brother just went to Italy and France. He got on a plane at Toronto Airport. He took a flight to France. He stayed there for a couple of days. He visited the Eiffel Tower. He was in Paris. He said that he enjoyed the food in France. He then traveled to Italy. 
he saw many towns and villages in Italy. He went to Rome and visited many of the tourist attractions. In Venice, he saw the canals. He tried to speak Italian, but he is not too good at it. He said that the people were very helpful. They tried to understand him. He bought souvenirs for us when he was in Italy. He ate Italian food. He said that pizza in Italy is quite different from the pizza we eat here in Canada. He saw many streets that were made of cobblestones. He saw many old buildings. A lot of people in Italy travel around on scooters. He stayed at a very nice hotel in Italy. He was sorry when it was time to come home. My brother likes to travel. He likes to fly in airplanes. The airlines lost his luggage once. He was not too pleased about that. Next year he would like to travel to England. The Farm My uncle is a farmer. He lives on a farm. He has many different types of animals. In the barn there are horses and cows. The cows swish the flies away from themselves with their tails. It sounds very loud if a cow says moo when you are standing there. The cows eat the grass from my uncle's field. He gets milk from the cows. I put a saddle on one of the horses and went for a ride. There are pigs in the pig pen. He has goats. He says that the goats will eat just about anything. He has a chicken coop with chickens in it. The chickens lay eggs. Have you ever seen baby chicks? They are very cute. My uncle collects the eggs every morning. There is a rooster, too. The rooster crows when the sun comes up. My uncle also has a goose. The goose makes a honking noise. I don't think that the goose likes me. It nips me when I go near it. Many cats live in my uncle's barn. They are stray cats, but he lets them stay there because they keep the mice away. My uncle feeds the cats. My uncle says that he would like to get some sheep for his farm. You can get wool from sheep. There are a lot of animals on my uncle's farm. Transportation Every family that I know has at least one car. Some families have two or even three cars. Most people get their license to drive when they are 16. In my house, we just have one car. If my father takes the car to work, my mother will take the bus. I ride in a school bus to school. My sister works in another town. She gets on the train to go to work. The train station is not far from my house. The train tracks run right by my house. My grandfather from Ireland comes to visit us. He came over by boat. He had to cross the ocean. We went to Florida last year. We flew on a plane. The plane flew right through the clouds. My friend's brother drives a motorcycle. He wears a helmet. I rode on his motorcycle once. I had to sit on the back and hold on tight. I ride my bicycle when the weather is nice. I also have a scooter that I use to travel around. I took a helicopter ride once. The helicopter's propellers were going around when I got on. I went straight up in the air. I enjoyed the ride. I would like to learn how to fly a plane or a helicopter. I like flying through the air. 
holidays. In Canada, we have many different days that we celebrate. On the first day of January, there is New Year's Day. That is when we ring in the new year and say goodbye to the old year. In February, there is Valentine's Day. That is the day when you tell your girlfriend or boyfriend that you love them. You can buy them flowers or candy or take them out to dinner. In March, there is St. Patrick's Day. Everyone pretends that they are Irish on St. Patrick's Day. They all wear green. Easter comes in the spring. Easter is a religious holiday. Some people celebrate by going to church. Some people think that the Easter Bunny comes and leaves chocolate eggs for them. In May, there is Victoria Day. We celebrate this day in honor of England's Queen Victoria. There are fireworks on Victoria Day. July the 1st is Canada Day. In September, there is Labor Day. This is the day that we honor the working man or woman. In October, there is Thanksgiving. We give thanks for all the things that we are fortunate enough to have. We usually have a turkey dinner on Thanksgiving Day. On the last day of October, there is Halloween. The children dress up in costumes and go from door to door collecting candies. Remembrance Day is in November. People wear red poppies and they remember all the people that died for their country. Christmas comes in December. Christmas is also a religious holiday, but many children believe that Santa Claus arrives on Christmas Eve in a sleigh pulled by reindeer. They believe that Santa Claus fills up their stockings with toys and goodies. He gets in and out of people's houses through their chimneys. We don't get off work or school for all these days, but many of them are holidays from work and school. Diseases There are many diseases. Some diseases are very deadly, and some are not so serious. Most people catch a cold sometimes. A cold makes you cough and sneeze. Colds can be passed on from person to person. Some people get the flu. With the flu, you get chills and a fever. A fever is a high temperature. If you have the flu, you will feel very bad. You have to stay home in bed. There are diseases that children get. The mumps make you have lumps in your neck. Chicken pox and measles leave you with red itchy dots on your skin. Older people sometimes get arthritis. Their bones get stiff and sore. There are people who get heart disease. In many cases, a healthy lifestyle can prevent heart disease. Cancer can attack different parts of the body. Many smokers get lung cancer. Some diseases are treated with pills or medicine. Other diseases need to be treated in the hospital. Sometimes doctors need to give you tests to find out what kind of disease you have. The doctor might have to do a blood test or an x-ray to find out what is wrong with you. Most diseases can be cured by a doctor. Jobs There are many different jobs that you can choose from. You can be a doctor or a nurse. You could work in a hospital or doctor's office. You might be a firefighter and put out fires. A policeman enforces the law. An actor plays roles on stage or in the movies. You could drive a taxi or be the pilot of an airplane. What kinds of things do you like to do? You might want to be a sales clerk in a store. Maybe you are good at a sport. You could be a baseball player or a hockey player. 
Being a dentist is a good job. A dentist fixes teeth. If you are good at arguing, you might want to be a lawyer. Do you like to fix people's hair? You could be a hairdresser or a barber. If you are good with your hands, you might want to be a carpenter or a mechanic. If you like to travel, you could be a stewardess or a travel agent. You could be a teacher or a photographer. Are you artistic or creative? You might want to be an artist or a writer. You could work on construction and build houses. You could look after animals and be a veterinarian. If you like to cook, you could be a cook or a chef. There are so many places to work and so many jobs to do. Maybe you could fix computers or work in a library. You could wash windows or be the captain of a ship. There is no limit to what you can be. My body. On the top of my head, I have hair. Below my hair is my face. I have two eyes. I have eyebrows and eyelashes. Below my eyes, I have a nose. My mouth is below my nose. I have lips. If I open my lips, you will see my teeth and my tongue. Below my mouth is my chin. On the sides of my head, I have two ears. My cheeks are on either side of my nose. My neck holds up my head. My neck attaches my head to my chest. On either side of my chest are my shoulders. My arms hang down from my shoulders. I have wrists on my arms. My hands are attached to my wrists. My fingers are part of my hands. I have ten fingers and ten fingernails. My back is at the back of me. Further down there is my waist. If I wear a belt, I put it on my waist. My hips are below my waist. My legs come down from my hips. My legs are made up of my thighs, my knees, and my calves. My knees can bend. My ankles are below my legs. My feet are attached to my ankles. My toes are part of my feet. I have ten toes and ten toenails. I am me from the top of my head to the tip of my toes.